It was necromancing, which is the absolute worst skill a hunter could possibly have. A legendary individual who is currently one of just five hunters in the world to hold the SSS class. The public, on the other hand, has a low opinion of him due to the fact that he has spent his entire life working as a hunting dog for a business, even when he was knocked out after receiving deadly wounds and being carried out of the gate. He managed to stay alive even after all of his co-workers perished, despite the fact that many thought he was repulsive. He was given the title of the Immortal King. Kang Tia is the one who is spared from death. It was a foregone conclusion that even he would not be able to escape the Cave of Death because the guy who was responsible for it was none other than his rival from the guild that he was a member of. But Kang Tia was able to endure the battle that lasted for six months. In addition, he made the decision to engage in combat with the Griffin's headquarters today. Kang stated that it seems as though the minor players each have their own desire for money. Just look at them coming in when they don't have a place of their own and then he raises his hand to generate some pressure. On the other hand, his adversaries were yelling at each other to eliminate Kang, and they don't care if he lives or dies as long as they get their hands on the 5 million golds that are being offered to the person who can catch him. Others have suggested that they must block him in order to prevent him from calling forth his bone dragon. Kang's adversary quickly strikes him with their sword, but Kang remains cool as he calls forth his bone dragon by using his might and placing his hand on the ground. After that, a tremendous amount of light and force appear. After then, his dragon materialized above him in the sky. As soon as they laid eyes on the dragon, his adversaries were overcome with shock and terror. They were completely at a loss as to how they might best Kang at that time. However, in the building where the fight was taking place, a light was shattered, and then it exploded as a result of the bone dragon's sudden flight as it attempted to flee the structure. Kang was positioned such that it appeared as though he was in control of the bone dragon while he stood on its neck. When Kang's opponent looks up and sees him with his bone dragon, they are shocked to see that he still possesses enough mana to summon the dragon. On the other hand, Kang abruptly cursed because he had used too much mana, which caused blood to come out of his mouth. As a consequence, he quickly covers it with his hand as if nothing had happened. As his bone dragon went by a structure, he became aware that someone was standing there and looking in his direction. It was Yo Jaju, Griffin's guild master and said that he was completely surprised. In addition, Yo was standing by the window when Kang soared in front of him with his bone dragon, which was storing a power in the shape of light in its mouth. Kang became aware of something approaching just as the dragon was about to launch its attack. It was a blow delivered by his adversaries on the ground, who were striking him at the time, and they used a holy harpoon shape in the light. As a result of the harpoon, Kang's bone dragon grew agitated, and it collided with the building, causing one of its wings to be hit. As a result, his dragon stuttered in pain, and Kang directed the dragon to fly up. However, before they could get fly up, another harpoon struck his bone dragon, and he watched as the arrow entered the creature's skull. Afterwards, they are struck by multiple harpoons coming from a variety of directions, and each one of them penetrates a different section of the bone dragon. They both ended up falling to the, the ground, which resulted in the production of smoke and the destruction of the ground. Holy Knight's team sees him, exclaimed his opponent. Afterwards, Kang was trying to stand but he was now surrounded by numerous knights. Yo told him to give up but Kang didn't want to give up and Yo never saw him giving up just like that. Yo's expression changes to a grin out of nowhere, and he comments that he hasn't seen Kang give up at any point. Kang managed to rise up despite the fact that blood was coming out of his mouth, and he furrowed his brow as he did so. He inquires of Yo the reason behind his asking him such a pointless question. In response, Yo approached him while wielding a staff and moved closer to him. He stated that he desired for things to proceed exactly how he had anticipated it would. But Kang was the only one who consistently behaved in a manner that was inconsistent with his expectations. Kang defied his expectations to survive in that land of death and emerged from the experience more powerful than he had expected. In the end, he even persisted and was successful in obtaining whatever it was that Kang was holding. On the other hand, Kang was seen clutching a nameless stone, and its quality and impact are unknown to anybody else. Kang brought the stone closer to him so that he could examine it more closely, and he questioned Yo as to whether or not he was referring to the stone. When Yo saw the nameless stone, his eyes immediately opened, and he burst out laughing. He then declared that the nameless stone is a sufficient justification for him to kill Kang. However, if Kang is willing to hand it up to him, he will release Kang without causing him any kind of pain. You want this stone badly, ask Kang. Yo urges Kang to hand over the stone because it is something that will be useful to him in the future. Kang is so convinced that Yo is correct that he uses his power to cause the stone to float in Yo's direction. The latter was anticipating that the stone would land in his hand, 
but Kang grabbed it out of nowhere and grinned as he did so. He had been playing a prank on Yo, and Kang was not an idiot who would willingly give up the stone. Kang mentioned that he had heard that Yo had spent his entire life searching for that stone. Because he had already consumed the stone, he needed to find a way to retrieve it from inside his body. So he questioned Yo about whether or not he could kill him to get the stone inside his body. When Yo watched Kang swallow the stone, he was taken aback. As a consequence, he became infuriated and ordered all of his team members to cut open Kang's stomach in order to retrieve the stone. On the other hand, Kang formed a grin on his face and was creating a massive force on his hand. I'll take as many as I can as my comrade, exclaimed Kang, then strike his massive force towards his opponent in one blow. And in this manner, the horrendous night came to an end. And due to the fact that he was fatigued, it is okay to take a break and he passed away. Afterwards, a senior citizen was shaken up and taken aback by something, while a younger man fought back the tear that was forming in his eye while trying to contain his elation at the fact that his young master had at last awake. The elderly man fled in terror because he believed the person lying on the casket was a ghost. Two individuals were having a conversation in the Jejong Palace about how the Bukun clan's eldest son had been brought back to life. They are both interested in knowing what took place. They inquire as to whether or not the mortician is, in fact, a necromancer. According to the young person, the firstborn son did not return to life, but rather transformed into a Jiangxi after his death. According to the older person, the reason why he thought it was that way was because he read too much fiction. In addition to this, he claimed that the eldest son had ingested a large quantity of remedies, which led to his falling asleep and appearing to be a corpse. But the younger person reasoned that if it's Yu Shin Wun, then it may very well be plausible. The older person cautions the younger person to watch what he says since members of the Beacon clan may overhear what he has to say. But the younger person was too obstinate, and he reasoned out what the issue would be if the Beacon clan was now a tiger without teeth. Meanwhile, Kang stands up in his bed and searches for a mirror so that he can examine his appearance. When he looked in the mirror, he was shocked to see that he had grown so large that he resembled a pig. He pinched his cheeks as if the expression might shift, but it remained the same. He believed that through training his grinding bones, he was able to keep his muscles in good shape. But now, he was reincarnated on a big body. Kang had also been told that the owner of the body he had reborn with was a prodigy who appeared to have spent his entire life feeding himself. Ilgong Ya had an unhealthy obsession with food, ladies, and beverages. He abruptly laid his large frame down on the bed while thinking about him being a naked toddler who used a shovel to spread his feces all around the billboard representing the Beacon clan. A person who, in the end, was unable to breathe due to his addiction to remedy. It was a mystery to Kang how he had come to be reincarnated as a pig in ancient China after living a dissolute life. Nameless stone is the sole factor that may have contributed to the occurrence of something like that. He recalled the reason that Yo was looking for the stone with such determination. When he realized that the old man had missed the chance to revitalize himself right in front of his eyes and that he must have been insane as a result, he couldn't help but break out in a spontaneous grin. He got out of bed all of a sudden when he had the notion. What is he doing when he can lose weight whenever he wants to if he does his training routine just like he did in his previous life? But first and foremost, he has to ensure his own survival in that strange environment. He was taken aback when a hologram suddenly appeared in front of his face and informed him that the player was attempting to enter into the interface system. But there was an error because the player's information had changed since the last time they logged in. In addition to this, the hologram informed him that the player is in the process of updating its information and cautioned him that the disparity in quality between the player's soul and body was too great. When he saw his name as the player, his eyes widened in surprise. His trade is necromancy, his strength was at level 7, his health was at level 6, his agility was at level 5, his magic power was at level 3, and his level was reduced to 1. Because Kang appears to be losing interest in viewing the hologram, he gives the command for the hologram to disappear. He reassured himself that the necessary abilities were still present, which would allow him to gradually build up his power. But in addition to the strength, the hologram also indicated that the person embarked on necromancy, which means that they have not engaged in any form of physical conflict. However, he chose to disregard it given that there was no way for him to go back. To discover what the consequence of the nameless stone that he ingested in his former life was, all that was required of him was to pass away once more. But it wasn't the method either, because there's no way that there's a gate in Zhejiang from which he could obtain another nameless stone. He reassured himself that no matter what occurs, at least there are no monsters in that place. He was sick of engaging in bloody confrontations with those monsters, and the absence of creatures in that location means he can get away from that situation. 
He then breaks into a broad grin as he realizes that he may now begin his life in that place. As of that same instant, he shall henceforth be referred to as Yu Shin Woon. However, when someone unexpectedly entered his room, he was taken aback, and they complimented him on how well he appeared to be maintaining his good health. That individual was being prevented from entering the room by a servant who was following close behind them. It was Yu Jin Sang who was involved because his master had instructed him not to let anybody else inside the chamber. The servant was pleading with Jin Sang not to enter the room. However, the servant is unable to finish his sentence because Jin Sang became enraged and told the servant that he had the audacity to issue orders despite the fact that he was only a servant. Kang, who was wondering who Jin Sang was, was watching what was taking place when all of a sudden he stepped over to the servant and asked him if he was okay. Jin Sang scoffed, however, and stated that even if Woon were to be resurrected, he would continue to be as stupid as he was before. However, the servant suddenly falls on his knees and begs Woon for mercy, explaining that Woon had commanded him not to let anybody else in. Jin Sang stops the lowly servant in the middle of his speech, saying that Woon is taking care of the humble servant even though it doesn't suit him, and the servant is unable to finish his sentence. On the other hand, Kang approaches the servant and inquires about his ability to stand. He kneels down to go closer to the servant so that the servant might assist him in standing, and he suddenly asks who Jin Sang is. The servant hears him whispering that Jin Sang was actually his half-brother. Afterwards, Jin Sang questioned Woon about the reason he didn't react to the inquiry that he made. On the other hand, an elderly man walked into his room and told him that Woon may have lost his memory and didn't recognize his half-brother. Additionally, he instructed Woon to show magnanimity and pardon to Jin Sang. Quack Woon San was his name, and he was the leader of the Red Clouds faction. Kang was taken aback when his servant abruptly cautioned Quack to watch what he said in front of the young master because he needed to refer to Woon as lord at that very moment. Kang had the impression, based on the information he had received over the course of the previous several days, that the lord, his father Yu Ho Yol, had fallen ill, and that the role of lord was now vacant. But the fact that Quack refers to Jin Sang as a lord demonstrates that he is disregarding him. In addition, Quack observed that Woon had immediately furrowed his brow, so he explained that he had unintentionally referred to Jin Sang as Lord because the latter had taken over the post after the former fainted. Jin Sang, on the other hand, cautioned Quack to exercise caution since it could make Woon feel bad, after which they would both laugh as though they were laughing at Woon. Kang, on the other hand, ruminates on the origin of the two Cretans in this conversation. When Quack referred to Jin Sang once more as Lord and looked to be making fun of him, he grew enraged. Quack then informs Jin Sang that it is time for them to meet with the leader of the faction, so Quack explains that this is because they had previously checked Woon's health. Quack was instructed by the leader of the faction that he must make elaborate preparations in order to extend his congratulations to the leader of Dengryong. They were laughing so hard that they didn't see when Woon suddenly jumped towards them and smacked Jin Sang on the neck. This occurred as the two were getting ready to leave the place. Quack immediately whirled around and was enraged, however, he was taken aback when he saw that Woon had allowed the punch to be delivered. He thought to himself that it's not like he didn't sense Woon, but how could he be squared by a guy who hasn't even learned martial arts the right way? He was confused, however, because of the rage that was welling up inside of him, Jin Sang's brow became wrinkled. He suddenly switched his attention to Woon just as he was ready to draw his blade and execute his plan to kill him. However, he suddenly became frightened and was unable to grasp his sword because he observed something peculiar at Woon. Quack was bewildered because he observed that Jin Sang, who was now perspiring, did not draw his sword. In addition, Quack became aware that the door to Woon's room was ajar and that other people were observing them from outside. Because of this, he communicates with Jin Sung using his mind, telling her that they need to wrap it up and head back because there are a lot of eyes watching them. Kang was oblivious to the fact that they are speaking non-verbally and will not question whether or not it is the complete tone he learned about in martial arts. The servant that was on his side did not fully understand what had taken place. However, Quack and Jin Sang unexpectedly walked through the door together, and Jin Sang commented to Quack that his half-brother appears to be acting irrationally before leaving Woon and the servant. Kang suddenly sighs in relief and thinks that Jin Sang was not that big. But as soon as he felt something on his head, he furrowed his brow and clenched his teeth in a startling display of anger. The servant who was so concerned about him inquired as to whether or not he was okay and whether or not he should contact the medical personnel. Kang heard a voice and said that he should have lived as a prodigy until the end according to his character. He was coveting the position of the Lord after all those years. Won't suddenly hold his head as if he was in pain. 
In his mind, he saw Jin Sang and said that if he had been giving up back then, he would have died in the hands of his only little brother. Now rest in peace next to father. Jin Sang added. Kang witnessed Jin Sang pouring the liquid from a bottle onto Woon's mouth while holding the bottle. Kang instantly let out a curse after coming to the realization that Jin Sang had poisoned Woon as well as their father. He was perplexed and questioned what he saw and heard, wondering if it was actually Woon's memories. Creating a target out of Woon by engaging in combat with him despite the fact that Woon has no knowledge of martial arts. Jin Sang was aware of Woon's attempts to find assistance, but he did nothing as his half-brother suffered. Kang also stated that Jin Sang was a pig who shows himself intentionally sleeping with a woman who has taken a marriage vow. Jin Sang was referred to as a bastard by Kang. Kang felt pity for Shin Woon and a tear wanted to fall on his eye. He suddenly looked at his hand that he used on hitting Jin Sang. His eyes widened when he realized he ended up committing a huge accident. The servant was confused by his behavior when he suddenly sat as if he was a kid crying because he thought that the back of Jin Sang who killed the body that he used was returned as level 1. It looks like it's the end for him since he walked the back of his head and things are flowing just like in the previous life. The servant walks up to him and inquires as to what the master means when he says that it's the end. While Kang was sobbing, he turned to the servant and asked where the location was that had the most number of people who had been killed by the bad guys. The servant was bewildered and speechless, he had no idea what to say. In addition Kang was still wailing, he had the misconception that being the firstborn child of that family would grant him special privileges, but in reality, he was about to meet his demise as soon as he woke up. Jin Sang was holding a vase when he suddenly hurled it on the ground in a fit of rage because of what Woon had done to him. How dare that worthless piece of trash. Jin Sang let out a yell. He questioned Quack about whether or not he ought to go now and rip him to shreds. Quack, however, ordered the guards to be dismissed, and then he advised Jin Sang to compose himself because so many people were watching. But Jin Sang was showing signs of extreme rage, as seen by the furrowing of his brows and the clenching of his teeth. He asks Quack how he can keep his cool if Woon had the nerve to put his hands on him, despite the fact that Woon isn't even capable of competing with him before waking up. Quack observed as Jin Sang's rage caused him to lose his mind. He thought that Jin Sang did not understand that he let Shin Woon get in his blind spot since there's no way for someone like Shin Woon who hasn't studied martial arts then he abruptly paused his thoughts because he might overthink everything. Then Quack approached Jin Sang and reassured him that he should not be concerned because Shin Woon will soon pass away once more. When Quack tells Jin Sang that it wouldn't be strange for a person who has already passed away once to pass away again after that, Jin Sang suddenly stops. Quack also stated that he will give instructions to their most reliable disciple to complete the arrangements for the ceremony then he left Jin Sang. After hearing those remarks, Jin Sang instantly laughed and thought that Shin Woon was a lucky bastard. Even if Shin Woon had gotten lucky before, Jin Sang was going to convert Shin Woon into a corpse, so he knew that Shin Woon would not get lucky again. Afterward, the name Blood Mist Valley was given to the valley when the moon was shining upon it since it is impossible to survive there. As a result of the unintended consequences of the spells performed by both sides approximately 200 years ago, the battlefield in the Great War was coated in most of the substance, a place so restricted that even a native of Hyangju would steer clear of it. However, Cam was quickly running out of breath as he climbed the valley since the body that he had reincarnated into and which had previously belonged to Shin Woon was so difficult to move due to the fact that it was excessively large. When he finally enters the restricted area, despite the fact that he was beginning to perspire, he breaks into a broad smile because he realizes that this is the ideal setting for practicing his necromancy. Because of the number of violent deaths that took place there, he reasoned, the ground in that area has taken on a distinct hue which indicates the presence of a powerful spirit. However, there are a lot of them that he wants to take, but for the time being he can only take the white ones. He laid his palm on the area of the ground that was white, and all of a sudden, light appeared upward on the ground. It is indicated by the hologram that his skill death has been triggered, and that his spirit is compatible with the present skill rating. He was now extracting the souls of the departed out of their bodies. He was informed by the hologram that he had successfully extracted spirit from the deceased and absorbed it into his body. In addition to this, he was able to distill spirits of a greater quality as he advanced in rank and mastery. He was now absorbing the Kai of the dead man's poison. Because of his talent in poison resistance, the incoming damage has been partially mitigated. The hologram also cautioned him about the potential for mental shock and informed him that he would briefly be able to hear the dead. On the other hand, because of the force that he was experiencing, Kang's teeth were clenched and he was sweating profusely. 
He believed that in order to succeed, he had to go through the same struggles too. However, that is only true for typical necromancers due to the fact that he was accustomed to the suffering. The hologram alerted him abruptly to the fact that he was currently absorbing a small quantity of yin mana from the deceased. That was the reason for his quick clenching of his fist. He has now reached level 2, at which point additional skills will become available to him. These include the skill of skeleton mastery, the skill of hypnosis, an increase in his attack at the new level 3, and an increase in his dexterity at the new level 2. In level 4, not only did his mana and health both grow, but his mana also grew by 3. On the other hand, it was only for applying the skills once, and he could hardly do that with the hordes of low-rank monsters he had to slay. When he watched the notification appear on the hologram, he pondered the question of why his mastery had increased by three for just one use. He believed that it was a useful bonus for veterans of the game, but he is willing to take advantage of it because he can unlock skills by either meeting the requirements or leveling up. Now is the time for him to put his newly acquired skills to the test. He reasoned that, in contrast to Yang Mana, he needed to amass a greater quantity of Yin Mana in order to properly care for the large physique he possessed. He relaxes on the floor and allows his body to move about freely. In spite of the fact that there was blood on his mouth, he bent his body. After that, he will experience a pain that was penetrating through his entire body, and it will appear as though a light has been tied around his body. Even though it's painful, he needs to keep his attention on the task at hand until the light reaches his heart. Another notice appeared, informing him that the condition had been met, allowing him to unlock another talent associated with Yin Mana Heart. Kang did this because in order for a person to handle mana, they need a circuit that can store mana as well as a mana-capable heart. The greater the number of circles counted around a mana heart, the more yin mana it is able to store as the number of circles increases. After that, he let out a sigh of relief. He claimed that he can feel the filth burning on his body, and that it is gradually having an effect on him. In contrast to the other necromancers, Kang Tia made the decision to transform his heart into a mana library rather than his brain. The use of mana derived from the brain increases the risk of developing dementia, even if just temporarily. Their mental and physical capacities are deteriorating at an alarming rate as their yin mana level rises. Kang Tia, being the only person in the world to employ yin mana heart, was spared from experiencing any negative repercussions. However, Kang will try to summon the skeleton. He raises his hand and releases a force that forms lights into the ground. That light released a skeleton who was holding a sword. He walked close to the skeleton. He felt strange after he saw the first creature that he summoned. He thought that it's not good in combat but he can use it as a scout. Then, he lifts his two fingers then the skeleton releases a light smoke on its mouth and eyes. He summoned another skeleton to test their combat. But Kang was confused when the skeleton gradually vanished. He asked himself if the heart chain is gone but is expecting it. Because the amount of mana in that world is only half of the mana in his previous world and it explains why the skeleton has little mana. He reasoned that if the feed body of a monster that was carrying a mana stone had a yin mana value of approximately 10, then the value of that world would be approximately 1. He instantly let out a sigh since it is impossible to change the situation if there is neither mana nor a monster. After that, he repeated the step where he placed his hand on the ground, and he will now attempt the death kai extraction. On the other hand, a few days had gone by at this point. Kang was sneaking a peek beyond the wall when he realized that the security around the home had been beefed up, which led him to conclude that they were observing him. And there is no doubt that his half-brother Jin Sang was the mastermind behind that. He gritted his teeth in irritation because if he had a stealth skill, he could have already strangled those guards, including his half-brother. He tightened his jaw, but despite the fact that he was in a hurry, he shouldn't rush into making any harsh decisions. Therefore, he has left the location where he had been hiding, and he needs to return to his room in order to investigate potential means of evasion. When he was abruptly looking around when he was in his window, he did it because he was concerned that someone might have seen him sneaking out. Because he was exerting so much effort to go through the window, he clenched his teeth and began to perspire heavily. It was difficult for him to walk around in his new body because it was much larger than the one he had previously inhabited. When he finally entered his room, he made a vow to himself that he would start exercising and eating healthier. But when he noticed a man standing in the shadows, he was taken aback, and he opened his eyes in surprise. After suddenly activating his mana circle, he dashes towards the other individual. Kang immediately covered his lips so that he would not be able to generate any noise, and he pointed his hand on the man's neck when the man turned around and was going to shout. When Kang realized that the man was his servant Wang Sam, he was taken aback by the revelation. 
he suddenly lost his tight grip on Sam and asked him what he was doing in his room without permission. While Sam was trying to apologize to Kang, he was simultaneously struggling to catch his breath. Sam was advised by the latter to forget about the situation, but he was required to explain why he was in his room. Kang was under the impression that Jin Sang had given the command. However, he was perplexed when Sam asked him if he was going outside again because Sam had just noticed that Kang always leave his room at night. When Kang furrowed his brow, Sam remarked abruptly that he didn't tell anyone else, therefore there was no need for Kang to be concerned about it. Kang, on the other hand, glanced at Sam for a moment before deciding that it appeared as though he wasn't lying. However, he was taken aback and baffled when Sam asked to come with him and then abruptly ran outside. The only source of illumination for Sam and Shin Woon was the moon. They were on the verge of going inside a shed when Sam stopped Shin Woon and informed him that he didn't have to be concerned because it had never been used before and thus no one would ever go there. Shin Woon was left bewildered as Sam attempted to lift a large box and, as a result of this action, a hole was discovered. Sam revealed to Shin Woon that the hole was an escape route that other servants had been aware of in the past but that, at that time, he was the only one who knew about it. He also stated that he would not inquire as to where Shin Woon was going or why he was going there since he believed that Shin Woon had a valid explanation for his actions. He inquires about Shin Woon, and he plans to wait for him till he returns before proceeding. On the other hand, Shin Woon was under the impression that Sam wouldn't be able to stay alive if Jin Sang found out that Sam had told him about that location and assisted him. He wonders to himself if Sam has any awareness of the repercussions that may ensue if he is discovered. In addition to this, he shared with Sam that while he doesn't currently trust anybody else, he would like to put his faith in Sam for at least one time. Will you trust me too? He added, when Sam disclosed to Shin Woon that he places his faith in him. He then quickly extended an apology in advance before placing his hand on Sam's head. Shin Woon makes use of his charm ability in order to ask questions, which leaves the other person with no time to ask questions. Shin Woon, on the other hand, was perplexed because of the response that Sam gave, which was to become instantly bewildered and to remain silent. He was worried about whether or not the charm had actually been successful. He reasoned that perhaps this was the case because the procedure had been carried out on a person who had opened their heart in front of a caster. Shin Woon begins his line of questioning by inquiring to Sam about the nature of his relationship with Jin Sang. Sam informed him that there is no connection between Jin Sang and him. In point of fact, Jin Sang despises him very much, and the reason for this is, well, he can't finish his sentence because Shin Woon interrupted him and asked him why he followed him to such an extreme degree. Shin Woon was under the impression that the effect of the charm was too potent, possibly because the inhabitants of that world lack any form of mental defense. However, Sam explains that the reason he followed Shin Woon was because he was a pure, and generous guy who treated him as if he was Shin Woon's younger brother when he was younger. However, after the death of Shin Woon's mother, the concubine and Jin Sang began to harass Shin Woon, which caused the latter's personality to become distorted. He began to beat him and treat him harshly, but Sam has faith that Shin Woon will, one day, change back into a nice and innocent person. After hearing Sam, he immediately snapped his finger to disable the charm talent and claimed that Sam was too stubborn when everyone abandoned him, yet Sam still followed him. He had the impression that he was treated like a monster throughout his entire life, but he now knows that he can trust someone to have his back. Shin Woon noted that Sam abruptly felt his head and appeared to suffer pain as a result of the charm skill that he employs. As a result of this, Shin Woon advised him to take a short break and lay down for a while. Shin Woon crawls into the hole and tells Sam that he will return later. Yes master, I understand. Utter Sam. Meanwhile, Shin Woon was informed by the hologram that his level had been raised to 10, and that his mana heart yin had also been raised to the C rank. Shin Woon was sweating because he was holding a force in his hand and he believed that it easily followed the mana circuit. Shin Woon also believed that because it readily followed the mana circuit, he could easily combine it with the yin mana, and he had no choice but to give it a try. When the circuit broke through his chest and entered his heart, he was perplexed and appeared to be frowning while blood poured from his mouth. He was having a hard time, but if he didn't get himself together, his mana circuit would blow up since it wouldn't allow even an ounce of power through. That was bad because the yin mana will reject it. However, the hologram informed him that his necromancy had advanced to the D rank level, and that the mana circle on the mana heart of yin had reached the second circle. In addition, the seals on the bone armor, the shadow bind, and the evil eye have all been strengthened, while the skeleton mastery has been downgraded to the D rank level. Shin Woon is standing and heaving a sigh of satisfaction as he realizes that he has finally completed level 10. 
even though he had just informed himself that he hadn't gained a new skill in a while. Three of them suddenly appeared. It came as a bit of a letdown to him to learn that all of them were merely supportive talents. When will he be able to learn talents such as bone spears and corpse explosion? He wonders to himself. Shin Wu's necromancy, on the other hand, has reached the D rank, which allows him to extract Death Kai more effectively. But when he peered at those lights on the ground, he was perplexed since the sensations of a white level spirit and a blue level spirit were completely distinct, and he had just recently experienced something similar to that. Then he remembered Yu Jin Sang and Guak Ju San, and they had a sensation that was comparable to that. Is this what Kai is? He utter. In addition, above the blue level spirits, the amount of yin mana is exceedingly low, but there is also a potent, unexplained force. They emanate a devastating aura, similar to that of the yin mana, which is proportional to the power that is able to be drawn from their personalities and skills. However, Shin Wun was concerned that what he was about to undertake was too risky, and he pondered to himself whether or not he ought to start off with the less stressful option instead. He put his hand on top of the ground, and a blue light became visible and stretched for his hand. He did this because he was interested in the unknown power on the ground, and he thought that perhaps he might use it as a replacement for the yin mana. As the light passed through his fingers, he began to perspire and was bewildered since he felt hot yet had no rejection. Additionally, it was simple to follow the mana circuit, and he was able to effortlessly mix it with the yin mana. After that, he made an effort, but his brow was furrowed, and blood was dripping out of his mouth. But despite the fact that he was struggling and his hands were gripped, he kept on even as the light traveled through his body all the way to his heart. If he keeps doing it, his mana circuit is going to blow up since it didn't absorb any amount of power, not even an ounce, and this is bad because yin mana is going to reject it. In addition, Shin Wun has convinced himself that it is not feasible to reach the mana heart by utilizing that strength. Because of the force that he generated, he was seen clenching his teeth, and his forehead revealed veins that were visible. Because he has no other option, he will have to start a new mana library in order to store the power because generating new mana is a difficult process that places an excessive amount of pressure on the body. However, there is not sufficient energy in the location, and in order for him to survive, he will need to seize the power for himself. However, due to the fact that his body was fighting against the power, he focused all of his concentration on accumulating the power. Stop fighting and gather down here, he exclaimed. However, after a period of battling and experiencing pain, he suddenly laughed and laid down on the ground because he had succeeded in absorbing the power. On the other hand, the hologram arrives and declares that Shin Wun has been successful in absorbing the strange power from the deceased, that the power has been identified, and that he has now absorbed 30 days worth of art flowing clouds. Afterwards, Shin Wun laughs to himself after reading the hologram since he now has a Kai that has increased to level 10 and his mana has increased to a maximum of 200. Because the type of Kai on the second library mana is 1, it indicates that he is capable of storing a wide variety of Kai types. Because he had read that there is a negative effect in mixing too many types, and that his Kai would burst inside of him if he did so, despite the fact that it sounded appealing, he needed to find a means. Nevertheless, all of a sudden he takes attention to what is being described as art flowing clouds. According to the hologram, the art flowing clouds is the most fundamental breathing method that the Yellow Mountain faction teaches its apprentices. The holographic also explains that the technique's defining trait is that it utilizes the practitioner's kai. It is of the second rate and possesses blade qualities in addition to its rank. However, because of the slow rate at which it accumulates power, it is challenging to master. He jumped up all of a sudden and questioned himself, should I try the art flowing cloud? However, he was apprehensive, which is why he chose to try it when he completely grasped what the art flowing cloud was. Shin Wu raises his hand and thinks to himself, how shall I use the mana and the kai? As he does so, following that, he issues an order for the skeleton warrior to stand. Shin Wu was perplexed because he had only used the yin mana because he believed there would be some negative side effects. But he questioned whether or not his control had already improved while he was gazing at the skeleton warrior, who had suddenly appeared and was carrying an axe. Afterwards, he was utilizing his kai in an attempt to summon a skeleton. He raises his palm, and an energy goes by his heart, which is positioned at his chest. Although he didn't intend it, he was pleased by this, as the yin mana mingled with the kai. He took a glance at his hand and was surprised to see the amount of power he already held, and he was only becoming stronger. As a result, he conjured forth another skeleton that emerged from the ground as he placed his hand there. When he saw the skeleton, which appeared to be very large, his jaw dropped. Now, this is it. 
he uttered while forming a smile on his face. Shin Woon was so confused about the two skeletons that he summoned and didn't know what's going on. He turns to the skeleton without clothes who has only the characteristics of white skeleton swordsman with the strength of 18, agility of 16, health 16, magic power of 5 and seems like a level 7. However, the skeleton with clothes has a characteristic of a third-class warrior. Its skill is flowing cloud 13 sword, the strength was 50, its agility was 31, and has experience for about one year. Afterwards, Shin Woon suddenly got interested in the skeleton with clothes because its strength was higher than him and also being able to use martial arts on top of that. He thought that the only thing he needed to be cautious about was his experiences. And that means summoning the skeleton with clothes purely through mana is impossible. And since the skeleton was already summoned, he have to check it out. So he lift his finger and commands the two skeletons to make a combat. After that, the two skeletons abruptly formed their stance and were about to attack each other. The white skeleton leaps up unexpectedly and raises his weapon in preparation for an assault on the skeleton warrior. However, the skeleton warrior sidestepped his blow. Because of this, the weapon that belonged to the white skeleton fell to the ground. However, the white skeleton continues to strike out at the skeleton warrior, who continues to avoid each blow. And as a result of the final blow that the white skeleton delivers, he suddenly falls to his knees on the ground. And it is now time for the skeleton warrior to launch an assault on him. Nevertheless, Shin Woon was keeping a close eye on them. He observed the footwork that the white skeleton executed. But the skeleton warrior lost all of his health in such a short amount of time. On the other hand, the skeleton warrior suddenly sprang up and the white skeleton was about to assault it when it suddenly stood up as well and went to attack it. They were both moving quite quickly as they got closer to one another. However, the white skeleton was taken aback when the skeleton warrior unleashed a force in its weapon and struck. As a consequence of this, the force that the skeleton warrior unleashed impacted the weapon of the white skeleton. And it was flung because the white skeleton used his weapon to dodge the force that the skeleton warrior unleashed. When Shin Woon gave the command for it to stop, the skeleton warrior suddenly stopped just as he was about to hit the white tiger in the neck. However, Shin Woon was impressed by their fighting prowess, so he decided to deactivate his summoning power, which resulted in the two skeletons gradually disappearing into the ground. He activates the status window, and then the hologram appears. He makes a remark about how the two skeletons have been fighting for a considerable length of time, but the total quantity of Kai that they have used is just 10. He still has some mana available to him. He wondered himself if it was because it was more effective when partnered with Kai, and if that was the case, that was good news for him, especially considering how difficult it was for him to absorb yin mana at the moment, while his inner Kai didn't appear to replenish on its own. In addition, he reasoned that there were two ways to solve his issue. Either he should find a service guy and extract the death Kai from him just like he did, or else he should train in martial arts. Afterwards, when Sam discovered that his master had an interest in martial arts, he was taken aback. He had the impression that his teacher had spent his entire life trying to stay out of fights, but now he has become interested in learning martial arts, which is something new for him. Therefore, he inquired with his master about the type of martial arts he should study. In response, Shin Woon inquires of Sam regarding the possibility of the existence of a martial art that is capable of absorbing the inner Kai of the adversary. On the other hand, Sam unexpectedly turned his head to glance behind him because he was concerned that there were people nearby who could overhear their chat and ask his master to speak more quietly. He inquired if it was the absorption technique that he wanted to learn, and then he told his master not to ask anything about absorption Kai. He did this because, as a result of the conflict that occurred 30 years ago, many people have been detained recently, even if it was for nothing more than uttering the Maw of Magic. In addition to that, he cautions his master to watch what he says at all times, regardless of where he is. Sam was continuing trying to explain things to Shin Woon, but the latter appeared uninterested and kept trying to cover his ears because of how loud Sam was being. However, Shin Woon pays no attention to what Sam has to say about it and instead thinks about the demonic arts and the art of flowing clouds. However, the art of energy absorption is the thing that he needs to keep in the back of his mind the most. After that, Shin Woon abruptly rose up and let out a sigh as he appeared to be dozing off for some reason. He gave Sam the directive to inform him of the locations at which the members of the Beacon clan learned and practiced martial arts. In response to his master's question, Sam informed him that there is a library where all the documents that have been passed down through the years are collected and archived. In addition, Shin Woon put his hand on the servant's shoulder and extended an invitation for him to accompany him to the library. 
However, the servants were not permitted to enter the library, so Xin Wun made a promise to the servant that if he ever became the owner of the palace, he would make it possible for him to access the library. The servants were at a loss for words and appeared astonished by the situation. Sam, upon observing that his master was going to depart, remarked that he would remain here and wait for his return. In addition to this, as Xin Wun was ready to leave, he abruptly turned around and asked his servant who throughout the history of the Beacon clan has been considered to be the strongest. In response, Sam became excited when he told his master that the strongest in the history was Lord Yu Il Yong, the one who established the Beacon clan 200 years ago. After Lord Yu Il Yong rose up and became the strongest, he was termed the Fon Gumho by the people. Okay, I'll get it, I'll get going. Utter Shin Woon. On the other hand, Shin Woon proceeded to the library with his usual composure as he walked there. He was considering Lord Yu, who asserts that he is the strongest person in history. He is unable to fathom the military prestige that Lord Yu possesses. The rankings were third class, second class, and first class crown and transcendence, and the skeleton that he had built previously was most certainly of the third class variety. On the other hand, he needed to determine how great of a power gap there would be between a transcendent soldier and a third class swordsman. In addition, something about the way people were talking behind his back when he walked by them attracted his notice and drew his attention. A lady has commented that Shin Woon appears to have lost weight and warned against making eye contact with him due to the possibility that he is drunk. The old man, however, claims that it appears as though he did not go to the Jibang, which is an eastern hostess bar, and that he did not consume alcohol these days. However, the lady told the man to wait since Shin Woon was going to be arranging the bed linens in a short while. However, Shin Woon chooses to disregard the rumors that have been spread about him and instead wonders aloud whether there is someone more infamous than their rumors. Because his senses have been heightened, Shin Woon is now able to hear a wide variety of things. He made the decision to separate himself from the people who were spreading rumors about him since he knew that people of that nature would invariably follow the powerful one. But he reasoned that since his reputation could not fall any worse, he would be forced to do whatever was necessary despite the fact that he had never intended to take the role of a benevolent monarch in the first place. Afterwards, at the main entrance of the Gathering Cloud Library, there were three men standing watch. When they saw Shin Woon walking towards them, everyone was taken aback and baffled by what they saw. Shin Woon was confronted by the one who appeared to be the leader, who appeared as though he could not believe that Shin Woon was present and asked Shin Woon what brought him to the library. He speculates to himself whether or not the man in front of him was the head gang a typical sleazy opportunist, and it appears that he was also a follower of Jin Sang. Shin Woon asked the leader what else he thought he would come to the library, of course, to read. However, the man seemed to be thinking and was teasing him and said that there were no books Shin Woon was looking for in the library. How would you know what book I'm looking for? Asked Shin Woon. In response, the three men laugh at him all of a sudden, and the top gang member says the book is not the one he was searching for because the book he was looking for depicted a lot of lingerie. The head gang believed that it was a chance for him if he insulted Shin Woon and shooed him away, as this would cause his master Jin Sang to pay attention to him. After that, Shin Woon abruptly lets out a sigh of frustration and puts his head in his hands because of the annoyance that he was feeling. He claimed that the problem, which follows him wherever he goes, is that those tiny worms might meddle without knowing where they are. After hearing that Shin Woon had referred to him as a worm, the head gang member furrowed his brow and became agitated. Consequently, he confronted Shin Woon, but Shin Woon was annoyed with the head gang, so he told him to step aside and then turned around to go into the library. However, the head gang suddenly put his hand on Shin Woon's shoulder to prevent him from continuing. Shin Woon shocked the head gang when he abruptly turned his eyes on him, flashed a fiery crimson, and became furious. After that, Shin Woon removed the hand of the head gang member that had been resting on his shoulder. The head gang member was now trembling in dread and sweating. Shin Woon then left them and entered the door. However, the head gang seemed to be taken aback, which is why his two comrades were trying to get his attention by asking why he could so casually allow Shin Woon travel through the library. And what about the faction leader Quack? Because the leader of the gang appears to be perplexed, they continue to scream out his name. Despite this, the head gang was dripping with sweat from head to toe and shivering with anxiety. In his head, he communicated to his two other comrades that he needed help since he had seen Shin Woon's eye and realized that it did not belong to a human. It was like reliving the terrifying experience he had the first time he saw a tiger for the first time. In addition to this, his two comrades both dropped their jaws and were taken aback by the fact that he did urinate on his pants out of fear for Shin Woon. 
The head gang was still surprised and still shaking in terror, which is why his two comrades carried him because he might do a bigger one in addition to peeing if he saw Shin wound twice, and they will take the head gang to the clinic. In addition, one of the head gang's comrades unexpectedly directs his attention to Shin Woon, who has arrived at the library at last. He was thinking about how Shin Woon had scared their head gang, but he reasoned that Shin Woon changed his attitude after returning from the dead and asked himself if he was a son of a tiger. However, terror eyes worked perfectly for Shin Woon despite being D rank. Inside the Beacon Clan Red Cloud Tower, faction leader Quack pushes a door that leads to the underground and enters a room where numerous people wearing red masks and clothes, a mummy lying on a bed, and a statue of some creature seems waiting for him. Ha Jiam, vice leader of the Red Cloud, greeted Quack. The latter asked Ha Jiam still not adjusted to their setup. However, Ha Jiam suddenly bowed his head and apologized to Quack because he must still have habits from the sect, but he will keep everything in mind. Ha Jiam was informed by Quack that Shin Woon had reportedly visited the Gathering Cloud Library. However, Ha Jiam reasoned that Shin Woon's activities were still within their expectation, and that he must have been afraid of his abrupt death followed by his revival in such a manner because of his deeds. On the other hand, Quack immediately thought since what Ha Jiam said was exactly his thought, but the issue is that it does not appear that way to the child. Ha Jiam suddenly sighs because Jin Sang was the reason for Quack's annoyance even after they firmly built his foundation. According to Quack, the natural stupidity of Jing Sang was the reason why they chose him. Then Ha Jiam suddenly thought that Jin Sang might be good for them. He explained to him that if someone who doesn't know a single thing about martial arts and learns it from some random book suffers from a state of chaotic inner energy, then they would have solved their problem without lifting a finger. Quack suddenly forms a grin on his face then says that it's a possibility, but they have to get some insurance first. However, Ha Jiam was going to report something on Quack, but since he was there, he showed him something behind his back and told him that they had already concluded their preparations. Quack, on the other hand, was relieved when he discovered mummified remains in the bed and the skeleton of an unknown species hung on the wall. Under the skeleton were a number of human head skeletons. Quack issued the command for his subordinates to carry it out tonight without delay. They dedicated their efforts in every way to the red sky. Then he parted ways with them. On the other hand, in the gathering cloud library there were two people guarding the entrance. A person with black hair asks his companion if it's really fine to leave Shin Woon like that and what will they do if he becomes mentally unstable. The bald man who seems sleepy scolds him for being noisy and reminds him not to give any help for Shin Woon if he doesn't want to be kicked out of the clan when Jin Sang becomes the leader. The bald man also reminds his companion not to bother interfering when Shin Woon was learning martial arts or trading it away and think of his family when the person with black hair said that there shouldn't be proper martial arts books left in the Beacon Clan's library nowadays. However, Shin Woon was inside the library and heard all the conversations of the guards outside. He told himself that it doesn't make sense to try learning martial arts by pulling out any book. Anyway, he doesn't need any help from the guards because it looks like he is just skimming over things in their eyes. He was reading about the art of the Black Wolf Judge, the hologram that states that it's a martial arts used by Dead Sea Black Wolf. Do He Su, who was infamous among the vagabonds in the Hubei area. Its energy accumulation is quick, but there's the drawback of major pressure points worsening due to accumulating other impure energy. Shin Woon abruptly put the book down and had the notion that if it is first rank advanced grade, then it is the highest ranked martial arts book that has been published up to this point. However, the disadvantages are too great because it is a clever art. Therefore, he was wandering about the interior of the library looking for a book that could be of assistance to him. He reasoned that there was a good chance that he would deteriorate into an unstable state if he amassed his inner Kai by the use of a crafty or diabolical art. He needs to become skilled in a high-ranking martial art that has the most consistent and unadulterated Kai. However, if he had accumulated a greater quantity of yin mana, then it would have refused him a lesser amount, and it is currently resisting his inner Kai with all of its might in order to avoid being consumed by it. He is perplexed as to why there aren't any creatures falling from the sky. It had been eight hours since Shin Woon entered the library, and he was still there reading a book. According to the hologram, the art of Unbreakable Heart is of a first-rank exceptional grade, and it is a form of art that was combined with martial arts by H. Wang Ya Chol, also known as the Unbreakable Fist. H. Wang Ya Chol was a martial artist who was trained at the Shaolin Temple. 
Its energy is pure, just like the martial arts practiced in the Shaolin Monastery. Yet there is a danger involved in releasing energy because it is a combination of two different styles of martial arts. The hologram inquires as to whether or not he is interested in studying the art of unbreakable heart. But Shin Wun has no other option because that is the only form of martial art that is considered to be of a higher grade. However, Shin Wun heard a bumping sound coming from the direction of the wall as he was seated on the floor. He jumped up to investigate the source of the noise and spotted a little girl walking forward while lugging a number of books and a box. The young girl's mouth sprang open and her eyes widened in shock when she realized that she had accidentally run into Shin Woon. She quickly expressed her regret while fighting back the tears that threatened to form in response to the anxiety that she was experiencing. Shin Woon approached the young girl and inquired about the books that she was carrying about while pointing at it. The little girl said that the books are the damaged books that they got as extras for purchasing other martial arts. She was surprised when Shin Woon instructed her to lead him to the place where she gathered all those books. However, the girl was sitting and watching Shin Woon reading thinking the latter was weird since it always sighs after reading books that she gave. When Shin Woon asked for another book, she asked him if it was okay to learn those kinds of things. In response, Shin Woon asked the little girl if she was worried about him. He instructed the little girl to try her best and picked one out and if she picked a good book he would buy some snack but he can't recall the name of the little girl and ask what it is. In addition, the little girl was delighted after hearing Shin Woon. That's why she introduced her name as Dan So Yeon. She parted ways with Shin Woon in order to search for an interesting book and a minute later she returned with the book and handed it to him. Shin Woon grabbed the book in his hands and remarked that it is an older and more worn out book. When Shin Woon unexpectedly caressed her head and informed her that she has worked so hard and late because of him, So Yeon was perplexed. Shin Woon also told her that she can buy as many snacks as she likes because she has worked so hard because of him. The delight that So Yeon was feeling regarding the sweets that Shin Woon had purchased for her was evident in the twinkle that appeared in her eyes. Afterwards, Shin Woon came back to his room and tried to practice the severing art of the Eastern Shining Sage. It was a martial art made by an unknown man who focused on the harmony of all creation. It has the power to encompass and embrace any energy and its destructive power is very lacking because it was not made for combat. The Kai release section is not included due to the damages done to the later chapter, and there could be problems when trying to learn it because it is incomplete in damaged martial art books. On the other hand, Shin Woon was working hard and breaking a sweat because he was trying the art of the Eastern Shining Sage encompassed and embraced everything, regardless of whether the item was rare or was trash in any event. But he has a counter-argument, which is that there might be a significant obstacle in the way. And so he is concentrating because there is a good possibility that it has a secret component, and he has to find a way to lock it down. He was having such a hard time that he wrinkled his forehead and gritted his teeth as he struggled. He believed that the absence of destructive force could be compensated for with yin mana, and that the release of Kai could be accomplished with the mana library. However, there is no middle ground when it comes to yin mana, and he may have been able to combine the two when he reached the third circle of mana. He needs to collect more yin mana, so thank god he can take a break in the middle of it even if it could potentially take longer time. During his relaxation, he was startled when he detected something behind him, and he was even more startled when he saw a greenish energy moving toward him. Because the emerald light appeared to be permeating his entire body, his eyes widened in an expression that suggested he was afraid. He was perplexed as the energy flooded his body and flowed into his entire body instantaneously and he was unable to stop it even though all of his mana circuits were wide open. On the other hand, the hologram alerted him to the situation and claimed that the curse of death had been placed on him by an unknown being. It was an irresistible energy of death that started to encircle his entire body. It was beginning to consume him. Shin Woon was irritated, but then all of a sudden he thought about Jin Sang. Jin Sang was the only one who would want Shin Woon with such a high level of death energy. That world was not restricted to solely martial arts, and the curse is more closely related to the hunter's power in his former life. Hence, it is not surprising that the physician in his prior world was unable to figure it out. Afterwards, when Shin Woon understood that the energy of death was a coincidence with a great fortune, he broke out laughing and was overjoyed. This was because the energy loaded with the power of death was a blessing for him rather than a curse for a necromancer like him. In addition to that, it possesses a sufficient amount of mana to fill the mana heart capacity of the second circle. If the bowl is small, you can just overflow it. 
He added, It appears that faction leader Quack is performing some sort of rite in front of the mummy alongside one of his subordinates. He was appreciative of the fact that Jin Sang's subordinates had sent a death curse, which resulted in a significant amount of yin mana being absorbed. On the other hand, for a necromancer like Shin Woon, being cursed is similar to being baptized. He wasn't going to let all of that unused mana go to waste, that was for sure. After achieving success in completing all three mana library circles, you will receive an appropriate rank increase as well as new abilities that correspond to the completed circles. However Shin Woon had around the same level as a hunter with a B rating. The hologram revealed that the rank of his Yin Mana Heart had increased to C+, that the Yin Mana Heart that stacked Yin Mana had reached three circles, and that his talent as Necromancy had reached rank C+, due to the fact that all Necromancy talents received mastery points. As a result of his skills Skeleton Mastery having reached its highest possible level of mastery, the Skeleton Monk and the Skeleton Lancer are now available to be summoned. Shin Woon, on the other hand, was taken aback by the rapid rate of growth, as well as the fact that this life is superior to the one he lived before. But he doesn't want to stop there because he wants to experiment with something while he's still holding the mana library in his stomach and heart. In addition, he stated that an increase in yin mana is making it simpler to accept the sage kai and that the art of flowing cloud is also fusing with it as a result of this. When the hologram revealed that the rank of the severing art of the Eastern Shining Sage had been decided, he was taken aback. The holographic also revealed that the rank is too high for the tier peak. As a result of Shin Woon's successful recreation of the severing art of the Eastern Dazzling Sage, he was graded. When the hologram also informed him that his level had increased to level 15, he couldn't contain his joy at the news. He now possesses new abilities, including the Shadow Whisper Mystery, the Hasten Rot, and the Bone Wall, which he recently acquired. Additionally, the hologram included information regarding the severing art of the Eastern Shining Sage, also known as the Flowing Down Cloud. It is a form of martial art that was developed with the idea that everything in the universe flows together. Through the changes made by Yu Shin Un, it has the ability to calm and combine all types of Kai. Both its destructive power and its capacity to eject Yah have been increased. In terms of its power and independence, it is currently comparable to a Typhoon. The Acceptance ability can absorb any form of power, while the Cleansing ability can cleanse any kind of power. Nevertheless, the powers are contingent upon the user's level of martial accomplishment. However, as a result of Shin Woon's enjoyment of the Descending Cloud, his frame advances two ranks, moving from E to C however. He remained unclear as to the nature of the inherent ability that was depicted on the hologram. When the light first entered Shin Woon's chamber, he didn't realize that the sun had already risen, so he stood up and stretched his body. Even though he stayed up the whole night, he feels like he has had a good night's sleep. On the other hand, Sam was running in his direction while calling at him to see if he was awake. When Sam informed Shin Woon that he needed to go down because someone had come to visit him, Shin Woon was taken aback by the information. It didn't dawn on him that he had a visitor until the visitor made it very obvious that it was he whom the visitor was looking for. When he heard another piece of information, it threw him for a loop when Sam told him that his guest was his fiance. Meanwhile, there have been rumblings that a carriage has made its way to the White Cloud faction. The first guard approached the second guard and asked him whether or not the cart in front of them belonged to the GM family. The second guard replied that he had never heard that the GM family was coming and that he had never seen the GM family before. In addition to that, the person who was driving the carriage reported to his master that they had already arrived at the White Cloud faction. As soon as the lady disembarked from the carriage, all of the personnel promptly fell in line in order to greet her. It was White Blossom GM Mai Ho. However, people take note of her arrival and immediately begin inquiring among themselves about who the lady was. People are staring at her and gushing about how beautiful she is as she walks. People begin to congregate in a spot where they can see Mai Ho, and some of them remark that she has the appearance of an angel. Others say that she is beautiful. A person who is in front of a crowd of people gathering yelling for them not to push is ignored by those individuals, which leads to his falling to the ground and his face making contact with the mud. When he lifted his head, he was gasping for air, but as soon as he opened his eyes, he was shocked and horrified when he discovered that one of Mai Ho's subordinates, who has a huge body, was furious at him because the hem of Mai Ho's clothes was full with mud that flowed from his face. The person apologized in a hasty manner despite the fact that he had not done it on purpose. Mai Ho's subordinate attempted to approach the individual, but Mai Ho stopped him and instead abruptly stepped up to the individual, inquired if he was okay 
and even handed the individual some medication to treat his injuries. On the other hand, people were taken aback by her generosity due to the fact that the rare flower that belongs to the GM family also possesses a lovely personality. Others have made the observation that beautiful thoughts are associated with beautiful individuals. Mai Ho is shown to be annoyed and has furrowed her brows after hearing everything that was said. Meanwhile, within the White Cloud Faction Blue Cloud building, Jin Sang was focusing his attention on one particular chair. He had nothing to do and was thinking that if it weren't for Shin Woon, that chair would have been his all along. He wonders to himself why the man in front of him head held so high, and he wonders if the man is aware that his father is still alive. He was referring to Du Jinu, leader of the White Cloud faction and White Beauty Blade was the second gentleman seated in front of Jin Sang. He was taken aback when someone called him, and it turned out to be No Diun, the clear cloud leader for the White Cloud faction. He explained to Jinu that the reason for their late arrival was because his son was a little slow to get up. When his father blamed him for being late, his son, who is positioned in his back, became furious because it was actually his father's fault because he got home late. However, this causes his father to get irate, and he gives him the order to present himself at Jin U. His son was the vice leader of the Clear Cloud, No Gun Ho. He did it in a rather abrupt manner and bowed to greet Jin U. Afterwards, while Jin U and No Di were having a conversation, Jin Sang was irritated when he saw that No Di first greeted Jin U, not him, and didn't notice him. He told himself that No Di was the person who isn't swayed by a woman, money, or even martial arts, because Clear Clouds only follow those stronger than them. Jin Sang furrowed his brow while looking at the two men. They had no choice but to come under him when he killed Shin Woon and became the lord of the place. However, a man took note of the fact that Jin Sang was already present and remarked that he seemed to be someone who was destined to become the person who would raise the White Cloud Fraction to its highest point. The man's name was Mo T. Gil, and he served as the small cloud leader for the White Cloud Faction. Additionally, it would appear that every member of the faction is present, which is why the man standing next to Jin Sang stated that they need to get the meeting started before their visitors come. Jin U, however, was against it due to the fact that their first master had not yet come. On the other side, Gil suddenly laughed and told Jin U that it was okay to start since the first master was either not feeling well or as if he would come to join the meeting. However, to everyone's amazement, the men inside the room widened their eyes when they saw Shin Woon go through the door, indicating that they thought he was going to attend the meeting. So he came, uttered Jin Sang who was clenching his teeth and furrowed his brow out of annoyance that he felt for Shin Woon. Sam was taken by surprise when Shin Woon grabbed him by the wrist and pulled him inside the room where all of the faction leaders were gathered. Since Sam was merely a servant, he had no idea what to do or how he should react to the situation. He was sitting in the chair. He was going to ask his master a question, but his master cut him off and told him to remain seated instead. On the other hand, Gil was incensed and demanded that Shin Woon allow a servant to take a seat in the assembly room of the Blue Cloud side, stating that he had never seen anything like it in all of history. Sam, who was shaking with fright, looked to his master for assistance in an instant, but his master disregarded him. Shin Woon, on the other hand, asks Gil to stop and wonders aloud what the problem could possibly be if a servant sat with them. I told you, why are you allowing dirty servants sits with us? exclaimed Gil. Shin Woon's irritation increased, and he yelled at Gil, telling him to pay close attention as he explained that Sam was his underling before he became a servant. Sam, who was sitting next to him and listening to what was going on, was perplexed and didn't know what to do. Afterwards, Shin Woon unleashed a power and intently glanced at Gil at the very moment that Gil was ready to say something. As a consequence, Gil broke out in a cold sweat and was horrified when he saw Woon's face. In addition to this, Gil wonders what sort of appearance Woon has or whether or not this Woon is the same Woon that he used to know. After that, everyone's attention is drawn to Woon's direction, and they appear perplexed when he asks Gil if he needs any permission from him so that Sam can sit with him. Will not fix his gaze attentively on Gil in a manner that suggests a desire to frighten the latter. Gil instantly bent his head and murmured in a shaky voice that there would be no problem if Woon requested that Sam would sit beside him. He continued by saying that if Woon wished that Sam would sit beside him, there would be no difficulty. Jin Sang interfered and said it was fine because it would be just that moment Sam was going to sit beside Woon since his older brother is still a bit ill. That's why he needs a servant on his side. Gil abruptly said that Jin Sang was right and praised the latter for his astounding kindness. However, Quack suddenly says that it seems that things have been settled, they have to start the meeting. Quack looks at Woon and seems to be observing him, but the latter notices it. 
In addition, as they all know, GM family has visited the palace unexpectedly, and they are expecting two objectives. First, they wish to end the scheduled commissions. What reason do they have to end the commissions that have lasted for 10 years? exclaimed No D. That's why Quack explained to them that the GM family has been complaining about their workers and their attitudes. But he doesn't think that the White Cloud faction was making mistakes and believes that there is an ulterior motive. Nodi abruptly asks what kind, but Jinu remains silent and thinks about the situation. On the other hand, Gil reveals to them that, in accordance with the information provided by their source, the head of the GM family regularly confers with members of the H. Wang Rock clan. However, Kang suddenly let out a sigh of irritation as a result of the annoyance he felt because of Quack and Gil could just tell the facts, and they are discussing the White Cloud faction, whose true objective was to bring down Jin U. In addition to this, Nodi was so enraged that he sprang up unexpectedly and slammed the table and he screams that he doesn't understand why, out of all the commissioners, they go to H. Wang Rock. Afterward, they all turn their attention to the door when someone from the outside announces that GM Mai Ho from the GM family is entering. When the door opened, Mai Ho abruptly bowed to greet the men within. Shin Woon and Jin Woo was just looking at Mai Ho and seemed annoyed. Jin Woo assumed that the custom is to leave the guards outside and she plainly showed that Mai Ho didn't trust them. Nothing much change us, although you have become more beautiful, uttered Jin Sang. Mai Ho suddenly blushed when she heard the words of Jin Sang. However, No D made the observation that it appears Mai Ho and her subordinates are rather impatient because they sent them a tea to the waiting room before they came before the tea had a chance to cool down. The big man was one of Mai Ho's subordinates, and he immediately laughed and scratched his head. He apologized, stating that the waiting room was too small for him to wait in. He also asked for permission to get right to the point regarding the reason for their unexpected visit in order to save time because it appeared as though they were all very busy people. As soon as Jin Woo gave him permission to speak, the big man quickly apologized and informed Jin Woo that from this point on, the GM family will cut any ties with the White Cloud faction. Cut ties with us? You can't just notify us like this one-sidedly, exclaimed No D. The big man explained that the head of the family had told him that an organization without an owner is destined to fail, so he couldn't understand how they could have let such a place handle their commission. Jin Sang let out a quick sigh, and it appeared as though he was getting frustrated. He then asked the family head if his ideas were definitive. As a response, the big man explained that if the problem that he described will be fixed, perhaps the family of GM would change his mind because they do have that bond from all of those years of cooperating so they will allow the faction's leader a half a month or leeway to decide. However, Jin Woo furrowed his brow and thought deeply. He told himself that it was it, the abrupt visit, and the pressure on us in a rude request to choose a leader of their clan in just half a month. He was looking intently at Jin Sang. He assumed that a deal with the latter and the head of the GM family was made for sure. Moreover, according to the big man, the engagement between Shin Woon and Mai Ho. However, because Shin Woon cut him off, that's why he is unable to continue his sentence. But before Shin Woon could tell what was in his mind, he heard Jin Sang's thoughts calling him an idiot. And according to the former, he can't forget his first love, which refers to Mai Ho even after nearly dying. On the other hand, Mai Ho was perplexed, and she looked at Shin Woon as though she wanted to know what was on his mind with regard to their engagement. When Shin Woon made the announcement that he wished his engagement with Mai Ho to be called off, every one of the leaders of the various factions, including Sam and Mai Ho, were taken aback and perplexed by his statement. Kang had already seen Mai Ho before the GM family arrived in the Blue Cloud Hall, and the moment he did, his head began to hurt in the same way as it had when he had met Jin Sang. However, he was able to tolerate the pain by drawing in and circulating the weaker yin mana. At the same time, he heard someone's voice echoing in his brain. Then, all of a sudden, he saw the memory of Shin Woon from the time that Mai Ho introduced herself to him for the first time. Mai Ho expresses her joy at seeing Shin Woon, and the two of them discuss how much they love each other and their engagement. But that was only Mai Ho's outward demeanor because she was concealing a negative attitude on the inside. She was criticizing Shin Woon by saying that she would not marry Shin Woon, who in her opinion resembles a pig, if he were not an heir to the Beacon clan. When they were outside, Mai Ho also instructed Shin Woon to act as if she did not recognize her so that Mai Ho would not kill Shin Woon on the spot if he revealed that she knew her. Shin Woon also witnessed Jin Sang and Mai Ho engaging in sexual activity. Mai Ho was a repulsive lady who covered her actual personality behind a facade. But Kang was thrown for a loop when he was confronted with yet another memory of Shin Woon. A vile woman could be heard ranting about how those despicable peasants took their own lives because they were unhappy, and how those peasants should have thanked the woman for passing away instead. 
it appears that she was arrested for something because she was let out by two security officers. Regarding the recollection that kept popping up in Kang's head, he was bewildered. He convinced himself that it was not a recollection and reasoned that it must have been a memory of the future from a period of time that had already transpired. However, he had no idea how the recollection of the future that he hadn't yet experienced got into his head. He hadn't lived through it yet. Was it Shin Woon's fate to regain consciousness? He starts to wonder what it was that Shin Woon was keeping to himself. If he gains a few more levels, he will be able to learn the talents that can uncover deeper memories, and by the time he does, he will undoubtedly be completely knowledgeable about everything. Meanwhile, when Shin Woon declared that he wished to call off his engagement to Mai Ho, everyone's jaws dropped and they were taken aback. Mai Ho bent her head because she was embarrassed by the fact that Shin Woon does not want to interact with her despite the fact that everyone adores her. Shin Woon inquired of Mai Ho once again because the latter was avoiding her questions. Do you have some lingering attachments towards me? He added, because Shin Woon had the audacity to offend their young lady, the big man became outraged at Shin Woon. Nodi also became enraged and issued a command to the big man telling him to mind what he said while he was conversing with their young master. Despite the fact that the entire room was in disarray, Shin Woon maintained his composure and scratched his head. He stated that it appeared as though they were intending to ask about the engagement to him as well, so he questioned what appears to be the issue if he first breaks off the engagement. How dare you think of those words that you can say? The yells of the big man, his vein can be seen on his head due to the annoyance that he felt because they were in trouble. If word got around that their lady got rejected by that pig then the family leader would have his head. On the other hand, Jin Sang and Mai Ho were surprised and irritated when Shin Woon calmly stated that the people concerned would know more about the disengagement. Afterwards, after what the big man heard, he claimed that he cannot overlook Shin Woon for insulting their young lady and released a force against Shin Woon. But to his amazement, Sam was struggling under the force that he had released, while Shin Woon appeared unaffected and maintained his composure throughout. He was perplexed because Shin Woon, who is completely ignorant of martial arts, is reverting back to the energy he possessed when he was at the pinnacle of his career as a martial artist while at the same time maintaining his composure and not collapsing flat on his back or wetting his pants. The big man couldn't believe what he was seeing, so he unleashed all of his might in the belief that Shin Woon was most likely fighting through the pain with everything he had. On the other hand, Jin Woo takes note of the energy that the big man discharges and he was Steel Axe Black Bear. So, he asked the black bear if he should take it as a declaration of war from the GM family. And if that's the case, he informed black bear that he was ready to fight right then and there. The whiteness that appears in his eyes is accompanied with the discharge of power. However, black bear quickly cursed because, despite Jin Hu's advanced age, his skill hasn't diminished, and it's still far too risky to ridicule the entirety of the Beacon clan. Therefore, the black bear decided to stop releasing energy and stated that they will not be expressing their complaints to the rest of the Beacon clan. They only wish to exact revenge on Shin Woon for the insult directed at Mai Ho. However, Jin Woo was irritated and thought that it was foolish due to the fact that any complaints against their young master were complaints against the Beacon clan as a whole. Afterwards, Jin Sang interjected himself and explained that it was a complicated matter and that they can't take responsibility for the choices that his older brother had taken without first addressing it with the leaders of the factions. However, it was difficult to prevent the GM family from defending Mai Ho's dignity and reputation. He wants them to give some thought to the nature of the relationship that exists between the Beacon family and the Jun family over the long term, and he advises that they settle the dispute by having a duel between the two families. Jin Sang believed that even if there is a regrettable accident, it is the perfect plan to explain that it was a mistake. On the other hand, when No Di and Jin Woo heard about the duel, their eyes opened and they made a frowning expression with their brows. On the other hand, the black bear gave some thought to backing out of the duel before ultimately deciding to continue with it. But Sam immediately stepped up and reminded them that duels make no sense for someone like his master who has no training in martial arts. He explained his reasoning by saying that they are a waste of time. Even Jin Woo and Nodi were against the duel and declared that it was impossible for Shin Woon to win because he knows nothing about martial arts. Jin Sang on the other hand, was quite confident in his chances of victory. The young master is teased by the black bear who forms a grin on his face and suggests, that the young master is going to be a coward if he steps back from the responsibilities. He also mentioned that if Shin Woon was a little nervous, he should try begging on his knees in front of their young lady, and because their young lady has a kind heart, she would forgive him. He stated that even if Shin Woon was a little worried, he should do it. But Jin Sang couldn't help but laugh since he knew it was the end for Shin Woon. 
However, both Sam and Jinu were taken aback when Shin Woon abruptly rose up, turned around, and left the building despite the fact that Sam and Nodi were attempting to prevent him from doing so. Shin Woon abruptly halted when he was in front of the GM family, but he disregarded them and continued to walk outside. As a consequence, the GM family was surprised when they observed that Shin Woon did not pay attention towards them. Everyone follows Shin Woon outdoors and watches as he performs some stretching exercises. Shin Woon, however, was irritated by the fact that they continued to chatter on and on without stopping. They were perplexed since they were aware that Shin Woon did not have any prior experience with martial arts. Hence, they were at a loss for words when Shin Woon abruptly turned around and announced that he will fight against the black bear. A man was calmly sharpening his blade when he noticed other people make their way towards something. He yelled out to someone who was walking by, why is everyone in such a hurry? Someone has apparently informed the man that there is a duel going on, and it appears like their master and the GM family are going at it. When the man heard that their master was heading into conflict, he couldn't believe what he was hearing because everyone knows that their master has unlocked a wealth of knowledge in martial arts. However, a large number of individuals were congregating at the gym that belonged to the Beacon clan. Nodi and his son were worried about their master and urged Jinu to stop the battle because their master may get gravely harmed and there is no way that the GM family had assigned to Maiho are ordinary men. But why did Mr. Ilgong Ya, if it's not a heartbreak, he can't be. Utter Nodi. However, Jinu revealed to them that he wished to put an end to the duel but that there was nothing that could be done about it at this point. He also warned them that if he interfered with the combat, all of the members' hearts would turn away from the first master. Nodi furrowed his brow and persuaded himself that the vice lord's remarks were correct. He reasoned that a person who betrays the faith of his followers cannot ascend to the position of the monarch, and that fleeing the duel would be the same as abdicating his position as lord. On the other side, Jinu was irate since it was not a circumstance in which they could simply wait and watch what happened, and this made her upset. If their first master is in danger, he will seek assistance, so Nodi does not need to be concerned in any way. But Nodi was perplexed since no one is permitted to interfere, until it is determined for certain how the winter would play out. They will turn to their vice lord for assistance in the event that anything untoward occurs with their first master, despite the fact that this will bring his reputation into disrepute. In addition, Kang seemed bored, yet he was paying attention to every word that Nodi and Jinu said. On his side was his servant, who begged him to back out of the duel because there is no logical reason for a duel to take place. On the other hand, the big man turned his attention to Kang and inquired as to whether or not he was prepared to begin. Mai Ho acts as if she is about to pass out and makes a scared face when Kang suddenly walks through the stage. This causes Mai Ho to give the impression that she is losing consciousness. Her servant was attempting to calm her, assuring her that the situation was not her fault and that her outward appearance did not compare to the beauty of her inner self. When Mai Ho was told by Kang that her acting ability was amazing and that she would be a perfect fit for an opera, she immediately covered her face and furrowed her forehead in anger. As a direct consequence of this, all of Mai Ho's staff became enraged with him, including the big man who was yelling at him and demanding to know how much longer he would continue talking about their young lady. On the other hand, Jin Mu explained to the black bear that the use of inner Kai in the duel is not permitted because Confucius was not a murum and the rules of the duel prevent it. The black bear was angry with Jinu because he believed that they did not know the rule, which is why he told them that there was no need to worry about it. After then, the black bear directs his attention to his subordinates and inquires among them as to who is interested in receiving instruction from the first master. His subordinates all of a sudden raised their hands and began clamoring for him to call their names because they believed that if Mai Ho took notice of them, it would be the best thing for their careers. But because there were a lot of people willing to help, black bear had a difficult time choosing. After some time, he chose Odal Singh to face off against Shin Woon in a duel. Singh is cautioned by the black bear not to use his inner Kai and to focus only on the threat. Singh, who had a grin on his face and appeared pleased to overcome Shin Woon, muttered, Do I have any choice? Utter Singh who had a grin on his face and seemed excited to defeat Shin Woon. However, Black Bear was perplexed when Kang asked him what he was doing because Kang intended for the duel to be fought between Black Bear and Kang himself and not with some subordinate. Sam, Jinu, Jin Sang, and No Di, together with his son, were all unable to find the words to express themselves. And as a consequence of this, the Black Bear grew furious, as evidenced by the widening of his eyes and the clenching of his jaws. He claimed that Kang would have to deal with his subordinates first if he chose to fight an opponent with an excessively large power gap between them. This would result in condemnation from the rest of the world. 
Kang was too obstinate in his assertion that Black Bear was his adversary, and not some subordinate, and he even insulted Black Bear about the power disparity between them, claiming that Black Bear was not that strong. However, a referee steps in to break up the fight and start the duel because, if he doesn't, there will be a significant issue if he just lets them go at it on their own. Duel starts. He added, Kang and Singh had already taken the stage, and Singh appeared to be warming up with some stretching. Black Bear communicated with him through his head and advised him that he would take care of everything afterwards, but that he should not hold back and instead completely crush his opponent. Singh's response was that he was going to break a couple portions of his body. Then, without warning, he takes his position while he grins at Kang. He jumped out of nowhere and was about to give Kang a punch, but Kang deftly avoided his blow, and the attack was for naught. He then jumped again. As Jinu and the black bear watched Kang's every move, they couldn't believe their eyes. Kang receives a rapid punch from Sin, but the latter is just as quick on his feet as Sin. Black bear observes that Sin is playing by his opponent, and as a result, he yells at him to perform the move in the correct manner. When those who are watching the battle discover that Sing is employing an inner Kai known as the Ghost Wolf Fist, they become incensed. Because he used martial arts against regular people, people look down on him and call him names like Bastard and Coward. However, Sing chooses to disregard them because he is aware that even if he were to strike Kang, the plan would not be successful. Kang, on the other hand, became aware that he was close to the edge of the stage, and he questioned whether Sing had cornered him on purpose. Sing was already moving closer to Kang, and he was getting ready to punch Kang with his fist. I will make you vomit everything you've eaten, utter Sing who seems annoyed at Kang. On the other hand, both Jin-U and Nodi were concerned about Kang because of the precarious situation in which he found himself, with Kang standing on the edge of the platform while his opponent approached. The black bear witnessed everything, and it made the black bear very happy when Sing delivered a powerful punch to Kang's gut. When he observed how Sing was hurting for his hands, which were suddenly bleeding, his elation quickly faded and was replaced with surprise. At the same time, his mouth fell when he noticed how Sing's eyes were widening because the latter couldn't believe what happened. On the other hand, the three of them, Jin Sang, Gil, and Quack, were completely perplexed. They could not comprehend how it had taken place. He inquires of Gil whether or not he believes Shin Woon cinched his abdominal area with steel plates or steel armor. But that can't be right because he didn't notice anything odd while he was on the road. However, Quack claimed that Shin Woon was employing an external art. In addition, Jin Sang was perplexed since he did not understand how Shin Woon could master external arts. Afterwards, Black Bear was irate and yelled at Shin Woon. He also called the latter a coward due to the fact that Shin Woon uses external art. However, Shin Woon abruptly switched his attention to him and appeared perplexed by the exterior skills that Black Bear had stated. On the other hand, the people were shouting at the Black Bear, which caused mayhem. They defend their master when Black Bear says that he is a coward for utilizing external art. Despite the fact that they are the first ones to utilize martial arts and even use inner Kai, this is why they wanted Black Bear to retract what he said about their master. And as a consequence of this, Black Bear is left with no other option but to accept their defeat in the first round. This is because if he did not do this, people would attack them given that they are in the territory of the Beacon. However, Kang scoffs at their lack of understanding because he was not utilizing any form of external art to defend himself. Rather, he was using bone armor, which was producing the desired results. According to the hologram, the bone armor is a monster bone that has been fashioned into a formidable armor. It is possible to summon it and wrap it around yourself to provide additional defense against physical assaults. On the other hand, despite Shin Woon's victory in the fight with Sing, the duel has not yet come to an end. After everything that Shin Woon said to their young lady, it was now Black Bear's turn to come toward the stage. Black Bear was incensed by what Shin Woon had said to their young lady. On the other hand, Jin Woo became furious when he observed that the Black Bear would be Shin Woon's subsequent opponent in battle. He gritted his teeth and asked the Black Bear whether he had lost his mind for sparring an average person against him, who was a skilled martial artist. Black Bear argues that the circumstance has altered due to the fact that body martial arts are still considered to be a type of martial art. He didn't think there would be any other problems with battling Shin Woon now that they all knew that the first master is now just a regular person who is skilled in martial arts. He didn't think there would be any other problems. On the other hand, Jin Woo and Nodi were irate at him for being so unreasonable, and they expressed their anger toward him by saying so. However, Kang interrupts them and orders them to cease what they are doing. Kang calls Black Bear a teddy bear for talking too much more than a man would do. He ordered him to get up on the stage to start the duel. 
Kang and Black Bear were now facing each other at a duel. Black Bear told Kang that he will regret everything while clenching his fists. But Kang was so calm, you don't see that he was scared of his opponent. For some reason, everyone that say that always loses. Utter Kang. But Black Bear became furious. For him, Kang was so arrogant after only winning with a few tricks. However, Kang observes that Black Bear seems so confident in his physical martial arts but it's a simple task to break. Just requires a stronger power but Kang will break it. Afterwards, Black Bear takes a position and suddenly punches Kang in the face, but Kang is able to avoid the blow and watch his every move, allowing him to prevail over the Black Bear's attack. Kang had little trouble prevailing over Seeing in their battle. Even though the Black Bear was quick, Kang takes precautions to protect himself from any attack. But while Black Bear was using all of his strength on his final strike, Kang dodged it once more, and as a result, his adversary lost his footing and fell to the ground. But all of a sudden he stood up and kicked Kang, and the immense force that he unleashed on Kang caused the light to materialize due to the impact of his kick. Black Bear was under the impression that he had struck Kang, therefore he was taken aback when he saw the latter suddenly raise his arms above his head in an effort to prevent any fatalities as a result of his assault. Even though Black Bear's attack was speedy, his opponent moved more quickly to escape his assault, and Black Bear had the unexpected notion that Kang seemed to be using a trick. He was upset because he couldn't hit Kang, despite the fact that his blow was swift. However, Kang observed that Black Bear was a bit different from his previous adversary due to the rapidity of his motion. On the other hand, many people who were observing them were uncertain as to whether or not Black Bear was truly one of the most advanced martial arts. Other people have noted that they are dissatisfied with the duel since Black Bear was unable to overcome their master who lacks knowledge in martial arts. Other people have commented that they believe the GM family will give the seat to anyone who asks for it. In addition, the attacks and dodging that Black Bear and Kang are currently engaging in during their combat appear to have already irritated Black Bear. As a result, he hastily went toward Kang and raised his one arm in an attempt to strike, but it turned out to be a poor move for him and an opportunity for Kang, who swiftly used the yin mana put the force on his fist, and then abruptly blew it in his face. This gave Kang the upper hand. As a consequence of this, the black bear was dragged outside and tumbled around on the ground. After the event, everyone was ecstatic and shouting their congratulations for their victory. However, when a black bear suddenly stood up and enlarged his eyes, he saw that people were cheering for their master's victory. Because of this, he approached Kang unexpectedly and applied a force to his body while gazing at Kang, who was staring at him. A light suddenly appeared on the stage just as the man was going to punch Kang. Everyone was blinded by the light, including Mai Ho, who instinctively covered her face in response. However, when Mai Ho opened her eyes, she was taken aback to discover that Shin Wu's opponent was floating in the air and heading in the direction of where she was standing. She takes a quick move to the side in order to dodge the black bear. On the other hand, Jin Wu had already made his way onto the stage in an attempt to conceal Kang and it was his sword that was responsible for the unexpected appearance of light. Everyone was taken aback, including the black bear that had not moved from its position on the ground. What are you doing? Your master has been attacked. White Cloud Faction raise your blade. Yells of Jin Wu. To provide adequate defense for their first master, each member of the faction has already converged on him and surround him. Even Nodi gave the command for the clean cloud to surround their adversary. Moreover, Black Bear and their subordinates were quaking in fright because they believed that they would all perish on Beacon. Furthermore, some of them cursed their commander for being an imbecile. But Maiho was not afraid, rather, she was outraged, and everyone was taken aback when she suddenly erupted in anger and her face transformed. Maiho's face changed as she erupted in anger. You bugs, where do you think you're pointing your swords? She yells. Swordsmen belonging to the Cloud Faction offered their opinions on Maiho. Some of them claimed that her eyes could kill a man, but others asserted that her true hue had become apparent. Still others admitted that they feared Mai Ho. Mai Ho, on the other hand, is unable to contain her rage and lashes out at Black Bear in retaliation for sullying her honor. She appeared to be so enraged as if she wanted to kill Black Bear. On the other hand, the latter was caught off guard when his young lady suddenly slapped him. However, because they have the right to make him pay the price for attempting to kill their first master, no D begs Lady Mai Ho for permission to hand over the Black Bear to them. But he is unable to complete his sentence because something happened, and Black Bear's eyes immediately widened when he saw someone who swiftly took his life when a man suddenly arrived out of nowhere. They were all taken aback because the young lady had only to make a single hand signal, and the man would kill for her. 
This should be enough, I presume. Utter the man while blood of Dal Singh was on his face and body. Furthermore, when Nodi noticed that the other person was using a horrifying blood claw, he was taken aback. Even the swordsmen that were surrounding Shin Woon were astounded when they heard that he was Gu Nam Singh, also known as the horrifying blood claw, and that he was the most powerful member of the Jiam family. Jin Woo, on the other hand, creased his forehead in concentration. He was under the impression that his level of martial achievement was somewhere near the apex of the middle tier, but it was even too low to compete with Singh. However, he is unable to pull back, and even if he were to perish, the only thing left for him to accomplish at this point is to safeguard the first master. Therefore, he quickly turned his attention to Shin Woon and assured him that he would look out for his safety. However, Jin Woo was taken aback when Kang questioned him who was guarding whom and advised him to care more about himself because Jin Woo didn't appear to be in particularly good shape. He focused all of his attention on his first master, and as a result, he failed to notice that Sing was looking at both of them at the same time while licking the claw that was covered in blood and appeared eager to murder once more. Gu Nam was hemmed in by No Di and the other members of his staff. It appeared as though he was getting ready to launch an assault as a bluish-green energy form began to emanate from him. After that, he asks No Di whether they want to begin a war, and if they want, he doesn't stop them. But Jin Sang cut them off and advised No Di to back off because there appears to be confusion on both sides of the argument. No Di's anger grew as he refused to back down and realized that it was inappropriate to dismiss Mai Ho and Gu Nam from their positions. Therefore, Jin Sang conveyed to No Di in a level-headed manner that the viewpoint of Mai Ho is one that can be understood. Aside from that, there is no point in continuing the fight because the black bear's neck has already been severed. But Jin Sang was so anxious that his face was sweating and he clenched his teeth because everything was a mess, and if something happened to Mai Ho or the rest of his subordinate they may expose the agreement that he had made with the head of the GM family. What part of their position do you understand? Yells No Di. However, all of the leaders and members of the faction shifted their attention to Shin Woon when he ordered them to release their hold on the GM family on the grounds that what had occurred appeared to be sufficient education for them. Shin Woon's decision left No Di and Jin Woo bewildered, while the rest of the people around them were shocked that their master could remain so calm despite the fact that he was on the verge of death. Others were pleased with their master since something has really changed in him, and others were interested about when he learned to use Kai. On the other hand, Jin Sang was enraged because the one getting the lesson that Shin Woon was talking about was him. Dot, and he can't forgive him and the first master heard all his thoughts. However, Shin Woon was surprised when Mai Ho poked hard and yelled at him. She even said that she will never forget what the first master did before turning around and leaving. But Shin Woon forms a grin on his face and whispers something. Meanwhile, a discussion is taking place between two groups of men, one of whom is wearing a hat, and the other wearing a mask. The man who was wearing the hat was infuriated, and he asked the man in the mask who was in charge of the other men what was going on, since their plan had failed completely. The man who was wearing a mask is a hunchback. He suddenly apologized and stated that who would have imagined the situation would be such a mess, but at least the person who was responsible for all of this is now dead. Jin Sang was the person wearing the hat, and he was taken aback when he asked the hunchback what the plan was, and the hunchback told him that their headmaster had made a decision, and he wanted to pull out their swords if Jin Sang would allow it. Jin Sang was stunned by this information. The hunchback was informed by Jin Sang that they will begin in seven nights, and that he will clear the dogs from the front gate. After that, everyone left the location, but they were unaware that a blue energy was creeping around on the ground. It appeared to be listening to what they were saying. And after that, it crept around and appeared to be looking for something. However, Sam continues to chatter about the fight that took place some time ago as he is present in Shin Woon's room. Shin Woon, however, did not appear to be paying attention to Sam and appeared bored. Shin Woon was informed by the latter that the leaders of the Clear Cloud and White Cloud factions are interested in learning when he will visit their respective factions. In addition to this, the vice leader of the Clean Cloud faction, No Gun Ho, requested that he also instruct them. Sam was taken aback when his master called for his attention and informed him that the events that transpired earlier during the combat weren't actually all that risky. He chastised his master and warned that Jin Woo would have to come to his rescue if things didn't turn out well for him. But Shin Woon abruptly turned around and appeared dejected. He told himself that he could have easily handled that weak strike even if Jin Woo hadn't blocked it. Afterwards, Sam abruptly sat down and informed his master that he had no idea how his heart had sunk when his master told him that he would fight a black bear. Kang, on the other hand, suddenly covered his nose with his finger, and when he realized that Sam, his brother in blood, had been thinking of stabbing a sword into his heart instead, his heart sank for Sam. 
he quickly apologized for the fact that Sam was worried about him. On the other hand, the latter stated that he is unable to apologize to servants such as himself. Shin Woon, however, argued against Sam by stating that he was not merely a servant due to the fact that he was a trustworthy guy. After hearing his master's remarks, Sam immediately felt an overwhelming sense of happiness. After that, he rose up because his master might be fatigued and he should relax, so he waved farewell and told him to just call him if he needed anything. Furthermore, when Shin Woon was by himself in his room, he put his hand on the window and acted as though he was trying to communicate with someone or something outside. It was the blue energy, it had come through the window and had come to rest on his table. He gives the blue energy the command to reveal what it has observed. After the blue energy moved upward and grew in size, the dialogue between Jin Sang and the hunchback materialized in the middle of the room. He reasoned with himself that it was fortunate for him to have a shadow whisper placed on him. Despite this, the Shadow Whisper has a rank that is a C+, and its mastery level is 8 at percent. If he calls forth a showdown parasite, also known as the Shadow Whisper, the Abyss will always watch back. It is able to become attached to the enemy's shadow and report back to its master whatever it has heard and seen. When he learned that in a week, Jin Sang would take the guards while a bunch of assassins would come to assassinate him, he became enraged. He asked himself if he was going to kill his half-brother, but he reasoned that he should not be too reckless because he did not know the power of his adversary. As a result, he decided that he needed to make preparations for seven days before putting his plan into action. He looks out the window at the moon, and all of a sudden he breaks into a grin, as though he was just thinking about something. Now, shall we get to the grave? He uttered. Kang found himself in the Valley of the Blood Mist. He raises his hand to summon a skeleton lancer, and immediately after, a skeleton materializes in front of him and kneels down. He then made a request for the status window, after which a hologram appeared and informed him that a skeleton lancer was a skillful spearman who was 20 levels high. The ability is a vagabond of the first rank, with a weakness in aiming and a moderate spirituality. It has the skills of 19 Yong Chain Strike and Lightning Bow Step, and its inner Kai has been at the level of 1825 for approximately 5 years. When Kang studied what was written on the hologram, he was overjoyed to learn that it acknowledged him as a hunter with a high B level. After that, he reversed the process of calling forth the Skeletal Lancer. He breaks out in a startling grin when he thinks about how quickly he can collect 5 skeletons of the first rank within a single day, not to mention the effects of all accepting power, and purify from the severing technique if the Eastern Shining Sage is insane. Once more, he communicates with the status window and then appears in the hologram to announce that he has advanced to level 22 and that the level of his inner Kai has increased to 3360. He was able to acquire the severing art of the Eastern Shining Sage, and he considered this to be an act of divine providence on his part to claim as his own all of the inner Kai that the undead possessed. He begins to wonder if it could be related to the martial frame ability known as natural frame of a sage. All of his other stats, with the exception of magic and knowledge, are above average. He was not subject to any sort of punishment despite acquiring both the close combat ability and the mage ability. At this rate, he might also be able to master other forms of martial arts in addition to the heart arts. However, it is in his best interest to concentrate on regaining his primary necromancy ability as quickly as possible. He had the intention of going to the graves of the peaked undead, which refers to the undead with the highest rank. So he set out on foot till he reached the grave, when he was taken aback to see that it was somewhat smaller than he had anticipated. He came within a short distance of the grave of Yuil Lang, the White Cloud Sword Master, who was the first leader of the Beacon Clan and was known for being the most skilled swordsman in the history of the clan. After that, he placed his palm on the grave and attempted to conjure the spirit of Yuil Lang, who had passed away. He believed that undead of the gold rank who had reached their full potential in martial arts would exude a golden glow. But the grave of the greatest martial artist of all time, Master Il Lang, is completely colorless. He wanted to know what Yuil Lang had been keeping to himself. Kang utters the phrase Death Kai Extraction. When the process of extracting death came to an end on its own, a light suddenly appeared on the grave and spread throughout the area. Then a hologram appeared, which informed him that his necromancy ability rank was not high enough to carry out the process of extracting Death Kai from the undead, and became even more perplexed when the hologram indicated that the required rank was a question mark. He starts to wonder why a gold rank undead shouldn't be able to be created with a necromancy level of B. He hypothesizes that this is due to the fact that Yuil Lang must have possessed strength greater than that of an accomplished martial artist. Because of this, he was interested in determining the level of success he had achieved in martial arts while he was still alive. He circled back around and was about to depart. 
Having concluded that his attempt to conjure the spirit of Yu Il Lang had been unsuccessful, yet, he was so confident that there must be another hidden piece somewhere. However, he is obligated to search to find the grave of another top-tier martial artist if at all possible. But he cannot continue his thought because he became aware of something happening behind him. He turned around to see what it was, but his mouth dropped open in shock as he noticed the light emerging from the tomb. He was surprised. It turned out to be a circle for calling forth skeletons. The hologram then emerged and informed him that the undead desired to follow him of their own free will that he had satisfied the specific condition of being the one who stimulated the attention of the undead, that the temporary rank restriction on the necromancy talent had been removed as a reward, and that other perks had been granted to him as well. Afterwards, it was incomprehensible to him that the undead would want to follow him and that the undead would, of its own will, release the rank restriction. Then, a skeleton materialized out of thin air and took a seat on top of the grave. The hologram also claimed that his necromancy ability rank is significantly lower than the rank of the undead, that his rank is automatically recalibrated and calibrated to gold rank, and that his rank would automatically grow as his necromancy ability rank increases. However, Kang couldn't believe it when he called the status window and stated that the ability and skill of the peak swordsman is all of the peak swordsmen and twelve swords of the thunder clouds are at a plus rank and more. Moreover, he suddenly furrows his brow when he notices that the skeleton warrior is walking toward him instead of kneeling for loyalty. He was also surprised as he widened his eyes when the skeleton warrior talked to him through his mind and said that he was an interesting lad. He thought that the emotion of the peak swordsman, Yu Il Lan, was being sent directly to him and the means the peak swordsman had chosen him. He was confused and asked himself if he could handle the skeleton when it suddenly put its hand on his chest. Furthermore, the status window suddenly appeared and began to indicate that the peak swordsman is attempting to transfer the twelve swords of the thunder cloud and the art of the lightning thunder god. The decision of whether or not he wishes to take advantage of this ability is being posed via the status window. And the reason why the peak swordsman put its hand on his chest is because it is transferring its talent towards Kang. A smile breaks out on his face as he acknowledges its capacity. Meanwhile, the moon is the only source of light for the large number of people who are frantically racing through the woodland at high speed. The man with the hunchback who appears to be in charge gives the order for his subordinates to take a short break. They were taken aback by the suddenness of the event, and as they turned around to look behind them, they saw a woman with a mask who yelled at them and instructed them to run in the appropriate manner. Even worse, the lady kicked one of the lower-level subordinates and cursed at the others. But the hunchback Gunam interrupts and asks the lady whether she was required to follow them. As a reaction, the woman stated that she needed to personally witness his limbs being cut off and beg for his life with her own two eyes. The latter believed that the lady was a nasty wench and that regardless of her knowledge of the demonic art, she would have continued to live her life. After we arrived, do you think Jin Sang, that rat would pretend not to know anything? Asked the lady. Gu Nam responded by stating that it was not an issue because he, too, was in a difficult situation as a direct result of Shin Wu's achievements. After she called him a maggot and stated that he didn't realize that the black bear had cost him his neck, he suddenly let out a force because he was outraged. He could have gotten into a confrontation with the lady, but instead he instructed her to shut up and get going again so that he could avoid it. When the lady saw that Gu Nam was incensed because she blamed him for what had occurred to the black bear, she abruptly halted when she discovered that Gu Nam was already releasing a power and playing with his claw. We're moving again, utter Gu Nam. On the other hand, when they were getting ready to go, everyone was taken aback when they noticed something was coming up behind them. Because one of the subordinates believed that it was an ambush, he guarded the lady and put his own body in the way of anything that might have approached. When something suddenly pierced the body of the subordinate, everyone there was completely taken aback. Gu Nam noticed it and his eyes widened as he realized that the object was a bone. He focused his attention to the spot from which the bone had originated. When he saw that a large number of bones were coming towards them and had already slain a couple of his people in a short amount of time, his eyes widened and he furrowed his forehead. When one bone was getting closer to the lady, he used his body as a shield for her and he used his claw to avoid it. When he saw that his subordinates were in disarray and were astonished by the sudden appearance of the bone, and that all of them would be killed if he didn't step up, he commanded the remaining subordinates to wrap their kai around their swords and knock the bone away. He then released a force from within his body. Afterwards, the subordinate of Gu Nam obeys his command, and they suddenly release their kai to their sword, after which they begin evading every bone that was heading in their direction. Oh, pretty good, utter Kang when he saw what happened. 
On the other hand, a significant number of Ganum's subordinates had been killed, and others had been injured. It infuriated him that he had yelled at their adversary to come out of the shadows and stop acting like a coward by hiding. So, Kang revealed his identity from behind the tree, and he responded to the assassin's accusation that he was a coward by stating that it was absurd to make such a statement while they were on their way to kill him. Ganum was perplexed as to how Shin Wu could be in this location. He did not know what response to give. On the other hand, Kang asks Ganum why he didn't talk or whether it's because Ganum believes that he won't be able to recognize them even if they wear a mask. Consequently, he pointed both Ganum and the woman whose name was White Lily with his finger. Ganum tells him that it is risky to accuse them of carrying out an assassination, and that the reason they were in that location was because they were carrying out a covert task that had been given to them by the leader of the GM family. Kang abruptly says that their hidden task was to eliminate him after suddenly forming a grin on his face. White Lily's anger was fueled by the possibility that Jin Sang had betrayed them by informing his half-brother that they intended to kill him. As a result, she ordered her subordinates to simply kill Shin Woon. On the other hand, Ga Num believed that both of the brothers were playing a game of bait with them. Since a large number of bone spears were released all at once, there must be more bone spears with him. When he looks at Shin Woon, though, he is unable to perceive anyone other than himself. He pondered in his head if Shin Woon was foolish or stupid for coming all by himself. He came to the conclusion that Shin Woon had perhaps launched a device, which is excellent news given that Shin Woon had made it simpler for them to eliminate him. Afterwards, Ga Num suddenly opened his arms wide and let forth a burst of energy while he was questioning Shin Woon about whether or not he didn't want to wait for his death. Yes, this is how this should go. Utter Shin Woon. Then a large number of Ga Num's subordinates made a sudden attack on Kang, but he was prepared for it and summoned another set of bone spears, which he then abruptly fired towards his adversary. His adversaries were taken aback as he once again launched a set of bone spears when it was already too late for them to evade the attack since it was too quick for them to avoid being pierced all over their body. However, everyone was taken aback when Shin Woon declared that he had not started the process yet. On the other hand, Kang thought that the bone spears consume a lot of mana so he has to control the usage but it's not enough to scare them. However, Ga Num was sweating and seemed confused and scared. He thought that it was definitely not Shin Woon using his Kai to move those spears and there's no way he was a transcended peak martial artist at his age. Therefore, it must be demonic arts. His eyes widened when he realized that the demonic sect might have something to do with the revival of Shin Woon. And as a result, he suddenly shouted and release a massive force all over his body and said that it was simply a trick and all they have to do is kill Shin Woon. In addition, he thought that because of the trick that Shin Woon might use, it caused some casualties in their part but they are still way more for them and the numbers of spears flying at them has decreased. If they run at him all at once, they can kill him. So Ganem made the announcement that he would be taking charge of his subordinates and was about to assault when Shin Woon warned him that he was not alone, which caused him to immediately stop. Kang raised his palm in a startlingly rapid motion and immediately called out his five skeleton warriors. When they saw Kang's skeleton soldiers, all of Ga Num's subordinates were terrified, and some of them even started crying out of sheer terror. They watch as the skeletons emerge from the ground and grasp their weapons in preparation to attack. Now this is demonic arts, utter Kang. When those five skeleton warriors stepped in front of them, the others quickly began praying, and Ga Num began to perspire out of dread. The latter believed that he had spent his entire life as a murderer, but his body still froze in dread whenever he saw a skeleton. He also asked himself how could something coming from simple demonic rituals have that strength to summon skeleton warriors. However, the skeleton warriors begin their assault on their opponent. Because of this, Ga Num warned his subordinates that whoever turned back would meet their death at his hands. Despite their fear, his subordinates make the decision to fight, leading them to believe they are only a bone then rush towards the skeleton warrior who is now approaching them. However, Kang let out a sigh and asked himself if they were all crazy for going through heaven and hell but they chose to die. The skeleton warrior was on his side while pointing its bow and arrow at their opponent. The skeleton warriors belonging to Kang were making their way towards Ga Num's subordinate. They used swords to battle against one another in this conflict. One of the people saw an arrow flying towards him, so he slashed it with his sword. However, he did not see another arrow coming towards him, and it struck him in the forehead. As a consequence of this, the guy fell to the ground and was killed. Ganum was there for it all, and it looks like he's afraid because he's sweating. He assured himself that he had already seen those formidable foes defeated by the Dark Shadow Iron Chain Arrow, which consisted of two arrows traveling in the same direction. 
he can't help but wonder how that skeleton could possibly use the skills of Zhe Jiang's most accomplished archer, No Juk Moon. Ga Num was unaware of the fact that Yu Il Lang, the skeleton, was the most strong member of the Beacon clan when he was still alive. In addition, he suddenly realizes that the 19 Yang Chain strike of one whole spear ghost and the Black Tiger Fist of Tiger Iron Fist that the skeleton uses are the skills of Zhejiang's martial artist. He furrowed his brow when he heard one of his subordinates coughing and asking for help he ignore it and thought that he will put himself in danger if he tried to defeat Shin Wun's subordinate then he noticed that the latter was calmly standing and didn't throw any more spears meaning he was focused on control those skeletons and that's a chance for him to kill Shin Wun then he abruptly run towards the latter. When Ga Num was already quite close to Shin Wun, he turned to look to the side and realized that something was approaching. A force that took the appearance of light suddenly erupted towards him. Ga Num was alarmed. Because of this, he came to a sudden halt and discovered that the light was a force that had been created by one of the skeletons who was attempting to protect Shin Wun. He was so enraged that he wrinkled his brow and clenched his teeth the entire time. Shin Wun and all of the skeletons are making their way toward him. Gunnam thanked Shin Wun for making the last moment of his life enjoyable and suddenly chuckled before those skeletons took his life. On the other hand, Kang was satisfied because what occurred was way more than he expected. The Thundercloud 12 sword using Lightning Thunder God Art, its power is unbelievable, and it seems he created a barrier using the Thunderbolt. And from that moment onwards he can train more seriously in martial arts. Then the hologram stated that a new summonable peak assassin has been added to his stash. That's why Kang was delighted as he walked to the lady with a mask who happened to be Mai Ho who widens her eyes when he sees that Shin Woon was walking towards her and can't escape because her body can't move. On the other hand, Mai Ho had been restrained by Kang's shadow bind, which is why she was unable to move. Kang removed the mask to expose Mai Ho's true identity. The latter immediately confesses that she was duped by Jin Sang, and then she cries fake tears as she claims that they are lovers and that they are engaged. Because of this, she insists that she would never harm Shin Woon, and she begs him to begin over because it is not yet too late. On the other hand, Kang gave Mai Ho the order to quit acting because she was so excellent at it, and he questioned whether or not she still kidnapped travelers and tortured them. When Mai Ho found out that Shin Woon knew such things, she became perplexed and furrowed her brow. As a result, she made the decision to kill Shin Woon since she knew that if her secrets were out, her life would be over. She turned on a device that was attached to her fist, and then she suddenly sprayed it on Shin Woon while urging him to die right then. She couldn't help but giggle when she saw the bluish smoke strewn around Shin Woon. But she was surprised when she realized that she had been mistaken about having defeated Shin Woon because the latter told him that his poison resistance skill is already at rank B+. Afterwards, Mai Ho's eyes widened as she saw the blue smoke dissipate over time, revealing Shin Woon's face. Shin Woon had already been pointing his two fingers in her direction when he suddenly thrust those fingers into Mai Ho's chest, which caused Mai Ho's eyes to widen. Kang, on the other hand, revealed to Mai Ho that he had slashed her throat in order to prevent her from speaking. Kang also shared with her that one of the things he appreciates most about their world is that he does not have to be concerned with breaking the law when he murders people like her. Mai Ho was shivering with terror as Kang stimulated the corruption. After that, she went to her knees and tried her best to utter words, but she was unable to do so. Now, however, she was quivering with fear because of Shin Woon and then collapsed to the ground. Kang had only ever used this ability once before, and that was to dispose of the body of a gigantic creature. He was unaware that it could potentially be useful in this situation. He got down on one knee in front of Mai Ho, who was trembling so badly that her entire body was quivering. Her eyes widened and her jaw fell. After that, he reached under his garments and pulled out what appeared to be a golden object, which he then tossed at the dead body of Mai Ho before fleeing the scene. You're next, Yu Jin Sang. Utter Kang. Couple of days later, Jin Sang was furious and ordered Quack along with his subordinate to explain what happened but he became enraged when none of them spoke. The subordinate thought that the assassin group sent from GM family never came back and later, a woman's corpse was found to have decomposed over 10 years. However, Quack thought that upon the discovery of an identity card on the corpse, they believed it was GM Mai Ho's body. The GM's family leader hasn't regained consciousness since the trauma. On the other hand, Jin Sang furrowed his brow while bullets of sweat formed on his face. He told himself that they found an identity card on the corpse and the killer must have planned it. He clenched his teeth when he realized that it might be Shin Woon's warning for him so he abruptly stood in his chair 
and instructed Quack and his subordinate to do something about the situation because if that continues, Jin Sang can't continue his sentence because Quack interrupted him and said to calm down and no need to worry. Then his eyes suddenly change and even his whole face then he was instructed by Quack to go to the red light district and drink some alcohol there. On the other hand, after what Quack said, Jin Sang suddenly calmed down as if Quack hypnotized and he was under some magic. Afterwards, Jin Sang left the two when his faces seemed blank and the only thing in his mind was Quack's order. A subordinate of Quack suddenly lets out a sigh and exclaims that he cannot believe that everything could become so complicated due to Shin Wu's actions alone. But the subordinate was perplexed when Quack told him that a knotted up string may be easily taken off. So Quack explained to him that if a bug became an impediment to the grand plan of their sect, then they had no choice but to exterminate it, even if it meant torching the entire house. The subordinate then grinned from ear to ear and thought to himself that the Beacon clan would soon be covered in blood as soon as it was possible. In addition, Quack issued an order to his subordinate, telling him to get ready for a holy battle with the White Blood Asuras underground. He said this because the White Blood Asuras underground will start the executions as soon as the day has begun. He also instructed his subordinate to enhance the intensity of the curse placed on Shin Wu and make it as severe as possible because he didn't notice that it didn't harm him. And it appears that Shin Wu has developed a resistance to the curse. Yes sir, utter the subordinate. On the other hand, when Sam informed the people that it was impossible for them to meet his lord, it caused commotion among the people. People, however, continue to assert that even for a few moments they desired to communicate with Shin Woon or pass him a letter for the purpose of Sam being able to deliver it to Shin Woon. They were all begging Sam to save them and appeared to be in fear. But Sam told them that his young master instructed him that he will not meet anyone for the time being. Please head back, utter Sam. On the other hand, when people began to leave, some of them abruptly cursed and wondered whether they were required to appease Sam while others expressed sorrow over the fact that they had only supported Shin Woon, which would have resulted in him taking Sam's place. Sam smiled at the folks around him despite the fact that he had just heard all of that and was convinced that he was about to lose his mind if people didn't stop. On the other hand, Kang disclosed to Sam that he was going to be absent from the residence for a couple of days and gave Sam strict instructions to prevent anyone from entering his room and to pretend that he was still present. Kang abruptly said farewell to Sam, who was crying at the time. He didn't want any arguments or explanations since he didn't want them. After that, he wandered around a large mountain, and eventually he came to a cave where a sinister air was moving toward him. When he saw it, he was taken aback because it was a curse that had been crafted by Quack's subordinate. And after that, he allowed the curse to permeate his entire body. He couldn't help but grin all of a sudden since Quack was so angry because things hadn't gone their way. But it worked out perfectly for him because he was in desperate need of mana at the time. He rose up and felt the curse inside his body before the hologram emerged and announced that the amount of death sent by the unknown had increased potentially and exceeded the maximum amount the body can absorb while his body is now filled with Death Kai. He was overjoyed as a result of the fact that his adversary, who had sent Death Kai, had caused his body to become saturated with Yin Mana. Because he was interested in putting it to the test, he conjured up the skeleton of an assassin. Following the arrival of the light, the skeleton was revealed. He was perplexed when he first observed the appearance of the skeleton due to the fact that it is not a dark skeleton, and it appears that not all skeletons of great martial artists have their bones turned dark. He is reminded of what Yu Il Lang told him about the skeleton, and as a result, he begins to contemplate whether or not he should murder the skeleton. That being said, he is rude even though he was a skeleton. He utter, however, the undead that he summoned was the spirit of Gu Nam Sin, whom he defeated a while ago. He instructed the skeleton to hand him his martial arts, but he was shocked because the undead resisted his command. The hologram appeared and told him that he fulfilled their requirement for the hidden quest but he has to obtain the desire of the undead. Another hologram appeared and stated that the undead is not able to forget his grudge of dying in his hand, and the undead agrees to give his martial arts if Kang will pay with his one arm. His reward was a peak of martial arts flowing chasing ghastly blood claws that Gu Nam used to possess when he was still alive. Kang forms a grin on his face and he will show the skeleton what his place is for demanding one of his arms until he takes out again the skeleton of Gu Nam. He will make him suffer from continued pain. Then he summoned two skeletons for their martial arts so that Gu Nam could reflect on himself until Kang killed him again. He asks again the skeleton of Gu Nam to hand him his martial arts. Afterwards, the hologram appeared again and stated that Kang obtained the hidden quest which is the desires of the undead too and three. Kang was full of joy because he can obtain the sacrifices of the martial artist if he completes their quest. 
He will also find out all about it thanks to Yu Il Lang for transferring his martial arts without even asking because he doesn't have to learn the first rank martial arts so he snaps his finger so that the two skeletons may go back in. But he noticed that the two skeletons were disappointed so he told them not to be because he had already had a martial art that he wanted to learn. Furthermore, Kang was kneeling on the ground, sweating and gasping for air while a sword was on his side. He is experiencing it again but it's really trash. He looked behind him and found the skeleton of Yu Il Lang and seemed to be laughing at him so he abruptly stood up and said that he was trying his best then he lifted his sword and tried again. He releases his yin mana on his sword and the sword suddenly forms a purple light. Following that, he utilized the Kai of the Eastern Shining Sage, followed by the Art of the Lightning Thunder God, and finally the Kai of Thunder Cloud. After performing the Twelve Swords of Thunder Cloud with his sword, which had reached its maximum potential power, he raised it above his head and executed the Thunder Cloud Slash on the ground. But he immediately muttered an expletive when he realized that he had failed once more because the fissures in the ground were too little despite the fact that he had applied such enormous effort. Kang was of the opinion that there was an extremely large gap between the power of Gu Nam's martial arts and those of Yu Il Lang's. However, this is not an issue with either the inner Kai or the body, rather, there is a significant distinction between the two. When the skeleton of Yu Il Lang suddenly pointed its finger on his back, he was taken aback. He was perplexed, so he turned his head to check what the skeleton was doing, and he discovered that the skeleton was quickly poking its finger multiple times on his back. This baffled him further, so he turned his head again. When he discovers that he has been practicing martial arts with mana circuits rather than pressure points, and that he has not been using all of his pressure points, because of this, all of the locations on his body that Yu Il Lang had been prodding are the locations on his body where his mana circuits are blocked off. Kang started to open all of his pressure points as Yu Il Lang sat behind him and poked him with the Kai of the Eastern Shining Sage. This shouldn't be a problem because Yu Il Lang has the power to counteract the negative effects of his ability, so everything should be okay. On the other hand, the hologram materialized and informed him that he had achieved the ability of the Peak Swordsman, as well as the skill known as Sword Kai, and that his level had also improved. In addition to that, he is able to unlock other powers such as Corpse Explosion, Soul Barrier, and Phantom Robe, despite the fact that his necromancy has reached the B-plus rank, and so on. Kang gradually opened his eyes and it seemed it was a success. Du Jinu's home, which is located within the Beacon Clan territory. He was sat on the floor, and it looked like he was having trouble controlling his Kai. He persuaded himself that the agony, the cause of which and the treatment for which are not yet known, was becoming more excruciating as time went on. He wrinkled his brow thoughtfully, convinced that it was not yet his time and that he required a little bit more time since he still had stuff to complete. When Nodi came to the door, he was startled and stopped what he was doing abruptly. According to the latter, Jin Wu's condition has been deteriorating recently. However, Jin Wu gave him a reassuring grin and informed him that everything was in order. It must be because he did not eat dinner before the exercise session. Then, Nodi comes to the conclusion that the leader must have overexercised himself in his role as a martial arts leader. However, he reasoned that he was not the one who should be blamed for the situation, and that if he were in his shoes, he would experience the same thing. Furthermore, Jin Wu informed Nodi that it has been three days since Bi Seung Ju left, and she inquired as to whether or not he was concerned about the situation. Nodi reached for a cup, expressed his concern to the leader, and then inquired as to whether or not it was time for him to take charge of a significant journey by himself. In response to his question, Jin Wu explained to him that his request was nothing out of the ordinary, so there shouldn't be any issues. But Nodi continued to press his query about whether or not Jin Wu was concerned, but the latter didn't react. So he stated that he was not convinced with the Japanese Confucius since the appearance of it in the last few days may have simply been a temporary phenomena, and a powerless person can never protect their own interests. The four pillars of Pyoguk have already reached a level of strength that allows them to compete with the other three. However, Jinu was of the opinion that what Nodi had said was correct. If they can discover a justified cause to unify, then Confucius and the four pillars of Pyoguk will take control. However, he will never be able to forget the looks of triumph that Shin Woon gave him after they defeated the Black Bear. Shin Woon's appearance during the confrontation with Jung Bu Yung and the gathering in the center of Beacon. The monarch Yu Ho Yol was the individual who he remembered staring at the most frequently. Nodi suddenly stood up and informed his leader that the movement of the four pillars of Pyo Guk was nothing out of the ordinary. However, much to their astonishment, someone abruptly opened the door, and they were even more perplexed when they discovered that it was the young master Shin Woon. They quickly dropped their heads to meet their young master, 
and they added that if the young master had informed them in advance that he would be dropping by, they would have prepared refreshments for his arrival. On the other hand, Kang informed Nodi and Jinu that they do not need to prepare anything for him because he does not usually hunt for sweets. He then asked them if they think he should lose some weight and laughed at them. But Nodi was skeptical of Shin Woon, so the latter didn't come out of his room. Instead, he gambled away all of his money and roamed aimlessly through the neighborhood. Therefore, he inquires of the young master as to where he has been for the past few days. But Kang chose to disregard No Di's inquiry and divert his attention instead to Jin Woo, whom he informed that although he has a lot of things to accomplish, they are not particularly significant. When their young master questioned Jin Woo how long he would continue to act like that, both No Di and Jin Woo were taken aback by the question. Kang grew irritated because it seemed like the two wanted to conceal Jin Woo's condition, so he ordered Jin Woo to cease bearing it and warned him that he will pass away if he continues to be in that state. On the other hand, Jin Woo recalls the moment when Shin Woon remarked that he was not powerful in their combat against the black bear. As a result, Jin Woo believed that Shin Woon may have realized that he was in a precarious condition because of what Shin Woon had said. Because of this, he shared with his young master that at that same moment, the situation was still manageable. So you'll keep going while it's still bearable, asked Kang. But Nodi suddenly yelled at Kang and admonished him to be aware of what he said, and he didn't act as though he knew why Jin Woo had become this way. But both Nodi and Jin Woo were taken aback when Shin Woon suddenly rose up and told Jin Woon that he was a lucky old man. This meant that if Shin Woon hadn't come looking for him, he would have survived the night. Nodi and Jin Woo were both astonished by this. Jin Woo was unsure of what to do, so Shin Woon put his hand on his shoulder and encouraged him to stop worrying and to leave everything to him. He then gives Jin Woo the command to sit on the floor, after which Kang sits behind him. He placed his hand on Jin Woo's back and let out a force, but the latter coughed unexpectedly and bled from his mouth as the force was released. Nodi, who had been kneeling on the floor and watching them, suddenly stood up and became concerned when he saw blood on the mouth of their leader. However, just as he was about to approach them, Shin Woon signaled him to stop and just leave everything to him. As a result, Nodi had no choice but to sit back down on the floor and continue watching them. Kang keeps working to heal Jin Woo while also releasing a force in his direction. Kang was exerting a great deal of effort, as evidenced by his wrinkled forehead and perspiration. He pondered to himself how the elderly guy could have survived the agony, considering that he would have perished if he didn't arrive in time. When he saw Jin Woo during the fight with the black bear, in which he also expended a lot of energy defending him, he realized that the situation wasn't quite as bad as he had feared. He ponders the reason behind the elderly man's and Sam's willingness to give their lives for the sake of others. He tells Jin Woo to keep her strength up because he is going to make sure that everything is removed, and he also gives a little bit of energy to help with the circulation. After that, Nodi observes that the leader of Beacon's face appears to be regaining its normal appearance. He asks himself how the young master did it and looks like his experience helped a lot to think he was also performing the same treatment the young master does. As soon as Shin Woon informed him that everything was finished, Jin Woo opened his eyes and was shocked. Thus, he attempted to unleash a force on his body, and he was amazed that all of his energy came back as if nothing had happened. On the other hand, Nodi's mouth dropped because he was surprised to see that all of the poison that had been on the leader had been removed, and he observed that the leader appears to be functioning at his highest level. He then jumped up, moved closer to Jin Woo, and congratulated him, but Jin Woo was still perplexed by what had just happened. Because of this, he questioned him how it was possible, but even Jin Woo didn't know the answer. As a result, they both turned their attention to Kang, who had his eyes closed and was still sitting there. They were unaware, however, that he was thinking about the hologram that had emerged and informed him that he had successfully accomplished the hidden quest. The hologram had also informed him that he would receive the hidden mission road to Wall 1, in addition to bonus experience gained from the hidden quest. The status window stated the Kang receive a huge amount of yin mana, and the amount of yin heart mana has reached the fourth circle, and because of that, Kang suddenly smiled because by absorbing Jin Woo's curse, he reached the fourth circle and accomplished a hidden quest and even received mana. But he suddenly opened his eyes when he noticed that he was still with no D, and Jin Woo and the latter told him that he was forever indebted to him for curing him. Both of them plead to Kang to explain to them how he found out about the poison and how he cured it. On the other hand, Kang told them that he was also poisoned that's why he knew it and the two were both surprised when he revealed it. But he told them that was not a poison but a curse given by someone. When Jin Woo asked him how he knew about it, he explained to them that he didn't find it. Instead, he heard about it from his father. The two leaders were taken aback, 
and they both dropped their mouth while a bead of sweat formed on their faces. Kang disclosed to them as well that his father had passed away as a result of the same curse, because Jinu was immediately filled with rage toward whoever had done those things to the father of his young master. He clenched his teeth quickly. As a result, he in no date asked Shin Woon who was behind all of that and who were the other persons aware of the essential information. Kang shared with them that he didn't have any faith in other people. When he learned about the curse, it was already too late to save his father's life and he could not heal him. And because his father was unable to put the family name at danger, he eventually just gave up. Instead, he decides to devote his life to figuring out how he can be saved. He also revealed that the technique he employs is a custom that has been handed down by his family from generation to generation, and that his father miraculously discovered it has the ability to burn everything. It came as a surprise to the two leaders when he abruptly seized his sword and brandished it in front of them. As a consequence, the two leaders were astounded when they witnessed how the sword emitted such enormous force. When they declared that it was a dragon hidden in a magnificent cloud, they were both shivering and their voices were shaking as they uttered it. They also reported that the skies vibrated in one breath and thunderbolts dropped to the ground. When Jinu mentioned that, once he learned that the sword was called the Thunderbolt Sword, he immediately broke down into tears. On the other hand, when a Thunderbolt Sword was obtained, it was questionable as to why such an outstanding martial arts weapon was not handed down. Yuil Lang did not leave his martial arts to future generations, everyone including his family, begged him to look back on his decision but it was useless. It is speculated that the Begun Payaguk wanted to remain a representative country, and not a shaman master. Therefore, pride and history improved on one side of the Begun Payaguk family's black crest. As a result of this chain of events, Kang is able to acquire the Thunderbolt. It is comparable to owning the most powerful weapon, which can overcome any justification, Nonetheless, he felt terrible for Yu Ho Yol for the life that he endured and swore that he will repay it by ensuring that he and his sons get the revenge that they deserve. He turned his attention to the two leaders and saw that Jin Woo and No Di were both still sobbing on the ground. He felt terrible about dragging his own body and overworking himself with the martial arts, and he expressed his regret to Jin Woo. And with regard to No Di, Kang will make amends for those shortcomings until the day he dies, and even after his passing, if necessary. When Shin Woon told Jin Woo and No Di that there's something he wants to clear up with both of them before he can explain the arrangement that his father left behind, Jin Woo and No Di were both perplexed by his statement. When the two leaders look at him in bewilderment, he suddenly unleashes a great force throughout his body. As a direct consequence of this, the two leaders both drop their jaws and expand their eyes in a state of being dazzled. Both of them couldn't believe the tremendous force of the thunderbolt, and they weren't sure whether Shin Woon was actually under the influence of that very vicious energy. Kang explained to them that he was simultaneously employing Yin Mana, and the severing skill that was passed down from the Eastern Shining Sage. No, is this jerk really a Confucian ill? Utter no D. On the other hand, Jin Woo was dazed. He told himself that he only seen that much power from one person in his entire life, and that one person who helped them during the secret attack in Pyo Heen Dan 30 years ago. It was the Muram swordsman, Damchen Gun. Is he comparable to him? He added. Afterwards, he called both B clan leader Do Jin Woo and Ho clan leader No Di Yung. He won't say too much but to follow him. Back clan leader Do Jin Woo, I'll be your trusted follower. Utter Jin Woo. Ho clan leader No Di Yung, I will do everything I can. Utter No Di. They both promised to Shin Woon that the Begun Payaguk will soar high because of their young master, Shin Woon. On the other hand, Kang gave the order for everyone to stand up and said that despite the fact that he wanted to congratulate Jin Woo on his recovery and their resolution, but he was unable to finish his sentence because he suddenly jumped to the ceiling. After that, he threw the body on the ground and informed them that they had an unexpected visitor. On the other hand, Nodi told himself and said that it was a top-secret technique that could fool even the most skilled master and perform the most complex trick. Furthermore, when Jin Woo is close enough to the individual, he is able to remove his disguise and discover who it is. They were taken aback, however, when they learned that the intruder was a member of the Four Pillars of Pyo Gux. They have known the man for a full decade at this point. On the other side, Kang issues a command to the individual, warning him that he will murder him if he does not divulge who his master was. But the man paid him no mind as he gritted his teeth and continued to ignore him. After a second, his mouth began foaming up and he fell to the ground. Nodi had good intentions of rescuing him, but it was too late because he had concealed poison in his teeth. They were all taken aback when they observed something in the surrounding area of the structure. Right, it's faster to tell them ourselves. Utter Kang. So he walked to the path where they sensed something. 
Kang leads the way and the two leaders follow him. Sam Bong, just why are you doing this? Utter the person who was trembling in fear. But Sam Bong raised his sword and struck the target with it. Sam Bong and his companions are dressed uniformly, their eyes all white and seeming mesmerized. He issues an order for his opponent to lay down all their weapons and submit. However, his opponents pull out a weapon in their territory and inquire as to what they are doing. Sam Bong, however, moves in front of them suddenly because he doesn't want to reiterate what he had stated. Did everyone in the Red Cloud faction go insane? Yelled Sam Bong's adversary. But all of Sam Bong's comrades disregarded them and briskly approached them, slashing each and every one of their opponents. But the subordinates of the Clear Cloud faction saw what had happened, so the leader in charge ordered his comrades to form their formation. Even the members of the White Cloud faction rushed towards the Clear Cloud faction, helping them and join their formation. Sam Bong told his comrades that their opponent was laughable because they were many, yet they were just a first-rate soldier so he ordered his comrades to kill them all. However, small cloud faction leader Gil came out from a house when he heard the commotion. His subordinates told that it was not right for the family to be shedding blood against each other and they must stop the mess. They saw that the combat had already started, and another person asked Gil not to fight against it. Moreover, Gil asked Sam Bong what is going on. Then Sam Bong explains to them that they have confirmation in the situation that the first young master along with the two faction leaders were planning to ambush the second young master as well as the Red Cloud house. Gil was surprised, he couldn't believe that Jin Sang would do such things. He thought that even if it's due to the fact that his position has been jeopardized from the feast of the first young master, he can't continue his thought because he abruptly asks Sam Bong if he has any definite proof about that. Sam Bong suddenly furrowed his brow because Gil seemed to be doubting them so he told Gil that those are enemies that rallied behind the wicked plans of the first young master. But Gil shouted at Sam Bong because there could be innocent people among them and they are their family. On the other hand, Sam Bong told Gil that it would all have been fine if he just followed the orders just like he usually does, then he abruptly strangled the neck of Gil and his subordinate. They can't escape from the tight hold of Sam Bong until they lose their breath and die. In addition, he saw that, like the rat their commander was, the members of the small cloud faction should have remained motionless and held their breath instead of standing by and seeing their leader die. He turns to face the terrified members of the small cloud faction and asks whether they concur. He vowed to make them at least pretend to avenge their leader if they started to rebel against him. Sam Bong cursed that their attempted assassination had appeared to have failed when he heard someone telling the guards of the white cloud and the clear cloud to lift their swords high. In addition, as the members of the two factions cheered that their faction leaders had already arrived and that their first young master had come to save them, Sam Bong watched Nodi continue to hack his swords at his allies. Therefore, he nearly faced Shin Woon alongside Jin Woo and Nodi. He said that Nodi and Jin Woo wouldn't be able to handle the toughest blood Asura he had sent in. As expected, Shin Woon himself marched into that dangerous region, and he was extremely concerned about the condition of the young master's head. You idiot. Watch your words against the future leader, exclaimed Jin Woo. However, Sam Bong noticed the word that Jin Woo used, the future leader and he realized that they have decided to follow Shin Woon. On the other hand, Kang approaches Sam Bong and gestures with his finger at him, claiming that the mentally ill person was Sam Bong's master, who had cursed his father and brother. When Sam Bong heard Shin Woon's comments, he grew furious and released a tremendous power, pretending he was unaware of the curse being discussed. But when he realized that the young master already knew where their underground location was inside the Red Cloud house, he was taken aback and stopped abruptly. All the members of two factions were confused on what underground area, and cursed their young master talking about. After he did, Kang unleashed his blade and believed that the shadow whisper he had planted across the clan had already told him where they were hiding. Furthermore, he said, now, bring it on, wasn't I your main target? Sam Bong ordered his allies to kill every member of the Clear Cloud and White Cloud factions as a result, and his allies immediately charged their adversaries. On the other hand, the members of the two factions were ready from the Red Cloud faction. They were shouting to protect their allies, others said that they have to fight without fear of death and others shouted to protect their future leader. Everyone wanted to conquer their enemy so every faction member gave their best to avoid every slash that their opponent released. However, Sam Bong wanted to kill the young master, so he leaped to assault him. When Kang realizes that Sam Bong was using the Frost Kai, he smiles unexpectedly. Sam Bong was about to strike Shin Woon but the latter used his sword to deflect the blow. However, Sam Bong was too fast. He grinned abruptly upon realizing that the young master was only beginning at his zenith, and that he had fallen victim to his white frost ghost hand. 
which would cause the young master's palm to freeze solid as yin accumulated. To his surprise, the young master's hand held his blade just fine. On the other hand, Sam Bong was mocked by Kang if it was his best, and they weren't in a kid's play. Confusion gripped Sam Bong as he considered how Shin Woon possessed such a strong Kai and Kang believed that Sam Bong paled in comparison to the undead's yin mana derived from the energy of death. Then, Sam Bong launched a surprise hand attack on Shin Woon, but before he could strike, the latter quickly changed positions and unleashed his thundercloud straight strike. Sam Bong, on the other hand, realized it was risky and warned himself, but it was too late since the young master had already slashed his sword against his body, causing parts of Sam Bong's hand to fly. The opponent's mouth dropped in shock upon witnessing what had happened to his leader, while other members of the White Cloud and Clear Cloud faction furrowed their brows in disbelief at their young master's ability to wield and unleash such immense force, and still others cheered and rejoiced upon learning that Shin Woon had used the Twelve Swords of Thunderclouds to secure their future. Still, the Red Cloud faction members dropped their jaws and furrowed their brows, but since their opponent only has three zenith, one of them yelled out that they shouldn't be frightened. He tells his allies that the fight has a clear goal in mind. Kang, on the other hand, approached the Red Cloud faction and remarked, Those guys don't feel bad about flaunting their superior numerical strength. When Shin Woon lifts his hand, a member of the Red Cloud side laughs at him and asks what tricks he is preparing. To his surprise, however, when he looks down at his shadow, it grows wide, slowly rises, and suddenly appears as a phantom robe. The individual was shivering in terror as the phantom robes approached him. When multiple ghostly occurrences suddenly materialized before their eyes and slashed their swords into their necks, they were terrified that they collapsed on the ground dead. Furthermore, Kang commands his numerous phantom robes to kill all the members of the Red Cloud faction that's why those phantom robes abruptly jump to catch their enemy. Afterwards, all the Red Cloud faction were rushing to escape the phantom robes and said that it was a chaos skill. However, no D and Jin who furrowed their brows, they thought that those phantom robes may be the one that their future clan leader had mentioned. Shin Woon told them that his father hired assassins from Killing Gate as his last mission to protect him and the top secret assassin group has no known information. They can't even make a request if they can't meet their conditions. His father had made only one condition, to protect him for one year. In addition, in exchange Shin Woon's father had submitted the Twelve Swords of Thundercloud and Art of the Thunder God as the request fee. On the other hand, No Di and Jin Woo made comments in response to Shin Woon's revelation that their clan leader had suffered humiliation for his child and that their family's martial arts tradition is utilized to hire assassins. But for Kang, it was all a lie because there was no other way for him to conceal his skeleton warriors because, if he gives them the ability to wear a phantom robe, which he gains from leveling up, they will be able to blend in with the enemy's shadow and conceal their skeleton bodies. In his haste, he created an arbitrary assassin clan, but it turned out perfectly. Moreover, all of the phantom robes had already eliminated the final member of the Red Cloud faction, and the members of the White Cloud and Clear Cloud factions were astounded by the phantom robes. Some claim that they have to be the subordinates their future clan leader has to secretly train. Others claim that, like their future clan leader, those were overly powerful. Following their victory over the Red Cloud, who was attempting to sow discord and usurp their young master's lordship, all of the members were applauding Shin Woon, their future clan leader. On the other hand, after Quack and Jin Sang, Kang believed that the only people still opposing them were them. All members of the White Cloud and Clear Cloud factions, along with their leaders, are given the order to proceed to the Red Cloud residence. Led by Kang, they dash for the Red Cloud house. However, it wasn't until he arrived at the front of the Red Cloud house by himself when he realized that members of the White Cloud and Clear Cloud faction along with their leader had slowly disappeared. He assumed that everyone had vanished without a trace, which bewildered him and made him think of the Blood Mist Valley. Perhaps Quack Jusan has engaged in some kind of formation technique, but it's much more effective because no one is around to witness his use of necromancy. Then he walks through the stair to ready the entrance door of the house. Furthermore, out of sheer rage, Quack Jusan struck the table abruptly, sensing that the Red Cloud faction he had deployed to sow discord had run out of energy. Despite the fact that it appeared that even Ha Jiam had lost, he was perplexed as to what had happened to their allies. However, he asserted that no member of the Beacon clan could defeat Ha Jiam's art of chilling in. Out of frustration, he tightened his teeth, reddened his eyes, and showed a vein on his forehead. He believed that his plan was flawless and that the major sect could easily turn against the Beacon clan if their base penetrated Jejong. They sent only blood asuras who hadn't been converted in more than a decade, not the generals in charge of fighting. 
That was undoubtedly insufficient when he was creating his plan. The young master is the one thing he failed to mention because, ever since the day of his revival, everything had gone wrong and he had changed totally, but it doesn't matter for him. In addition, Quack Ju San was enraged, though his plan failed. All that's left is to kill everyone in the house and turn everything into ashes. If the existence of their sect became known to the world before that time came he will never survive, but he will never be defeated because he has that power. Furthermore, he noticed a man walking down the staircase. On the other hand, when Kang did eventually enter the mansion, he saw Quack while traveling to the Red Clouds underground. As he explored the basement, he was shocked to see a large number of mummified creatures leaning against the wall. Everything was much above the limit, so he felt Quack was sufficiently insane. Just what kind of idiot are you? Asked Ken. Quack, however, disregarded the young master and informed him of some recommendations. In three months, Quack would elevate him to the position of clan leader and establish the Beacon clan as Jejong's top commission clan. However, for that to occur, the young master must first fully regenerate for the sect and then throw him a sword towards Kang. On the other hand, Kang was standing when the sword dropped to the ground. The young master picked up a blade and Quack grinned unexpectedly. He informed the young master he would offer him fame and money if he went back up and killed every member of the clan. Though Quack believed he had the young master convinced, to his astonishment, the young master suddenly threw the blade in Quack's direction, which he narrowly dodged. Kang expressed his curiosity at Quack's lengthy and unending rant, as well as the number of verse in it. And Quack became enraged over it, widening his eyes and even cursing the young master. Now, let's carefully shut the disgusting drinking mouth. Utter Kang then he unleashed his sword. But laughing at him, Quack wondered what the young master thought was so reckless. He raged at the young master, then, asking whether it was because he had only learned one meager martial technique from his ancestor. Unexpectedly, he gripped his hand and released force, determined to teach the young master the actual meaning of strength. On the other hand, the young master didn't understand Quack's level of power. Suddenly, he called upon his skeletal knights. Then a number of mummies appear to come to life and start moving toward the young master and his skeleton knights. The young master believed the mummies to be ghouls, but they were Jiangshis if there was a controlling corpse in the world. At the same moment that he gives the order for his skeleton knights to fight the mummies, Quack gives the order for his mummies to attack the young master. The mummies are being repeatedly struck by the swords of the skeleton knights. However, though it was unlikely to succeed, Quack observed that the young master was employing an odd form of chaos art. The young master comes to observe that the mummies are still attacking them even after the skeleton knights had slashed them in two with their swords, leaving them bewildered. Kang, while observing the fight, in his opinion, each Jiangxi possesses strength comparable to that of a zenith, and using his typical approach to get rid of them was difficult. In Quack's direction, he turned, and it seemed that only Quack was at ease. Their current predicament suggests that Quack Ju San is attempting to buy time by delaying what appears to be preparations he has been making since he triggered the Jiangxis. Moreover, the young master had just come up with a way to fix the situation once, so he let out a force. When Quack saw it, he became interested in the young master's plans and the inner force he was using. The young master was utilizing a talent called the Corpse Explosion that draws out 60% of the mana heart. And as a result, all of the mummies explode instantly, causing Quack, who witnessed it, to dramatically widen his eyes. Then, the entire house explodes. Afterwards, the young master was suddenly covered by the skeleton knights to keep him safe from the blast. After the explosion, smoke was seen everywhere, and the young master was still alive. Since it was closer, he couldn't believe how destructive his corpse explosion was while he was shaking off his garments. If his skeleton knights hadn't shielded him, he might have been gravely harmed at that precise moment. Though he was curious about what had happened to Quack Ju San, he searched about to see if he was still alive. He can't finish his sentence when he looks behind him. It was the same power he had used in a past existence, but he didn't understand how Quack had those things. When Quack abruptly appeared on the ground and seemed to levitate due to his immense power, Kang was taken aback. On the other hand, Quack Ju San believed that Kang was amazed by his power, which is why he was laughing and bragging about it. The young master is asked if he can see his power which is the power of the one who has been blessed by the demon god. He was shocked to find, however, that the young master was composed and did not show any fear or wonder toward him. How interesting, utter Kang while looking at Quack. Afterward, Quack became enraged when the young master ignored his power. He thought that even if the young master learned the forbidden art of exploding corpses, there are no more Jiangshis left and he disrupted the great will of their sect that's why he decided to take the young master as a sacrifice to their demon god. 
when he was about to attack. He suddenly stopped and was confused when the young master told him that he was not a species modification caused by a parasitic species and he doesn't look like a monster and the formation is in progress due to corrosion. Well, maybe I'll get an answer after I beat him, says the young master while forming a grin on his face and clenching his fist. Quack on the other hand was so confused and didn't have any idea what the young master was talking about. And because the young master seemed to be ignoring him, Quack clenched his teeth and was annoyed and told himself that he was not afraid of the young master. Afterwards, he spread his arm while floating in the air and releasing power. He claimed that it was the power of someone who received the demon's god blessing then his body gradually became ash that mixed in the air until he vanished. Instead of experiencing dread as a result of being exposed to the force of Quack, the young master appeared to be searching for something as he gazed around him. He called upon his bone wall ability as soon as he became aware of anything behind him. Then, without warning, the jagged edge of the bone abruptly surfaced on the ground. It looked to strike something as blood began to spurt forth and then Quack's arms, which had been pierced on the bone wall, came into view. Quack, on the other hand, was perplexed as to how it took place and how the young master was able to sense that he was present at that location. He then utilized his ability once more and gradually disappeared. Moreover, the young master gave another thorough search for Quack, whose body had now dispersed across the surroundings. And as soon as he became aware of a certain location, he abruptly cried out to his bone wall. Moments later, a bone suddenly rose from the ground, and it snagged another arm of Quack. The agony he was experiencing combined with the rage he felt toward the young master caused him to shake uncontrollably. It didn't make any sense to him that the young master could actually possess that bone wall, so he was perplexed by the situation. Furthermore, Kang moves approaching Quack, who is quivering in anguish at this point. He lamented that it was a shame for Quack because, had he stood slightly more to his left, he would have been able to remove both of Quack's eyes. Quack retracted his arm from the bone wall and prepared to speak. But the young master stopped him off suddenly and explained that a novice rank missed blink will invariably result in a mana distortion phenomenon prior to arriving at its target. The young master also mentioned that he put in a little bit more effort in addition to that. Quack grew furious as a result of what the young master had stated, and he hurled curses at the young master for demeaning the demon god. After that, he let out a force on his body, which was followed by the scattering of countless drops of his blood. Die! Quack screamed then the drop of blood became sharp and was approaching the young master. In addition, Quack grinned and told himself that he would not be surprised if the young master attempted to cut the flow of blood if he could because it would immediately burrow through him and drain all his blood once it got a hold of him. On the other hand, the young master chooses to keep his ground and appears uninterested in the expertise of Quack. However, just as the drop of blood was about to strike him, he activated his soul barrier and deflected every single drop of it. When it comes to protecting oneself against spell-related assaults, the soul barrier is unrivaled. On the other hand, Quack's jaw dropped in surprise when he realized that the young master had sidestepped his assault. It was hard for him to accept the fact that his blade veil technique was ineffective against the young master. Quack was uncertain as to whether or not he had already advanced past the level of his capability. He scowled, and then he said to himself, If I can't do anything against the young master, then I'll go after his underlings, and I'll absorb blood from them. He furrowed his brow, and then he made his decision. After that, he assumes his stance and directs his sword veil ability toward the skeleton knights in order to deal damage to them. On the other hand, the skeleton knights were perplexed by the blood veil that was piercing them all over their bodies. Afterwards, Quack was ecstatic when he saw his blade veil puncture the skeleton knights, and he will now regain his power as a result of taking the blood from their wounds. But his grin evaporated as quickly as it appeared when he realized that those skeleton knights were unaffected by the blade veil he was using, and that they were all remaining motionless. On the other hand, the young master believed that even though Quack continued to poke his skeleton knights, it would have no effect on them because their phantom robes were empty. Quack erupted in wrath, he couldn't believe what was taking place, and the young master calmly avoided all of the assaults that he hurled at him. At this moment, the young master and his skeleton knights were standing in front of him. When one of the skeleton knights draws its weapon, a power that manifests itself as a yellow light, and slashes it, Quack is perplexed. But Quack was prepared because there was no way for him to get away, so the only alternative left to him was to run away once more into the clouds and he eventually disappeared. Unluckily for him, another skeleton knight was hot on his tail and slashed its sword in his direction as they ran. On the other hand, when Kang witnessed how rapidly the skeleton knight moved and slashed its sword against Quack, 
He was astounded by how quick the skeleton knight was. He questioned how he was able to ascertain the skeleton's path with such incredible speed while maintaining such a high level of accuracy. On the other hand, Quack was lying on the ground when he was attacked by the skeleton which severed his body in two pieces. The young master approached him and explained that everything was being consumed because the vessel was unable to deal with it any longer. Quack gets the advice from the young master that he should have employed martial arts instead, and he genuinely thinks he can beat the young master by using power from those bastards. Quack questioned the young master what he meant despite the fact that he was having trouble breathing. On the other hand, the young master seemed perplexed, as if he truly did not know. He reveals that he is able to immediately know whose strength is that by looking at the mist blink, the bloody spear, and the bloody thorn. And Quack was using the power that belonged to a vampire lord, a monster with the ability to increase their strength and turn their victims into familiars by absorbing their blood. The creature was designated as a disaster rank and was one of the toughest monsters. But for Kang Tiho, it was just another one of those annoying pests he had to deal with as a hunter. Since a vampire's skills doesn't work on the undead, most of the elimination requests for them were handled by him. He was grateful for all the experience. He was able to figure out immediately that Quack Jusan was using a vampire's power. And in his previous life, no human was able to successfully use the powers of a monster. Transformation, infection, berserk and explosion. The citizens had to shoulder the damage from the attempts to use a monster power. In addition, Kang had a sudden recollection of a man who was yelling at him to run away. When he spoke to that adult, he addressed him as director despite the fact that he was still a child at the time. Fear caused him to tremble all over. In addition to that, Kang suddenly let out a sigh since he could scarcely remember his own recollection. As he examined Quack while knelt on the ground, he was under the impression that only monsters were capable of making use of corrupted mana, a human being who is capable of employing it without losing their sanity in the process. And he cannot deny the fact that Quack crossed over into a dimension that is not shared by humans. However, Quack was still alive, although struggling. He asked the young master what he meant by a vampire because the power that he has was a power from the demon god. He gathered enough strength that's why he yelled at the king saying that after a thousand years of long waiting, finally, and his power is the power of the one that has descended upon them, the blood sect. But Kang was still confused, he assumed that when they were going on and on about sects, they were referring to the demonic sect in Mount Tian. But he doesn't want to make any harsh decisions even though it might be a lie. But he thought the thousand years of waiting means that there is a secret organization that's been accumulating power without anyone knowing. And the demon god descent means that there is an absolute being that they follow. Afterwards, because Kang has to find out more information, he slams his fist down suddenly on Quack's chest. Because of this, he decided it would be safer to start by destroying his Kai source. And as a consequence of the discomfort that he was experiencing, Quack was yelling about it. After that, Kang raised Quack's body while he was pleading with the young master to put an end to his life while he was being strangled by Kang. But the young master disregarded him and instead reminded him that the anguish he was experiencing was insignificant in comparison to all of the lives of innocent people that he had given up. The young master saw something on Quack's face when he was looking at him, and it turned out to be a skin mask. When he suddenly removed the mask to show his true identity as Quack Ju San, he was taken aback when he observed that his face appeared to be deteriorating. In addition, something suddenly came to Kang's mind. He saw the body of Shin Woon covered by cloth and looked like a mummy. And as a result, he lost his tight grip on Quack's neck and he fell to the ground. Kang was confused and abruptly held his head because it was Shin Woon's memory that suddenly popped up in his mind. He saw Quack wearing his real face in Shin Woon's memory. While Shin Woon was lying in the bed, Quack sat next to him and said that Shin Woon was trash before he got buried. Who would have thought that he would become an exceptional talent after taking him out of his coffin? Quack rings a bell and the eyes of Shin Woon suddenly open and say that he should rejoice because he will be reborn and become the foundation of the blood sex will. On the other hand, Kang is able to immediately experience the emotion that Shin Woon is experiencing, and the question he had been trying to find an answer to regarding the hallucinations of Jiam Mai Ho finally has an explanation. There is evidence of an alternative life for the original Yu Shin Woon, one in which he was not reincarnated. The recollections of the future that were presented to him in the form of hallucinations were actually his memories from after he had passed away. And as a consequence of what he believed, he suddenly grabbed Quack's hair and demanded to know everything there was to know about the blood sect. But before Quack could say any words, Kang was astonished because he spotted something in Quack's face. That is the reason why he suddenly released his hair and plummeted to the ground below him. 
quack is restrained by another individual since his mental state is deteriorating rapidly. It was necessary for him to put an end to it because he was still locked on information. He suddenly placed his palm in Quack's head, but the mental confinement was too great, and Quack had already passed away before he could do anything about it. Kang decided to waste his time by sitting on the steps because there was nothing he could do. On the other hand, the status window popped up all of a sudden and informed him that he had defeated the Vampire Lord and had been awarded a Mana Stone as a reward. It also informed him that he had reached level 35 and his necromancy had reached rank A. He had also received an artifact vampire sword as a first clear reward. But the vampire sword was disqualified because it was a violation of the world's rules. It has been decided that he should receive a scythe melting poison as an alternative award, in addition to the new reward that will be automatically assigned. Kang, however, chose to disregard the message and instead questioned whether or not Quack Wusan was a monster. He also pondered the identities of the other members of the blood sect. On the other hand, the cloudiness is beginning to lift. Because of this, Jinu has given the orders to all of the members of the faction to locate their future clan head and protect him. They were yelling in order to get the attention of their future clan leader, and to inform him that the Red Cloud faction had completely fallen apart. And when they saw Shin Woon, they ran towards him, and when they saw that he was still alive, they all rejoiced and were happy that he was. On the other hand, Kang has to face them in order to concentrate on the present moment. He then announced that the combat was finished and they had won, and he raised his sword in celebration. The victory in the war brought joy to Jinu, as well as to Nodi and the rest of the members of their faction. Meanwhile, several lights were gathered in a room and it seemed like they were conducting a meeting. One of the lights was annoying because it was the time for their monthly meeting and he seemed bored with their routine. Other lights address him as Commander T and scold him to watch his mouth because the meeting was part of the plan of their demon god. But the commander seems to lose his temper because he was also scolded by the other light which is Commander Jin. T threatens Jin if he speaks again to him with his tone he will snap his neck. Both of them keep yelling at each other. That's why one of the lights interrupts them and tells them to calm down since they are in the demon god's castle. So they started the monthly meeting and said that they should be able to completely overwhelm it within three months. One of the lights has mentioned that there is a slight issue with him. He reveals that an accident occurred in Jejong and the infiltration team that he had stationed there has been wiped out as a result of the event. Everyone is under the impression that the uprising was nothing more than an everyday occurrence, despite the fact that the sorcerers were called in to investigate. After inspecting the infiltration spot where the infiltration squad was eliminated, it appears that the adversary makes use of a powerful thunder bomb. There was a man from the Beacon clan by the name of Yun Shin Woon who was responsible for the deaths of one vice shaman and one squad of blood of Asuras. Other lights were furious and claimed that they had been humiliated by faceless cowards and that it was possible that one of the eight leaders will be changed in the near future. According to the opinions of others around us, Commander T will be able to repair the damage. In addition to this, they stated that Commander T was obligated to handle the situation with extreme prudence until the appropriate time of the sect which must be kept secret. I got it. Utter Commander T. They end their monthly meeting but Commander T seems curious about Shin Woon and swear that he will kill him and tear him to shreds. A gathering of happy people was taking place in a bar a few days after Shin Woon had finished dealing with Quack Ju San, and it appeared as though they couldn't wait for their drinks to be brought to them. They were talking about the fight that had just taken place between Shin Woon and Quack. A person described as having short black hair stated that a structure belonging to the Beacon clan had entirely fallen. It appeared as though the second young master, Quack Ju San, and the other members of the Red Cloud faction had vanished entirely. The rumor was confirmed by a second individual who had long hair pulled back into a ponytail. Another individual who had long black hair indicated that the war was an internal fight, and that it all started when the three faction leaders of the Beacon clan, Do Jinu, No Diyum, and Mo Ti Gil endorsed Yu Shin Woon as the next clan leader. But the second young master, Jin Sang, and his supporter, Quack Ju San, accepted it, and they staged an ambush when everyone else was unprepared for it. As a consequence, numerous members, including Mo Ti Gil, were taken out and executed. However, there was only one person who was able to escape the assault unharmed. After that, he inquired his companion who it was then revealed that it was none other than the incompetent first young master Yu Shin Woon. He also stated that the young master displayed his latent potential in martial arts, that thunder struck with every swing of his sword, and that he was given the twelve swords of the thunder cloud, which were the martial arts of the first clan chief. The individual with the ponytail had a hard time accepting the fact that what he had heard was accurate. 
The person with the long hair also added that when Quack was cornered and met his death at the hands of the violent thunder bomb buried in the Red Cloud Mansion, the first young master also locked up the second young master who is high on drugs, which means that he won't allow any more disorder to occur. On the other hand, the individual with short hair stated that such an ancient form of martial arts couldn't possibly be as incredible as it was made out to be, that it didn't make any sense to use the twelve sword of the thunder cloud, and that it appears the first master just showed up after the white beauty blade and the steel core blade had already been cleaned. In addition, the individual with short hair was oblivious to the fact that two security guards were standing behind him and overhearing all of his remarks. Because of this, the individual with the long hair chose not to make any humorous remarks about the initial young master. Moreover, the individual with the short hair continued talking and added that it would make more sense for Shin Woon to be referred to as the young fat phoenix rather than the young phoenix of the Beacon clan. After saying this, the individual laughed at his own joke. In addition to this, he stated that, according to what he had heard, the Beacon clan's internal troubles have been chaotic. None of the other members follow the first young master and as a result, the future of the Beacon clan may also be chaotic. When someone grabbed his shoulder, he was taken aback to discover that there were two security guards standing behind him. When they asked him if he was finished talking and encouraged him to come with them if he was, he was concerned that the two guards may overhear everything that he said. Afterwards, the person with short hair was given a beating by the two guards because they believed that they were interfering in the business of others and conversing with others behind their backs. He was groveling on the ground, shivering with panic, and pleading with the guards to spare his life while blood trickled down his nose. If he continues to mess around with his tongue, one of the guards warns that he will put him in danger of losing his life. The individual abruptly bowed to the two guards that he would never do that again. Then, without warning, he dashes away before the two guards can reconsider their decision. On the other hand, the guards were having a talk about the rumor that was circulating, which stated that the H. Wang Rock Clan had been spreading false stories about their region. And it wasn't just the H. Wang Rock Clan. Other small and medium-sized merchant groupings, as well as the Kowloon Group, have also been exhibiting some very weird behavior. People were interested in learning more about their strategy, but at the moment they are only working on the commission they have already accepted, so they are unable to take on any more customers. It makes no difference to the two guards what other people think of them, and their faith is greater than it has ever been. When they considered how their Beacon clan will develop in the future, their hearts began to shake. Meanwhile, Sam was standing just outside the door of the room of his young master. After wishing him a good night's sleep, he exited the residence. As Sam continued on his way out, he reflected on his young master, who had recently taken over as the new owner of the Thundercloud house, the residence of the clan leader. It's finally quiet now that everyone in the family has agreed that the young master should take over as the future head of the clan. On the other hand, because it had been five days since the tragedy, he was concerned about his young master. Because he was so interested in finding out what his young master was preparing, he didn't get any sleep at all. On the other hand, it looks like Kang is meditating inside of his room. He stated that he had finally removed their suspicions and recalled all of their spies, which was quite appropriate for a blood sect, and it was fortunate that he responded so promptly. As soon as he finished dealing with Quack Ju San, he started telling every member of the clan an entirely different version about the uprising of the Red Cloud faction, its repression, and Quack Jusan's violent end. There is only one reason this was done despite the enormous amount of mana it took, and that is because he possesses a skill called memory manipulation. Those individuals lack the mental capacity to comprehend the true nature of the blood sect. During the fight with Quack Jusan, Kang gained new insight into the level of insanity and bloodshed that pervaded the blood sect. Nobody in the clan would have been able to stay alive if their identities had been disclosed. However, he was able to buy himself some time by ensuring that even in the event that the blood sect requires someone to target, the focus will be on him rather than the clan. Summon cancel, utter Kang. Afterwards, Kang sent forth his shadow whisper, and it landed in an unexpected fashion on his feet. It would have been challenging to observe in real time if he did not have a shadow whisper at his disposal. It was impossible since all 200 members of the clan had a summon of five days, even if his mana was full, and at his fourth circle, yet, it would have been conceivable for him to have the mana stone of the vampire lord. It was an ore that had been removed from the heart of a monster, and it has a substantial quantity of mana. The rank of the mana stone depends on the rank of the monster that the ore came from. Kang closes his eyes and lets out a force. He has no idea why a monster's mana stone emerged from Quack Ju San, but he finds this to be a relief. If the Blood Cult is a covert organization, then they will never expose themselves by assaulting in the open. 
Therefore, he needs to work on getting stronger till such time as it arrives. He sneaks a peek inside his room before giving instructions to his two skeleton knights to keep his door locked at all times. After that, he activated what he called his pocket dimension. It was a void that had been created in the fissures between dimensions, and the caster could only bring inanimate objects there with them. However, Kang begins with the weapon that was recently gotten, and it was a scythe of melting poison. This is a mythological item that was utilized by sages who have powers that are above normal human comprehension. One of the treasures, if the user does not have the body of a sage and the energy of a sage, then they should not dare to use the power that is within. In addition, Kang takes hold of the scythe of the melting poison, which is heavier than he had anticipated but still manages to fit comfortably in his hands. It was unusual because it was a weapon he was using for the first time, yet he feels like they've been together for a long time. He slashes it suddenly through the air to test it, but he felt strange. He paused and pondered that the phrase leading sage might relate to the owner of the item or the person who created it, and that the phrase authority might be referring to an additional talent that was included within the treasure. And with regard to the unreleased, he ponders what it is that he needs to do in order to free it, or whether he ought to give the Yin Mana Kai of the Eastern Shining Sage and the Kai of the Thundercloud a combined shot instead, then let go of force and assign it to the scythe. But as he was doing it, he was taken aback by the fact that the scythe's emotion that was being sent to him was anger. However, Kang stopped sending his Kai to the scythe because it was a superior grade item with a personality, an ego weapon has to obtain. Since the weapon selects its owner, it was something that can't be obtained even with the skills or money. On the other hand, the hologram appear and notifies him that he failed to use the treasure because he has no natural power in his body and the natural power must be replenished. Kang suddenly felt confused regarding the natural power that the hologram stated so he asked the status window to show his martial status. The hologram stated that most sage bodies are born naturally but there are cases where people obtain a sage body as a result of bone grinding effort. Furthermore, Kang thought that it looks like the treasure uses natural power and he can't even use his ego weapon after obtaining it. He asks himself how he can obtain the natural power that was required to use the treasure. He has no other choice but to bring back the treasure on the pocket dimension because he can't even release the sword Kai since the treasure rejected its Kai that is why he can't use the scythe as a weapon right now. However, he needs to strengthen his actual combat strength. He suddenly turns to the pocket dimension so that he can finally take those guys out. Come forth, utter Kang. Then numerous people came out of the pocket dimension and released a power on his hand. There are 20 skeletons of Zenith Intermediate rank, and their combined strength is comparable to that of the majority of medium-sized martial clans from Kang's pocket dimension. And the lone skeleton that stood in front of Kang was constructed out of Ha Jiam. He began to question whether or not he was actually a mage because the summon had the statistics of a frost mage, but the man's strength and agility were off the charts. However, all of the martial arts that the skeleton has mastered are demonic arts, which means that he is unable to utilize them right away. If it was discovered that he was working with subordinates who practiced demonic arts, then everyone would rush forward to kill him. In addition, turning that guy into a skeleton would be an extremely inefficient use of resources, and if the system had recognized him as that thing, then he would have undoubtedly been returned to his pocket dimension. Kang believes that he has completed everything that has to be completed, and that the time has come for him to put the most crucial thing into action, after which he will grab a pillow and lay down on his bed. Information is the single most critical resource that he needs in order to successfully defend himself and defeat his foe, but he does not have any information about the blood sect, a recollection for which he has no idea how he will search, and in which he was unable to hear the most crucial section as if it had been muffled. On the other hand, the hologram materialized and made a statement regarding the mental image projection. It had a rank of a plus, and after using it, the caster had the ability to recover from the harm caused by mental type skills. Additionally, it required a portion of the caster's soul to be separated before it could be used. Kang, on the other hand, closes his eyes as he prepares to employ the previously obtained skill for the first time. Afterwards, his spirit abruptly separated from his body, and he was victorious as a result. But he has a foreboding feeling, as if he were entering a place from which he will never emerge again. However, if he is unable to rid himself of the terror that he experienced, then he will instead be consumed by it. Therefore, he makes a swift descent and enters Shin Wun's body. He screams out in anguish as he enters, and he has the sensation that his skull is going to explode. He was aware of it. It turned out that the owner of the body had certain issues. When he fell into a spot, 
he was perplexed, and he was even more surprised when his foot stepped on the water, and he saw his own image as Kang Tier rather than as Shin Woon. He questioned why he was being reflected, as well as whether or not it was him before he passed away. In addition, his reflection in the water evaporated all of a sudden, and it was replaced with a memory of himself when he was much younger. He had no one to talk to because both of his parents had been killed by monsters when he was little. Because he had no family from the time he was born, he spent his childhood moving about from one orphanage to another. After that, he became acquainted with Park Hayek Jun, who, together with other abandoned youngsters, was the one who raised all of them. However, the worst incident that occurred was when Park fought with a monster in an attempt to save him, and as a result, Park lost his life. As he makes his escape, he makes a solemn oath to himself that he will exact vengeance upon those monstrous individuals. After that, he met Yo Jaju and persuaded him to sign up for Griffin's guild due to the fact that he was the immortal king. Yo assures him that he will assist him in identifying the person responsible for the incident at the orphanage, and will also assist him in exacting his vengeance. And because of Kang's grudge, Yo has a secret plan. He can easily gain the item that he's been seeking for by using Kang's skill. But Yo didn't know that Kang already possesses the thing that he's been looking for. However, when someone unexpectedly asked Kang if the world belonged to him, he was taken aback. When he turned around, he saw Shin Woon and broke into a broad grin because at long last, they finally met one another. And prior to this meeting, Kang had the impression that it would be disorderly for another person to exist in his mental worlds. And because only his own soul is capable of taking on a reasonable shape in the mental world, Shin Woon has been hiding all this time and is only appearing now to retake his body. If this is indeed the case, then he needs to make himself ready for battle. It would appear that Shin Woon is able to read his thoughts because he reassures Kang that he does not intend to injure him and tells him not to worry about it. Instead, Shin Woon's only desire was to be of assistance to him. He had no other wishes or desires. Furthermore, Kang came to the conclusion that Shin Woon was likely not antagonistic since he could unequivocally sense Shin Woon's sincerity being communicated directly to him. It is an effect brought about by the union of the souls of two different people in one physical body. On the other hand, Shin Woon stated that he will deliver something that couldn't possibly have been sought after. Suddenly, the space between them was divided in half, and they moved into the new space that was created. They proceed inside till Kang spots something in the room. When he looked at the picture of Shin Woon, he realized that it was a memory of the day that he woke up inside Shin Woon's body. The other side is, he couldn't continue his sentence when Shin Woon intervened and said that the day of his funeral, the world's timeline split into two paths. Something caused the world to remain the same but now two different paths have been created. But Kang interrupted Shin Woon and said that he thought he knew what it was, the nameless stone that he possessed. So there exists a timeline where he woke up in Shin Woon's body and one where he didn't. After Shin Woon saw the nameless stone, the latter let out a sigh. In addition, if Kang believed that the future he saw was the recollections of other people's experiences that Shin Woon had been through, then his goal is now crystal clear. When he was on the verge of entering a portal, Shin Woon warned him that he will regret everything and that he may spend the rest of his life in anguish because he was consumed with terror the way he felt at that moment. Try devouring me if they can. Utter Kang then enters the portal and leaves a warm smile at Shin Woon. Afterwards, he walked and fell in Shin Woon's body the time when he was mummified and Quack was sitting next to him. The time when Quack told Shin Woon that the matter was a trash before he died and got buried and who would have thought that Shin Woon will become an exceptional talent after taking him out of his coffin. Afterwards, it was a success because Kang can finally see and hear everything when he enters the memories of Shin Woon. Kang succeeded in entering Shin Woon's memory since he felt his senses and thoughts but he couldn't control Shin Woon's body yet who now felt shaking in fear in Quack's presence. The latter shook the bell in his hand and Shin Woon's body abruptly got up as a reaction. On the other hand, Kang thought that it's like Jiangxi's that Quack was commanding. But it's different from those things because his senses were present and he was in a state where he was able to think by himself while inside Shin Woon's body. He looked at his hand and saw akin to the complete resurrection of a corpse. But before his thoughts go further, Quack commands the body of Shin Woon to sleep and his eyes automatically shut. Kang could hear people shouting around him when Shin Woon's corpse eventually came to, and he was holding a sword at the time. A guy stood in front of him and begged for his child's life. Shin Woon was forced to execute the order to kill the guy in front of him that was given to him by Quack, despite the fact that Shin Woon did not wish to carry it out. Shin Woon was pleading with the people to go away from him so that he could not hurt them, but since he was strong and powerful and the people were not, he ended up killing them. When Shin Woon looked at his sword and saw those people laying on the ground lifeless, 
he felt an overwhelming sense of terror. Quack approaches him and rings the bell that he had been holding the entire time in order to maintain control over Shin Woon. He then laughs and tells Shin Woon that he will be the recipient of the resentment of all living creatures and will drink more blood from the innocents. Your strength shall grow endlessly the more you do. He added, on the other hand, Shin Woon desperately tried to stop himself from using the sword to pierce his neck, but his body refused to comply with his desire and continued to move on with the action. Instead, he became more powerful as he bled more blood, which ultimately led to the deaths of a great number of additional individuals. The bodies of the surviving Jiangxi were able to assimilate the slain Jiangxi's abilities and become stronger as a result. The horrible demon that was responsible for an infinite massacre, which had never been seen before in the annals of the world of martial arts. Shin Woon was given the nickname White Eye Blood Demon by his tormentors. Furthermore, after one year, the Beacon clan has already surpassed Jejong and is at the top as a strong force. Jejong was previously the dominant clan in the region. On the other hand, Quack and the corpse of Shin Woon were having a meeting with an old man. The old man asked Quack if Shin Woon on his front was the living Jiangxi since he found it impossible to accept that someone with not even a trace of talent in martial arts could become the most lethal assassin in the sect. In response to this, Quack stated that the living Jiangxi has only been completed once in the long and extensive history of the sect, which is the reason that Shin Woon's strength is unparalleled. The old man remarked that Shin Woon's stare radiated the same level of superiority as it had before he became a servant of the religion. The elderly man inquired of Quack whether he was certain that there would be no difficulty in exercising control over Shin Woon. In response, Quack reassured the old man not to be worried about Shin Woon because his yin spirit suppression had entirely nullified the threat posed by Shin Woon. After that, Quack and the old man alter the topic of their talk to focus on how the union has become increasingly corrupt. With the exception of Mount Hua and Wudang, the majority of people have given their approval. On the other hand, Kang was still Shin Woon's body, and he wanted to bring as many of his senses to the fore as he possibly could and it is necessary for him to learn as much as he can about the blood sect. However, this is not an easy task because Shin Woon's spirit has been entirely damaged, and it is filled with vengeance. As a result of this, he must also avoid his tormented mind. It's been close to two years since Kang first appeared in Shin Woon's memory, but he still doesn't know how much longer he has to watch. He just is unable to continue to put up with what he's witnessed. Shin Woon was capable of setting an entire village ablaze. He ignored the people who were being slain and begging for their lives. And once he killed them, he would steal the energy of the dead. As he devours his dead victim, the living Jiangxi evolves as well. Kang had never experienced that particular kind of energy before, and it has the impression of being the natural power that encompasses both humanity and the world. When Kang recognized that it was a natural power, he had a startling flashback to the fact that Shin Woon already possessed the energy that was necessary to use the treasure. However, Shin Woon's captor, Quack, wields an unknown power over him, and if Shin Woon can get a handle on that power, he will be able to liberate himself from Quack's shackles and be able to act in accordance with his own will. Up until then, he must conceal himself impeccably and watch for the appropriate moment to strike. Shin Wu is sorry for everyone who has lost their life as a result of his actions. He will never stop repenting for his fault, even after he has passed away. Nevertheless, one thing is certain, Shin Woon will get revenge on everyone who has died as a result of his actions. In addition, Shin Woon was finally able to break free from the confinement and recover control over his body by relying on the power of nature after he had to persevere through three stark winters. But the great will of the Asura blood sect had already come to pass, and the warriors of the blood sect massacred everyone in cold blood, regardless of whether they were martial artists or simple people. Even though the situation was really dire, no one stepped up to fight for the individuals because they had already been dead. On the other hand, there appeared to be a large number of individuals bowing down in preparation for the eight commanders to accept the hierophany of the demon deity. Then the leader was disguised as a demonic creature with a pointed horn by the mask he wore. Watching the landscape be transformed by the flames was a breathtaking experience for him. This isn't the moment where our aspirations have become a reality, utter the leader. The leader also made an announcement to his people, saying that the parts of the world that had not been baptized by the demon god are now cleansed, and that the rest of the world will be set free. The recipient of the people's applause was the leader, Shin Woon, who was also present, had a serious expression on his face as he scrutinized the leader. He grips his blade firmly before bolting forward in an attempt to catch up to the leader. When other people who were hiding their identities saw him, they were perplexed by the quick movements he made. Everyone was taken aback as Shin Woon walked right past them without even stopping. 
On the other hand, the leader noticed Shin Woon who was carrying his sword and ready to strike him. Shin Woon was surprised because even if he used all his strength when he attacked the leader, the leader still caught his sword and cut it off. That's why he lost his tight grip on his sword. Afterward, he bent his body, swayed his arms, and was about to release a massive force. But the leader sliced his arms and strangled his neck. He was now trembling in fear when the leader lifted him. The commander said that he was fascinating, describing him as a living Jiangxi who had emancipated himself from his confines. The leader is unaware that this is even possible. Although Shin Wun breaks a small piece of the mask, it's not enough to reveal the identity of the leader. And the leader said that regardless of how hard a simple bug may try, it will never be able to rise above the status of a lowly creature that is incapable of even ripping off a mask. Kang, who saw and heard everything, said that the leader was the final enemy. Just wait. He added, lowly animals, now become sacrifice. Utter leader then pierced his own arm on Shin Wun's body. On the other hand, near the portal, Shin Woon waited calmly and patiently for Kang to arrive. After then, the portal opened up and released Kang, who appears to have been seething with wrath. Shin Woon was at a loss for words because it was possible that Kang already knew what had occurred to him. Kang was crouching low to the ground and bowed his head as he tightened his grip on his fist. He stated that regarding the clan, the youngest lady that's been reported missing, the nested lake blood group one year later, and then two years after. He is unable to proceed with his sentence because he is enraged, and when he looked up, his expression was filled with venomous animosity at the blood sect. A group of extremists known as the blood sect has set their sights on bringing about Armageddon in the name of bringing about purity. Kang Tia was blown away by their overwhelming strength and close camaraderie, which far above his expectations. The transcendent body art of Yu Shin Wun, which could fold space and charge forward. Combined with the overwhelming demonic Kai and natural force instilled in his blade brought it to the level of and ascended. But no, perhaps it even exceeded the abyss. It was difficult to think that an ordinary Jiangxi could have acquired such a degree of power as he had accomplished. Xin Wun was unable to even make a dent in the blood sect leader's defenses despite having so much strength at his disposal. In addition, the head of the blood sect did not even use 30% of his power in those dying minutes due to the fact that the blood sect had possessed an unparalleled degree of power. On the other hand, Kang believed that if it had been him in his former existence, he would have lost without a doubt, and that Shin Wun, in his current incarnation as living Jiangxi, was almost as powerful as he had been in his previous life. All the leader of the blood sect was an entirely different person. He was neither a monster nor a human, but rather a being that transcended both of these categories. However, Shin Wun gives Kang the piece of advice that it is not embarrassing to give in to fear, and from that point forward, Kang should be thinking about how to keep himself safe. Moreover, Kang's brow furrowed in confusion as he listened to the word fear because he considered it to be meaningless drivel. Shin Wun was told that he was not someone who would submit and that if it was fear, then he would make the blood sect leader dread him. He did this while grinning broadly across his face. However, it is possible that at that time he is not as powerful as he was in his former life. However, five years is enough time for him to grow more powerful than the leader of the blood sect. Even though he was not flawless, he will be able to interfere with those blood sects because he knows what is going to happen in the next five years. It may not be ideal, but he was not perfect either. If he guarantees that the people the blood sect sacrifice will not be harmed in any way, and that they will remain together, then it should be possible to carry out his plan. On the other hand, Shin Wun was overjoyed by what Kang stated, and it appears like Kang would carry out his intention to get revenge, which was something he failed to achieve while he was still a Jiangxi. He reached out and placed his hand on Kang's shoulder, saying that he felt his previously still heart begins to beat again and that he wanted to place his hope in Kang. In addition to that, he declared that he would stake everything on him. Take good care of me, my friend, he added. In addition, Kang was perplexed, and then he was taken aback as the body of Shin Wun released the light, and the latter was attempting to share the last remaining portions of his soul with Kang. The guilt that Shin Wun felt toward the individuals who died as a result of his sword, the pain that he felt for his father, who had been poisoned by his younger brother, and the fury that he felt at not being able to exact revenge were all intertwined. Kang lowered his head and closed his eyes as he took in all Shin Wun's mind and feelings. Now, you can rest easy, utter Kang. Afterwards, Kang suddenly awakened after entering the memory of Shin Wun and his whole face was full of sweat. The hologram appeared and stated that the unity of soul had been achieved and he met the hidden requirement. His reward was his martial body, the sage natural body has evolved, the heaven-defying martial body, and the small amount of natural power has been obtained. 
His hidden quest that he has to obtain is one chases chaos and a new title chaos pursuer. However, no matter how thoroughly Kang went through his past, he could not shake the feeling that this was the very first time he had been given a chaos chase. As he continues his pursuit of the blood sect, he believes that the situation will eventually resolve itself on its own. The very first thing that he needs to do is start considering whether or not the Beacon clan ought to be freed from the blood sect's aim which he misjudged in the first place, because it would appear that the entire Beacon clan is on the blood sex list of people to be eradicated. But he will never allow something like that to take place. Afterwards, as he steps outside his home, he is still thinking about the blood sects, and the thought is like a poison that has been steadily working its way through him for a very long time. And at this time, the blood sect has spread throughout the Order sect, the Chaos sect, and the Demonic sect because each of the eight commanders has established a foothold in one of the eight great powers. They are now in a position to exert their influence over the activities of each of the factions. Because he did not even know where the leader of the blood cult was located, he had to pay very close attention to any actions made by the leader. As he contemplated Commander T, he deduced the name of Quack Jusan's superior officer. Even a martial artist with ties to Zhejiang is likely to have heard of him because of his prominence in the region. A man who has commanded Zhejiang for several decades, one who is a member of the Chaos Sect and controls the nightlife in Hangzhou. Yom Chen Siok, also known as the Black Heaven Tyrant, was the man in charge of the Kowloon faction. A person who has been influential in Zhejiang for more than 20 years despite holding no official position. Afterwards, while he was pouring tea into his cup, he was thinking that on the other hand, it was for the best because it meant that he didn't have to drive very far beyond the region to get rid of Yom. But he can't do it right now since it won't take place until everyone in the Beacon clan, including himself, grows stronger. Therefore, the first thing he ought to do is, he can't continue his sentence when Sam interrupts him because there appears to be a significant issue. The previous day, No Gun Ho and the others were traveling, and they all appeared to be exhausted. He reasoned that it seemed as though they will come in six hours, and that they will have to finish it as quickly as possible because everyone was exhausted from the continuous commissions. Following the carnage that was initiated by the Red Cloud group, the absence of commission for their clan has too great of an effect at this point. There are a number of other commission clans that are also interested in their business, and the scenario that they are in right now is chaotic. However, their young lord remains shut up in his chamber the entire time. On the other hand, an elderly man who was traveling in a carriage caught Gun Ho's attention and informed him that the time was growing late, and that they needed to find a place to rest in that area before continuing their journey early the next morning. The elderly guy was abruptly embraced by his son, who informed him that he felt uneasy. Afterwards, everyone worked together to construct a tent for them to relax in. Gun Ho was approached by a young girl dressed in pink who had her hair in a ponytail and offered her food. In answer, Gun Ho reassured the young girl that he was good and instructed her to hand out the food to the other people in the group first. But since he has to know the name of the small girl, she introduces herself as So Yon and says that she worked on the Gathering Cloud Library. In addition, the old man gives Gun Ho two thumbs up and tells So Yon that she is far better than any random male worker because her personality is so bouncy that not even guards or carry can stand to be around her. Given that the elderly guy insisted that she remain seated in the carriage during the duration of the commission, she shouldn't be experiencing any discomfort. It's crazy to think that they have to seek assistance from a little girl who has a leg injury just because they don't have enough people. Afterwards, Gun Ho became aware that something was approaching, and because it was possible that it was an invader, he issued the order to Elder Bang to evacuate everyone. This is the campsite of the Beacon clan. Show yourselves if you have any business, yells of Gun-O. On the other hand, a man mounted on a horse with his troops following after him progressively got closer and closer to the group of Gun-O. The man remarked that it was only a coincidence and inquired as to whether or not Gun-O was familiar with him. He belonged to the H. Wang Rock clan and was an heir to the family. His name was Duak Chil. As soon as Gun-O realized it was Ak Chin, he gave a curt and respectful bow to show his respect. But keep in mind that Ak Chil is a person who is notorious for being harsh and filled with envy. Rumor has it that people instinctively know to steer clear of him. He inquires about Ak Chil's plans for the evening and finds out what they are. On the other hand, the servant of Ak Chil replied somewhat quickly that their rationale was the same as theirs. In addition, Gunno advised them to proceed with their journey since, as he glanced about, he noticed that there were many locations that might be utilized as rest stops. But Ak Chil and his servant look at each other, grin and then turn to Gunno and ask if there is a need to purposefully go far. 
As a direct result of this, Gunno suddenly clenched his teeth and furrowed his brow because it appeared that the H. Wang Rock clan desired to share the location with them. When Ak Chil told Gunno and his men that they were also planned on making the Olive as their resting place, Gunno and his men were all shocked. Ak Chil then smiled at them as if he was plotting something. Gun Ho grew serious and asked Ak Chil if it truly made any sense for them to take the spot as their resting place when Ak Chil mentioned that they intend to use the site as their resting place. Gun Ho is being yelled at by the servant of Ak Chil who has become enraged because he used an impolite tone when speaking against the vice leader of the H. Wang Rock clan. However, Gun Ho immediately yelled at the servant, and the two of them were determined not to lose with their opinion. But Ak Chil, who was gazing carefully at Gun Ho, formed the opinion that the latter was excessively arrogant, and that Gun Ho's arrogance enriched the heavens. Why did I say something I shouldn't have? Utter Ak Chil. On the other hand, the old man was hurrying towards them and gave off the impression that he was concerned that their conversation may escalate into a fight. When he was at the front, he presented himself in a brisk manner as Jiang Di Chu, a representative of the Huijin Merchant Association. Aki Chil said to him that he seemed familiar. Jiang responded that yes, they had already met before when Ak Chil inquired about the two of them having previous encounters together. In addition, Gun Ho was under the impression that he had heard that Ak Chil was the leader of a faction that attempted to steal the commissions from the Beacon clan. However, the latter seek Jiang's thought if they intend to stop in the same spot as the Beacon clan given that their horse is so tired that it can hardly move as a result of the long commission they have been on. Jang was undecided about which of Ak Chil and Gun Ho he should support because he was afraid that if he supported either of them, it would lead to conflict. Ak Chil was the most aggressive of the two while Gun Ho was a compassionate and easygoing individual. He stated that, to the best of his knowledge, it is unheard of for a commission group to use the same camping location. Afterwards, Jang's characterization of Ak Chil and his companions as those ruffians who would ambush people infuriated Ak Chil to no end. Then Ak Chil unleashes a force in the direction of Jang, and the latter is able to sense the power. As a result, he is terrified and in excruciating pain. But all of a sudden, Gun Ho put his hand on Jang's back and released the same energy to assist him in reducing the pain that he was experiencing, and Jang was extremely appreciative of Gun Ho. The latter was angry at Ak Chil because he had used his inner Kai on a citizen who was not trained in martial arts. On the other hand, Jang's decision to let them share the campsite and his question to Gunno about whether or not there will be a problem if they do so appear to have satisfied Ak Chil's needs. When Gunho responds that there is no issue, he will assume that is permission to proceed and will then go to fetch some members from their campsite. In addition, Gunho issued orders to everyone that they should return to their camp, with the exception of the individuals who were assigned to the night watch. He took a sudden look at Ak Chil and had the impression that the two of them were clearly plotting something. So he went to his subordinate and told him to select the horse with the quickest speed and proceed directly to the clan without stopping for a break. Notify their clan leader that there is a potential for a clash with the H. Wang Rock clan and make a request for more support as soon as he can. The subordinate then suddenly bolts out to grab a horse so that he can go seek assistance from the leader of their clan. Gun Ho believed that the subordinate should be able to reach the clan within four hours if he moved without resting, and if the backup departed immediately, then it would be another four hours, making the total time required to reach the clan eight hours. It is a period that is neither short nor long since he should be able to handle even an unforeseen circumstance if his father and the member of the faction arrived during this time but he was keeping his fingers crossed that his ideas were nothing more than needless worry. There has been a total of six hours since then, when someone finally yelled in the dead of night. It was Ak Chil who initially accused So Yon of being a thief in the situation. Because Gung Ho heard it, they ran rapidly toward them while asking Ak Chil what he was doing for holding his blade in front of a youngster. After seeing Gung Ho, Ak Chil put his sword to So Yon's neck and asked the Beacon clan how they controlled their servants. And because Gung Ho had already arrived, Ak Chil once again questioned the girl about where the ice jade was hidden. Even though So Yon was shaking with fear, she nevertheless responded to Ak Chil that she did not know what ice jade is and that she did not know anything else while her tears were threatening to fall down her cheeks. Suddenly, though, Ak Chil shouts at her, claiming that her shamelessness has no boundaries and that she continues to act foolish. Because Gung Ho was irritated, he cut Ak Chil off and told him not to prosecute some child and to explain the facts in detail instead. The vice clan leader suddenly kneels on the ground so that he and So Yon were equal in height and tells them that the azure threaded ice jade had vanished from their wagon, and then suddenly So Yon arrived from their camp's woodland. He also told the small girl that it was evident that she had taken the opportunity to steal the ice jade while it was dark and then quietly buried it in the forest. 
On the other hand, despite the fact that she was trembling in dread, so Yeon claimed that she is unable to sleep, which is why she went to collect some flowers that she had seen the day before on a road leading there. Jang interjected himself and added that it must be some sort of misunderstanding because So Yeon is not the age of a child who would steal with items that belong to other people. Gung Ho also cautioned Act Child to avoid becoming unreasonable in situations when there is insufficient evidence. Even though he was trembling with rage and had a strong grip on his sword, they needed to speak to the youngster, so Ak Chil needed to sheath his sword and hand over the girl. But Ak Chil opposed Gun Ho and warned him that he can't do that and as Si Yeon just confessed, it's a fact that she entered the woodland at dawn. His servant suggests that they immediately question the girl by bringing her back to their clan and questioning her there. The young girl who was still clutching onto Ak Chin appeared to be in a state of panic as she turned to Gun Ho and pleaded with him to save her by claiming that she hadn't stolen anything. Gung Ho gritted his teeth in frustration since he was at a loss for what to do given the fact that the backup party wouldn't come for another two hours. Ak Chil goes so far as to threaten them by saying that if they do not pay back the cost of the stolen ice jade, Gun Ho will be obligated to deliver over So Yeon to them, and if that does not happen, they will be subjected to the sight of blood. The poor little girl was desperately attempting to free herself from the strong hold that Ak Chil had on her but she was unable to do so. Afterwards, someone struck Ak Chil in the arm with a stone, which is why he was unable to maintain his firm grip on the little girl, and his sword fell on the ground. Aki Chil's servant immediately asked him if he was okay. After Si Yon unexpectedly collapsed to the ground, she focused her attention in the direction that the stone had originated from and was elated to see a person she recognized there. On the other hand, Gun Ho and his comrades shifted their attention to the direction from where the stone originated, although they were unsure of who the person was. It was their clan leader Shin Woon, and the latter heard the thoughts of the subordinates saying that their clan leader arrived, and some of them said that it was over because their clan leader was already there when he walked and passed by them. However, Gun Ho couldn't help but wonder how their clan had managed to get there so quickly, since he arrived at the encampment two hours earlier than Gun Ho had anticipated. It was impossible for him to do so unless the leader of their clan was a skilled practitioner of speed techniques. And he noticed the horse that their clan leader rides, and he didn't see any signs of exhaustion on the animal despite the fact that the horse ran without stopping for a break. However, he is unable to proceed with his thoughts since he was taken aback when the leader of the clan inquired as to how long he intended to mindlessly stare at his horse. As soon as he heard the clan leader, he rushed forward and immediately embraced So Yeon, who was trembling in fear. When their clan chief remarked that she must be afraid and informed her there's no need for her to worry because he had already arrived, the latter had teary eyes as well. On the other hand, when Ak Chil spotted Shin Woon, it caused him to become irritated while he was releasing force. He convinced himself that an idiot like Shin Woon, who was even more unattractive than he was, had managed to lose weight and even change the way he looked. He came to the conclusion that Shin Woon could not have eaten very well because he was so worried about becoming clan leader, which is not an appropriate role for him. Shin Woon is confronted by Ak Chil's servant, who asks him abruptly what he thinks he was doing when he injured their vice clan leader by sneaking around with a concealed weapon. Shin Woon, who was engaged in play and tossing a rock in his hand, inquired about the concealed weapon that the servant had indicated. In addition to that, he mentioned that a crazed dog was running around free, so he threw a rock at it to make it come to its senses. The H. Wang Rock clan observed the stone lying on the ground, and someone said that it's true, but, based on the way Ak Chil shouted, they believed that he had been stabbed by a knife. Therefore, Ak Chil bring back his sword from its sheath and proceeds to pay respect to Shin Woon and explain that his greetings are late owing to the chaotic situation that he is responsible for resolving as the vice clan chief of the H. Wang Rock clan. Do Ak Chil. But Shin Woon was not interested in his name, which is why Ak Chil remarked that they did not need to be furious. Nonetheless, if that is how Shin Woon is going to act, then there is no need for him to uphold etiquette. After that, he told them that So Yeon had stolen their treasure, and that they either had to pay them back for the item or they could hand over the girl. Shin Woon ignores him and turns to So Yeon and asks if she really stole their item but So Yeon says that she didn't steal anything from them. He grabs the girl to protect her and tells Ak Chil that the girl doesn't steal anything from them. But the vice clan leader still insisted that she steal the ice jade and it was absurd because Shin Woon took the word of a servant at face value instead of him. He even becomes enraged when Shin Woon calls him a bastard and he will listen to his clansmen instead of him. He gritted his teeth and furrows his brow. When he was about to say something, Shin Woon cut him off and said that regarding the azure-threaded ice jade he knew something about it. 
On the other hand, Akchil and his servant share a smirk as they try to figure out how the man could have known about the Jewel of the North Sea, which they have also only just discovered for the first time. In addition, Shin Woon informed them that the azure-threaded ice jade originates from a mythological creature that is indigenous to the frozen lake of the North Sea, and that it is the most exquisite jewel that can only be extracted from the azure-threaded clam. Shin Woon also said that the azure-threaded clam is the only source for the azure-threaded ice jade and there is no available information aside from its place of origin. It was something that every single member of the Commission clan laboriously achieved after a considerable amount of time had passed. However, it appears that Akchil did not believe him and that he was merely attempting to reduce the cost of the refund, which will not occur. As a direct consequence of this, Shin Woon goes to Jang in order to borrow the item that is on his waist. He then proceeded to demonstrate the bottle to the H. Wang Rock clan and explained that even the people who live in the North Sea might not be aware of the fact that the ice jade is smeared with a singular essence derived from the blue-threaded clam and that essence, when it comes into contact with alcohol, causes a peculiar event to take place. On the other side, Ak Chil was perplexed, so he inquired about the peculiar phenomenon that Shin Woon had mentioned. In addition, Shin Woon abruptly removed the cork from the bottle and continued, The essence, when it comes into contact with alcohol, creates a thick purple color. However, the essence naturally disappears after a day, and it can't be washed away. Shin Woon then explained that in order to determine whether or not So Yeon had touched the ice jade, all that needed to be done was to pour alcohol on her hand, which is exactly what he did. The H. Wang Rak clan sees So Yeon's hands, and she do not have any traces of the color purple on them. However, this caused Ak Chil to become upset, and he proceeded to tell Shin Woon that what was being said was rubbish, and that he had never heard of such a thing, which is why he lied. If they have nothing to feel guilty about, then why don't they pour some alcohol over their hands, especially the guy who has been wiping his hands on his pants like a madman. Then he pointed his finger at one of the servants of Ak Chil. Shin Woon put on a grin and insisted that it's true because it was just alcohol and not some kind of poison. All of the swordsmen from the Beacon clan are asking the H. Wang Rock clan to show them their hands so that they can spill some alcohol as evidence that they didn't create anything by putting the blame on their clan because none of them stole the ice jade. On the other hand, the terrified servant's voice was shaking as he tried to explain everything to his master act chill, but the latter suddenly brandished his sword and slashed it towards the helpless servant. The members of the Beacon clan were taken aback when they witnessed the Kichil taking the life of the servant. After that, the vice clan chief turned to the Beacon clan and said that there must have been a misunderstanding between them and that they will soon go since the day has become brighter. But he gritted his teeth, glanced at Shin Woon, and said that the latter will receive the payment for the disrespectful attitude towards him. However, he was taken aback when Shin Woon abruptly stood on his front and slashed his sword. As a consequence of this shock, he furrowed his forehead and at first failed to notice that his arm had thrown itself upward. Everyone was taken aback when he abruptly collapsed to the ground upon realizing that his arm had already been cut and was writhing in excruciating pain. In addition, Shin Woon apologized to Ak Chil for cutting his arm. Nevertheless, because he was rather eager, he will be accepting the payment up front rather than waiting for it. Because of his son's cut arm, Ak Chil's father caused such a commotion inside the H. Wang Rock clan that it seemed as though he was losing his mind. After the treatment was over, he gave the order for the medic to exit the room. He went by the name Du Jung Ak, and he served as the head of the H. Wang Rock clan. His son was lying on the bed and had bandages all over his upper body. He was yelling while asking his son why he needs to stir up trouble by doing something that he didn't even order him to do, and he was unaware that the entirety of Zhejiang is talking about the ice jade all because of him. Ak Chil was shaking with Fesser and asked his father about the significance of the jewel, which caused him to ask him why he was being cared for in such a manner while he was hurt. However, he was taken aback when his father revealed that the Kowloon group is the one who has been searching for the Ice Jade, and that the Kowloon group would never spare them if the problem had been any more significant. On the other hand, he explained to his father that Director Yong, the servant that he has with him, told him that he had a plan. On the other hand, Director Yong's face began to become covered in perspiration. He thought that he was just only worried that things would get worse, so he made numerous attempts from the beginning to stop Ak Chil but the latter seemed to place all of the blame on him. When the head clan asks him whether it was real, he has no choice but to bend to apologize and accept that it was true and that it was his fault. But all of a sudden Ak Chil looked at the director, and his eyes lit up as he realized that director Yang had taken the blame for him. Jung Ak instantly cursed as a result of their predicament due to the fact that he must find some way to win back the sex trust. 
he inquires with the director as to whether or not he will attack the Beacon clan with Act Chill's occurrence as an excuse. But the director is against his proposal because it would be difficult because the event was caused by a misunderstanding on their end. And if they started an all-out war, both the union and the government would step in to stop it. Don't bother with the eyes of the world and just get it done by any means necessary, exclaimed Jung Ak. Director Yang came to the conclusion that if they continue to coax them in the same arrogant manner that they have been doing up until this point while also carrying out other plots, the reputation of their commissioned clan will continue to deteriorate. But Jung Ak was against it because he believes their reputation is meaningless given that the world will only remember the triumph in the end. He went on to explain that if they were to become the most powerful commission clan in Zhejiang and had the backing of the Kowloon gang, then they would be able to reclaim their former glory and return their reputation to its former position. He has given instructions to Act Chill to wait patiently inside their home in silence till the world stops laughing at him and considers him a laughingstock. In addition, because his father had ordered him to do so, Act Chill gritted his teeth in wrath and even hurled insults at Shin Woon. He made a pact with himself that he would eliminate him in any way possible, even if it meant giving up everything he owned. On the other hand, when Nodi found out what had taken place, he exploded with rage. Even Jinu was irate, and he said that they should immediately dispatch someone to oppose the situation since they simply cannot allow it to continue. However, the leader of the clan intervened and stopped them, explaining that it was pointless to apologize to an adversary who had already lifted their blade against them. Kang gathered all of his loyal faction leaders and informed them that beginning that day, the utter destruction of the H. Wang Rock clan would be their Beacon clan's top objective. And from that day forward, he wants them to just focus on how they are going to make up for the shame they have been put through. His remarks astonished Jin Wu as well as No D and Gun Ho, but they understood what he was trying to say, and they will comply with the command given by their clan leader. Kang then turns to Jin Wu and gives him instructions to temporarily absolve So Yeon of all of her responsibilities and to provide her with an own room so that she can call herself down. Afterwards, when the leader of their clan called for Gun Ho by name, he understood it was in reference to the incident that occurred with Act Chill, so Gun Ho quickly lowered his face. In addition to that, he expressed his regret that even though their customer had granted permission to share the same campsite with an adversary, which is unacceptable behavior. But he was taken aback when the leader of their clan asked him whether he was worried about a potential conflict that may have occurred that would have caused even more damage to the precarious circumstances the clan was already in at the time. Gung Ho was going to say anything, but their clan leader cut him off and said that from that point forward, every action taken by a clan member would be the duty of their clan leader, and that Gung Ho must cease his unnecessary concern and act confidently before anyone else. In addition, Gung Ho's eyes widened in astonishment when their clan head appeared to be complimenting him for believing in a clan member till the very end. However, the clan leader also said that if he traded Si Yon for the protection of the others, he would never be forgiven for his actions. And because of their leader's message, Gun Ho suddenly bowed down on the ground and took an oath, swearing that he would profoundly sear their clan leader's word of counsel into his heart. Kang and Nodi both give him their attention, and Nodi's expression conveys a sense of immense pride for his kid. On the other hand, Shin Woon is questioned by a third party over his extensive knowledge of the Ice Jade and how he acquired it. In answer, Kang revealed that he was fortunate since he had earlier read a passage from a section in their Gathering Cloud collection that accidentally referred to the Ice Jade. However, this was a falsehood due to the fact that it all relates to the original Shin Woon's recollections as a living Jiangxi, and Quack Ju San had attempted to get the Ice Jade on numerous occasions. However, he thought that he did not know which of those people were agents from the Kowloon Gang. Fortunately, they approached them first and exposed their identities, but he did not know which of those people were agents. If he had so desired, he might have swept them all by himself, yet, doing so would have drawn the attention of the blood sect to them. Therefore, it is necessary for him to put an end to that conflict as a battle between the two clans. In addition to this, he addresses his inquiry to their head treasurer, Gok, and inquires about the status of their commissions as well as the amount of money that is still available. As a response, the head treasurer Gok said that the periodic commission had been terminated, and the commission they had was being taken away, which resulted in their money decreasing at a quick speed. At this rate, their funds would only be able to endure for three months, at the very most four months. Nodi and his son were both at a loss for words, while Jinu was thinking that it did not matter how dedicated their subordinates might be if there was no money, the location would not be adequately maintained. On the other hand, Sam, the treasurer, and the leader of the faction were all perplexed when their clan leader informed them that their financial situation was not quite as dire as he had anticipated. 
After that, the leader of their clan provided an explanation of his plans for the future, and when they heard the plan that the leader of their clan had outlined, they were stunned and their jaws dropped. Meanwhile, there was a lady wearing red clothes using binoculars peeing somewhere. There's no change today as well. She utter, someone outside seems calling her but she didn't notice because she was too focused on the Beacon clan and she was sure that there's definitely something they were hiding. She was Dang Ha Rin, member of the Muram Union Intelligence Group Flying Hawk Squad with a code name of Number One. When she heard someone repeatedly screaming her name, she quickly worked herself up into a frenzy. When she realized that the man was one of her allies, she quickly retracted her sword and replaced it in its scabbard. However, she reprimanded the man because she had already reminded him on several occasions that they were to refer to each other by their code names while they were outside. This individual's name is Juj Gun and has a code name of number two. He previously served for the Miram Union Intelligence Group Flying Hawk Squad. When there were only the two of them in the room, he explained his logic to Dang by saying that it was odd for them to refer to each other as number one and number two. However, Dang was upset, and he insisted that Juj comply with the regulation of the union. When Juj unexpectedly cursed about their regulations, she was going to unleash her sword once more. However, when Juj observed that the lady was about to unleash his sword, he swiftly said that it was not what he meant. And of course he needed to respect the union's rule. Whatever, why did you call me? Asked Dung. Juj, who was really hungry at the time, suggested that they find something to eat as soon as possible. In addition, Dang abruptly turned her head to take a look at Juj. She was under the impression that members of the Juj clan are experts in the mechanism and fabrication of traps, and that they are the sort of people who are cautious and prefer to save their breath. However, he was perplexed by the fact that Juj didn't appear to have those characteristics. On the other hand, Juj was waiting for Dang's response but it seemed as if she was daydreaming. So he stated that even old sages have taught that the causes of all diseases stem from those who do not take their meals at the appropriate times. When Dang asked him which sage said those lines that he mentioned, it was from the sage that could have starved to death then put his hand in his stomach. Dang had no other choice. She let out a sigh and agreed with Juj to go outside to find something to eat and Juj wanted to try their dumplings. In addition, in order to conceal their identities, they always wear a mask whenever they are engaged in activities to hide their identities. Meanwhile, while Dang and Juj were strolling outside, they kept their communication to themselves by having mental conversations. This ensured that no one could overhear what they were saying. Juj inquires of Dang as to whether she continues to believe that the Beacon clan is connected to the baffling disappearance case. In reaction to this, Dang stated that there had been no alteration to her thinking. When Juj stated that he believed that they were merely needed to fulfill their mission to investigate the downfall of the GM family, Dang explained to him that they can't just pretend to ignore the serial disappearance case that began in Hangzhou and occurred all around Zhejiang. In addition, they have witnessed a wide variety of instruments of torture in addition to dead bodies in the underground storage facility owned by the GM family. Instead of intervening in a situation like that, in which it would not be in their union's best interest to do so, they would. But she is unable to continue because Juj interrupted her, and remarked that it was best if they just reported it to the union and stayed out of it. But Dang ignores him and continues her thoughts that someone uses the GM family as scapegoat not to cause any friction from the government. And if that happens, then the crime will continue and the innocent citizens of Zhejiang will be burdened by the damages. Juj also said that a certain someone from the Beacon clan has been secretly meeting with GM Mai Ho, and their relationship could have just been immoral. But here's more suspicious than that for Dang. It was Yu Xin Wun, someone who was a ruffian who suddenly one day decided to win a duel against a Zenith warrior. In the end he destroyed his younger brother faction and the knee opposing him even though his brother was the stronger successor candidate. A situation where someone explosively obtains power is usually associated with them learning a demonic art. Dang also thinks that GM Mai Ho's strange death and disappearance could be due to demonic art. And to obtain definitive evidence, they need to disguise themselves and infiltrate the commission clan. What? Juj yelled out in surprise. What do you mean to invade and out of nowhere? Even though the latter was extremely angry, Dang chose to ignore him and instead urged him to apply to work as a guard for the Beacon clan. Juj was doing everything in his power to avoid applying for the position because it was irrelevant. The difficulty was that Juj was a man, and Dang was a lady. It would be tough for her, and no one hired a female guard in the first place, and she will be forced to share her meals, her beds, and even her showers with other men. However, even if she wore men's clothing and pretended to be a man, she would sleep outside if he was working a shift, and it would be very evident if she was discovered. It's not your issue, so don't worry about that. Utter Dang. 
In addition, when Zhuge told Dang that her shoulder was wider than a man's, Dang erupted into a fit of wrath. She can pass herself off as a male with ease, but she suddenly punches Zhuge and then abandons him. When Zhuge tried to call Dang because he had witnessed something, Dang furrowed his brow and turned to ask him whether he wanted to be hit once more. Zhuge was crouching low to the ground, gripping his stomach, and trembling because of the hunger he was experiencing as well as the blow that Dang had given him. He indicated to his left that a large number of individuals were congregating on something, and when Dang turned to it, she developed an interest in something. She instantly set off in the direction of a wall, where she encountered other males who were similarly interested. There was a letter that mentioned that the Beacon clan was looking to hire guards who were reliable and skilled in their work. In addition, both the Black Cloud Faction Guard and the Straight Cloud Faction Guard hired 20 people in total for their respective personnel rosters. The prerequisites included either a level of martial ability at or above second rate 3 or a significant amount of experience working as a guard over a long period of time. There was no consideration given to factors such as age, gender, disability, race, martial arts training, or experience. When Zhuge saw the posting, he suddenly cursed because it was over and Dang will definitely apply for sure since gender is irrelevant. Huh, just what is this? Utter Dang. One morning, Gun Ho made an announcement that those individuals who are applying to become guards for the Straight Cloud Faction should stand in the right line, and those individuals who are applying to become guards for the Black Cloud Faction should stand in the left line. People listen to what he has to say and immediately begin forming their line. Gung Ho also disclosed that they will conduct interviews in groups of four individuals within each tent. On the other hand, a bald man who is a member of the Thug Martial Artist Group and the Five Dogs of Zhejiang stated that there is not a single applicant who is of a quality that is better than second rate. According to one of his soldiers, the H. Wang Rock Clan was involved in whatever transpired there. Therefore, the H. Wang Rock Clan will compensate them financially if there is a major problem caused by him there. Suddenly, one of his men muses on the vast sum of money that may be theirs if things go according to plan. In addition to this, they were searching on the line in order to select a man to be the first person to become their first sacrifice. The gang of bald guys observed a former courtesan named Hong Yon, as well as an elderly man who appears to be on the verge of collapsing at any moment. A one-armed swordsman, a blonde semu, and a black Kunlun servant, nevertheless, none of these individuals are worthy of being opponents. After that, they noticed Dang and Zhuge standing on the line. Moreover, Dang and Zhuge were discussing what kind of food they would have when the interview had concluded. They were so focused on one another that they failed to notice the bald man following them. Additionally, when the bald man asked Dang and Zhuge if they would come to take the guard exam together as a pair, Dang wrinkled her brow and turned to look at him. Zhuge did the same thing. However, the bald man disregarded her outburst and instead said that the individuals who were standing in line behind her were unable to concentrate because she spoke so loudly. He also added that the test was utterly damaged, and he questioned whether or not they were ashamed of inflicting harm to other people. One of the people also reminded them that they don't need to destroy everything in order to feel relieved, therefore they shouldn't feel pressured to do so. And as a direct consequence of this, Dang felt furious. Afterward, Juge was taken aback when he saw Dang become enraged, however, he quickly devised a plan to prevent them from engaging in conflict due to Dang's actions. As a result, Juge suddenly broke down in tears and apologized to the man with a bald head. The sudden outpouring of tears down his cheeks prompted him to drop to one knee, reach out, and grip the bald man's leg. Zhuge said that he must have run his mouth without knowing his place, and that he had considerably disrupted the attitude of those honorable guys. Zhuge mentioned this more than once. He continued by saying, Please forgive me. On the other side, the bald guy was perplexed by the abrupt conduct of Zhuge, who also approached the bald man's companions and bowed to beg them to spare his life because he did not wish to pass away. Juge was flung to the ground after the man with the bald head suddenly kicked him in response to the annoyance that he was feeling. Afterwards, Juge laughs and scratches his head in response to the bald man's question about who said that the bald man would kill him. But something did happen to the bald man and his companions, as evidenced by the beads of sweat that suddenly appeared on their faces, and the sudden clutching of their stomachs by all of them. After that, they took off running and it seemed as though they were experiencing constipation. On the other hand, Dang was perplexed, and he inquired of Zhuge as to what had been done to the bald guy and his companions. Zhuge breaks into a quick smile and adds that it was one of the clan secrets that had been passed down from generation to generation in the Zhuge family. The art of blood force constipation, 
which makes one feel the need to defecate more frequently. After hearing Zhuge, Dang begins to back away from Zhuge in the fear that the latter may attempt to utilize his skill on her. Meanwhile, it appeared as though Kang was bored while looking in the three men and the woman who were standing in front of him. He informed them that everyone else, with the exception of the woman, is qualified for the position. When the three guys found out that they had failed the test, they became incensed and remarked that it seemed like a cruel joke to them. They are interrogating the chief of the clan about how he knows about their degree of martial art, and he qualifies the woman even though she doesn't appear to have ever had to see anything sharp. Because of this, the leader of the clan grew furious and let out a force that had been building up in his body. Because he had already gained sufficient insight into the pointlessness of the three men's capabilities, he gave them the directive to depart. Just as one of the evaluators was about to leave the tent, he cautioned the chief of the clan that he would come to regret not qualifying them. On the other hand, Kang gave the lady an instruction to put on her commission uniform and report to the straight cloud house before the day that was stated. The woman was grateful to the leader of the clan, and she pledged that she would look after him for the rest of her life. After that, Dang and Zhuge were included in the following set of people who would be taking the examination. Dang believes that she will soon have the opportunity to meet Yu Xin Wun in person. She was intrigued about the latter because even if he dropped weight, the kai that was flowing from his entire body could never be from an ordinary person, and it's the kind of body that can't be attained without regular training. Dang, who was observing the leader of the clan very carefully, made the observation that his spirit is not typical, which suggests that he is not an easy person. In addition, Dang was astonished when the clan leader questioned her over the purpose of her attendance at the examination. She was under the impression that the clan chief might recognize her, but nobody, not even the Flying Hawk team, is aware of their infiltration at the Beacon clan and she was protecting her face with a high-quality skin mask. But she is unable to continue her train of thinking because the clan leader was waiting for her answer. As a result, she stated that she intended to make the most of this opportunity in order to realize her childhood dream of working as a guard which was mainly foreshadowed by the circumstances surrounding her birth. Afterwards, Dang was confused since the clan leader was closely looking at her. She questioned Zhuge, who was standing by her, what's the problem with the clan leader and why he didn't want to respond. Zhuge imagined that Miss Dang, who's the most calm and cool in the entire Flying Hawk team, would be cornered that much. And because the clan leader did not respond, Jinu questioned her what her level of martial arts was. She abruptly retorted that she was a complete zenith. Jinu was startled and couldn't believe such a lady who achieved a peak novice. However, Dang was going to tell them that she was only a first rate when she first met them. But if she had told them that she was a zenith, perhaps they would have fallen to their knees in an effort to recruit her. However, she became infuriated when the clan leader stated that if her martial arts are as good as she claims they are, then she would have no trouble applying anywhere else even if she was rejected from this one. Jinu, who was seated next to the clan leader, was startled since it appeared as though she did not wish to qualify the lady who possessed such a high level of skills. The next person to be questioned was Juj, and he was asked about his skill level in martial arts. In response, Juj stated that he was simply exceptional. When the clan leader stated that Juj had been qualified while Dang was not, Dang's anger was over the roof. However, she was startled when Juj reasoned that she was more skilled than she appeared and that if the clan leader qualified her, he would never be let down. However, Juj was astonished when the clan leader inquired as to whether or not he would not join the clan simply because Dang had been disqualified. That's not the case, utters Juj. On the other hand, after hearing the clan leader say that he will leave the lady as a standby if she accepts it, Jinu's jaw drops open in shock. In addition, when Dang learned that the clan head would be placing her on standby, she became enraged. Her teeth were clenched, and her brow was wrinkled as she showed her anger. When Juge sees her anger, he immediately puts his hand on her head and makes her bow. Juge thanks the clan leader. He said that it was okay for Dang to be on standby. She was so happy that he couldn't speak, uttered Juge, and then he said that they would take their leave. He pulled Dang out and said that he would be waiting for the good news. Then they left. Kang was curious and wondered why they were there. A person was bringing packages and pounding on the door while people were inside the Heaven Sent Parlor in Hangzhou, which is one of the top parlors in the city. The delivery man had no idea what had happened because after they had placed their order in the middle of the night, the restaurant was closed. After that, a woman opened the door and mistook the individual for a customer. Hence, she apologized and said that someone else had rented out the Heaven Sent Parlor in its entirety. The individual was perplexed and looked around the interior of the parlor. He couldn't believe that someone rented the entire heaven scent, 
which is Hangzhou's most expensive parlor. The individual was shocked when the lady mentioned that the leader of the Beacon clan was feasting at the moment because he had heard reports that the leader of the Beacon clan obtained some formidable martial arts and destroyed the fighting and straightened out the order in his clan. The woman abruptly stroked his chest and then remarked that it was the same person who had stolen money from his clan and then frittered it away. She also mentioned that Shin Woon may have slimmed down, but he hasn't changed at all. He's still a challenging host, which was good for them because it appears like the clan leader of Beacon will be eliminated soon. On the other hand, Kang was inside the room of the Heaven Sent Parlor and it looks like he was already drunk. He was with four girls, he was brandishing how he cut the arm of his opponent and how hilarious watching his opponent fell on the ground screaming in pain. He laughed and encouraged those women to get drunk until they passed out. But he couldn't continue his sentence because he fell on the ground because of his drunkenness. The four young women suddenly move in closer proximity to him. Others advocate leaving him because he appears to be unconscious after drinking a significant amount of alcohol, while others wonder if he will ever break his habit of being a scoundrel. The result of this was that the four ladies left Kang in a hurry while he was snoring. They even sneak a peek fearing someone might spot them sneaking away from the clan leader, and they didn't see the skeleton knights of Kang who were keeping an eye on their master. Afterwards, Kang opened his eyes and let out a heavy sigh because those girls already left after pretending he was drunk and fell asleep then one of the skeleton knights tapped on the door. He was using his inner Kai in order to come up with an immediate solution to a problem such as intoxication. He stood up and observed that the chamber was being watched over by no one then he started with his equipped title of Bat Lord which was a silent wave along with the majority of doppelgangers. After that, he lets out some force, which results in the creation of his duplicate. The Miss Doppelganger is able to make a clone out of Miss that can be maintained for as long as the title holder's magic is active. In the event that the clone takes damage, it will be annihilated immediately. Kang gave his clone the order to go to sleep until he got back, and his clone did as he said. After that, he triggered his pocket dimension and retrieved a brown cloak, along with a mask depicting a demon. After that, he got up and left his clone as well as the heaven-sent parlor in a hurry. On the other hand, in the outskirts of Hangzhou, a certain butcher shop there was an underground stair that a bald man used to enter into the basement. He passed by numerous people inside a jail who were pleading to let them go and they will never tell anyone what happened to them. All they wanted is to send them home. A lady who has tears on her eyes begging the bald man to release her and he promises that she will not tell anyone. But the bald man hit the steel of the jail and said that she should be thankful that she was selected as a sacrifice for their demon god. The lady has no choice but to burst into tears. Other prisoners were pleading to save them, give them medicine, and others wanted to curse them. But the bald man ignored them and her eyes were focused on the two ladies in front. He pulled the chain that was strangled in their neck and the two ladies were shaking in need of medicine, and water. On the other hand, the bald man grabs one of the two girls and observes that it appears that the remedy they use to them have a positive effect on them. However, he abruptly turned since the entirety of the room appeared to go silent all of a sudden. He yelled, but he was perplexed since he couldn't hear anything, not even his own voice, it was as if he had suddenly lost his hearing. However, he is unable to continue his train of thought because somebody slashed his throat, which caused his entire body, including his head, to fall to the ground at the same time. It was Kang who was dressed in a cloak and donned a mask of a monster. He was utilizing his silence wave, which has a radius of 5 meters and eliminates any noises inside that area. He located his memory of the future in the correct location, which was underneath a modest butcher shop. There, he discovered, were several hundreds of women held captive in a hidden area of that size. Perhaps ten more of those jails have been constructed by Commander T of the Kowloon Group and are located in Hangzhou. In addition, he believed that the vast funds of the blood sect were obtained from the illegal sale of remedy and the trafficking of people. He wishes he could free everyone in that little amount of time but doing so would send some others to their deaths. Because of this, he must first use his death kai extraction technique to remove the poisonous kai from the people who are in critical condition as a result of the medications. After that, he turned his back on them and told them to wait for him because he would first carry out their vengeance, and then come back. On the other hand, Gong Sun Chu, who was the chief of the playful dragon and a member of the Kowloon Group Combat Force, was upset because the young men that he had instructed to bring the sacrifices were so late. However, as he turned his attention to the entirety of the room, he got the impression that something was off, and he cautioned his subordinates to be vigilant. One of his colleagues told him not to worry and that he would teach those boys a lesson about the way they were behaving in the future. But as soon as his subordinates opened the door, he discovers something, and as a direct result, 
he abruptly yells at his subordinates to be careful and warns them to look out for the danger. His subordinate was so perplexed, but in the space of a single instant someone threw a force that penetrated his body, and then he fell to the ground lifeless. An intruder. Everyone, ready your stance, exclaimed Chu. The latter tore the sleeves off of his shirt and was applying a bluish-green force to his arm. In spite of the fact that he cannot see the intruder, he gives the command for the intruder to show themselves. A harsh curse escaped him as he realized that the site of the underground jail had been discovered, and that if their group commander had found out about it, he might as well have been dead already. It is imperative that he apprehend their invaders and question them as to how they were able to locate the underground. On the other hand, Kang eventually presents himself to Chu, and at that moment, Chu observes that he was unable to detect any other Kai than the one coming from the intruder. It was almost as if Kang was all by himself. He couldn't help but crack a grin as he watched the intruder make his way into hell all by himself. They're crazy as can be, he added. In response, Kang said that he was alone because he decided to kill them all with his own hands, without any exception. The grade of the bone spear that he utilized has been raised to a plus, and it is expected to be two to three times as powerful as it was before. As they cut with their swords, he realizes that all of Chu's subordinates are bald and they are significantly more powerful than the swordsmen of the Red Cloud faction. On the other hand, one of the bald men approached Kang and questioned whether he believed he could defeat them with such a high level of sorcery. But Kang was just a simple sorcerer, but he did bring his sword with him. However, Kang's sword is more than just a way for him to get some additional preparation time for his subsequent magical maneuver. After giving him the command to be quiet, the three bald men unexpectedly approached Kang while brandishing their weapon. However, the latter was so composed that it was ultimately beneficial for him that his adversary approached him. But to the surprise of all three bald men, Kang split them in half with a single blow to each of their heads. Chu was taken aback by his skill, and he commented that there shouldn't be any martial artists who are able to wield magic. Nonetheless, he was at most a pinnacle novice anyhow. Chu utilizes his playful dragon squad without warning and directs them to confront their opponent while positioned in a wheel configuration. Therefore, the six nefarious guys suddenly walked towards Kang, encircled him, and appeared to be getting ready to strike. Kang believed that every single one of the bald men had reached the pinnacle of exceptional rank, and was an expert in their field. They planned to take him on one at a time and systematically drain his inner Kai as they do so. However, he suddenly struck all of them at the same time. This made it possible for him to employ all of the inner Kais at the same time, each of which had multiple properties that he had absorbed up to that point through the process of death Kai extraction. All of this is possible for him as a result of the purifiability of the Eastern Shining Sage and the effects of the all-accepting power. The other bald men were perplexed as to who he was because he possessed such an incredible amount of force. On the other hand, Chu observed his adversary swipe his sword in his playful dragon squad as they battled one other. As a result of the rage that he was experiencing, he made an angry face by furrowing his forehead and clenching his teeth. Their adversary was able to use a variety of Kais of his level power, including Thunder Kai, Yin Kai, and Demonic Kai. It was unfathomable to him because he had never encountered anything even somewhat like it before. Furthermore, the status window appeared and informed him that he had been successful in harmonizing the art of the White Frost Ghost and the Twelve Swords of Thunder Cloud and he has made tremendous strides in terms of his proficiency. His accomplishment in wielding his 12 Sword of Thunder Cloud has significantly risen. He has acquired a 5-star rating in martial arts, and he has both his attribute as a transcendent swordsman and his sword thread now. In addition, the remaining bald man were perplexed, questioning how something like this could even be possible. But they are currently engaged in a fight for their lives, despite the fact that their adversary is getting stronger with each passing moment. Are you still planning to capture me? Utter Kang then he releases much power on his sword. When Chu and the other members of his playful dragon team saw Kang's sword, they were all shocked and they couldn't believe that their adversary was wielding a thread sword, which is the form that can be manifested if transcendence is achieved. But Chu assured them that what Kang had employed was nothing more than sorcery, and that they didn't need to trick his skill. He commanded them to kill their rival. The remaining bald men do as Chu tells them to do. One of them claimed that their three-wheel configuration was worthless, so they had no choice but to take their opponent's life with a single hit. They have no choice but to launch their most powerful assault on him. Afterwards, they unleashed a great amount of force and were getting ready to fight while Kang incited them to attack him while simultaneously encouraging them to do so. The bald men suddenly charged at Kang while slashing their swords in his direction, but Kang was ready for them. 
He used his 12 Swords of the Thunder Cloud second form and his Thunderous Gale Horizontal Slash, and as a result, his remaining opponents were simultaneously cut in half horizontally. The bald men watched as their bodies separated and fell to the ground lifeless. It came down to just Kang and Chu at this point. Moreover, because of the rage that he was experiencing, Chu gritted his teeth and furrowed his brow in an angry expression. Even with the Kowloon gang, they were considered to be one of the stronger forces, and for the playful dragon squad to be wiped entirely by one person, he just can't believe it. On the other hand, Kang refers to Chu not as the head of the playful dragon, Gong Sun Chu, but rather as a dog for obeying Commander T. When Chu heard the name of his master that Kang mentioned, Chu became infuriated because he recognized that Kang was an enemy of their sect, and that he needed to eliminate Kang as soon as possible. In addition to that, he abruptly let forth a dark force that had been contained within his body. Kang, who was watching him, became irritated since Chu was emitting tainted mana rather than inner Kai, which indicates that Chu too got the blessing. Therefore, Chu is going to make advantage of the power possessed by a monster. And it turned out to be true because Chu transformed into a monster in an instant that resembled a lizard and was releasing a smoke on his mouth while his eyes were lightened. Chu suddenly leaped and attacked Kang who appeared to be waiting for him because he also went towards the monster. In addition to this, Kang saw the eyes of the monster when it became a shining red which is the reason he suddenly leaps backward to avoid colliding with it. Kang witnessed the transformation of the bald man's body into stone when it hit the red eyes of the monster. In addition, Chu was perplexed as to how Kang evaded his attack, but Kang had been anticipating it all along. Chu reasoned that his adversary must have evaded his hit by pure chance, considering that not even his master was aware of the full extent of his strength. Then, without warning, he started running towards his adversary while his eyes were glowing a bright crimson. When Chu struck Kang's sword, the latter was subsequently cleaved in half, and the grotesque grin on Chu's face widened as he watched the spectacle. After that, Chu launches another attack and blows green smoke at Kang. But Kang sidesteps to dodge it and then launches a counterattack by kicking the monster directly in the face. On the other hand, Kang switched his attention to the wall that had been hit by the monster's breath, and he noticed that the wall was beginning to melt. He understood that the monster was employing armored scale, acid breath, and demonic eyes of petrification, and as a consequence, he was able to determine what kind of monster Chu was, the basilisk. He then hurls his severed sword to the ground, which is what causes the monster to break out in a grin. The monster then asks Kang what a soldier could possibly do without his weapon, and since Kang has no weapon, Chu encourages him to submit and accept his death in an obedient manner. Kang asked Chu why he was so excited because he hadn't even started. Then he lifted his hand and opened his pocket dimension, at which point his scythe gradually appeared in the pocket dimension. He grabbed the scythe in an unexpected move, and it immediately began to unleash a tremendous amount of force. When Chu saw the scythe, he clenched his teeth and wrinkled his brow in concentration. Because Kang was able to produce a weapon seemingly out of thin air, he was quite interested in Kang's identity. He wondered to himself if Kang was someone who had traveled to Zhejiang from the western region. But he decided that it didn't matter because he was going to get rid of Kang at whatever cost and rip him to shreds. Kang who was bracing himself for the monster's attack, was taken aback when it suddenly charged toward him while releasing force and flashing its eyes in a fiery red. The monster raised his hand, generated a tremendous amount of force within it, and then swung it at Kang. However, Kang utilized his scythe to escape the strike and protect himself from the monster. The monster was surprised and thought that it was impossible since the power of the scythe is equivalent to his attack. It wasn't just a visual deception but the scythe was an amazing item. But the monster thought that it looked like it was unable to utilize sword kai or sword thread like the sword that Kang used a while ago. And as a result, the monster all of a sudden rushed towards his opponent and he lifted again his arms and strike it but Kang avoided it using his scythe. And as a result, the scythe slashed through his thigh but the monster ignored it and seems didn't mind the pain as he stepped back in the wall then strike again but Kang used his scythe to dodge again his massive strike and light was formed when the scythe and Chu's hands made contact. The monster was seething with rage and clenching his teeth because it appears that his opponent is unfazed by the amount of force he puts out and is instead able to easily escape each assault. The startling realization that someone like Kang could genuinely evade each of his strikes caused him to let out a curse, but he had to get rid of Kang by whatever means possible. 
Therefore, the monster leaped once more and activated his demonic eye of petrification, which resulted in the release of a force, however. Kang was so quick to step back that he was able to avoid being hit by it then teased of Chu by telling him that he was running his mouth so boldly despite the fact that his self-proclaimed great skill was to covertly mix in demonic eyes. As a direct consequence of this, Chu became infuriated, and all of a sudden, he leaped forward while unleashing chemicals from his mouth and planned to melt Kang's weapon. On the other hand, Kang observed the chemical green item discharge on the mouth of the monster, and he believed that it was time to terminate their conflicts because he will infuse the natural power he has gained from the soul union he has through with Yu Shin Wun into the scythe of melting poison. So he simply allowed his scythe to stand in front of him and waited for the poison that the monster releases when all of a sudden, the status window appears and states that the treasure is filled with natural power, and the treasure scythe of melting poison has accepted Kang as its owner. The sealed authority of the treasure has been unlocked, and the authority cruel poison divine blood has been unlocked. At that time, Kang was standing still while patiently waiting for the poison, but just as it was about to hit him, it abruptly stopped in front of the scythe and dissolved. It appears that the scythe was soaking up the chemical at that point. When the monster saw it, he couldn't believe his eyes when he saw that the weapon used by his adversary appeared to absorb the monster's powerful attack. On the other side, Kang believed that all of the poison that was unleashed by the monster belonged to him because of the cruel poison divine blood, which means that it is an authority that governs over all of the poison within the region. On the other hand, Chu was trembling and was thinking of escaping the combat. He asked himself if it was the fear of death that he felt since he can't move his body and it seems his body won't listen to him. That's why Kang walked close to him and explains that the armored scale of basilisks is one of the factors that make a battle with one difficulty. But if Chu attacks from the inside it's not particularly hard. In addition to this, Chu was so frustrated that he couldn't move, yet he still yelled obscenities at Kang and demanded to know what he was talking about. However, Kang chooses to disregard him and instead asks Chu what would take place if he totally absorbed all of the poisonous Kai that was contained within his body. Then he aimed his scythe at Chu, who was perplexed at the time because he couldn't believe that the weapon could genuinely consume all of his power. Isn't the effect immediately? Utter Kang. Chu was hopeless and scared, and he begged for mercy not to kill him. Kang said to stop that nonsense and put the scythe in her mouth, and he shouted die, you trash. On the other hand, the status window appears once more and informs Kang that the scythe of melting poison has successfully absorbed the energy of the monster and that the toxin of petrification has been acquired. After that, Kang decided that it was not the appropriate moment to celebrate since he still wanted to acquire those women who had been poisoned, and he had a lot of things that needed to be done. He made a way out by constructing a portal. In addition to this, he was searching for the jail, which ought to be right about there. Then he saw a brick against the wall and it seemed it was a device to unlock the door, so he pressed it. When the door was opened and the light turned on inside the chamber, he was taken aback since it revealed a significant quantity of gold that had been concealed in that room. Yom Chin Siak, the leader of the Black Tyrants as well as the leader of the Kowloon group, presided over the gathering of several individuals who were present in the conference room of the Kowloon group. It doesn't matter how much he thinks about it, his ears just don't appear to be working properly anymore, so he told his fellow soldiers to repeat what they had said. After hearing that the third jail had been raided the night before and that the items had not been delivered, the crazy dragon squad made a hasty trip to the third jail and confirmed that all of the things that had been stored there had vanished. Meng Dung Ho, who was the second in command of the Kowloon gang and the leader of the Mad Dragon, abruptly looked at the person who was seated beside him and inquired what had happened of the wealth that was being stored and the remedy that were going to be sold. In response, according to the information provided by the individual, all of the medications have been turned to ash, and anything of value has been destroyed. As a direct result of this, Yom furrowed his brow, and a fiery color flashed before his eyes. He was irate because it didn't matter how much he heard it. The problem wasn't with his ears, the problem was with the maggots and other vermin like them. He unleashed a tremendous amount of power against his fellow soldiers who were shaking with dread and had blood pouring out of their noses. Because one of the other soldiers was having trouble controlling the enormous power, he signaled for the attention of their leader and asked stop releasing force. But Yom disregarded him and gave them the instruction that finding the person responsible for the crime should be their first priority. He inquires of his fellow soldiers as to whether or not they have any information regarding the whereabouts of Gong Sun Chu and the playful dragon squad. However, Meng apologized to their leader for his unexpected interruption and explained that he found remnants of the combat. But that was all he found. 
However, he did find signs of the leader of the playful dragon squad employing Divine Kai. After that, the head of the Kowloon group stated that Meng had mentioned that there absolutely wasn't even a single corpse left, and that Chu's primary weapon was poison, therefore it is possible that this was the cause. In response, Meng stated that Chu may have been able to execute those individuals who opposed his will, and that the poison would allow the corpses to be removed. Furthermore, Yom issued instructions to his fellow soldiers and told them that they must begin the investigation with both the chance that Chu may have betrayed them and the prospect that there may be a distinct unidentifiable faction. He added that the case would be handled as an independent investigation from this point on. Everyone in the group got to their feet at the same time and bowed to their leader. They responded with, Yes, sir. In addition, Yom believed that the occurrence was on an entirely other level in comparison to the humiliation that he experienced in the Beacon clan, and he believed that his position would be in jeopardy if the episodes in question were reported to the monthly meeting. However, if he is unable to retrieve the wealth once more, their connections to the kidnapping and drug trafficking must be kept secret at all costs in order to honor the great will of their sect. On the other hand, if he is able to sway the new provincial governor to their side in the same way that he did their predecessor, then they must find and eliminate the perpetrator in order to ensure that nobody is able to discover the incident. Afterward, one of Yom's allies has remained behind and has stated that there are very certainly more than one conspirator, and if there is one thing that is certain, it is that the adversary is not a solitary individual. When Yom questioned the person why he believed so, the guy stated that they had transferred all of that mountainous money in a single night, and if they loaded the heavy fortune on a carriage, then it would undoubtedly leave a trace no matter how much they attempted to hide it. In addition, as a result of the person's explanation, the leader of Kowloon gave the person the instructions to put other insignificant concerns to the side and concentrate on the task at hand. Meanwhile, Kang was inside a carriage and seemed asleep. Sam who is also inside the vehicle advises Kang regarding his finger can come out through the other ear if he continues to do so. Sam asks the clan leader why he went to the parlor when he already told him that he needed to go for the development of the commission clan. The clan leader who seems bored claimed that he went to the parlor to brighten his mood since he's been being punished every day like Sam did at that moment. Sam suddenly scratched his head and laughed at his master since he didn't know why his master was acting like that. He felt like his master's personality got worse than before. In addition to this, Sam was unaware that Kang was considering the girls that he had cured and saved from the poison that they had. He wished for everyone's swift and unharmed escape. When he witnessed the prisoners crying happy tears because they were finally released from jail and no longer have to endure any further hardship, they were overwhelmed with gratitude and affirmed that they will one day repay him. Kang used Death Kai extraction to consume all of the harmful Kai, ensuring that they will not have any difficulties in their life until they have fully recovered. It is far safer to go their separate ways, despite the fact that he wants to assume responsibility to the very end. The wealth that he recovered was sufficient to allow the White Commission clans and Zhejiang to live extravagantly for an entire year. He is not allowed to waste the money that the blood cult earns from dealing with remedies and slave people in some pointless endeavor. He would only make use of it when he was waging war against the blood sect or when he was assisting those who had been victimized by the blood sect. Blood sect, just wait a bit longer, I will crush you all. Utter Kang. On the other hand, the announcement that they had arrived at their destination was made by the carriage driver. He claimed that the location was satisfactory despite the fact that the land was settled and there did not appear to be any source of water in the area. Sam, who was standing by his side, looked up at him in a startled and perplexed manner all of a sudden. In addition, the one who is currently standing on Kang's side appears to be the guy selling the land. He expressed his happiness and praised the clan leader's choice, remarking that the latter truly had an appreciative eye and has made an exceptional choice. Sam's sudden objection to his master's plan to purchase the wasteland is motivated by the realization that if the land is purchased, it will mean that the money was wasted. When the vendor heard Sam, he became enraged, and he made the comment that Sam did not have a good eye, unlike his master. But Sam continued to be certain that the wasteland should not be purchased, and he said that the vendor had no shame in asserting that the unproductive area could not be used for agricultural purposes. Kang interrupts them and inquires of the vendor as to whether or not what Sam stated is accurate. The vendor suddenly laughs and says that it's not that the land can't be farmed, rather, it's just that it hasn't been farmed yet because it's a fertile piece of land that has been allowed to rest in order to maintain its productivity because its fertility has been restored to the point that it is entirely full once again. That piece of land is the one that will undoubtedly achieve a great deal of success in the coming year. 
However, Sam yelled at him and continued to claim that the area was even more of a wasteland and that there is no value in that place. But when his master added that he would acquire all of the land that he had seen earlier in addition to that acreage, Sam was taken aback, and his mouth literally dropped when he heard the news. Since it appears that he has struck it rich, seeing as how the price of those territories is not even a tenth of what it is for the other lands. In addition to that, he mentioned that he would prefer to make the payment as quickly as possible. When the vendor found out that the clan leader would purchase all of the land, he gave the man a book and told him that the money would be made immediately if the man signed the contracts. The vendor's grin became wider since he believed he had tricked the man into buying all of the land. On the other hand, Kang told Sam that he can't breathe around with his serious face, but Sam was irate because he cannot see why his master would purchase such a piece of land that has been used for nothing but rubbish. He added that his master might be glad because he will quickly become a wealthy farmer with a big land holding and that this might make him happy. However, he continued to be irritated and because of this, he advised his master that they must hasten their journey to the carriage and get there as soon as possible. On their way, when Kang spotted a residence, he requested that Sam accompany him there for a short while. Both of them walked till they reached the entrance of the building, where they discovered an elderly man working on something. When the elderly guy asked them what they were looking for, Kang answered quickly that he was going to purchase one blade from him but the elderly man was irritated and asked him whether or not their location would have something similar to a sword. However, Kang is adamant that the object appears to be a sword. On the other hand, the elderly man wrinkles his brow and mutters something about watching Kang babbling on about sounds that don't appear to be genuine phrases then he asks Kang if he was the fool when he heard who bought all of the wastelands that can be bought. Old man, watch your mouth, exclaimed Sam. On the other hand, a woman suddenly walks in and sees that they have a customer, but it seems that their customer was fighting with his grandpa. Because of this, she offered an apology on behalf of her grandfather, despite the fact that his grandfather was a kind man but his words were only harsh. Kang and Sam have both stated that everything is going well for them. In addition, the woman mentioned that she had overheard them discussing their desire to purchase a sword, and she expressed her regret that the shop did not stock any swords. Instead, she displayed some high-quality tools for farming that were made by her grandfather and if they decide to purchase those products, they will never be sorry for doing so. On the other hand, Kang seemed to be looking for something as he went around the store, but Sam was perplexed by the fact that he suddenly wanted to purchase agricultural implements after buying those wastelands which have no benefits. Even the lady was taken aback when he selected 10 different farming tools to purchase, and then she hastily wrapped the items up and handed them to him. After that, when Kang was saying farewell to the woman, her grandfather turned to Kang and asked what the chances were that they would run into each other again in the future. In answer, Kang stated that they will have reasons to meet one another again if the heavenly destiny continues to follow and the connection continues to reach. Afterwards, they parted ways. However, the lady couldn't make heads or tails of what Kang and his grandfather were talking about, so she decided to ask Kang before he went. However, Kang disregarded her and continued on his way. On the other hand, the elderly man was staring at Kang closely, and it would appear that he is familiar with the clan leader. Meanwhile, the elderly man was inquiring about the best course of action for them. What action, and what do you mean by that? Someone explained. The elderly man said because it appeared he knew something about both their location, and the godmother as well. The woman's rage was fueled by the fact that she had repeatedly cautioned H. Wang Gong Mang not to call her that way. Gong Mang was sweating profusely when he suddenly bowed and apologized because he realized that the lady had released a force. On the other hand, the person who established the Heroic Steel Alliance, a Zhang Yuan-based organization that serves as a union for all steel traders and craftsmen, and the finest blacksmith that has ever lived, who is responsible for making two of the top ten weapons in the martial arts world. She was known as Beak Li Lang, and in the martial arts community, she was referred to as the Steel Monster of the Five Monsters of Zhang Yuan. One of the two blades that she had fashioned into weapons went on to become the sword of the leader of the Miram Union, while the other went on to become the sword of the leader of the demonic sect. As a result of what happened, every member of the Order, Chaos, and demonic group who practiced martial arts went looking for her. It is almost certain that she would have been apprehended at some point and compelled to work as a slave at a hammering forge for the rest of her life if it were not for the enormous wealth of the Heroic Steel Alliance and her own special martial art. However, she must have aged horribly, thought Li Lang, and she shouldn't have exhibited her irritation to the young lad. She informed Gong Mang that, to the best of her recollection, the Beacon clan had no relation with her in any way, and about whether or not she had missed something. I can't think of even a single thing, uttered the old man. 
In addition, Li Lang suddenly let out a sigh and wondered about when she would finally be done with her fugitive lifestyle, and whether or not she needed to find a new place to hide. Because in her later years, she experienced a miracle rejuvenation as the result of some good fortune from heaven, and she began to live with the appearance of a child in the hidden branch territories of the Heroic Steel Alliance while concealing her true identity. Afterwards, Gong Mang stated that anybody who knew her appearance had either passed away or been slain, with the exception of him. Yet, the elderly guy was very puzzled because Li Lang did not behave in such a manner. Li Lang revealed that the ten objects that Xin Wun chose were all things that she made fun of. But she couldn't guarantee that Shin Woon had found out her identity only based on those items alone because there were too many eyes around them. Gong Mang is able to comprehend her reasoning since, in the event that she succeeded in eliminating Shin Woon, word would have unavoidably spread to either the demonic sect or the union. But Li Lang is unable to remain in their hiding place and waste her time, and because Shin Woon craves attention so desperately, she will comply with whatever he asks of her. After that, the elderly man will, without delay, dispatch spies from the coalition to follow him around and watch his every move. In addition to this, when Li Lang opened the window, she had the preconceived notion that Xin Wun was some pitiful heir of a wealthy clan who had purchased all of the wastelands around the blacksmith. However, there was something strange in him which was something that she couldn't even understand. Just who are you? She added. On the other hand, the status window appeared and a message regarding the scythe of one strike was displayed in it. It was a one-handed scythe that a skilled blacksmith had purposefully made with a deliberate flaw in the balance that it possessed. The category rating of this item is C+, and despite the fact that it was fashioned out of black steel, it possesses the exceptional capability of being employed as a weapon by a martial artist. Kang was astounded by the scythe that he was currently holding in his hands. He didn't believe it was a fabrication when it was said that the steel monster was the best blacksmith that had ever lived. He had seen the blood sex report that the Beak Li Lang had been seen by herself in that village's weary shop around, and the natural power that oozes out of the girl that they met in the blacksmith they entered by chance led him to believe that she was the Beak Li Lang. He assumed that the girl was Beak Li Lang because if he had spoken about her identity, then a fight to the death would have occurred. It was fortunate that he had activated the system window just in case, and he was grateful that he had done so since it allowed him to select what Beak Li Lang had prepared for him. Kang purchased the wastelands and then carefully selected the stuff that the steel monster had crafted. After having planted these two seeds, it is now incumbent upon him to wait till the fruit matures. Sam appears to be enjoying a dream while resting on the chair inside their carriage, and it appears that he was having a conversation with a female. His thoughts were interrupted since the reason for the interruption was that Sam. Kang believed that Sam's failing is that he is unable to appreciate the beauty of women. However, now that Kang was staring at Sam, he had the impression that the fight from yesterday was an illusion, because Commander T and the Kowloon group had probably already begun their movement at this point in order to resolve the affairs. Those ideas that were going through his head were just the first phase of his plan to destroy the Blood Sect. There were still a great deal more steps to go in his plan, because he needs to rapidly improve his strength in order to prevent the murders of any more innocent people. He is unable to act before the blood sect just because he can see into the future. In addition, it is necessary for Kang to develop his own style of martial arts by studying a wide variety of other, more advanced styles. In order for him to determine the actual power that the treasure possessed, he needed to enhance his power with additional natural power. In addition to this, he must reach a degree of necromancy that is superior to the one he possessed in his previous life, and he must also improve the overall power of the clan as well as the abilities of his subordinates. Looks like it's time for me to visit Mount Tianmu, he added. The following day, within the Blue Cloud Hall of the Beacon Clan, Jin Wu, along with Treasurer Gok, and No Di, along with his son, were assembling inside of it. Treasurer Head Gok was perspiring and thought about their clan leader for wasting all of their management fees on the parlor and even buying a wasteland that couldn't be cultivated. He questioned himself, wondering if the report that their clan leader was actually reverting back to his earlier self was true then he remembers the day their clan leader took their funds because he wanted to spend it someplace. But when he asks their clan leader where he plans to use it, their clan leader just tells him that he does not have time to explain and that Gok would know later on. But Gok believed that he was not in a position to place blame on others because it was he who handed over the silver ingots as if he was tranced by the clan leader. Clan leader has arrived, announced by someone. Jin Wu and the other leaders of the factions that were currently within the Blue Cloud Hall extend a greeting to their clan leader. Jin Wu initiated conversation and stated that the White Cloud faction is devoting all of their efforts to the periodic commission that is now underway as their clan leader made the announcement to start the meeting. 
They are managing the guard groups with the bare minimum number of people in order to handle the various commissions that they are responsible for, but so far they have been successful in completing everything without any problems. On the other hand, it was reported that the guards who are currently stationed at the White Cloud Fraction must be the most physically fatigued guards that are currently stationed anywhere. Therefore, the clan leader gave the head treasurer Gok orders to provide the White Cloud faction with more pay in the right quantities and to ensure that no guards are causing physical harm to themselves while performing their duties. Yes, simultaneously utter Gok and Jin U. Afterwards, Gun Ho was all ears when their clan leader said that their clear cloud faction is putting all of their members into the security of the clan all day and night in preparation for attacks from the enemy. Their clan leader asks the Black Cloud faction leader, Gun Ho, about the training of their newly hired guards. In response, according to Gun Ho's explanation, the martial arts of the new guards are in such a state that they need to be reconstructed from the ground up. However, because they do not have access to a suitable fundamental martial art inside the clan, it has been challenging for them to continue their training. Nodi also stated that this was the case since there were not nearly as many books on martial arts that had been stolen by Quack Jusan and his subordinates and then destroyed in the explosion that took place at the Red Cloud House. Sparring is the extent of their capabilities because they lack a foundation in a martial art. Doc, the head treasurer, was quite concerned since it appeared as though Nodi and Gun Ho were about to inquire about purchasing some martial art books but they are no longer able to pay for any other bills. However, the leader of the clan stated that all of their issues could be resolved if they only possessed an excellent foundation in their martial art. Gok, Jinu, and Nodi, together with Nodi's son, were all taken aback when their clan leader announced that he would find a solution to their dilemma, but that it would take some time to finish, and until then, they would have to wait. Various ideas began to run through their heads. Gok wondered if their clan leader would be able to finish it. Gun Ho widened his eyes and thought that their clan leader was trying to invent a basic martial art himself. Nodi speculated that if their clan leader was an exceptional genius, then it was not impossible. And Jinu was curious and confused at the same time because he felt that it would be possible for their clan leader to find a solution to their problem. Moreover, the leader of their clan inquires about the whereabouts of the H. Wang Rock clan with them. In response, Jinu stated that the H. Wang Rock clan has dispatched an ambassador to the Mount Huang sect, and that Duak Chil, the individual whose limb was cut by their clan leader, is a disciple of the Mount Huang sect. The Mount Huang sect, however, will not act rashly because they are a member of the order secta that is affiliated with the Murim Union. Kang had an abrupt realization that it was unfortunate since it would have been wonderful if they had provided them with a reason to act first. However, given the fact that they have a short fuse, he questions whether or not he has the patience to wait for them at this time. After that, Kang informed all of the leaders of the factions that they were finished, and then he asked Jinu if he brought the item that he had requested earlier in the conversation. In response, Jinu handed their clan leader papers and these are the deferred commissions that are minimum of 5 years old and a maximum of 10 years old. Head Treasure Gok along with No D and his son were all surprised and No D stated that those are deferred in words and he was curious on what are they going to do with the commissions that they declined. Gok stated if their clan leader was planning to take the commission, that would earn as much as one year's worth of the clan management fees if done successfully. While Gun Ho said that those kinds of commissions would force them to put the lives of their guards on the line. In addition, Kang seems to have found something on the pile of deferred papers then announces that they will be proceeding to commission at the Mount Tianmu. When Jinu saw the document, he immediately appealed to him to reconsider his choice because the commission included stipulations that were difficult to fulfill. Even the head treasure Gok sided with Jinu and admitted that they were unable to be successful in that commission because they lacked the necessary resources. Shin Woon, however, disagrees with them and argues that they are in the wrong because the guards that will eventually turn out to be the key to success have already been finished. In addition to this, he even swears that the commission will save the Beacon clan. Although it appears that the faction leaders, including Treasurer Gok, had some reservations about the commission on Mount Tianmu, they didn't want to go against their clan head. On the other hand, a large number of guards were going through their training. Everyone appeared to be straining and was sweating profusely as cups of water were being placed in their arms and legs. They are questioned by the in-charge commander about whether or not there is anyone who is already shaking from the extortion or anyone who intended to quickly and simply obtain command over their own inner Kai, they are required to leave at this time. Willpower is more important than natural ability for those of them who are attempting to learn the pulse arts and martial arts that their clan chief was working on establishing, and those of them who are able to develop their physical strength via determination will be successful. 
and if they can't back up their inner Kai with their physical strength, it doesn't matter how much Kai they have. Participants were instructed to go into a squatting stance while their entire bodies shook. In the other hand, while Dang and Zhuge were contentedly watching the trainees, Zhuge mentioned that it had already been a few days since they had joined the Bikung clan, and that after the investigation into the clan's internal affairs and Shin Woon, who was thought to be the person responsible for the disappearance cases, everyone is only filled with admiration for Shin Woon. He asks Dang whether or not it is normal for a place that is meant to be a den of evil to be so calm. But Dang cut him off and informed him that they had only looked at the families of the clan and that they needed to delve deeper while maintaining a higher sense of skepticism. Because Dang was so incensed that Zhuge had not addressed her by her cover name, she was on the verge of drawing her sword and slashing Zhuge to pieces in an instant. As a result of this, Zhuge was perspiring and made an impulsive apology to Ah Rin, which is Dang's cover name. When Ah Rin returns her blade to its scabbard, it causes him to let out a sigh of relief. However, Zhuge made the observation that, despite the fact that they are not instructing martial arts for some reason, the training that has been carried out has been quite methodical, and the guards who are in charge of the training are also doing their best to ensure that the students receive the greatest possible education. But Ah Rin seems to be daydreaming as she stares carefully at the trainees and muses that only based on the environment, it's already like a distinguished clan. Or perhaps she is thinking that it's because of the family-like atmosphere that they maintain. However, she was perplexed by the fact that no one had trained them because they had previously stated that Shin Woon is accountable for the education of the Straight Cloud Faction despite the fact that he had been wandering outdoors. Why did he hire the Straight Cloud Faction if he was going to be like this? She suddenly thought and because she can't understand Shin Woon and his motive. Afterwards, when someone suddenly speaks from behind to Dang and Zhujin and asks them what kind of interesting conversations they are having as a lover, both Dang and Zhujin are taken aback and their jaws drop in surprise. It was an elderly white man who was walking around with a tray in his hand that had a cup of tea. Ah Rin immediately jumped up when the elderly guy interrupted their talk, but she afterwards apologized for yelling at the old man because his statements were so ludicrous and his words were inappropriate. H. Wang No was the name of the elderly guy, and Zhujin goes by his cover name, which is Sima Gun. The elderly guy claimed that he had come out because he was bored in their quarters, and also because Nyon had informed him that every guard in their faction had come out. Additionally, Nyon explained to the elderly man that she had prepared tea for everyone in advance because she anticipated that they would be sweating heavily as a result of the exercise. She also learned that a member of the Straight Cloud faction was being held in reserve, and because of that, she's been trying to stand in for all sorts of difficult work and it's pitiful for her. Meanwhile, everyone was taken aback, including Nyon, Ah Rin, Juin, and H. Wang No, and they all turned their attention to whoever had yelled. The names of the two trainees who were fighting are Marluk and Ju Da Il. Marluk didn't want to show Da Il any mercy, even after the latter voiced his displeasure and pointed out that Marluk appeared to be attempting to kill him because he was punching him with an incredible amount of force. They were unaware that Nyon, Ah Rin, and Zhujin were following them around and watching them. The fact that Nyon didn't know how to serve them their tea was a problem. But the clan leader, who, to Nyon's surprise, appeared behind him and offered to serve the beverage instead of her. On the other hand, Ah Rin and Sima Gun, along with Da Il, Marluk, and Nyon, were gathered by Kang inside the Straight Cloud faction. Kang expressed his regret to each of them, explaining that he was unable to teach them due to a pressing matter. It was said by Da Il that their commander was very busy with his work, which is a statement that is very plausible given the circumstances. On the other hand, Sima Gun grinned and commented that there was no requirement for their leader to offer an apology. When Da Il and Sima Gun look at each other, it gives the impression that they dislike one another. But Kang cut him off and explained that he would be honest with them and said that they had received their first commission. Kang informs them that they are excellent enough, and he will tell them about the intricacies after they go through actual commission together. Everyone was startled, because they haven't even had any training yet. On the other hand, Marluk was ecstatic because he was hoping to embark on a mission. In addition, Da Il inquires as to what their first commission is, prompting Kang to inform them that it is derived from the Heavenly Favor Bank. Ah Rin was taken aback, and she inquired as to whether or not it was the heavy favor bank that Kang had mentioned being the largest bank in all of Zhongyuan, and whether or not it might be the Mount Tianwu Commission that has rattled the entire martial arts community. Ah Rin was perspiring as though she recognized the location, and she seemed to be sweating. However, Kang stated that Ah Rin was correct, and it would appear that the lady has a great deal of knowledge of Mount Tianmu. In addition to that, he mentioned that their client is Gil Gun Pyong who used to be the head of the Heavenly Favor Bank. 
In addition, Gil Gunpyong had created a bank that many scholars looked down upon, but he made a profit on all he had invested, which propelled him into a tremendous position. This was despite the fact that he was a remarkable genius and that he came from a distinguished family. However, due to the vast number of peculiarities he possessed, he was always well recognized by the general population. Gil Gunpyong was the kind of person who would never think twice about putting his enormous money toward accomplishing the goals that he had set for himself. The entire world of martial arts was thrown into disarray as a result of the commission that Gil Gunpyong left on his deathbed. It was a commission that would give 10% of the revenue that was earned in the Divine Favor Bank to those who would be able to succeed on a mission to Mount Tianmu, which is where the Tianmu hideout of the 72 hides out of Bandit Union is located. Even though it's a straightforward assignment, they need to bury a little wooden box beneath the summit of Mount Tianmu and bring back a branch from the Azure Divine Tree as evidence that they were successful. The bandits revere the highest point of the mountain as a sacred location. As a result of the constant and brutal reprisal meted out by the bandits, several troops have foolishly attempted the challenge in the hope of claiming the reward. But these forces have all been wiped out. However, because they will put the safety of the entire Beacon clan in jeopardy, Ah Rin appealed with their leader to reconsider their commission on Mount Tianmu. However, Kang reassures them that they do not need to be concerned about those bandits because he is going to be traveling with them. However, he warned them that he does not need subordinates who do not trust him and who manufacture excuses to leave whenever there is any danger. He told Ah Rin that if she wants to stop right away, then she needs to quit right now, but he will still pay her for the job that she has done over the past few days. He also noted his subcadenets who do not have confidence may leave the room at that very moment if they so choose. On the other hand, Ah Rin was unsure about whether or not she would go because she has not yet made up her mind. Sima Gun warned her that this was their best chance because if they continue working for the commission, they will undoubtedly meet an untimely end. And for that reason, he wanted them to resign from their positions at that precise moment. But Ah Rin didn't understand because no one was speaking up to quit. Now, what are you going to do? Tang's query. Marluk agreed because he likes mountains. The old man was willing to go because he was old and close to death he was nothing to fear. Mion and a person who was sitting on her side were both willing to join the commission. Dail has no other choice but to join as well. And Sima Gun dropped his jaw when Ah Rin finally decided to join the commission, and he has no other choice but to join as well because of Ah Rin. The latter begged for permission to question their leader about the strategy they would use to sneak up on the summit of Mount Tianmu. Afterwards, the leader explains to them that they will not go through the bandit's lair because there is no reason to do so in the first place because he has already located an unexplored mountain pathway. After hearing it, Ah Rin conceived of a new route that sidesteps both the bandit's stronghold and the savage beasts, and weird monsters that inhabit the mountain, as well as the numerous traps set up by the Tianmu hideaway. She begins to speculate to herself as to whether or not the Straight Cloud Faction's clan leader is attempting to discover the private thoughts of the faction's members. If he had it thought out up to that point and behaved accordingly, then he is a truly thoughtful and complex individual. When the leader of their clan revealed to them that not everyone would be allowed to take part in the Mount Tianmu Commission, all of them were startled because the commission will need to be completed in the shortest period of time possible with the fewest number of participants conceivable. In order to scale Mount Tianmu, Kang does it by himself, therefore, he will bring the members of the faction who are equipped with the required talent. Even the selection of the grounds for the Straight Cloud faction had been done with this idea for the Mount Tianmu commission in mind, which added to Ah Rin's overwhelming sense of bewilderment. However, she was unaware of the skills that might have been held by those individuals whom she had previously categorized as a ragtag group. Kang yells out the names of H. Wang No, Marluk, Sima Gun, and Chi Ah Rin, indicating that these are the individuals who will travel to Mount Tianmu with him. He also stated that it is a tragedy that not all members are able to participate in their first commission, and that he was hopeful that the remaining members would not be disheartened by his decision. However, those individuals who have chosen to remain behind will not be idle because additional commissions have been organized for them all. He appointed Ju Ti as the interim leader of the commission group, and he will appoint carriers to them so that they may begin traveling to Nanchang and Jiangxi as soon as the sun rises tomorrow. He will hand over Ju Ti a letter, and once they reach Nanchang and Jianji, he will read the letter and they will immediately begin carrying out the instructions that were written down. I'll do as you command. Utter Juti then took the letter that their clan leader handed over. On the other hand, Sima Gun was too obstinate, and he asked Ah Rin in his mind if they are really going to join in the commission since he doesn't want to and kept on asking Ah Rin to withdraw. But Ah Rin replied that they will need to be with Shin Woon in order to grasp what is on his mind. 
but Kang abruptly shifts his attention to them because he can still hear the conversation they were having when he first saw them at the guard exam. Tisk, it's far too early to be surprised, he added. Meanwhile, on the Tianu hideout, members of the first wolf squad appear to be searching for something because the members were complaining that he was going to lose his mind because it seems that they were searching the Mount Tianu for a long period of time. Some say that he worried that they might be lost and that if they take just a few more steps outside, it will be a dangerous area for them to be in. Their squad leader was infuriated by their complaints, so he told them that if their boss wanted them to do it, then they had better do it, and if they had any problems, they should inform their boss directly and not to him. Or should I tell him in your stead? The squad leader added. Afterward, the first wolf squad continued to move around and look for something while conversing about Shin Woon and the Beacon clan and their commission. They said that the Beacon clan is not the place for brothers who are scoundrels and who are digging around in an attempt to injure themselves. One of the members was irritated and swore that as soon as he got his hands on Shin Woon, he would separate Shin Woon's limbs from his torso and release them. On the other hand, a member of the first wolf squad began to enjoy exploring Mount Tianwu since he was able to learn about the mountain paths because he was new to it. This allowed him to gain an appreciation for the mountain's terrain. When he heard a voice, whether it belonged to a person or anything else, he abruptly whirled around. However, much to his astonishment, one of their members strangled him because, according to one of their members, he was slowly walking towards the edge of the cliff. He was attempting to explain that he heard some type of noise on the cliff, but the man was becoming angry at him for talking back at him, so he couldn't continue his statement. He thought the man was angry with him. The man also gave him instructions to follow after him and refrained from further angering him despite the fact that he was already upset. The man had no choice but to follow the other member, despite the fact that he was still perplexed by the voice that he had heard, yet, as he had no other option, he followed the other member. On the other hand, Kang, Arin, Sima and Gun were climbing the cliff at the same time, and the commotion that was noticed by a member of the first wolf squad came from them. Kang informs Sima Gun that he can relax a little bit because it appears like the first wolf unit has totally gone. In light of the fact that he was still getting acquainted with the wall tiger technique, Sima Gun expressed his apologies to him. Marluk and H. Wang No, who were hanging from their waist bound and using rope tied on the waist of their clan head, asked if their clan leader was truly fine and expressed their concern for him. However, Kang told them that he was truly fine and they don't need to worry about him because he was so lucky to be able to figure out an effective use for natural power, and his hand and feet feel as if they are one with the wall even without the wall tiger technique as if that wasn't the case. He was planning to secretly summon his bone spears to grab and climb up the cliff. On the other hand, Marluk noticed something and he shouted to their clan leader that he saw an empty spot under their feet. So they all abruptly jump except H. Wang No who was carried by their clan leader since his eyes were blindfolded. It really does exist. Utter Ah Rin. Ah Rin questioned the leader of their clan about how he learned about the location. The chief of the clan, however, did not answer her question and instead stated that he had previously experienced the same thing but that she always asks questions as if she were conducting an investigation into him. Ah Rin has grasped the meaning of his inquiry and she quickly apologized for going too far with their clan leader because if she didn't apologize, the leader of their clan might have been able to figure out who they really were. Despite this, the clan leader acknowledges her apology and tells the other members of the group that the location in question is a safe haven that his father had constructed in the past. And it wasn't too long ago when he had an epiphany about the actual function that location plays. Marluk, on the other hand, finds something written in the rock but he is unable to decipher what it says, so, he approaches their clan chief for assistance. The secret cave of all things was described in the inscription that was carved into the rock, and everyone who carelessly enters the location without having made up their mind to do so will inevitably meet their end there. And as a consequence of this, Sima Gun appears to be anxious since there may be a great deal of danger with him. Kang, on the other hand, was under the impression that he had arrived at the correct location given that it was the secret way to the summit of Mount Tianmu. 200 years ago, the greatest specialist of formations and trap mechanisms in all of the several martial worlds, and that location holds everything pertaining to Man Sang Ya. He can't help but break out in a grin as he discusses his plans to plunder that location for all of the valuable items he can find there. Afterwards, Sima Gun started to light a torch, but his entire body was quivering out of terror, and his eyes enlarged while his face was sweating. He also had a palpable sweaty face, because it appears that he is unable to even take a single step, everyone is staring at him. Because of this, Kang made fun of him by saying that everyone else is calm, except for him, who looks like he's about to cry. 
because Sima Gun had overheard legends of the hidden cave being recounted at the Marshall Temple. He informed the head of their clan that venturing into it would be a highly risky endeavor. Mang sang -ya was utterly deranged, and he was the kind of person who, for the sake of a relatively little disagreement, single-handedly brought down a big religious community. To commit suicide, one must go through the system of his traps in the eight-gate configuration. But the leader of the clan reassured him that there was no need to be concerned, explaining that, as he had stated earlier, he had only brought along individuals who were capable of breaking into the concealed cave. In addition, Sima Gun's eyes abruptly widen, and he points his finger toward the front of their sockets. They appeared to be moving into the first compartment when they noticed what appeared to be a light in front of them. When Kang first saw it, a smile broke out on his face, and he immediately wanted to get started. They proceeded through the opening into the first chamber of the cave, and as they glanced around, they noticed that there were fragments of light that had been affixed to the walls in order to illuminate the entire area. Even though it could just be a cave, H. Wang No reported to their boss that he was experiencing an unexplainable chill. The location must be the first test given that it stated first compartment on the door leading into it. In addition to this, Marluk's vision is restricted to nothing but water, and he cannot see anything else anywhere else. Sima Gun made a sudden approach toward their clan leader and informed them that the structure must have evolved over time as a result of the natural occurrence. As a result, he urged that they go back and look for another route. However, the leader of their clan told them not to because the location itself is a test and they should pay great attention to both sides. And as they were doing so, Ah Rin noticed a rock that looked like it was barely big enough for one person to climb upon it. And when she turns around, she sees the same thing on the opposite side. This indicates that two people need to get into the water and swim to separate rocks. As soon as he heard it, Sima Gun breathed out a sigh of relief since it appeared that Man Sang Ya had a conscience, which made the first trap a little bit easier to set. But when the clan elder explained that practically one would have to swim through the heavenly glacier water while avoiding the armored ghost fish, he was taken aback by the information. Even the clan leader gets an earful from him as he yells at him that the heavenly glacial water is divine water that can be found in the center of the northern sea ice fortress, which possesses the utmost coldness. The armored ghost fish is a monster species of fish that may be found in the thick vegetation of Nanman's jungle. It has scales that seem like steel armored plates and teeth that look like drills. The leader of the clan bursts out laughing when he suddenly realizes that Sima Gun appears to be knowledgeable. And because Sim Gun was unsuccessful in persuading their leader to turn around and go back, he suddenly knelt down on the ground like a kid and started crying. In addition to this, he stated that it was weird and insane because Mang Senya added armored ghost fish to the heavenly glacier water and poured enough of it into the cave to completely drown it. Because he was so terrified, he suddenly took hold of one of their clan leader's legs and pleaded with him to bring him back. On the other hand Ah Rin was under the impression that anyone who had not yet achieved mastery of the Yin Yang Kai art form would perish the instant they entered the heavenly glacier water because they would not be able to withstand the extreme cold. It is also believed that the group of armored ghost fish can even consume zenith-level specialists, and that the only people who are able to solve this trial are masters who are able to perform the duckweed crossing technique. It was a more advanced form of martial arts than the parts of a lighter body, which are the types of arts that let one to move freely across the surface of water. And due to the fact that time is running out and the required explanation appears to be sufficient, Kang calls for Marluk to come in front of him so that they may start. Despite this, Ah Rin harbors ill will toward their clan chief, although she was unaware that their clan leader had overheard her thoughts about him. She came to the conclusion that their clan leader had chosen them because they would not be a source of future conflict even if they were to be sacrificed at that location. She was irate with the leader of their clan, and if he had played any games, she would have neutralized him right now. However, she was taken aback because the leader of their clan was instructing Marluk in the lotus position at the time. After that, he sat behind Marluk and placed his hand on the ladder's back then he unleashed a tremendous force in the direction of Marluk. Even Sima Gun saw how powerful it was and commented that even his inner Kai was beginning to stabilize as a result of their clan leader's energy. But Ah Rin couldn't believe what she saw when she discovered that Shin Woon had already attained the level of transcended. On the other hand, Kang was taken aback by Marluk due to the fact that he has not been trained in any form of martial arts. Nonetheless, his eight remarkable meridians are in immaculate condition, which is the reason why Marluk has no problem taking Kang's energy. The latter ground his teeth together in concentration as he absorbed the energy. Despite this, the status window materialized and it spoke something about the art of energy transmission. It was the kind of transmission method that distributes a portion of the caster's energy to the recipient. 
According to the status window, Marluk's body is loaded with absolute cold energy, which protects it from damage caused by the cold. For this reason, Kang decided to choose Marluk in the first trial since his constitution possesses the ability that is most suited to accomplish this goal. In addition, Kang was able to comprehend the physical characteristics of Marluk's body by making use of the hundred spirit eyes that he had acquired as a result of the transformation of his martial body into the heaven-defying martial body. According to the status window, the heaven-defying martial body cannot be owned by humans and can only be obtained by monstrous sage. On the other hand, the hundred spirit eyes have the ability to look at the martial body and attribute of targets with a lower level than their own. When the level of one's competency and a skill improves, a greater number of one's attributes increases. Afterwards, Kang gave Arin a look before speaking to her in his mind and revealing that he will only be employing a select few of his talents to ensure his continued vitality. Got it. Dang Arin, he added. On the other hand, Arin was perplexed, and she was at a loss for words because the clan leader was talking to her in his mind. After that, Kang seems to be about to finish sending energy to Marluk. He thought that his body was already good because of the resistance of frost and martial body as well as both the Kai of the Thundercloud and in the Kai of the Eastern Shining Sage, so he should have been able to adequately endure the water. Then, Marluk's eyes open, he stares at his palm, and it was shaking. He can sense the energy that Kang gave him, and he abruptly kneels in the ground. He also says that he met his lifelong leader, and from this day forward till the day he dies, he would remain with the leader. Kang, on the other hand, disrobed himself and stated that Marluk would show his thanks once they had successfully completed the first test. But just as he was ready to remove the remainder of his clothing, Ah Rin suddenly yelled at him and demanded to know what he was doing. Because Ah Rin was a lady, and it is considered impolite for a man to remove his clothes in front of a lady. But Kang puts on a grin and asks Ah Rin whether she thinks he would send his subordinates alone in a dangerous location then he informs her that he will be accompanying them himself. Ah Rin was dazed. She couldn't believe that their clan leader would join Marluk on the glacial water. Meanwhile, when Kang and Marluk are standing in front of the glacial water, Sima Gun is astonished when he sees Kang perform the art of energy transmission to his subordinate. He really wants to clear the trial with Marluk, and he adds that the art of energy transmission is extremely dangerous and might cause the caster to lose their inner Kai, and that's why it's only done by the clan or by the heir of the family. In his mind the clan leader placed his trust in people who he met not long ago. He was a strange one, and he was an amusing person. Kang put his hand on Marluk's shoulder and told him not to worry anymore, and that he would not be attacked by armored ghost fishes he assured him that. He added, at the count of three, he must jump into the water and swim without stopping and go to rock at the right side. Ha Rin is not convinced of his plan. The cold of the glacing water is to be managed using the inner Kai, but the armored ghost fishes are not easy to deal with. They were all shocked when Kang suddenly sliced his arms and rushed at the water, and he dives into it, and Marluk going as well when he dives into the water. His whole body shakes and it is cold enough. He feels the blood on his body has frozen, as he struggles he realizes that he must survive this, and never be disappointed the clan leader. He swims toward and told to himself that he Marluk will never surrender, and he notices that the armored ghost fishes were not to be found, and must be chasing the clan leader, then suddenly his chest was glowing, and light within him is absorbing the cold, and he feels warm into his body. He rises under the water while catching his breath, and he successfully got into the rock, and he was worried about his leader, and their leader is not yet to be seen. They were all silent waiting for their leader. Kang makes a diving maneuver into the water of the glacier and swims downward till he reaches the bottom. He anticipated that others would claim that it would be bone-chillingly chilly, but he found the temperature to be just right for relaxing and rejuvenating him. To think that he would come across such a fantastic chance so early on in the process of the first trial demonstrates how very lucky he was. Because one of the passive effects of the heaven-defying martial body is something called the five elements resistance, and what this does is offer an incredibly strong resistance to the elements of metal, wood, water, fire, and earth respectively. The cold is being captured by the five element resistance, and the Kai of the Eastern Brilliant Sage is absorbing the cold as inner Kai. He does this while standing at the bottom of the glacier water, and he is overjoyed because everything went so well, and was so well planned that he was able to receive such extraordinary and pure inner Kai at no cost. However, H. Wang No together with Ah Rin and Sima Gun who were standing by were curious on what is happening to their clan leader, and Marluk who dove in the glacier water. When their clan leader didn't come up, Ah Rin suddenly made a step forward through the glacier water, and Sima Gun who saw her restrained her for what she was doing. 
but Ah Rin couldn't stop her because she reasoned that she needed to save their clan leader before it's too late. They were yelling at each other because Sima Gun was worried since it was dangerous for her as well. Get out of the way, shout of Ah Rin. On the other hand, Marluk was additionally concerned about their clan leader who, at that very moment, had not yet emerged from the glacier's water. But he noticed a light emerging on the water, and even Ah Rin and Sima Gun saw it, which caused them to drop their mouths. Sima Gun then grabbed H Wang No and held him tightly because of the tremendous amount of energy that was growing along with the water. After that, ghost fish started dropping along with the glacier water, and Ah Rin and Sima Gun were surprised to see one of those fish fall directly in front of them. In addition, when Marluk saw the hand of their clan leader grab the stone, then abruptly climb it, it filled him with joy. Kang invites Marluk to feel around the surface of the rock, and he will locate an area that appears to be different. After Marlin located it, they exerted as much force as they could on it. After that, there was an abrupt shake followed by the precipitation of a number of fragments of small rocks. The water from the glacier then appeared to be draining away like a tornado that was sucking in sediment at the base of the glacier. Ah Rin is startled and looks across at the leader of their clan, wondering to herself just what he is. However, she was abruptly brought out of her thoughts when the leader of their clan demanded that she stop mindlessly wandering around and instead pass him his garments. After the water had been removed, they all congregated at the base of the mountain and noticed a staircase. Kang claimed that this staircase was the authentic route to the summit of Mount Tianmu, and because they don't have time, Kang gave his subordinates the order to enter right away, and Marluk was given the responsibility of carrying H. Wang No. They make use of a torch to illuminate their path, and while they are ascending the steps, Sima Gun suddenly thinks about Shin Woon, who is suddenly looking so majestic. He has a mountain of questions that he has been longing to ask, and if he does not get the chance to ask, he is going to go crazy. After noticing a boulder, Kang informed them that they had arrived at the second trial, because the route that they were about to enter was too dark, and the only light that they saw was too small, which indicates that it was too distant. Sima Gun remarked that it seems like the exit is quite a ways ahead, and Ah Rin added that the area between is pitch black and appears to be dangerous. Marluk was carrying H Wang No in his back when Kang suddenly turned around and told H Wang No that it was now his turn. This prompted Marluk to immediately release him. The rope that was tied around H. Wang No's shoe was suddenly removed, and he asked Marluk to hand him his bow. H. Wang No then retied the rope around the bow, and he secured his arrow around his waist. It was shown in the status box that He No did not possess a martial body, but that his attribute was exceptional in hearing. After that, he fastened the rope to the arrow and directed his bow and arrow at the walkway in front of them. On the other hand, Sima Gun was taken aback by the fact that H. Wang No could still use a bow, an arrow despite having his eyes covered, and he was employing the horn bow of Goryeo, which is said to be the dwelling place of the bow god. The old man gave his response, which was that it was appropriate because he had a tenuous connection with them when he was younger. But Kang cut them off in the middle of their conversation and asked the old man if he brought what he had been telling him about. The old man said, of course, I'll shoot it now. After that, he pointed his arrow in the direction of the walkway, and as soon as he let go of his arrow, a light emanated from it that illuminated everything it went by as it passed. When the arrow hits something, Kang tells him to draw back, but the old man appears to have difficulty pulling back his arrow, and to the old man's surprise, Kang suddenly grabs the rope by force and pulls it back himself. When Sima Gun, Ah Rin, and Marluk look at the arrow, they are taken aback when they notice that it has been penetrated by a large insect. When the clan leader inquired about the nature of the insect, Ah Rin exhibited a bewildered expression. She questioned herself, why is their clan leader asking as if she would definitely know what it is? Or is it possible that their clan leader already knows who she is because the clan that she was raised in is the most well-versed in poison out of the entire martial world? As beads of sweat began to appear on her face, she became perplexed and was at a loss for words. Kang quickly let go of the insect and dropped it on the ground before stepping into it. He then announced that the blackness behind him was not actually dark but rather packed with venomous insects. Kang asks Ah Rin and Sima Gun the name of the dangerous insect that H. Wang No was able to capture in his bow and arrow because they are currently in a standby position. Ah Rin furrowed her brow and sweat started to form in her face after the query of Kang, but he was confused by her question because there's no way that they made a mistake that would betray their identity along with Sima Gun. 
However, despite this, she continues to reply that, Based on the information she has, it appears to be a black death roach. Ah Rin ignored Sima Gun and continued to explain that the scariest aspect of the black death roach is that it possesses Kai dissipation poison that scatters the inner Kai when Sima Gun was surprised and asked Ah Rin if she was referring to the abominable toxic insect that lives in the desert of the boundless wasteland. But to Ah Rin's surprise, she furrowed her brow when their clan leader seemed to belittle the capability of the black death roach in addition to this. Just as she was about to say something, Kang turned to H. Wang No and asked her to sit in the lotus position because he will once again perform the art of energy transmission, despite the fact that only two hours had passed since he sent energy to Marluk. On the other hand, Kang moved behind H. Wang No and sat down, after which he put his hand on the back of the older guy. He was sending energy, but he became aware that it was not beneficial due to the fact that he is well over 70 years old and his scars from the past are really rather deep. It is true that his meridians have become worn down, but the more serious problem is that the meridian that runs in the direction of his lower belly has sustained significant damage. In order for this to have happened, he must have lived up to this point while enduring excruciating pain, because there is now no other option available but to send him additional huge energy. H. Wang no bleeds out somewhat on his mouth as a consequence of this. Both Ah Rin and Sima Gun were unable to believe it and inquired how it is possible when Sima Gun was able to sense the energy that he sensed coming from their clan leader to resemble that man. It was because they were able to witness a Grand Taoist give his retirement address on the same day that Ah Rin and Sima Gun became members of the Murin Union. The man had previously served as the leader of the Wudang sect and was known as the Sword Sage Jade Spiritual Master. Sima Gun can feel the same Kai from Shin Wun as the one who has both the Grand Taoist and the greatest swordsman from the Order sect. They are dead wrong about Shin Wun since he cannot be one who has acquired the demonic art. Moreover, Kang was still sending energy to H. Wang No when his eyes suddenly opened and noticed that the status window stated his hidden quest. The road to becoming a healer has been completed because he achieved to heal 30 people in a critical condition and he will receive a massive amount of additional experience for the attribute medical art as a reward. But Kang was confused in those 30 people that the status window mentioned. But then he realized that it could be from the poisoned women he healed at the jail. But his eyes widened when the status window appeared again and stated that he discovered the first medical unknown to the world and the attribute of the medical art has reached its limit and has evolved to sage medical art. He also obtained the new skills, reverse purification, accumulative power reinforcement and white wishes. He also obtains the hidden quest, the road to becoming a healer too. In addition, Kang was overjoyed because sage medical arts had reached the SS rank and it was feasible for him to assume that a necromancer like him would be able to attain the power of a healer because he had used natural power to he treat H. Wang No. This made Kang extremely happy. Following that, he told H. Wang No that he had finished delivering him energy but Kang interrupted the old man just as he was about to question how he had accomplished that and informed him that they would talk about it at a later time. Furthermore, Kang got to his feet and informed his subordinates that, in addition to the black death roaches, he had a sneaking suspicion that the passageway included a number of other potentially lethal trap mechanisms. He asks H. Wang No to protect him since he knows that H. Wang No will destroy the trap mechanism once he has entered the passageway. Understood. Utter H. Wang No then he lifted his bow, an arrow as if he was ready to strike. Afterwards, as Kang made his way to the passageway, he noticed that the area was illuminated by a dim light produced by those black death roaches. After he asks those roaches to come, a large number of black death roaches fly at him and are surrounded by them. It grabs his entire body in an instant and begins to bite him. But he must bear the suffering. Because of his exceptional tolerance to poison, it is quite unlikely that he will sustain any harm from the poisonous substance in question. In addition, his resistance to poison increased to a S-plus rank as a direct result of him using the scythe of dissolving poison, because he will store within his body the Kai dissipation poison that requires the usage of inner Kai. His entire body is now full of roaches, and they are biting him for as long as they want. He will transfer this poison to the scythe of melting poison so that he can utilize it in the future. Afterwards, he became aware that something was coming in front of him. Let's see, shall we? As expected of the now ghost. He added, on the other hand, during the time when H. Wang No was aiming at their clan leader, who was covered with black death roaches all over his body, he had the thought that even though he was blind, he could still see it. Even though it was in black and white, he can undoubtedly recognize him. 
Then he suddenly strikes his bow and arrow on their clan leader, and just as it was about to reach their clan leader, the bow and arrow was cut in half, and then it turned to the side of their clan leader and exploded as if it were some kind of firecrackers. When Ah Rin and Sima Gun witnessed what had occurred, they both furrowed their brows and noted that it was hard to believe that someone would be capable of pulling something like that off. They made the same observation about the blind archer who was guarding their clan leader. Kang, on the other hand, is disheartened after discovering that the Black Death Roaches were the only test for their second trial. Nonetheless, given that he already has an adequate quantity of poison, he just passes through the door and opens it. And as soon as he opened the door, the Black Death Roaches appeared to be dissolving beneath the light until it gradually dissolved into his whole body. At that point, he turned to his subordinates and informed them that they are heading to the next trial. Furthermore, as Kang and his minions ascended the stairs into the cave, they were followed by the cave's inhabitants. Ah Rin turned his head to look at H. Wang No and noted that he had been carried the entire time. However, at that very moment, after their clan chief had transferred him energy, he was now walking with his own strength, and he displays no signs of exhaustion despite the fact that they have been traveling for a considerable amount of time. She gives a sigh before turning to gaze at the leader of their clan, at which point she has a sudden recollection of a youngster who was joyfully running, but she quickly pushes the image out of her mind since she has already made up her mind not to give that boy any more reasons to have false hope. They have already arrived at the chamber where their third trial will take place after having to trek for quite some distance. When Ah Rin and Sima Gun first saw the location, they were perplexed since it appeared to be empty. When Marluk glanced around, he said that the setting was weird because there was nothing there. Marluk commented that the place was empty but it felt strange. Marluk, there doesn't seem to be anything here just as you said. Utter Ken. But Sima Gun had seen something in the area, and he was going to keep it to himself until their clan leader turned to him and asked him whether it was a formation. He was nervous because he didn't know how much their clan head knew about him and Ah Rin, and that made him sweat because at first, Shin Woon asked Dang about deadly insects and now he was asking him about the formation. Nevertheless, he reacted by stating that Shin Woon was correct and that the location was protected by Man Sang Ya's structure. Even yet, they run the risk of putting themselves in harm's way if they divulge their names. This is due to the fact that Shin Woon was a transcendent specialist who had dedicated subordinates who possess powers that cannot be ignored. But as of right now, the most effective strategy would be for them to carry out the directives of their clan head and figure out how to break the formation as quickly as they can so that they can escape. Afterwards, he added that it appears to be a formation that depicts a disguised landscape by the arrangement of natural elements. Specifically, he said that it looks like a camouflaged forest. When Shin Woon asked him whether he could find a solution to it, he didn't waste any time before responding that he would give it a shot. And as a result of that, Ah Rin's jaw fell because she was shocked and she had no idea that Sima Gun was able to deconstruct Man Sang Jan's formation. Furthermore, after Sima Gun has finished his inspection of the area, he will crouch down, collect the stone, and then stand back up. He was under the impression that it was a structure that incorporates natural elements, so he flipped the rock, moved the orchid, and planted it in that location. He abruptly jumped when a stalactite appeared and he thought it needed to be encased in soil. On the other hand, Kang was observing Sima Gun when he referred to him as Heavenly Brain. However, this was not the case, as Kang had to first observe the abilities of the present Heavenly Fool of the Zhuge clan. The most naive individual in both the heavens and the earth, the Heavenly Fool was how Zhuge Gun was referred to by his tribe in the past. The Zhuge clan, which had previously produced generations of people who excelled in formations and tactics, failed to pass on any talent to him when he was born. However, he not only lacked talent, but he also lacked motivation to succeed. Zhuge Gun had turned his back on his studies and training and instead spent the entire day lounging around. Although he was the second son of Zhuge Sung, the clan chief and member of the Zhuge clan, which had taken over the military strategy department of the Muram Union, he was simply assigned to the Flying Hawk Squad rather than the post within the Union. This was despite the fact that Zhuge Sung had been the one who had taken over the department. To tell the truth, Zhuge Gun's performance up until this point was really a sham. After seeing his parents turn distant toward him after he had exhibited his skill, Zhuge Sung began living a life in which he hid his talent. This is evidenced by the fact that Zhuge Gun was a child that Zhuge Sung had accidentally with a prostitute. On the day that the sect wiped off his clan, he was the only member of his family to survive. And from that day onward, he began to conceal his true identity. In addition, he became renowned as the Heavenly Brain due to his remarkable performance over a number of conflicts, despite the fact that he eventually met his end. 
Huge Gun's good strategies and formation led to him becoming the head strategist of the faction that opposed the Blood Cult. Kang had never entertained the idea that Huge Gun would voluntarily join his clan. Furthermore, the leader of their clan was informed by Sima Gun that the configuration in question was a thousand road diluting shadow formation that was utilized in the conflict with the Mount Huang sect, and that it appears to be a modified version of that. When the chief of their tribe asks him whether he knows how to solve it, he immediately says yes and points his finger in the direction of the large boulder, explaining that it was one of the key objects that composes the structure. In the event that the boulder were to be destroyed, the formation as a whole would fall apart. Even though Sima Gun was unaware, he was overjoyed when Shin Woon put his hand on his shoulder and complimented him on how great his work was because Sima Gun's work had impressed the leader. On the other hand, Kang moves towards the boulder and punches it with his immense force. As a consequence, the boulder was crushed into bits, and then the stalactite appeared in the ceiling of the location. After that, they found the door leading outside. Warlock remarked that Sima Gun's performance was quite remarkable, but Sima Gun couldn't help but scratch his head and said that it turned out that he was simply lucky. Sima Gun, however, observes something as they get closer to the entrance, and it appears like Man Sang Ya has written something on the door. The sentence reads that only one person who is prepared to risk dying to protect their friends may attend the last trial. Sima Gun was taken aback when Ah Rin announced that she would go, and he was about to argue with her when Ah Rin abruptly cut him off. She explained her decision by saying that she was the only one who hadn't been able to offer any assistance since they had entered the cave. She was resolute, and competing would be the sensible option for her to do at this point. But Kang confronted her and argued against her desire to participate in the subsequent trial. He reasoned that he had brought all of them to the cave so that they could gain experience. He was on the verge of cursing Ah Rin but he restrained himself because it was not the appropriate time. Instead, he confronts her with the question of what nonsense she is talking about, and Kang says that he would be the one who would go. Ah Rin was stunned, but Ah Rin continued to push, and just as she was ready to say anything, Kang asked them who among them is stronger than he is. When no one answered, Kang informed them that he would enter the door. However, just as he was getting ready to go, Ah Rin called him and handed him the ox hair stinger case. There are needles inside that have been coated with the best quality paralysis poison, and he can use it as a hidden weapon or utilize the poison to minimize the amount of pain he feels in the event that he suffers a significant injury. Kang, on the other hand, took a look at the ox hair stinger case and came to the conclusion that it was the clan's top secret hidden weapon. He believed that it should only be given to members of the clan when they were in a situation in which their lives were in danger. If word got out that the item existed, Ah Rin's bloodline would be severely punished. Despite this, she still gave it to him. He quickly took the object and stowed it away beneath his clothing. He assured Ah Rin that he would put it to productive use and then give it back to her. When he was about to go, Kang turned to his subordinates and told them that they have no reason to be concerned because everything will be resolved in a short amount of time. After that, he went ahead and opened the door to the subsequent trial. He perceived something on his front, something that looked like a snake but had feathers. And when the monster rose to its feet and let out a force, Kang suddenly beamed a smile and expressed his appreciation for the food that was on his front. The status panel appeared and revealed that the creature in front of Kang was a flying salamander. That radiates a strong wrath against the invader. The flying salamander is also known as a serpentine monster due to the fact that the creature was half salamander and half serpentine in its appearance. In addition to this, the salamander started to get angry and approached Kang. But the latter, who was unafraid of the creature, explained that from the very beginning, he takes everything seriously, and that he does not have the luxury of doing things easily. Afterwards, Kang suddenly dissipated the force he had been holding in his hand and called forth his several skeleton warriors. And because he left his subordinates outdoors, it was perfectly acceptable for him to cultivate his skeleton warrior, and nobody will be the wiser about the fact that he owns them. In addition to this, the salamander was exerting force, and its eyes were glowing brightly as it moved closer to the skeleton warriors who were firmly gripping their swords and rushing towards the creature. The salamander uses its jaws to seize one of the skeletons, while its tail attacks the other two skeletons. After that, the salamander came to an abrupt halt, and it appeared that it seemed to be observing its opponent. However, a few skeleton warriors quickly struck the salamander using force on their palm while other skeletons abruptly struck their sword and hit every portion of the salamander's body. The skeleton was tossed when the salamander struck its wings, which caused the skeleton to be flung. Furthermore, the peak swordsman suddenly advance toward the salamander and strike its sword at the opponent. Then, a massive force that forms a light is released, which causes one leg of the salamander to be cut. This causes the creature to become enraged, 
and it suddenly flies upward, dropping the skeleton that was in its mouth and being watched by a large number of skeleton warriors, including the peak swordsmen, who were still holding its swords and still shining with force. On the other hand, the salamander was furious and waving its wings, and as a consequence, the salamander was releasing a large quantity of its stored energy. Kang, accompanied by his skeleton soldiers, was looking skyward at the salamander and commented that the salamander was emitting a significant quantity of inner Kai. However, Kang was astounded when the salamander suddenly unleashed its immense might on them. This is why he yelled for his skeleton warriors to spread out throughout the battlefield. Some of the skeletons are able to avoid being hit by the huge force, but others are not. As a result of this, Kang made a decision to call forth an ally who possessed the capacity to fly as well. After that, he placed his hand on the ground and used his skill revive, and the two gradually emerged in the light on the ground. He summoned two of his newly obtained subordinates, Quack Ju San, who has the skill of a vampire lord, and Gong Sun Chu, who is a basilisk. Now, round two begins, he added. On the other hand, it was stated in the status window that his revive skill was the most powerful strength given to necromancers, and that it was his ability to revive and control the monster he had killed. Additionally, it stated that it would revive the dead monster to its form when it was alive, and that the revive monster would retain the abilities and skills it had before it died. Kang believed that he would never have a need to utilize the revive skill, but since Quack Ju San and Gong Sun Chu were deemed to be monsters, he waited until the skill could be used before attempting to use it. In addition to this, Kang observed that there's something strange at Quack and Chu. After then, the status window pops up and it says that he has found a new effect of revive, and that the Vampire Lord and the Basilisk as a veteran creature have been called forth. He was the first player to summon a veteran entity in the game. In addition, as a reward for making the discovery, he was given a significant quantity of experience, and his overall level was raised. On the other hand, the veteran entity is a one-of-a-kind creature that was produced when tainted mana and the Kai of a monster that had been sacrificed were combined. It has better statistics than the average entity, and it can learn a new ability whenever it gains a level, and once it reaches the maximum level for its class, but whether or not it can learn further skills is still up for question. Kang had a grin on his face and was still thinking that he could exceed the monster's limit when the peak swordsman clack its mouth for his attention and pointing its finger upward since the salamander was already approaching them. As a result, Kang swiftly directed Quack and Chu to proceed to their task, and he continued to think that he could overcome the monster's limit. And as a consequence of this, Quack gradually disappeared while Chu was making use of his demonic eyes of petrification. The salamander, whose eyes were gleaming and who was releasing force while waiting for the opponents, the basilisk eye glowed, and he made a hasty leap and released an aura. The salamander was shocked and abruptly smacked its own tail. After that, Quack appeared and spread his blood in the air, and he lifted his hand and formed a blade veil. Afterward, he struck down, and then those blade veils rushed toward the salamander. The body of the salamander was punctured multiple times by the blade veils of Quack Ju San, which ultimately led to it collapsing to the ground. After that, the basilisk moved closer to the salamander and used his demonic eye petrification ability to attack the salamander. In addition, the basilisk bared its razor-sharp teeth and bit the salamander. The salamander, whose body was being penetrated by the sharp teeth, was in excruciating pain and seemed at a loss for what to do other than grumble. After that, a number of skeletons, including the most skilled swordsmen, approached the salamander and thrust their swords into it. All the while the basilisk continued to bite the salamander until a green liquid began to emanate from its body. When all of a sudden, the salamander's eyes were enlarged and was spewing fire all over its body, and as a consequence, all of the skeleton warriors, including the basilisk, were surprised, and they abruptly ran away from the salamander, who had swiftly risen up and seemed to regain its vigor as it released fire. However, before the salamander could strike them, Kang abruptly pierced the salamander's head with his sword, which caused the creature to tumble back down onto the ground. Kang pressed so hard on the sword that it entered the entire head of the salamander and pierced on the ground. As a result, the sword released a large amount of force and formed a light as it scattered across the area. This occurred because Kang had pressed so hard on the sword till it had penetrated the entire head of the salamander. After that, he used his heavenly thunder compression attack because he had to take care of the salamander before it got burned because the corpse of a monster is a material that is comparable to riches for a blacksmith. The status window appeared and informed Kang that the monster known as the flying salamander had been defeated, and that as a reward, he will be given the inner core. His level is now 51 and the rank he has achieved in necromancy is s in addition to this, 
He advances his proficiency in all of the skills associated with necromancy. A number of new abilities, such as Guillotine Bones, Curse of Berserker, Extortion, and Monster Exorcist, have been acquired by him, and all of his statistics have been permanently raised. The Scythe of Melting Poison has amassed a tremendous amount of natural force, and the total quantity of power that it is capable of absorbing has reached its limit. As a result, the Scythe of Melting Poison has advanced to rank S. On the other hand, Kang was holding his Scythe, and it appears that it has undergone some changes as a result of the large ingestion of poison. Because if the Flying Salamander had gone all out from the very beginning, it would not have been an easy task. He contemplates whether or not it would be okay for him to eliminate monsters in order to achieve natural power. It was fortunate for him that the salamander misjudged him and the monsters that he had summoned, as this contributed to him winning the battle. Kang was about to dismember the salamander when he observed that it appeared to be already dead. This prompted him to suddenly kneel on the ground and attempt to revive it. In addition, Kang brought his palm up to the salamander's head and let off a burst of energy. After that, a figure that resembled a circle of light developed beneath the salamander, and it was successful because the salamander's eyes suddenly opened wide and began to glow and its cut arm was already healed. It started growling angrily at Kang as it suddenly stood up. The status window materializes out of nowhere to inform Kang that the flame serpent monster has been brought back to life and that it has been added to the roster of his summons. On the other hand, the salamander was suddenly moving closer to Kang, but when it got close, Kang put his hand on the salamander's head as if he was attempting to tame it, and as a direct result, the salamander quickly stopped attacking him. According to the information provided in the status window, the flying salamander has an attribute rating of S+, its vitality is 400, its strength is 463, its agility is 481, and its sagacity is 461 respectively. As soon as he had the salamander under control, he made the decision to put an end to the situation before his subordinates discovered what had occurred and saw his skeleton warrior along with the salamander. Quack Ju San and Basilisk then he slowly made his way out of the room. Furthermore, Kang went looking for the barrier based on the written report that the Blood Sect provided, which stated that it will be lifted and a door would appear after the monster is slaughtered. However, he has been unsuccessful in his search. While he was pondering about the location, he questioned whether it was because he had summoned additional summons or because he had made the salamander his familiar. In spite of the fact that it deviates so drastically from the natural progression of the initial history, it would appear that the location still harbors some secrets. He touched the wall, and an energy began to flow on the wall. He realized that the energy was natural power since it felt rather pleasant, and he was able to clearly feel the complete inner structure that was contained within the wall. However, he was perplexed because he was unable to locate it. Once more, he aimlessly strolled around the area, and after he located the barrier, he opened it. As he approaches the barrier, he wonders whether or not Mang Sang Ya's martial arts books or his body are within. However, when he finally reached the middle, he was taken aback to see that there was nothing there. He pondered the possibility that there was another concealed location beyond the barrier. But Kang's mouth dropped open and he was taken aback when someone spoke from behind him and told him that he didn't have to wander about like a rat hunting for food and that there wasn't a skeletal corpse on the site. As a direct result of this, Kang abruptly gripped his sword and turned to look for who had spoken to him. The elderly man, upon first seeing him, remarked that he couldn't possibly be from another world because he seemed to be exactly the same as them. Kang breaks out in a cold sweat and is startled by the fact that the elderly man appears to be aware that he was reincarnated. As a result, he inquires of the elderly man as to whether or not he was previously known as Man sang -yong. In response, the elderly man stated that it was pointless for him to raise the question because he was already aware of the response. The elderly man appears to be disheartened because, when he read the energy within the heaven, he received a divination that told him that he would be trapped in a horrible predicament if he left his corpse at that spot, and that if he had done so, he would have been the servant of some young lad in his final years. On the other hand, Kang approaches the elderly man and feels he doesn't sense any hatred from the man, despite the fact that the elderly man appears to be pitying Kang as he approaches. Kang was told by Mang Sam Jan that he was not fond of his power that mocks the body of the dead but he has no other choice but to give him his power that Kang needed to combat the larger evil. The old man then asked Kang whether he wanted it, but if he didn't want it. The elderly man couldn't continue his words after Kang unexpectedly held his hand, and as a direct consequence of it, the elderly man raised his hand and directed his energy against Kang. Afterwards, Man Sang-ya moved so that he was standing behind Kang and put his hand on the latter's shoulder. 
In addition, Man sang -ya explained that he was a genius who might or might not show up once every 10,000 years, and that it is impossible for a common person who is not familiar with formations to comprehend all of his teachings. He said this because it is impossible for an ordinary person to reach the end of his teachings. Because of this, he will deliver each lesson in two parts. First, he will give Kang the power to annul all of the information in the world. Next, he will request Kang to deliver the hidden record that contains all of his teachings about traps and formations to someone who is comparable with his talent, which is Sima Gun. Nan Sangya continued by saying that he is capable of feeling regret for surrendering the fate of the planet to a foreigner who hails from another realm. However, because Kang protected his friends as he progressed through the trials, he hoped that he would also extend a helping hand to those innocent people as well. Afterward, Man sang -ya vanished, but Kang guaranteed that he would put an end to the blood sect. To his astonishment, though, he took a startled step back as an explosion occurred just in front of him. After that, the door opened, and his subordinates ran towards him while inquiring whether he was okay. However, Kang only smiled at them as they approached. There are two points of interest on top of Mount Tianmu that allow visitors to experience the majesty of nature. The first is a sizable body of water known as Heaven Lake, and the second is a single tree that is stunning in both its magnitude and its uniqueness. Then, all of a sudden, a light appeared at the lone tree, and it opened up as if it were some kind of a gateway. Kang, Ah Rin, Marluk, Sima Gun, and H Wang know they're all get out. Sima Gun instructed everyone to bury the box before they were discovered by those bandits. Once they had done that, they could grab a limb from the solitary tree and make their way back to the Beacon clan. Sima Gun called again to the attention of their clan leader who was looking at numerous graves on their front. They were all surprised because of those numerous graves. Shin Woon told his subordinates that there's no need for them to bury the box. But Sima Gun suddenly laughed because he was confused about the logical decision of their clan leader. He asked Shin Woon how would the Heavenly Favor Bank know whether or not they buried the box then he insists that they have to snap off a branch of the divine tree then leave. But Shin Woon also insisted that they don't need to snap off a branch of the divine tree then Sima Gun asked him again on how they will prove to the Heavenly Favor Bank. But he can't continue his sentence because he was surprised when he saw numerous bandits come rushing towards them. When they looked again at the lone tree, the portal was already gone. On the other hand, Kang maintained his composure, and it appears that he had been anticipating the arrival of the bandits. Those pirates, on the other hand, couldn't believe that Shin Woon and his men had scaled the pinnacle of the mountain when they hadn't seen them there the previous night. A man who was in charge of the bandits clenched his teeth and became furious as he watched what was happening. He yells at Shin Woon and demands to know what other people are doing in their stead. Then, all of a sudden, he lifted his sword and gave directions to all of the bandits to get ready for battle. He also made sure that not a single one of them was able to get away. The subordinates of Shin Woon get themselves ready for combat in the same way as the bandits do. Shin Woon, on the other hand, appeared to be holding his position and it seems he was waiting for someone to approach. He believed that every one of those bandits was at a rank higher than Zenith, with approximately 40 of them being at the Zenith advance rank. It is highly possible that the transcendent man there is the vice hideout, and each of them is an extremely formidable expert. However, just as the bandits were about to assault them, someone yelled at them to back up and get out of the way. Kang took note of it, as well as the man's sudden and enormous roar like that of a lion, and he reasoned that the man must be the leader of the Tianmu hideout, Do Nam Gang, and that he was the king of the Gale Thunder Mountain. Shin Wu's subordinates begin to sweat and appear afraid when they see Nam Gang who was releasing energy towards them, and they can sense how vast it is. This is in contrast to their clan leader, who smiles when he sees the Mountain King. Shin Woon wonders to himself whether Nam Gang is at the ascended beginner rank because he can see the remarkable Kai in him, and because he releases his own energy in the same manner as Nam Gang does. Furthermore, Nam Gang was taken aback by the fact that Shin Woon's Kai was being deflected rather than crashing into his, and he found Shin Woon to be an intriguing man. On the other hand, Ah Rin furrowed her brow as she realized that the odds were stacked against them and that if they engaged those robbers, everyone would perish. She was debating whether or not she should come clean and admit that she was a member of the Miram Union. But she was hesitating and asking herself whether or not she should sell the name of the Miram Union in order to escape the mayhem. If she did so, she would have to spend the rest of her life carrying the stigma of dishonor on her shoulders. But the lives of Marluk, H. Wang No, and Yu Shin Wu can't be more vital than her dignity. Her astonishment was justified when the leader of their clan revealed himself to be Yu Shin Wu, the leader of the clan that serves Beacon's commission. In addition, Nam Gang did not care who Shin Wu was, nor was he the least bit concerned about his name. 
Instead, he was attempting to bury a revolting box that Shin Woon was carrying in his hands. After making it appear as though he was using his power to grab the box from Shin Woon's palm with his finger, Nam Gang finally managed to get a hold of the box, while the other subordinates of Shin Woon furrowed their brows in confusion. Ah Rin thought that Nam Gang was Kai Telekinesis, which is rumored to be a power that can only be employed by people who have achieved ascendance. On the other hand, Nam Gang informed Shin Woon that his sin was having the audacity to encroach into their hallowed territory while being blinded by his avarice, and that he would pay for his actions with his lives. Shin Woon broke into a quick smile and informed Nam Gang that it appeared as though he had misinterpreted something. Shin Woon responded by stating that he was not there to fulfill the commission from the Heavenly Favor Bank and that he was only there to tell him something when Nam Gang asked him what it was. The latter furrowed his brow and didn't believe Shin Woon and thought that what he said was just a lame joke because Shin Woon couldn't overcome their crisis with his mere words. So Nam Gang commanded Shin Woon to stop his useless words and draw their sword while he was playing the box that he took from Shin Woon. On the other hand, Kang was forced to draw his sword from its sheath because he had no other option. Kang challenges Nam Gung if he survives 10 rounds and then asks him if he will listen to him a little bit more after each round then he draws his sword to fight Nam Gung. Then it seems I won't hear a single word. Utter Nam Gung. After taking his position, Nam Gung launches an unexpected assault on Shin Woon. He moves very quickly, almost as if he were the wind itself. He was under the impression that Shin Woon was an idiot and that he would be able to kill him with a single blow but then he used his divine fist of gale thunder. After that, a large number of punches were directed towards Shin Woon. Shin Woon parried the blow with his sword as Nam Gang threw a punch and unleashed a tremendous amount of force in his direction. As they assaulted and counterattacked one another, a gigantic light formed as a result of the conflict. The fact that Shin Woon was already transcendent despite his young age and was able to escape Nam Gung's onslaught caused the latter to furrow his brow. On the other hand, those who were seeing the battle from the side couldn't believe that Shin Woon was able to compete head-to-head -head with their formidable hideout leader. Even Marluk, along with Sima Gun and Ah Rin, were taken aback by how powerful their clan leader was, who was able to maintain a face battling with the hideout leader. In addition, the vice leader of the hideout was concentrating very hard on the fight between their leader and Shin Woon. He had the impression that their hideout leader was holding back some of his power because he knew that if he used all of his power, the tomb would be completely obliterated. In addition, there is an insurmountable chasm that exists between someone who has transcended and someone who has risen. However, he furrowed his brow and his jaw dropped because he was aware that Shin Woon possessed abilities that were beyond his wildest imagination. Because their great hideout leader's inner Kai is about equivalent to that of three cycles, and Shin Woon is able to block those consecutive punches without suffering any inside harm. On the other hand, Nam Gung unleashes a powerful kick at Shin Woon and thinks that in order for Shin Woon, who is barely over 20 years old, to have that much inner Kai, the latter would need at the very least around two cycles worth of inner Kai. But Kang was able to evade all of those sequential attacks from Nam Gung. Nevertheless, it was difficult for him to do so because Nam Gung was significantly stronger than he had anticipated. And that fight would have been very challenging for him to win had he not acquired the skills necessary to win while studying the sage medical arts. Additionally, the status window revealed that his accumulated power reinforcement had reached the rank of S+. He briefly dramatically boosted the effectiveness of all potential energies that were contained within himself, and his current maximum duration is 15 minutes. His modification is 150%, and his present efficiency is at its maximum. Kang furrowed his brow and held tight his sword while releasing massive energy into his body. He thought about the half-cycle of inner Kai that he absorbed from various undead using Death Kai extraction and adding the half-cycle from the Kai of Thundercloud and the Kai of Eastern Shining Sage as well as the half-cycle worth of inner Kai from cold absorbed from the Heavenly Glacier Water. And because it was a 1.5 times amplification of one and a half cycles then it should produce the effect of being slightly over two cycles worth. It has already been three minutes, and he can't be careless during the remaining twelve because he could be defeated in one strike. On the other hand, it appears that Nam Gang is fascinated with Shin Woon and that he has captured his attention. The latter indicates to Shin Woon with his palm that he should approach him and begin his attack while releasing a large amount of force on his body in the form of yellow light. And because Shin Woon is able to escape all of Nam Gung's attacks, the latter chose to release a bit of his power. As a direct consequence of this, Shin Woon furrowed his brow and clenched his teeth when he watched Nam Gung form his stance and enhance the power that he was producing on his fist. After then, Nam Gang threw a hard punch in the direction of Shin Woon. 
In addition, Shin Woon was aware of the heavy punch that Nam Gung was going to throw at him, so he made preparations to avoid it. However, the punch was so powerful that Shin Woon was unable to escape it, and as a consequence, he was thrown. Shin Woon's subordinates were shocked and shouted his name when they saw that he could not avoid the powerful attack of the hideout leader and fell on the loner tree. Halt! exclaimed Shin Woon. The latter's subordinates were worried about him when they saw that he was in pain. Afterward, Nam Gun walked close to Shin Woon who was gradually stood up. Shin Woon on the other hand, bowed in respect to Nam Gung and said that he had endured roughly 50 rounds and asked the latter if he was allowed to say one thing. Nam Gung furrowed his brow and Shin Woon told him that he has to surrender and plead to accept his subordinates and he will bear the responsibilities for their sins as their leader. Nam Gung was amazed at Shin Woon because even in this sort of situation, he was still taking care of his subordinates. Very well, utter Nam Gung. In addition, Shin Woon has given the order for his subordinates to put down their weapons. However, his subordinates were mad and did not want to follow him. But as soon as Shin Woon shouted at them, they immediately put down their weapon. On the other hand, Nam Guk called Di Guk and gave him instructions to bring Shin Woon's subordinates back to their hideout. Nam Gung gave an affirmative response when Di Guk questioned whether or not he intended to stay in the location, telling Di Guk that he was correct and that he intended to remain in the location. After that, Marluk, Sima Gun, H. Wang No, and Ah Rin pursued those bandits and went to their hideout. But Ah Rin furrowed her brow because she was powerless to do anything about their predicament while her allies were in such a state of bewilderment. Furthermore, now that all the bandits and Shin Woon's subordinate left them, Shin Woon and Nam Gung were alone and they can now talk properly. The latter commented that Shin Woon had good subordinates and the latter told Nam Gung that they are not just subordinates, they are good comrades. Shin Woon said that Nam Gang won't need to be conscious of his surroundings because their comrades already left and they can begin their conversation at that moment. On the other hand, Nam Gang bursts out laughing because, in his mind, Shin Woon is an idiot. He then asks Shin Woon whether he truly believes that he would be able to take him on with all of his strength. He also asks Shin Woon if he is aware that the box is absolutely empty and that he was made to look like a fool by a simple merchant and that they only intended to drive people to death and insult the world even after death and then he throws the box on Shin Woon. It is a celebration of viewing the person who will lead the subsequent generation that he tells the latter to get his subordinates on their hiding and leave the mountain and he will look the other way about the incident. Afterward, Shin Woon catches the box and closes it after saying that he cannot do what Nam Gung was instructed him to do, and as a result, Nam Gung becomes enraged and yells at Shin Woon saying that he was foolish, and even though he already spoke so that Shin Woon could understand, but it seems that he really wished to antagonize the bandits for a mere coins. Shin Woon had to start talking quickly since Nam Gung was already producing such great energy. Nam Gung abruptly froze and became inquisitive when Shin Woon began about how, 60 years ago, the eldest son of a prominent scholar family was able to pass the final test of the imperial examination. He had a woman to whom he had made a commitment to marry, but she was only a simple peasant. Unfortunately, the truth was revealed by his family, and as a result, she was subjected to a variety of threats and eventually had to flee. And after he was made aware of the facts, he cursed his family and then fled. In addition, he searched for her until his feet shed blood and pus but he realized he was unable to find her and needed immense fortune in order to find her. From then on, he began making money as if he was possessed. He poured all of his money into searching for her but was unable to find even the slightest trace. Falling into despair, he began committing all sorts of eccentricities. He did so because his empty heart couldn't be filled no matter what he did. Only when he approached the age close to death did he finally figure out the truth, that when she was driven out she was pregnant with his child. And because she was unable to find a place to live, she roamed around the world and eventually gave birth to her child in the mountain hideout then died. He immediately wanted to go to his wife's grave and see the child who was all grown up. He couldn't face his child while he was still alive. Therefore, he decided to see his wife and child after he died. Afterwards, as soon as Nam Gang heard Shin Woon, he began trembling all over as though he himself was familiar with the story. He challenges the latter to provide evidence for what he has just stated. Shin Woon responded with of course. When Nam Gang questioned Shin Woon what he would do if he couldn't prove it, he was astonished when Shin Woon suddenly tossed his sword in front of him and said that if he couldn't prove it, Nam Gang has the opportunity to cut him down in an instant. When one of the bandits, a bald man, saw Marluk, H. Wang No, Sima Gun, and Ah Rin sitting on the ground while being bound by a rope, he was taken aback and questioned his comrades what was going on when he witnessed the situation. He also said that when they got the call from the main hideout, 
he came sprinting over and asked if the peak had truly been penetrated by that few individuals. They were also questioning where their hideout leader was, but one of the bandits stated that the leader of their hideout was currently engaged in a secret meeting with a young man who is directing them. They were terrified because the mountain hideout that they had been hiding in was discovered by Shin Woon and his allies, and because it was now certain that they would be executed. However, Nam Gang and Shin Woon were carrying on their talk inside of the residence they were in. According to the Nam Gang, the majority of the people who live in the mountain hideout have either chosen to isolate themselves from the outside world for a variety of reasons or are keeping secrets that they cannot share with anybody. He was none of those because he was born and raised on the mountain from the very beginning. He abruptly paused because he hesitates to say, and that Shin Woon might be aware that his mother gave birth to him in that location, and then passed away. And the man who's been referring to himself as his father has callously cast aside his mother when she was pregnant. And that is the only thing he is aware of concerning his sad mother. It appeared as though Nam Gang had suddenly recalled all of the difficulties that his mother had gone through when he suddenly bent his head and furrowed his forehead. Afterward, Shin Woon is questioned once more by Nam Gang on whether or not he invented the falsehood in response to the rumors in order to ensure his own survival. Kang, however, is adamant that what he shared is genuine, and as he mentioned earlier, there are many different accounts of the hideout leader and his mother. And as a consequence of this, Nam Gang furrowed his brow and sat quite still in his chair before declaring that the protagonist of Shin Woon's story was none other than Gil Gun Pyong, from Heavenly Favor Bank. When Shin Woon told him that he was right and that he believed that Gil Gun Pyong of the Heavenly Favor Bank was his biological father, he couldn't believe it and his eyes widened. The rage that he was experiencing caused him to clench his fist. Throughout the past five years, he had yelled and cussed at his father an innumerable number of times. In addition, Shin Woon was told by Nam Gang that when he talks carelessly about unreal things, it makes him appear odd since he is unable to accept those stories. Shin Woon continues to assert that he can provide evidence for everything, and if he was unable to do so, he never would have traveled all the way up to the mountain in the first place. Shin Woon gestured in the direction of the empty box that the commander of the hideout was holding when Nam Gang questioned him about what he used to prove it. However, Nam Gang appears to be frustrated since Shin Woon doesn't appear to pay heed to his comments, despite the fact that Nam Gang has already informed Shin Woon that the package contained no items, and there is no one single use for that thing. Shin Woon assured the head of the hideout that there is unquestionably nothing contained within the box, but that the injection itself serves some kind of function. In response, Nam Gang slams on the brakes and hurls the box at him, saying if it is the item Shin Woon needs to demonstrate that his words are true. After that, Shin Woon manages to get his hands on the box, at which point he inquires about the possibility of borrowing an ink stick, an ink stone, and a writing brush. Shin Woon's response to Nam Gung's question about why he needed it is that it will explain everything after he shows him everything. Afterwards, Shin Woon started to use the writing brush and gently scrub it in the box, and Nam Gang seemed bored waiting for him and noted that what type of nonsense is Shin Woon attempting to pull. After getting to this point, he asks Shin Woon whether he has any thoughts of coming clean and admitting that everything he said was a lie. But Nam Gung's eyes expanded to Nam's amazement when he turned his focus to the brush, and the box where letters became apparent. It was hard for him to comprehend that the box even had an etching on it. After that, Shin Woon handed him the box and said that the contents were the letters that his late father had written to the head of the hideout. When it comes to the contents of the letter, he will be able to view them in greater detail if he stamps them on the paper. Shin Woon also noted that it should be the same for all of the boxes that Nam Gung has accumulated up until this point, and that one of the contents of one of those boxes might be something that his father wanted to leave for him. Nam Gang was at a loss for words, he had no idea what to say. At the same time, he was intrigued by the possibility that each of the boxes he had been collecting contained a secret message from his father. Shin Woon, on the other hand, collects all of the boxes, brushes each one with ink to disclose the hidden message, and then places a piece of paper on top of each one of the boxes. Nam Gang who had been waiting for the result, is now quite excited to check out what is written in the paper. And when everything was said and done, Nam Gang was stunned when Shin Woon gave him the paper and said that this father had never forgotten since he clearly remembered his wife's face and etched it on the box. When Nam Gang finally got a hold of the piece of paper and looked at it, he noticed a picture of his mother on it, and he couldn't help but touch it. 
He also stated that he spent his life having forgotten her mother at some time and that he lives his life just with recollections of the face of her mother who had been through adversity her entire life. Nam Gang was overcome with emotion and unable to keep it under control. This is why tears were freely running down his face. He had just abruptly been reminded of his mother's beautiful smile. Shin Woon, on the other hand, was grinning from ear to ear since his strategy had been successful in every respect because he had already received his ultimate goal and it was the Gale Thunder Mountain King, Do Nam Gang. The man himself, his objective for that commission was not the wealth of the heavenly favor bank it was him. In addition, the blood sect in a different future was successful in gaining control of another major hideout commander. This leader then contested the position of supreme head in order to obtain the bandit union. The blood sect then began plotting to eliminate the most likely contender for that position, which turned out to be the Do Nam Gang. In addition to this, the blood sect intensified the level of animosity between the hideout on Mount Tianmu and the Heavenly Favor Bank. In the end, two opposing groups engaged in a protracted conflict with one another. In spite of the fact that Nam Gang was ultimately successful in destroying the Heavenly Favor Bank at the end of the long conflict, he later found out that Gil Gun Pyong was his biological father. Upon learning that he had murdered a member of his own family, Nam Gang labored under the weight of overwhelming remorse until the day he passed away. Therefore, all that could have been done was done in order to alter Nam Gang's future since Shin Woon needs Nam Gang in order to prevent the destruction of the future. In light of the fact that Shin Woon disproves everything at Nam Gung, the latter inquires as to whether Shin Woon wants anything from him. As a response, Shin Woon stood up and asked the Mountain King how he could ask for a reward for a deed that follows the will of the heavens when he had gotten to the peak of the mountain by climbing until his bones would break and he was quite tired from having to face Senior's fist, so he would like to quench his thirst and he requests for a cup of fine liquor. Nam Gung appears pleased with Shin Woon's request, so he inquires once more to ascertain whether or not that is all that is required of him. When Shin Woon verifies that booze is only his request, the mountain suddenly laughs out loud. As a consequence of this, all of the bandits that were outside Shin Woon's residence were all bewildered because they did not know what was occurring inside. Even Ah Rin, along with Marluk and Sima Gun, were at a loss for words and had no idea what was going on inside the residence with their clan leader. Afterwards, Nam Gung appeared suddenly outside of his residence and demanded that all of the bandits pay close attention to what he had to say. He gave them orders to immediately prepare for a feast and bring out all of the alcoholic beverages that were hidden in the hideout because on that day, he was able to put his most significant regrets to rest and gain a younger brother. We're going to get completely drunk, announced the Mountain King. Everyone was having a fantastic time and drinking booze as per the King of Gale Thunder Mountain's instructions. Marlin was engaged in a battle of strength with a bandit who was far larger than he was. When the enormous guy was defeated by Marluk, the other bandits laughed at the huge man and said things like, it seems all that boasting about his strength proved useless, and he can't even endure using all of his remaining strength. Other bandits said that they heard that the Kunlun slaves are as powerful as wild horses, and they concluded that this must be true because Marduk was able to fight their fellow bandits. On the other hand, during the course of their chat, Sima Gun and the other bandits shared a cup of booze. He was bragging to them about what had taken place within the cave. They finally passed the second test after overcoming a revolting swarm of black death roaches, which was the final obstacle in the trial. Other bandits remarked that they couldn't believe what they had been through. Other bandits were amazed that Man Sang Jan's hidden cave was located within their mountain, and other bandits were surprised that the junior brothers were able to uncover it. But Sima Gun continued his statements and informed those bandits that it is not done yet because the long-expected trial was not yet elaborate and it seemed as though he was the hero because he introduced himself as a genius strategist who was able to deconstruct Man Sang Jan's formation. Bandit couldn't believe that he was capable of disassembling such a formation, and due to the fact that Sima Gun's story was highly interesting, the bandits supplied wine to Sima Gun once again. Nonetheless, he had to finish his story. However, everyone was joking around and having a good time, with the exception of Ah Rin who was paying close attention to their clan ahead while drinking alcohol with the Mountain King. She believed that Shin Woon was a man who was difficult to understand, and hence she needed to be more watchful around him. Shin Woon, who was drinking wine with the Mountain King at the time, saw that Ah Rin was staring at him carefully and it seemed as though she was monitoring his every move. In addition, Nam Gang is pleased because, despite the fact that he had consumed the alcoholic beverage many times during his decades-long sojourn in the mountain hideouts, today was the first time he drank a drink that was equally as sweet and flavorful as it is today.
There's no other possible explanation than the fact that he was drinking with his younger brother. Additionally, he stated that it was a reward for the hard work that Shin Woon, who had put his life in danger to travel all the way there, had put in. However, Nam Gang became aware of something and he disclosed to Shin Woon that he was conscious of the fact that Ah Rin and Sima Gun were not revealing their true faces. Shin Woon had mentioned something, which is why Nam Gang had such a hearty chuckle and told him that his anxieties were completely unfounded. On the other hand, Shin Woon requests permission to inquire about the Mountain King concerning one particular matter. Shin Woon attempts to address Nam Gang as the leader, but Nam Gang stops him. Instead, the latter would prefer it if Shin Woon referred to him as Hyung Nim and he will not respond to any questions asked by Shin Woon unless the latter addresses him as Hyung Min. Shin Woon responded by saying, Understood, Hyung Min. But he was hesitant to address Nam Gang as Hyung Nim due to his advanced age. The conversation continued with Shin Woon asking Hyung Nim if he had any plans to visit the Heavenly Favor Bank. In addition, Nam Gang didn't answer right away, and it appears that he was considering how to respond to the question. After a brief pause, Nam Gang's expression darkened, and he stated that Shin Woon was correct. He ought to pay a visit to the Heavenly Favor Bank on at least one occasion because there were still certain things he wanted to learn about. However, Kang was of the opinion that after Nam Gang learns what is written in the letters that Gil Gun Pyong has left behind, the visit that Nam Gang pays will have an extremely significant meaning. The Miram world is heading toward a more loud future sooner or later. When Hyung Nim told Kang that he wanted to ask him a presumptuous question, Kang's train of thought came to an abrupt halt. Hyung Nim wanted to know if it was truly all right for Kang that his commission would be registered as unsuccessful. However, Shin Woon has previously communicated to Nam Gang on several occasions that it is acceptable to cause his commission to fail, and that he has no problem with this at all. In addition, Nam Gang was at a loss for words. He believed that, should the news of his failure become widely known, Shin Woon would be mocked for allowing his avarice to cause him to behave in an irresponsible manner. But if it were to become public knowledge that he, Nam Gang, one of the major hideout commanders of the Bandit Union, had his hideout perfectly infiltrated, not only would it have a negative effect on him personally, but it would also have a significant influence on the Bandit Unions as a whole. But Shin Woon wasn't concerned about his honor, rather, he was being respectful of the challenging situation he was in. And for the younger brother, Shin Woon's thoughtfulness for him, he unexpectedly told Shin Woon that he desires to convey his profound gratitude and admiration for Shin Woon. On the other hand, when Nam Gang wished to show respect for Kang, Kang's eyes widened in surprise, and he stifled Nam Gang's offer of gratitude because the former had already demonstrated a sufficient amount of appreciation and he was acting in a manner that was appropriate. But Nam Gang continued to insist on it since Shin Woon was hiding his shame, and Nam Gang only wanted to reciprocate the favor as his older brother. As Nam Gang's anger grew, he abruptly stamped his foot, releasing a tremendous amount of energy. As a result of the energy, the table that was in front of them seems to vanish and all of the bandits, including Ah Rin, Sima Gun, and Marluk, are taken aback when the Mountain King all of a sudden releases such a significant amount of force. They were all taken aback and didn't know what to do because, only a short while ago, they had been laughing and having a nice time together. Nam Gang drew the attention of all of his bandit brothers and announced that his younger brother had turned down enormous wealth, and instead chose to take the humiliation upon himself in order to protect their honor. If they do not return the favor in its entirety, it would be evidence that they are nothing more than common criminals. Therefore, he seizes the chance to announce to his younger brother and to all of his bandit's brothers that beginning from that day forward, his younger brother's commission clan will be permitted to go through all of the mountains that are under his jurisdiction without being subject to any restrictions. Kang was taken aback when he learned about Nam Gang since a reward like that was something he never would have considered for himself. Yes sir, simultaneously replied by bandits. Kang was under the impression that Nam Gang was a formidable mountain stronghold leader who dominated mountain strongholds in the provinces of Zhejiang. Jiangxi, and Anhui. This indicates that they will not perform any inspections on the Beacon clan, which will result in significant gains for the Heavenly Favor Bank. He broke into a smile all of a sudden because he realized that their issue would be resolved immediately because the most significant barrier to their commission was clashes with bandits. As a result of Nam Gang's announcement, the Beacon clan commission now has the opportunity to extend its sphere of influence to areas further afield than Zhejiang. 
On the other hand, Nam Gang turned to Shin Woon and said that it was the least he could do for his younger brother, so he pleaded with him to accept for the sake of his older brother who was missing. In addition to this, Kang made a fist and proclaimed that his announcement is the best gift there is. He shows homage to the mountain monarch, who receives it with a smile on his face. Suddenly, Nam Gang chuckles, and you can tell that he is actually delighted. He then raises his bottle of booze and asks everyone to raise their cup and make a toast to his younger brother who shares his happiness on that day. To everyone's long and healthy lives, exclaimed Nam Gang then he abruptly drank his bottle of liquor. Everyone cheers at each other and continues to drink until they are completely drunk. In the privacy of his own room, Jin Woo was giving the situation a great deal of thought. Outside, the Beacon clan was suffering a string of setbacks as a result of the increasing volume of malicious tales that circulated about them. According to one of the reports, the clan leader took a sizable amount of money which explains why their fund is running out of money much more quickly than was anticipated. Additionally, the H. Wang Rock clan has been spreading malicious rumors to their new guards, which explains why the number of guards quitting as a result of being received by their schemes has been increasing. Jin Woo paces back and forth while he mulls over whether or not he should deal with such issues at this time. However, his primary concern is for the safe return of their clan leader who has gone to Mount Tianmu. He removed the sheath from his sword as he waited anxiously for the leader of their clan to arrive unharmed. He needed to pull himself together since in situations such as those, he was expected to act as a kind of backbone for the clan leader, because the clan head spared his life at a time when he could have passed away at any second. He will do everything in his power to assist him, even if it takes his own life. But he was taken aback since someone was shouting outside, so he hastily exited the dwelling. And when he did, he noticed that their guards had been injured. He was shocked. Afterwards, when Jin Woo spotted Ak Chil and Director Yang waiting in their gate, he furrowed his brow in confusion. One of the guards was attempting to explain who Ak Chil was, but he was paralyzed by the terror that he was experiencing and was unable to finish his sentence. No Di and his son Gun Ho hurried over to confront Ak Chil with their question of who he was and demand that he disclose his name. But Ak Chil disregarded him in favor of looking for the demonic head Shin Woon to come out and kneel before him. If Shin Woon did this, Ak Chil promised that he would spare the demon's life and then take his own. When No Di and Jin Woo heard Ak Chil refer to their clan lord as a demonic head, both of them furrowed their brows and clenched their jaws. Jin Woo was quivering in fury and tightly gripping his sword because he had the audacity to refer to the lord of their clan as a demonic head. Jin Woo abruptly lifted his blade and released a great force against Ak Chil. What an imprudence, Jin Woo added. No Di gave the order for the guards to brandish their swords. Jin Woo, however, was perplexed since it appeared that there were only two of them, but Jin Woo knew that Ak Chil would never go there without his subordinates. However, Jin Woo's eyes brightened and he froze in his tracks when he recognized someone. Jin Woo, No Di, and Gun Oh all drop their jaws and turn their sight to the man who enters the gate. The man is asking them who has the audacity to point a blade at this subordinate. A sudden curse was placed on Jin Woo because the individuals responsible are the leaders of the Mount Huang sect. He was known as Master Chung Su, and he was a lunar chilling sword and an elder of the Mount Huang sect. He immediately requests that Jin Woo remove his swords from the situation. But Jin Woo became serious because he believed that what had occurred was a catastrophe since the master of the Mount Huang sect would respond so swiftly. So he questioned Chung Su how they might lessen their vigilance toward the invaders who had damaged their carefully locked gate and infiltrated their area. Chung Su didn't have an answer for him. But Jin Woo, along with No Di and Gun On, was curious when another young man spoke about Jin Woo being arrogant of Jin Woo's tongue to run like that and that he must not know who is standing before him. The young man's name was Song Hak, and he was Ak Chil's disciple and brother. After suddenly yelling at them, he demanded to know whether they were under the impression that he would forgive them for amputating the arm of his younger brother. On the other hand, Jin Woo was under the impression that even Song Hak, a direct pupil of Master Chung Su and the first generation Song clan disciple with the most impressive set of abilities, was present. It is intolerable that an elder of the Mount Huang sect would take action for the purpose of exacting revenge on a simple branch disciple. After all, there is no value for an elder who aspires to be the future leader of the sect to get involved in affairs that are of such little importance. Chung Su must have been promised an amazing wealth by the H. Wang Rock clan in exchange for ridding their whole clan. However, Chung Su explained that since the limbs of his disciples were severed by a terrifying demonic head, it was impossible for him not to go there himself to get revenge. Chung Su's remarks went too far when she referred to their clan lord as a demonic head and this made Jin Woo angry. Suddenly, he yelled at Chung Su and demanded to know what evidence he had to support such ludicrous assertions. 
But Cheng Su smiled and suddenly pointed his sword and attacked him. Jin Wu was startled, and his eyes widened when he realized that the sharp blade of Cheng Su was only an inch away from his eyes. As a result, Jin Wu manages to block his attack before it hits. On the other hand, No Di and his son were both taken aback by the unexpected turn of events concerning the leader of Mount Huang. However, in preparation for the impending assault, Jin Wu clutched his blade ever more tenaciously. No Di, together with his son and their guards, was going to assist the vice leader when Song Hak stopped them and warned them not to interfere with Chung Su and Jin Wu because if they make even the slightest move, they will massacre all of them without pity. Then Gung Ho asks his father if he is interested in going into battle with him, but Jin Oh yells at them to back away from the fight. Because if they come forward, everyone else will be slaughtered, and he was in good shape as the only adversary left standing. No D is forced to come to a halt because he has no other option. He grits his teeth because there is nothing he can do to assist Jin Wu given that he has already instructed them to remain where they are. On the other hand, Chung Su slashed his sword in the direction of Jin Wu's neck, but Jin Wu was able to avoid the assault by bending backward. Chung Su was infuriated by Jin Wu's folly because all that was required of him was to obediently deliver Shin Wun there. However, he dared contradict an elder of the powerful Mount Huang sect, despite the fact that Jin Wu was nothing more than a soldier of the small Beacon Commission clan. He also stated that Jin Wu's arrogance is without limits, and that the Union's mission to battle this and exterminate the demons has not yet come to a successful conclusion. In addition, Chung Su never stopped striking Jin Wu, unleashing enormous amounts of force with each blow. However, Jin Wu was able to defend herself and counter Chung Su's assaults. After that, Chung Su unleashed a powerful blow and slashed his sword towards Jin Wu, but Jin Wu leaped unexpectedly, causing Chung Su's blade to hit the ground. Furthermore, Chung Su warns Jin Wu that he must bring Shin Wu to that same moment if he does not want to hasten toward an untimely end. However, Jin Wu reasoned that their clan leader was extremely busy with work and would not have time to receive him. Therefore, they should not continue on and should return to their sect. Jin Wu was having trouble breathing, but he was adamant about beating the leader of the Mount Huang sect despite his condition. As a consequence of this, Cheng Su formed a grin on his face and declared that beatings are a wonderful form of treatment for individuals who behave irresponsibly and are unaware of their proper position. Then he let forth a tremendous amount of energy and employed his technique of the spiraling lunar sword, then directed toward Jin Wu and hit. And as a consequence of this, Jin Wu was unable to avoid the blow, and the huge amount of energy that impacted his body caused his blood to spray in all directions and eventually pool on the ground. Afterwards, Jin Wu was shivering in fear and coughing when he saw the leader of the Mount Huang sect walking close to him. The leader of the Mount Huang sect told Jin Wu that if he wanted to preserve his life, he could better call his clan leader than plunge his blade in Jin Wu's neck. However, the latter still did not follow Cheng Su because Shin Wun was not physically present and had gone to Mount Tianmu instead. Because Jin Wu understood that this moment was the beginning of the end for him, he scowled and gritted his teeth as he ordered Cheng Su to execute him. On the other hand, when Jin Wu didn't follow through to deliver their clan master, Cheng Su had no alternative but to kill him because he had no other options. He lifted his blade to do so. However, just as Cheng Su was about to bring his blade down on Jin Wu's neck, the latter appeared to be perplexed. Because of this, he opened his eyes and was taken aback when he saw Shin Wun in front of him holding his sword back against Cheng Su's blade. The latter was caught off guard when Shin Wun suddenly materialized in front of him and ordered him to cease his actions. Cheng Su furrowed his brow and looked perplexed as Shin Wun suddenly materialized in front of him. It seemed as though Shin Wun had entered the sphere of Cheng Su's Kai senses without his prior awareness. He stared at Shin Wun closely and thought to himself that he had accomplished an inconceivable feat using only standard martial arts. Therefore, he moved backwards. When Nodi, his son, and a large number of the clan's guards saw their clan leader arriving, they could not contain their excitement. On the other hand, after placing his sword over his neck, Shin Wun flashed a grin at Chung Su. He made the observation that it appeared that while he was away, they had some uninvited guests. By uninvited guests, he meant the leader of the Mount Huang sect and his minions. He then turns to Jin Wu and asks him whether he is okay, but Jin Wu appears to be in pain because he suddenly grabs his chest. Because of this, Shin Wun encourages him to treat his body with the respect it deserves. He ordered Jin Wu to remain in place, and then he put his palm on Jin Wu's shoulder because he was going to fast heal him. Shin Wun then used his white wishes to heal Jin Wu. On the other hand, the status window appeared and stated that the White Wishes strengthens Shin Wun's self-curative properties or those of a target to quickly heal injuries. The effect increases as skill proficiency and level increases, and that should be enough for emergency aid. 
Shin Woon told Jin Woo that his condition should improve now so he better be at ease because starting that moment, he will make Chung Soo cripple then he will turn to look at the latter. Furthermore, Chung Soo became infuriated after hearing what Shin Woon had to say. As a result, he furrowed his forehead and became angry. On the other hand, Song Hak heard Shin Woon as well. He was incensed that Shin Woon had spoken to his master in such a manner, and he threatened to amputate all of Shin Woon's limbs. While Ak Chil seemed to be overjoyed upon finally coming face to face with Shin Woon, the individual who was responsible for cutting off his arm, because his opponent, Chung Su, was also his master, he reasoned that he would be digging his own grave if he lost. Shin Woon is a guy who, despite appearances to the contrary, has a narrow-minded mindset. This is due to the fact that he knows that making fun of someone with the status of Master Chung Su will result in death. On the other hand, Song Hak was ready to approach Shin Woon, but he was taken aback when Chung Su suppressed him and asked him to step aside. Chung Su then continued by saying that Shin Woon's wickedness genuinely reaches the skies, and that is why he will eliminate Shin Woon without having to bring him before the Union. After that, he unleashes a tremendous amount of force and suddenly charges straight towards Shin Woon like a wind. When No Di, his son, and Jin Woo realized how fast Chung Su was, they all let out audible gasps and widened their eyes in shock. Within the blink of an eye, Chung Su had arrived in front of Shin Woon and was employing his art of moon seizing heavenly net. However, Shin Woon was unfazed as he waited for his adversary to launch an assault, but Chung Su was flourishing his dozens of blades, and there was no way Shin Woon could avoid them. He also planned to begin by tearing Shin Woon's mouth apart before moving on to the rest of his body. When he realized that Shin Woon had evaded his heavenly net, however, his eyes opened and he was startled. Even more impressive is the fact that he is able to parry every blow that is directed his way. However, it was difficult for him to do so, which is why he unleashed another huge energy and attacked Shin Woon, but the latter was just as quick as he is. They engage in combat with one another, attacking and counter-attacking one another. On the other hand, Shin Woon observed that Chung Su moved extremely slowly, and that his sword technique was one that relied heavily on Water Kai for its foundation. He believed that he would be at a disadvantage if he confronted him with only his twelve swords of the Thundercloud, each of which corresponds to a different type of metal. And if that turns out to be the case, he will confront Chung Su with the absolute coldness that he has acquired from the divine glacier water. After that, he carried out his threat against Chung Su, who widened his eyes in response to the fact that every slice that Shin Woon made was only an inch away from his face. However, as Shin Woon used his absolute coldness together with his twelve sword thundercloud skill, Chung Su was unable to avoid it, and it struck him in the body, causing him to scream out in pain as it did so. When Ak Chil and Song Hak saw it, their mouths fell open in shock, and they clenched their teeth together in fear. While this was going on, No Di, his son, and Jin Woo furrowed their brows, and beads of perspiration began to form on their faces. This was because they couldn't believe how powerful Shin Woon was, and the fact that he seemed to have defeated Chung Su without inflicting any damage on him. On the other hand, Chung Su was writhing in agony as his blood flowed freely throughout his body. He couldn't believe that he had been defeated by a simple soldier without a name, and this infuriated him to no end. On the other hand, the status window appeared and declared that the twelve swords of the thundercloud and the chilling kai of the heavenly glacial water had developed. It also stated that his understanding in martial arts with the harmony of the twelve swords of the thundercloud had reached its full potential. The level of expertise possessed by the twelve sword of thunderclouds has improved, its grade has been updated and it has become an ascended item that is capable of evolving. However, Shin Woon observed that from the looks of it, it seems as though Chung Su was almost cut in two, and that he shall provide him a unique act of charity so that he commands them to live and get out of his sight in an instant. Chung Su was having trouble standing up as Shin Woon was speaking. On the other hand, Chung Su, together with Ak Chil and Song Hak, gritted their teeth and furrowed their brows because of the anger that they felt towards Shin Woon. Chung Su believed that Shin Woon was just a spoiled brat, there was no way that he could have attained such a transcendent level. And because he believed that Shin Woon was the head of a monster, he intended to chop him down and sever his neck. Then, he unleashes another enormous energy throughout his entire body. Moreover, Shin Woon became aware of the energy that was being expelled from Chung Su's body. He added that if that was the latter's wish, then he should reply accordingly and urge his opponent to come since he will be the one to slice his neck instead. After that, Chung Su lets out a burst of energy and suddenly moves closer to Shin Woon. But before they could face one another, they were both startled when they observed an arrow quickly approaching them and was about to strike them and because of this, 
They both took a step back in order to escape being hit by the arrow. When Shin Woon saw the arrow, he was confused. Chung Su's eyes widened in surprise when he realized that the arrow was the Dang Clan's lightning arrow. The Dang Clan's lightning arrow is an artifact that serves as a signaling device, indicating when the Sichuan Dang Clan would declare war on their enemies. To put it another way, when Dang's lightning arrow appears, it indicates that the fight is coming to a conclusion. When Chung Su turned to see where the arrow came from, he noticed with widening eyes what appeared to be members of the Dang Clan standing nearby. However, he was perplexed since the only people he saw were Marluk, Ah Rin, Sima Gun, and A Chuang No, and he was not familiar with their appearance, nor are any of them members of the Sichuan Dang clan. Chung Su was informed by Xin Wun that the individuals in question are part of the Straight Cloud faction after Xin Wun observed that Chung Su was unfamiliar with the individuals in question. However, Chung Su thought that they must be some idiots of the Beacon clan based on their looks, however. He asked himself how Ah Rin got the lightning arrow of Dang, which is why he told Ah Rin that she must not know that the heavens are high and the lands are thick, and it seems that she can fool him by her trash imitation of the arrow. After that, he issues an order for Ah Rin to disclose her true identity. Song Hak also mentioned that the Dang clan's lightning arrow is a secret weapon that only members of the Dang clan's direct bloodline are allowed to use. And if that's the case, Chung Su interrupted Song Hak in the middle of his sentence and stated that he was well aware of that because he has seen his fair share of members of the Dang clan, but he has never met Ah Rin and Sima Gun before. On the other hand, both Sima Gun and Ah Rin are at a loss for words because Chung Su could not recognize them because they were both hiding their identities behind masks. In order for Chung Su to demonstrate that Ah Rin was a member of the Dang clan, he needed Ah Rin to take off his mask, so Ah Rin nudged Sima Gun and then both of them took off their masks at the same time. When everyone saw the genuine face of Ah Rin and Sima Gun, they all dropped their jars in amazement and their eyes widened. They also stated that the woman was Dang Ha Rin, the vice clan leader of the Sichuan Dang clan. On the other hand, Shin Woon wasn't prepared for Ah Rin and Sima Gun to reveal their genuine identities. He believed that the two would wait a little longer before doing so, and he was surprised that they did so in front of everyone including Chung Su. The latter, on the other hand, trembled as his eyes widened in shock when he saw Ha Rin, and he thought to himself, of all the places, why is Ha Rin there? In addition, Ha Rin and Zhu Gun abruptly pay respect to the elder that is in front of them and say that it looks that in their endeavor to stop the conflict, they have mistakenly insulted the senior. Both of them said their names were Dang Ha Rin of the Sichuan Dang clan and Zhu Gun of the Zhu clan when they introduced themselves. In addition to this, Ha Rin informed them that they are currently operating as part of the Flying Hawk Squad in order to complete the objective that they have been given. As a result, they would like to make a request for their assistance in conducting the investigation that is necessary for their task. Afterwards, because of the rage that was welling up inside of him, Chung Su furrowed his forehead and gritted his teeth. In the beginning, it was the Dang clan, then it was the Zhuge clan, and now he discovered that they were also members of the Flying Hawk Squad. He believed that the situation had grown quite precarious as a result of these developments. Even if he holds a rank that is higher than that of the Flying Hawk Squad, the Ha Rin and the Zhuge are still considered to be children of the Seven Clans, especially at this time when the power battle between the Ten Sects and the Seven Clans is at an all-time high. If Ha Rin and Zhuge find fault in him for acting for his own personal advantage, the entirety of the Mount Huang Sect will be in difficulty, and it may even have a bad impact on the Ten Sects as a whole. Therefore, he must always make an effort to conceal himself. Afterwards, Chung Su revealed to them that he had no idea that the Dang clan would look down on him and the Mount Huang sect to such an extreme degree. He then added that he was present at the scene because Xin Wun was thought to be the head of a demon. He did this while pointing towards Xin Wun and the latter's power is identical to that of a demonic head, and he had a great deal of justification for traveling all the way to the Beacon clan. Chung Su stated that the Flying Hawk squad suspected him to be unreasonable and that he went to that location without a proper reason. In response, Ha Rin told him that she did not intend to belittle the leader of the Mount Huang sect. However, all she was trying to do was safeguard the assistant who has been covertly working with the Flying Hawk squad. And Xin Wun is also the benefactor to whom the Dang clan owes a great deal of gratitude. When Ha Rin revealed that Xin Wun was a benefactor to the Dang clan in addition to being an assistant, Chung Su was astonished. It appeared as though he was at a loss for what to do since he furrowed his brow, and a bead of sweat started to form on his face. Because injuring the benefactor of the Dang clan represents a challenge to the Dang clan, and because going up against them will never be to the Mount Huang sect's advantage, 
he believed that the situation had grown extremely complicated. He was enraged because the outcome of a conflict between the depleted Mount Huang sect and the Sichuan Dang clan, which was vying for a higher place even among the seven clans, would be precisely as he had predicted. However, Cheng Su continues to insist that Xin Wun be punished and has stated that despite the fact that Xin Wun may be a benefactor of the Dang clan, the chance that he is a demonic head still exists, and if he does not punish Xin Wun and set an example for others, there is no telling what might happen in the future. Cheng Su still insists that Xin Wun be punished. Then, he inquires as to whether or not she is able to accept responsibility for what has occurred. In response, Ha Rin stated that certainly, she would do so. She also stated as she mentioned before that the clan leader of the Beacon Commission clan is a benefactor and assistance of the Sichuan Dang clan, and that, contrary to what she believes, Xin Wun is not a demonic head. She appeals to Chung Su to put an end to the conflict by stating that it appears that the incident was the result of a misunderstanding. After all, she is familiar with the numerous accounts that describe how generous and open-minded Chung Su is. Furthermore, Chung Su does not have any other options available to him. Continuing to do so would put his life in jeopardy, and he has no reason to put his reputation on the line for someone as insignificant as Ak Chil. Chung Su chose to state that there is a misunderstanding between them, and is requested from the member of the same union, Ha Rin from the Dang clan. He excused himself. This was done despite the fact that he was shivering due to the certainty that he would be embarrassed. After that, Chung Su makes his way out of the room and gives his subordinates orders to draw their swords so that they can return to their posts. On the other hand, Ak Chil was so enraged that he demanded to know more about the leader of the Mount Huang sex plan for revenge. However, he was forced to stop mid-sentence as his eyes widened when he saw how angry Chung Su was. Ak Chil then gave Chung Su an order to keep quiet before cutting off the man's remaining arm with his own hands. Because he has no other option, Ak Chil is forced to maintain his quiet. When the members of the Mount Huang sect finally leave their location, No Di, along with his son, and Jin Wu, let out a sigh of relief. The Beacon clan had been successful. Thus all of their guards were rejoicing because their adversary had been forced to retreat. After then, Shin Woon gave the order to everyone to find those who were injured and start putting their situation in order as soon as possible. On the other hand, Juj and Ha Rin were both problematic due to the fact that they had already revealed to everyone, especially Shin Woon, who they really are. It is now over for them because they were supposed to be entirely hidden but everything went wrong. But Juj Gun noted that their strategy worked somehow. Both of them were taken aback when Shin Woon stepped towards them, and he expressed his appreciation for their assistance, stating that they were able to stop more loss of life. On the other hand, it would appear that they have a lot of things to discuss as well as a lot of things to explain. Don't you agree? He added. Both Ha Rin and Juj were present within the room and waiting for their clan leader to make his statement. They were all seated, but nobody spoke throughout that time. However, the latter appears irritable since he is having a difficult time waiting for Shin Woon to speak because it had been 10 minutes since he had heard anything from Shin Woon, and he was uncertain as to whether or not he was angry with them. On the other hand, Shin Woon eventually spoke out and suggested that they should avoid reintroducing themselves to one another. After all, he already heard their true identity a moment ago. Afterwards, the quick bowing of Ha Rin was followed by an apology for the late disclosure of their identities. Because Shin Woon has been aware of the two people's identities for some time, he made it abundantly plain to them that there is no need for them to apologize for revealing themselves to him. Juja's abrupt outburst of crying coincided with Ha Rin's apparent embarrassment at the notion that they were frequently talking about their clan leader in their mind. Shin Woon reveals to them that he assumed they were aware of what was going on and that he was aware of their genuine identities on the day that they took the exam. He also reveals that he knew who they really were. Ha Rin was astounded, and she inquired of Shin Woon how he came to that conclusion. In response, Shin Woon stated that he was blessed with good eyesight from birth. However, Ha Rin did not trust him because a person with average inner Kai would not be able to recognize them in their disguise. And in the fight against Do Nam Gang and Master Chung Su, he demonstrated that he was not overpowered by either of his opponents and she had the impression that Shin Woon was everything but a typical person. However, Shin Woon informed them that he wanted to set aside the matter of their true identities and that he wanted to ask them a question instead. He claimed that even in the event that neither of them had intervened, he would have taken matters into his own hands and resolved it. 
he asks them why they intervened at that point, going so far as to reveal their names. Is it to protect their master Chung Su? Or is their aim to put him in debt? Or is there any other reason? In response, Ha Rin said that she does not care in the slightest about the life of the hypocrite who is blinded by wealth, and that she does not even give it a second thought. In addition, she doesn't have any intention of indebting the clan leader. Instead, it would be better for an idiot like Master Chung Su to be dead for the benefit of the martial world. And she did it for the sake of their clan leader, Shin Woon. The latter appears perplexed because he finds it hard to believe that Ha Rin actually did step in to save him during his fight with Chung Su. It was told to Shin Woon by Ha Rin that if she hadn't intervened in the struggle, he would have undoubtedly severed Chung Su's neck. It's possible that he had intended to eliminate all of the masters of the Mount Huang cult, but this is pure supposition on Ha Rin's part. Shin Woon conceded, however, that she was true and that he intended to get rid of each and every one of them. On the other hand, Zhu exhibited signs of surprise and he was under the impression that Shin Woon's true intention was to eliminate each and every teacher on Mount Huang. This indicates that he was prepared to wage war against one of the ten different sects. In addition, Shin Woon inquired to them as to whether or not he was acting in an irresponsible manner. In response, Ha Rin told him that although it was true that Chung Su was an unredeemable piece of trash, the fact that he has an important position in the Union, if Shin Woon had actually been successful in killing him, then even the Dang clan would not have been able to prevent the Union from moving forward with their plans. It is inevitable that it would result in violence, during which tens or perhaps hundreds of lives will be lost. As a result, he will never be in a position that is beneficial to him, which is why they choose to intervene. On the other hand, Kang felt convinced that Ha Rin was correct in her assessment that going against the Union Murum at that particular juncture was not the best course of action. After all, in the not-too-distant future, the population of the Miram Union will experience a natural attrition. After learning the motivation behind their actions, he had a few more inquiries for them. Ask anything. Utter Ha Rin. Afterwards, Shin Woon questioned why they went to such lengths to defend him, even claiming that he was a kind benefactor to the Dang clan all of a sudden. In answer to this, Ha Rin stated that he was a genuine benefactor since, if it weren't for Shin Woon, they would have perished either in the hidden cave of all things or at the lair of Tianmu. In addition, Kang had the stunning realization that the idea that members of the Dang clan never forget favors or a pite even when their lives are in jeopardy wasn't simply a rumor at all. Afterwards, Kang presses them for information regarding the reasons behind their infiltration of the Beacon Commission clan. Both Xuge and Ha Rin were visibly embarrassed as they abruptly bowed their heads and began to sweat. According to Ha Rin, he wants to be honest with their clan leader, which is why she told Shin Woon that he is being accused as being the perpetrator behind the serial disappearances that are now taking place in Zhejiang. Zhuge bursts out laughing as he explains that after what happened that day, he was no longer a suspect because they both proved that he was not. But all of a sudden, Kang began to suspect that the two were looking for remnants of the blood sect. When the Muram Union finally became aware of the succession of mysterious disappearances, it was too late, everything had already come to a halt, and the individuals who were tugging the strings were never discovered. Afterwards, Kang shared his third inquiry with them and inquired as to the reason why he was no longer being suspected. Ha Rin was going to say something about Per, but Zhuge was holding a persimmon, and he guessed that Ha Rin intended to talk about persimmons. As a consequence, Ha Rin became enraged, and he yelled at him, stating that he was not talking about persimmons, but rather perceptual intuition. Afterwards, Shin Woon was informed by Ha Rin about what had happened within the cave, that Shin Woon was told that in order to protect his subordinates, he had coated himself in black death roaches, jumped into the heavenly glacial water, and even engaged in a duel to the death with an elder from the Mount Huang sect. It was only her gut feeling, but she thought someone like that couldn't possibly be the one responsible for the crime. Nevertheless, if what she intuited to be true turns out to be the case, the skills of the clan leader was absolutely remarkable. Shin Woon, rather than being awful to them, asked them if they expected him to appreciate them for their help. And because the responses they provided to all of his queries were satisfactory, he ought to tell them a story that will be to their advantage. Both Ha Rin and Zhuge were curious about the account that their clan had related to them. Afterward, Shin Woon revealed to them that he has been following the serial disappearance case that the two of them are currently looking into long before they had started doing so. Both Ha Rin and Zhuge displayed signs of astonishment by opening both of their eyes wider. They couldn't believe their clan leader had followed the case, nor could they understand why he had. Because of this, Shin Woon told them that Jiam Mai Ho and Yu Jin Sang were heavily connected with the case, and that after a lengthy investigation, 
He was just about to figure out who the perpetrator was at that point. In addition to this, Ha Rin was pleading with their clan leader to reveal all of the information he had to them. In addition, Shin Woon said that the moment they hear the truth, they won't be able to turn back anymore. Are you confident you won't regret it? Asked Shin Woon. They were both surprised when their clan leader told them everything he knew. Meanwhile, under the light of the moon, a large group of individuals could be seen proceeding forward while draped in black cloaks and pushing a cart. An arm abruptly falling to the ground lends credence to the theory that the wagon is transporting a dead body. When two of the guys turned their gaze back behind them, they saw an arm that had been severed fall to the ground. One of the other men in the group picked up the severed arm and threw it in the wagon. The three men who seemed to be in charge of the situation noticed what had taken place. After that, the bodies of three guys were discovered, and it appears that they were one of those masked men who were pushing a cart. And it appears that two of the individuals pulling in that cart are responsible for the killings because they smile as if they'd done some heavy work. Within the cave, a guy in authority gave instructions to his companions, telling them to wait in a certain location until the head's ritual was finished. In addition to this, he orders them to pull the cart and follow after him. Following that, the people who were wearing cloaks said that they were finally able to recover their breath because everyone had been working so hard, even though it was late in the night. They see three people standing in front of them wearing the same cloak as them, but the two assume that those people are just their colleagues because one of them heard that they will receive some assistance from other squads due to a lack of manpower, so they reason that those people must be their allies. On the other hand, a man with no hair approached the three individuals and suggested that they sit down for a while instead of standing around in that manner. He went so far as to give the three of them a bottle of drinks, but when they declined, the bald man burst out laughing and believed that the three people were anxious because they hadn't accepted his offer of the bottle of drinks. He also told the three individuals that they are experiencing a great deal of difficulty due to the head of a playful dragon, and that he has been working non-stop throughout the entire day without taking a break. One of the three people asks the bald man a question about the location of the lone exit in the cave while he was drinking liquor from the bottle. In response, the bald man stated that there is only one exit to the cave, and he then inquired about the identities of the other three individuals. The statement that they were messengers of the underworld was relayed to the man with the bald head by one of the three individuals, who had a smirk on his face. The bald man's eyes widened, and his lower jaw fell as well. When he opened his mouth to say something, one of the other three people suddenly struck him. Other persons who were dressed in a cloak were taken aback when they learned of the unexpected death of their companions. The leader removed his cloak, and it was revealed that he was Shin Woon. The individuals who were hiding behind the cloak were perplexed and demanded to know from Shin Woon who they were and whether or not they could reveal their identities. Shin Woon, on the other hand, did not disclose to them his name or even the names of his subordinates. Rather, he told them that they are the messengers of the underworld. One of the men wearing cloaks, who seemed to be the leader, can be heard yelling at his other comrades, telling them they need to be ready for an attack. One of them was going to blow the horn that signals a surprise assault, but before he could blow it, one of the three persons already sliced his throat and collapsed in front of those men wearing cloak. Everyone was shocked to learn that the person who had slashed the throat of one of their allies was a woman, and she was Ha Rin, and it just so happens that Juj is the third person. On the other hand, Ha Rin let out a sigh when Shin Woon told her that he will have the chance to properly confirm the true power of the seven sects. He also said that their opponents have more numbers so they don't have to leave a single survivor, inside or outside the cave. He asks Ha Rin if she can do that alone while Juj was surprised because their clan leader seems to be letting Ha Rin to fight alone on their numerous opponents. In addition, Ha Rin told their clan leader that she can't get them all but she was able to kill most and she abruptly ran towards their opponents. Those cloak men seem terrified but they prepare themselves to combat. On the other hand, Ha Rin is quick to draw her blade and attack anyone who stands in her path. Then she utilizes her snowing poison flower to kill everyone. And as she swings her sword, a picture of blossoms emerges on the place in front of her. Shin Wu had believed that he wouldn't need to be concerned about Ha Rin since the latter seems confident in fighting alone against those numerous opponents. But he picked up on something. He neglected to take into account the fact that Zhu Jin lacked any familiarity with martial arts, despite the fact that he was exceptionally skilled at breaking through formations. He was on the fence about whether or not he was going to assist him who at the time was engaged in a fight with two adversaries and appeared to be at a loss for what to do. He probably would have passed away a long time ago if not for the extraordinary abilities of the Zhuge clan, specifically the heavenly predicting steps. In addition, Shin Woon made the decision to assist Zhuge, and as a result, 
He raised his hand and transmitted energy to Xuge. After that, Xuge got perplexed when he observed that his hand was emitting a form of energy. Because of the mysterious power that he possesses, he was completely oblivious to the fact that his adversary was going to launch an assault on him. However, because of the fact that he has power, he abruptly slaps his fan on the face of his opponent, and as a consequence, his opponent falls to the ground motionless. This causes him to appear shocked and his mouth to drop. He believed that he had acted rashly when he pulled out the iron leaf fan and slapped his adversary with it. After that, he had experienced an extraordinary surge of power. He had a feeling that their clan leader was the one who had sent him the energy so he searched the area to find Shin Woon. And when he did, their clan leader was giving him a thumbs up sign. However, he couldn't help but wonder what kind of spell their clan leader had cast on him. Afterward, they all slaughtered those people wearing cloaks who were pushing a cart. When questioned by the leader of their clan if they were okay, both Ha Rin and Zhuge responded that everything was well with them. But Zhuge suddenly draws near and questions Shin Woon about the energy that he gave because Zhuge appears to be happy when he suddenly feels stronger. On the other hand, Shin Woon was under the impression that he had just utilized the Silent Wave, a skill that comes with the Bat Lord title. But given that there is a possibility that Zhuge may not comprehend even if he explains it to him, he will just have to make something up. Therefore, he explained to Zhuge that it is a spell that Man Sang Ya had left behind. When Zhuge learned that their clan leader had gained the knowledge of Man Sang Ya in the hidden cave of all things, he was taken aback. Shin Wun, however, paid him no attention and continued walking while remarking that they can't afford to waste any time in that cave because the longer they stay, the greater the number of people who will be killed within. They make a mad dash for it as they approach the cave's exit, but they come to a halt all of a sudden as they see something in front of them. When Ha Rin finally understood what it was, she quickly put her palm over her mouth to prevent herself from screaming, and her eyes grew extremely big as a result. Huge, on the other hand, gritted his teeth and wrinkled his brow in response to what he observed. In addition, it was the head of the earth dragon flowering fire witch, Mi Wal Hua. She said that her sweet meal was not yet finished but she had some unwelcome guests. Mi was taken aback when she discovered that her dinner would be cut short due to a shortage of food while a large number of people were lying directly beneath her feet. She wanted Ha Rin, Juj, and Shin Woon to be her dinner since she thought they looked tasty, but she planned to set their necks aside and offer them to her commander instead. On the other hand, Ha Rin and Juj were getting ready for battle and were just waiting for their clan leader to give them the command but they were astonished when Shin Woon informed them that there was no reason for them to engage in combat. Instead, the latter provides them with a task to complete. Afterwards, when Shin Woon called for her attention and inquired where those revolting vines originated from because they appear so strange, Mi was perplexed and unsure of how to reply. The clan leader also inquires as to whether or not it would be appropriate for her to cut back on those vines and as a consequence of this, Mi becomes upset since it appears that Shin Woon devalues her vines and as a result, she unleashes a force that causes her countless vines to suddenly assault Shin Woon, and those vines will most certainly absorb him all the way down to the marrow. Shin Woon, on the other hand, was being pursued by a large number of vines, nevertheless, he was able to quickly evade them and use his sword to chop them. Numerous vines kept attacking him while he kept on slashing his sword. However, the leader of the clan realizes that his efforts are in vain when one of the vines that he has already cut continues to move and strikes him again. Mi explained to him that it did not matter how many vines he cut because her vines are virtually infinite in number. She makes a menacing chuckle with her face, and it appears as though she had sharp fangs just like her nails. She was intrigued to see how long Shin Woon could continue to withstand the assault. In addition, Shin Woon was attempting to sidestep every vine that was heading in his direction. He marveled at the ingenuity of those vines, reasoning that if even one of them punctured him, it would extract every last drop of blood and fluid from his body at that precise location. And if those vines persist in their assaults on him, he will soon be pushed to his breaking point. But that is too soon, he needs more time, and he has no choice but to suffer through it. On the other hand, Mi was laughing at him because Shin Woon was trying to demonstrate his sportsmanship to her and embarrassing himself in front of her. She couldn't help but wonder about Shin Woon and his degree of expertise, given that he carried himself in front of her as though he were superior, despite the fact that he dared to mock her with his relatively low level of expertise. But Mi was dull, and she lost interest in continuing to fool around with Shin Woon, so she decided she wanted to end their combat. 
Afterwards, Shin Woon was the target of Mi's vines as she struck them in front of his face. The clan leader widened his eyes when he saw the vines but he quickly bent backward but he noticed another vines on his side that is why he quickly stood up but it was too late because he never be able to dodge it and as a result, the vines pierced on his body and when Mi saw what happened, she laughed and thought that it was the end for Shin Woon and that she will devour him without leaving any trace. In spite of the fact that Shin Woon was writhing in agony from the pain caused by the vines that had been pierced on his side, he continued to stand still and endure the discomfort and this caused me to be shocked, and she furrowed her brows as she did so. On the other hand, when Mi saw that something was happening to her, she looked down at her hands and was perplexed by what she saw. Her power appears to be ebbing away gradually, but she is positive that she is getting sufficient nourishment. The fact that she is able to crush people under her feet is evidence of this. When she heard something, she turned to her left and found that Ha Rin and Zhuge were attempting to flee along with the individuals they had kidnapped to become her food. Zhuge was able to see that Mi was gazing at them. As a consequence of this, he tightened his teeth and Ha Rin widened her eyes. Mi was able to figure out that they were attempting to flee. She was furious, and because of this, both of them suddenly started running while pulling the cart. Ni tries to stop them and starts to attack. Shen Wun quickly prevented her from attacking Juj and Ha Rin just as she was ready to do so. He did this since the attack was not the most essential thing at the time, and he had been waiting for the opportunity to do so. Ni became enraged when she noticed that Shin Woon was using the art of the fiery Yan and was releasing a massive force. The latter was also holding his swords along with her vines. On the other hand, the status window appears and stated that the extortion has a rank of S+. What belonged to the servant was also belonged to the master. The user is able to use one of the skills of the summon, and the summon with a skill extorted is unable to be summoned until the end of the skill. Furthermore, Shin Woon clenched his fists around Mi's veins and informed her that he wanted to turn her into ash, but that he couldn't just burn those innocent people along with her. On the other hand, Mi was in a state of extreme fear and was pleading with Shin Woon to put an end to what he was doing. She tightened her teeth and wrinkled her brows as beads of sweat began to form on her face. She couldn't help but wonder how a simple boy like him could be so skilled in the art of fiery young as well as who exactly he was. After that, Shin Woon formed a grin on his face while releasing a tremendous amount of energy that resembled a fire. He then copied what Mi had said a while earlier, that she had become so boring and he didn't want to mess around with her anymore, because he intended to burn Mi until there was nothing left in her. Then, he brandishes his sword before suddenly charging towards Mi and making use of his inferno ability, which allows him to unleash a fire that would consume Mi along with her vines. Mi was taken aback and filled with panic as a large amount of energy was released toward her, and her attacker slashed his swords towards her in an attempt to cut all of the veins in her body. Even her arms and legs were severed by Shin Woon before he let forth a force that created an abrupt explosion. Mi ended up falling on the ground and coughing up blood as a consequence of what happened. After that, Shin Woon approached her and remarked that she appears to have improved a great deal now that the unnecessary veins had been removed. Mi was enraged and even cursed at Shin Woon. She was still alive despite the fact that she was missing her limbs and legs. She was so enraged that she asked Shin Woon to simply kill her but the latter assured her that he would fulfill her wish and kill her, but that he was unable to do it at this time. Instead, he lifted his palm and let out some of the energy that had been building up in it. Afterwards, when Mi witnessed the abrupt reappearance of one of her arms, she was taken aback and her eyes widened in shock. But she was horrified as her eyes widened. Then she asked the clan leader what he was doing because she saw that Shin Woon brandished his swords and abruptly stuck her arms again. Shin Woon's appears content with what he is able to accomplish and assures Mi that she will heal her whenever it is convenient for him. Why don't we begin again? Utter Shin Woon. On the other hand, Mi was sweating because of the fear that she felt towards Shin Woon because she didn't know what he was capable of if she didn't follow him. A large number of ladies could be seen resting on the ground outside the cave, and they all appeared to be in a weakened state. Juj and Ha Rin were successful in rescuing those women, and while they are still breathing, their conditions are extremely serious. Juj inquired of Ha Rin concerning the availability of urgent care for them. Ha Rin answered by saying that she needed to try and then she laid her hands on them while attempting to heal them. However, it appears that this was not sufficient because the wound was not a basic one and she is unable to heal non-physical wounds with her power. If they continue to progress at this rate, none of them will be safe if they are not treated soon. Others were leaning against the wall or the wagon, while still others were lying down on the ground. It appears that they were having difficulty as a result of the agony that they were experiencing. 
Ha Rin's eyes snap open and she stares in the direction of the cave's entrance. They had no other option except to wait for their clan leader to return, who was at that very time still engaged in combat with me. While clutching her hand, she was shaking uncontrollably. She was witnessing the unfolding of the catastrophe as it unfolded right in front of her eyes, yet she was unable to pick up on even the slightest clue the entire time. It never occurred to her that someone like her background could legitimately claim to be a part of the Order sect and the White Path. Zhuge and Ha Rin were taken aback, however, when their clan head suddenly appeared before them and informed them that they had accomplished their task to successfully rescue all of the women and that they had done an excellent job doing it. When the leader of their clan emerged from the cave unscathed, they were both filled with a sense of relief. Shin Woon inquires as to whether or not they have sustained any injuries. As a reaction to this, Ha Rin felt sorry because even though they were all doing well, those other women were not. She also mentioned that she provided some rapid emergency care for them, but their wounds do not appear to be typical, and their circumstance was undoubtedly critical. But as their clan leader turned around and began reaching for something under his garments, Shin Woon informed them that what she had done was sufficient, and that from that point on, they were required to leave everything to him because they had both worked so hard and were in need of rest. Then Shin Woon showed them the stinger case, and Ha Rin immediately recognized it as hers because it was displayed in front of them. She had an abrupt realization that the stinger case was being used to conceal her abilities, but that it would eventually be put to use to treat those who were injured. Nevertheless, Shin Woon unexpectedly kneeled on the ground and began to cure them. He took the needle out of its case and carefully inserted it into the body of each individual patient. Both his reverse cleansing and his white desires will be utilized concurrently by him. The reverse purification is stated to be at rank S plus in the status window. It neutralizes one of the damaging effects that have been inflicted on either the user or a specific target. When used on a victim that is currently being affected by the skill reverse purification, any healing-related skill that he use will have its effectiveness increased by 20%, and the effectiveness grows in tandem with the development in both the level and the mastery of the skill. However, when Shin Woon pierced those noodles into the bodies of the persons whom they had saved, he noticed that the toxins in their bodies were departing, and that they were breathing normally again. It was wonderful since what he had done was sufficient for any urgent circumstances, and as a consequence, he breathed a sigh of relaxation. After that, the status window appeared once more and began indicating that his proficiency in the sage medical arts had increased. Additionally, he gained new skills, including the ability to perform the divine spiritual duty with the rating of S+. In addition to this, it said that he had healed 15 people out of the total required for the achievement criterion of the hidden quest titled Road to Becoming a Healer 2, which indicated that he had to heal 100 patients who were in critical condition. Afterwards, Shin Woon stood up and closed the stinger case. He told Juge and Ha Rin that it's all done but they all need to be taken to a doctor to receive further treatment but at the very least, they won't die. Ha Rin who seemed still worried about them asking their clan leader what is the cause of their condition. Shin Woon became serious and said that the reason that those women got into that state was the remedy. And he was assuming that Juge and Ha Rin were aware that remedies are far more addictive than opium. When Zhuge and Ha Rin found out that the reason for those women's agony was remedy, their jaws dropped and their eyes widened in horror. When Ha Rin asked Shin Woon if they've been selling those drug-intoxicated ladies like a commodity, Shin Woon responded with an affirmative nod. Ha Rin was shocked to learn that a prominent member of a chaos sect known as the Kowloon Gang had been involved in the illegal trafficking of people as well as the use of illegal narcotics. She was under the impression that this wouldn't merely be an event in the realm of martial arts, but that the government would become involved. It's possible that this major incident will be the one that finally causes the government and Muram to breach their neutrality deal. Afterwards, Juge and Ha Rin were both over themselves with rage. They conveyed to the leader of their clan the message that the occurrence could not be ignored, and that they should alert the union of the news as quickly as they could. And in order to exterminate the Kowloon organization in a single operation, they will work along with the authorities. However, their clan leader did not respond to what they said, which prompted Ha Rin to furrow her brow and inquire as to whether there was anything further that they were unaware of. In response, Shin Woon informed them that if they bring their complaint to the higher departments of the union, it will most certainly be ignored due to the inclusive proof. Even if they report the incident to the appropriate authorities, there will be no further development of the probe in the end. 
Ha Rin was able to decipher what their clan leader was trying to convey, which was that the union and the government both contain individuals who are responsible for the occurrence. When their clan had confirmed that there are perpetrators inside their government and that there is someone within the Muram Union who knew about the Kowloon group but neglected them, they were astounded to the point that their mouths dropped, and they were startled to learn that there are criminals within their government. Shin Woon also asks the two of them if they recall the words he uttered just before they entered the cave, which were to the effect that once they were within, they would not be able to turn back, and that it was now their time to decide whether they would trust the Union or believe him. It seems as though Zhuge and Ha Rin are both uncertain about who they will place their faith in. But before Ha Rin can make a decision, she casts a mournful glance downward and asks their clan leader who among them is an insider. On the other hand, Shin Woon explains to them that currently, the drugs of the Kowloon group are only distributed into two regions, the Zhejiang and Anhui. Both Xuge and Ha Rin drop their jaws in surprise regarding the Anhui. They couldn't believe what they had discovered. On the other hand, Shin Woon followed his sentence by stating that because the Kowloon group has maintained control of Zhejiang for such a significant amount of time, the influence of the Union is at its lowest point in that region. However, Anhui is not like the other provinces since there are two factions that live there and act as pillars of the Union Murum. One of them is the most influential member of the Seven Clans, which is also referred to as the Clan with the Blue Sky Sword. This clan is known as the Nangong Clan. But to regard the Nangong Clan as an insider, especially since their youngest son passed away from an opium overdose five years ago, he was very convinced that they are not because the Sword Saint meticulously inspects all individuals in the Nangong Clan every month. On the other side, Ha Rin's forehead begins to be covered with beads of perspiration as she tries to trust her guest that since the only faction that still remains is the Mount Huang sect, this must mean that Master Chung Su was the one who committed the crime. However, Shin Woon believed that up until the moment that he fought Chung Su, he was uncertain as to whether of the two, the Nangong clan or the Mount Huang sect, was covertly interacting with the Kowloon group. He believed that this uncertainty persisted until the moment that he fought Chung Su. It was due to the fact that he had successfully concealed such information within his recollection of the other future. However, when he drove Chung Su into a corner, there was that energy that he unwittingly invoked and even though it was very faint, he could tell that it was the force of a monster and it was the same energy that he had previously felt from Quack Ju San, Gong Sun Chu, and Mi Wal Hua. Master Chung Su had allied himself with the blood sect, and as a result, he was bestowed with the power of the demon god. Moreover, Shin Wun should inquire of Zhuge and Ha Rin regarding their decision, namely whether or not they are willing to disregard the opinions of others, let go of their pointless pride, and carry out his instructions. He gave them both the assurance that they will be able to help even more people than they have up to this point. Zhuge Gun, Dang Ha Rin, will you follow me? Ask Shin Wun. On the other hand, suddenly, they get down on their knees and make a solemn oath that they will give their clan leader everything they have and follow in his footsteps, and the devils will be vanquished by them altogether. Good, utter Shin Woon. In addition, Kang makes a request for permission to borrow a little bit concerning the power of Zhuge. Kang re-enters the cave, at which point he tosses the mask that resembles the one that leader of the blood sect used and proclaims that it ought to be sufficient as a message that those blood sects only have to wait because he will destroy each and every one of them. Inside the Kowloon house, Yom Chin Siok seems to be having a meeting with his subordinate. Eight people were sitting in front of him. He told them that first, someone attacked the third jail, and now even the ninth jail is completely destroyed and left. He commands his subordinates to more thoroughly fortify them because seeing how everything turned out, it must be because the culprit treated him with disdain. He was so furious and asked his subordinates if he was wrong then abruptly released a massive force towards his subordinates. On the other hand, his subordinates were all struggling and seemed in pain after receiving the enrage of their leader through the energy that he released towards them. Afterward, Yom used his energy to lift the mask, then smashed it to pieces because they had the audacity to make fun of him while using it. In addition to this, none of his subordinates have unearthed even the faintest clue about who might be responsible. When he became angry, his eyes turned crimson and he furrowed his forehead while clenching his fist. On the other hand, one of his subordinates quickly cut short his leader's statement, and even though he was terrified, he still said that a report just came in and indicated that Yu Xin Wun of the Beacon Commission clan have returned from Mount Tianmu on the same day that the ninth jail was attacked. It's odd that the incident took place so soon after Shin Wun got back to the office. In addition to that, he stated that he will monitor his activities, but he is unable to continue speaking and his eyes are wide open in fear as a result of the sudden thrust that their leader gave him with his sword in the neck. 
When the head fell to the ground, all of the other subordinates were shocked. Several of them even dropped their jaws in disbelief. Gilm turns to his subordinates and asks if there is any other who wants to spout such worthless drivel. However, their vice leader said that there were traces of someone using the highest level of the art of the fiery young inside the ninth jail. He will track all the experts who were able to use the arts of the fiery young who entered Zhejiang these past ten years. From seems satisfied with the report of their vice group leader and as he expected, the vice group leader is using his brain. But the man was not yet finished because he also told Yom that there were also traces of poison left inside the ninth jail, and it wasn't just one intruder as they expected. Yom was taken aback to find out that there were signs of poison arts, and he surmised that they must have originated from Gong Sun Chu. Yom believed that Gong Sun Chu must have been persuaded by their officer, and he had anticipated, or they may have promised him the gold from the third cell. Because if it is not Chu, it is impossible for the others to know the sites of the jails that are completely hidden, and Chu is the only one who knows where they are. Yom then turned to the leader of the vice group and told him that he will lessen his load due to the fact that the traces left in Ninth Jail are from the Flaming Serpent. However, in order to make use of the Flame Serpent, one must first have attained ascending level. He furrowed his brow and said, In that century, there is only one person who is able to reach that level of ascension who utilizes the art of the fiery Yong. When Yom said that the perpetrator was a man who had a deeply antagonistic connection with them, the vice group leader's eyes widened and his brow furrowed. Yom named the flame terror Yong Guangzhou as the person responsible for the crime. In addition, Yom went on to tell them that 30 years earlier, Guangzhou had attained the level of ascending with the art of fiery Yong when he was 50 years old. This was another piece of information that Yom shared with them. It is currently known that he engaged in a fight to the death with the entirety of the assassination squad after becoming the target of an assassination attempt after he killed the envoy of a sect that had sought to recruit him. However, it is quite certain that he has survived in anonymity and regained his abilities. Yom was right, the vice group leader stated, since if the perpetrator is a flame terror, then all of the parts of the puzzle will fit together. Additionally, he complimented Yom on his level of wisdom. However, Yom reminds his subordinates that the attack of the flame terror will continue but now, there will no longer be any carelessness. He commands his subordinates to arm the rest of the jails with plenty of items filled with freezing kai in order for them to face the flame terror once it goes there. His subordinates abruptly bow and will follow his command. In addition, Yom asks them regarding the daughter of the provincial minister jailed. In response, the vice group leader told Yom no need to worry about it because the lady was locked up in a completely unexpected place that isn't one of the hidden jails. Yom prays for the vice group leader's work. He also told them that they must keep that lady in their possession so that they can continue to maintain their control of the provincial minister jail, and they have to take more caution in her security. Furthermore, Cheng Su, the clan leader of the Mount Huang sect, was waiting for someone, and he was getting annoyed since the person that he was waiting for took a long time to arrive. However, he exhaled a sigh of relief when it unexpectedly emerged in the waiting room and apologized to him for the fact that the meeting had gone on for longer than he had anticipated. Yom Chen Siak was the individual who Chung Su awaited all this time. Yom asked Chung Su for a choice, but the latter seemed uncertain, however, he stated that he would question once more if he would be able to break through the wall of transcendent level if he accepted the energy. Yom's face broke into a spontaneous grin and he told him that he didn't have to restrict his aspirations to achieving the ascended level if he had the bravery to sacrifice everything he has. And as a result, Chung Su appears to be quivering with excitement as he tightly grasps the armrest of the chair, and thinks of the time in his past when he was a supernova who received all of the attention from both the Mount Huang sect and the Muram Union. It was said that he was someone who looked forward to becoming the youngest ascendant in the annals of the martial world. But he gritted his teeth because one year, two years, ten years had passed, but the path to being an ascendant only went longer, and there wasn't even the tiniest chance that he would reach transcendence, much alone ascend. But he insists that there is nothing wrong with him, and that everything is simply due to the fact that the martial arts taught by the Mount Huang sect are subpar, so he furrowed his brow in frustration. After that, he inquired of Cheng Su regarding whether or not he was unable to ascend due to his account in the Mount Huang sect. In response, Cheng Su stated that she was aware of the situation and blamed it on the incompetent master. Cheng Su also mentioned that if only that master hadn't extended his hand out to him or if his master had been someone from Mount Hao or the Wudang, 
then he would have been able to effortlessly descend into the abyss. He tightened his fist and gave the appearance of being shaken with anger, but to his amazement, when he glanced at Yom, the latter was already releasing energy, and Yom asked him if he desired strength, the wall transcendent advance rank that had been preventing him from progressing for all of those years. Yom also advised him that he will be able to break through that wall but only if he gives everything he has for that power. Afterwards, when Chung Su observed that Yom released such a large amount of energy that he wanted to have and he imagined that if Yom had that power, it would be possible for him to possess it. Chung Su's jaw dropped. There will no longer be a requirement for an amount of patience and time that is so great that even mountains will shift, nor will there be a requirement for training that is so strenuous. And above all, he will no longer be seen as someone who is no longer relevant, and he will match right to the top position if he transcends. Additionally, the most powerful group in Anhui will no longer be the Nangong clan, but rather the Mount Huang sect. Then he remembers Shen Wun, and he realizes that he has the ability to exact revenge for the humiliation that he had on the day that they assaulted the Bikung clan. Cheng Su bowed down and gave the impression that he was considering something, but ultimately he came to the conclusion that he would be happy to provide anything. Yom, on the other hand, couldn't help but crack a grin upon hearing that Chung Su had finally made up his mind to join them. He just needs to lure and show Chung Su the power that he can possess when he joins them. Shin Wan has gathered together all of his loyal faction leaders of the Beacon clan, including head treasure Gok. In reference to the situation of their faction leader, Jin Wu, he turned to Nodi for assistance. In response, Nodi shared the news that he had recently returned from Jin Wu's visit to the medical facility, and that, despite the severity of the wounds on Jin Wu's body, the patient's health was, luckily, improving. If he had sustained such wounds in a normal circumstance, he would have been on the edge of passing away. Nevertheless, the doctor stated that it is nothing short of a miracle, and that their clan head should not be concerned in any way. However, it is a relief for Shin Woon, and it appears that his white wishes worked as intended. Gung Ho interjects and inquires as to whether or not there is an issue with the fact that their clan leader asked for them so urgently. Shin Woon reached below his clothing and pulled out a letter, at which point he instructed his companions to first examine the document. When Gok, Nodi, and Nodi's kid saw the letter, all three of them displayed shock, which did not surprise Shin Woon in the least. It came to everyone's attention that the government committee declared that because the province minister had lately been overworked as a result of the quantity of work, with the authority provided to them by their monarch, they would like to provide the commissioned clans of Zhejiang with the opportunity to take on the humor involved in carrying out the order of his majesty, and they would like to do it as soon as possible. The application process is open to any and all commissioned clans that meet the requirements outlined above. And after all of that has been taken into account, the commission clans that satisfy those standards will be chosen to fill the supervisor posts, but only if each commission passes a fair test that has been set in advance. Each and every commission clan that adheres to the same will be required to fill out the application and send it in before the deadline. There are a total of three distinct sorts of government commissions that have been prepared, and additional information will only be distributed to those individuals who meet the requirements. The minister of the Zhejiang government, Kang Waiso, was the sender of the letter. On the other hand, Nodi spoke with the head of their clan as to the reason behind the Kowloon group's approval of it because, up until that point, the Kowloon group had monopolized all government commissions in Zhejiang. Xin Wun had already predicted that it would happen which is only natural given that this is how Yu Jun Sang Bikun's commission clan was able to establish themselves as the greatest commission clan in Zhejiang. The Kowloon group deliberately abdicated their place on the government commission in order to promote the H. Wang Rock commission clan to the position of representative commission clan of Zhejiang. The public considers any clan that has overtaken the Kowloon group and sees the government commission to be the representative commission clan of Zhejiang. However, he did not share all of those specifics with his comrades. On the other hand, Gun Ho observed that the letter contains a notice indicating that the deadline is one month following the day on which the notice is printed, and the qualifications for applying to the commission are that the clan must have more than three gold in their respective budget, and at least two transcendent martial artists living within the clan. After that, head treasurer Gok abruptly felt a headache when he realized that they needed three guan of gold and that there's no way that they have that much gold in their treasury at that moment. Nodi also mentioned that despite the fact that the government commissions present an excellent opportunity for them to make a comeback, they are unable to meet with any application commissions at this time. 
Shin Woon, on the other hand, seemed to be unfazed by the possibility that they may be disqualified. Nevertheless, he did inform his fellow soldiers that the government had been generous enough to give them a month's grace, and that period of time needs to be sufficient to resolve all of their issues. The other members of his clan were shocked when all of a sudden their clan leader unleashed his sword in front of them when he pulled out his sword out of nowhere and raised it in front of them. However, their clan leader thought that he just needed one more transcendent martial art and that in one month he would make all of them regret giving him that much time. Afterwards, when someone unexpectedly walks through the door and begins to report about their clan leader, everyone in the room turns to look at the newcomer. He introduced himself as Ju Ti and stated that he had completed his journeys and was now back in order to carry out the directives of their clan leader. Shin Woon approached him and complimented Ju Ti on how well he looks as well as how well he had been performing his task. On the other hand, Ju Ti gave their clan leader the report letter he had written. Shin Woon opened the letter in an unexpected manner and quickly read what was written inside. When Nodi saw the paper, his son saw that his father was trembling, but he was unable to explain why. Looks like our last problem is solved. Otter Shin Woon. People in Jiangxi were taken aback a couple of weeks ago when they witnessed the Beacon clan's commission, during which a large number of carts passed by them. However, some remarked that none of the carts had any goods, and others wondered whether members of the Beacon Commission were present because it appeared as though they were going to make a purchase of something like rice, but Ju Ti disregarded them, since the command of their clan leader was the only thing on his mind at the time. Shin Woon gave him the letter and instructed him to take it with him. While Shin Woon was climbing Mount Tianmu, Ju Ti was given the directive to carry out the contents of the letter. First, he had to announce to everyone in the Grain Merchant Association at the market that he planned to sell the carts and the price was five gold liang. On the other hand, they couldn't believe that it was so expensive and said that they must be joking. Others said that there's a limit to how much Ju Ti can con them, while still others said that he must be nuts since they wouldn't buy anything that wasn't even worth a single gold liang with five liang. Naturally, they did not go through with the purchase of those carts, and Ju Ti was left perplexed as to why their clan leader had commanded him to do so. The second order stated that after he arrived, he was to remain in place in the pavilion of Prince Tang at approximately 11 in the morning on a daily basis, but, throughout the course of the previous two days, not a single individual purchased those carts. However, the leader of their clan instructed him that he must go back to his lodgings if he witnessed an elderly beggar being smacked. Even though Ju Ti was confused, he still obeyed the order. He wondered if he would see an old beggar get slapped, and he wondered why their clan leader would say something so arbitrary given that he was not some kind of prophet. Ju Ti continued to follow the order, but to his astonishment, he turned to his right and saw a woman who was fuming at an elderly beggar and suddenly slapped him on the face. He had been there when everything happened, and now he needs to go back to his lodging because, according to the leader of their clan, as soon as he gets back to his lodging, he needs to lock the door for three days and not interact with any other people. After a period of three days, various merchants rushed up to him with the intention of purchasing those carts. Ju Ti was shocked when he opened the door that numerous merchants were uproarious and wanted to buy those carts. They say they will buy the carts for five gold liang. Another was willing to pay more than what Ju Ti offered and another was pleading to sell to them those carts. Ju Ti didn't know what to do as his jaw dropped from those numerous merchants and he didn't have any clue in what was occurred since three days had passed and they are furious on him for selling those carts with such high price, but now they are willing to pay even if he offer more than five gold liang. Ju Ti was speaking with an individual about the disturbance outside because those merchants who wouldn't even take a glance at the carts are now clamoring to buy them, so he questioned the person if something happened while he was resting at his accommodation. The individual stated that the situation is currently chaotic not only in Nancheng, but throughout the entirety of Jiangxi. In addition to that, the person also mentioned that there was an explosion around daybreak at Lake Poyang. Ju Ti was startled as he had begun to sweat. Furthermore, according to this individual, all of the grain ships that had been anchored at Lake Poyang capsized and sank. The individual is questioned by Ju Ti regarding the cause of the explosion. The individual gives his response, which is that it must be the work of the terrible thunder bomber. Ju Ti was unable to believe that the fierce thunder bomber, not only were they the users of one of the eight forbidden techniques in the martial world, but they were also the cause of the explosion. In addition, Ju Ti suddenly remembered that a few days earlier, in front of the pavilion of Prince Tang, an elderly beggar had been slapped by a woman. Could it be that man would perhaps be the aggressive thunder bomber? Because if his idea was accurate, how could the clan leader have known? But he is unable to proceed with his train of thinking because the individual has interrupted him and said that the situation is far more dire than the explosion. 
it is currently impossible to travel utilizing ships since they are conducting an investigation into the likelihood of dozens of thunder bombs that are still active and violent. In addition, Ju-T was also informed by this individual that all of the different commercial groupings have transitioned to using land-based channels. Because of this, the merchants who are located outside of Ju-T's accommodations are attempting to purchase the carts with as much vigor as they can muster. When people are knocking on Ju-T's room asking if he is inside and asking him to please come out so they may buy his carts, they both divert their attention to the exterior of his lodging. Some people have stated that they will purchase the carts at twice the current price, while others have stated that they would purchase the carts for 13 gold of Liang, and yet others have stated that they will purchase the carts for 15 gold of Liang. Ju Ti heard everything, and in that kind of situation, he can name any price he wants and that transaction has the potential to become the greatest in the history of their commission clan. However, he looked at the instruction written by their clan leader, and because he was a warrior who follows order, he must not be shaken by personal greed. It is imperative that he carry out the third directive given to him by their clan leader. The next directive is to locate Hio Ya Peng, who is the head of the Heavenly Flower Merchant Association. When Ju Ti told him that he wanted to sell those carts to their Heavenly Flower Merchant Organization, the latter was taken aback to the point that he even dropped his jaw in shock. However, all they could provide was five gold liang, in contrast to the other merchant who could offer a price that was three times higher. This left him perplexed. Ju Ti assured him that it was acceptable at the price of 5 gold liang for each item, and that they planned to sell it at the same price as the original. It looks like Ya Peng is overjoyed, so he immediately bowed to pay respect to Ju Ti and Dalil. He also expressed his gratitude to them. In addition, Ya Peng stated that he will never forget the kindness that was done for him. However, Ju Ti explained to him that the business transaction was very significant to him, and that he was simply trying to reciprocate the generosity shown to him. This was in addition to the fact that he was carrying out the directives given to him by their clan leader. On the other hand, Ya Peng made a request to Ju Ti that in the event that their clan leader ever travels to Shaanxi, he wished for Ju Ti to inform the clan leader that he should stop by and pay a visit. After that, they sold every one of the carts, which resulted in a profit of 200 gold liang. When Ju Ti turned to face Dial, he informed him that the clan leader's fourth directive needed to be carried out immediately. Meanwhile, a merchant was selling tea leaves, and another person who was wearing a cover head was trying to buy those leaves. But the guy seemed to be selling it at a high price, and it appears that they did not understand each other because the person who was wearing the cover head spoke a different language. Because of the cost, the individual who wore the head cover was likewise unwilling to purchase the tea leaves. However, he is unable to continue his speech because Ju Ti interrupted and stated that he is interested in purchasing all of the tea that is sold in Nanchen. Da Il gets closer to the individual who is wearing a cover head and tells him that what the merchant said to him was nonsense, and that the merchant is only inflating the price because he is not familiar with the language spoken in their place. Because Da Il is fluent in the language, he will be able to assist the merchant in understanding the other individual. The merchant at first gives Dahl the impression that he is offended by him, but then he comes to the conclusion that they had simply misunderstood one another because the merchant was a bit novice in speaking Persian. In addition, the person was so thankful to Dahl because it was his first time to come to Nanchang from Persia, and he didn't think that there would be someone able to communicate with him. And because Dahl seems nice, the person asked his name and introduced himself as Mahab Jai and Dail also introduced himself afterward. On the other side, Ju Ti witnessed what took place, and in his opinion, they were in a position where they needed to carry out the fourth command that their clan chief had given them. Afterwards, at this time, Ju Ti has arrived and made the announcement that he has already carried out the directives given to them by their clan leader. When Nodi saw the 400 gold liang and the 4 gold guan, he was astounded to the point where he really dropped his mouth and his eyes opened in surprise. He couldn't believe that Ju Ti had managed to sell all of the carts and purchase all of the tea. And that is how much money was made off of selling all of that tea to the Persian merchant. No Di and his gun Han were overjoyed by the sum since it was one guan higher than the minimum requirement of three guan that is necessary for them to apply for government commissions. Clan leader, you're amazing. They added, Shin Woon stated that there was no need to bring it up because everybody put in a lot of effort, particularly Treasurer Gok, who must have been going through a lot of stress. On the other hand, Treasurer Gok looks embarrassed that their clan leader needs to highlight his hard work in budgeting their cash, 
but he was grateful that their clan had noticed it. On the other hand, Treasurer Gok seems embarrassed that their clan leader needs to acknowledge his hard work. Shin Woon put his hand on Gok's shoulder and stated that he had to have been worried the whole time. But now that everything in the Commission clan would go back to normal, he didn't need to be worried about it, and he could continue to manage the finances of the clan. Yes sir, uttered Treasurer Gok. However, when Shin Woon surveyed his comrades, he couldn't help but feel content. He reasoned that their commission clan would soon be in possession of absurdly large quantities of funding. And if those large-scale commissions continue to succeed on an annual basis, and if they happen to claim even one of the three government commissions on top of all of that, then it is not impossible for them to surpass being the greatest commission clan in Zhejiang, and move on to becoming the largest commission clan in Jiangnan. But all of a sudden, he recalled something important to share with his fellow comrades. Because of the commitment he made to the Tianmu hideout leader, he informed them that from this point forward, the commission of their clan is free to use the mountain trails of Mount Tianmu in any way that their hearts want, and they need to remember to bear in mind while they are planning their itineraries. That's all, great work. He then waved goodbye to his comrades and left them. On the other hand, they were all surprised that the words of their clan leader did not register with them right away and Treasurer Gok, together with No D and his son, dropped their jaws in shock. But as soon as they realized that they were able to use the route of Mount Tanmu, they asked their clan head to elaborate on how he managed to get permission from the hideout leader to allow their commission to use those routes, but their clan chief ignored them. Afterwards, when darkness fell, Kang announced that he had at last arrived at a location that it had been a long since he had previously been. He lets loose an enormous power all of a sudden and then looks inward to see whether or not he should start and when he casts his attention back on the location, he realizes that something has changed compared to the last time he was there. He wonders to himself if the poison causing the Kai to dissipate is the same as or different from any other lethal poison. On the other hand, it would appear that he has advanced to the level of a transcendence, which allowed him to recognize the Kai. It was possible for him to get into harm's way as a result of the formation of the Blood Mist Valley, which does greater damage according to the martial level he is currently at. But if he merely possessed inner Kai, then it would be sufficient. Kang generates energy on his palm, and then suddenly opens his arms to disperse the energy, which forms light. However, it appears that the potentially lethal poison has slightly dispersed. It is time for him to collect the depleted inner Kai that he has acquired throughout the innumerable conflicts he has fought up until this point. The vast bulk of the inner Kai of the undead that was accumulated through the utilization of death Kai extraction has been depleted, and the inner Kai that was received from the undead through the utilization of death Kai extraction can only be used once. Because of this, the amount of Kai that he used up during the fight was significantly larger, despite the fact that he was able to absorb Kai each time he killed one of his opponents. However, for a necromancer like Kang, there is no better way to increase his power aside from increasing the number of summons he has, but his utmost priority is securing as many summons as he can. In that way, he can be able to challenge huge factions like the H. Wang Rock, Commission Clan, Mount Huang Sect and the Kowloon Group. He notices a gold rank undead, and it seems that gold rank is the highest possible rank for the undead in Blood Mist Valley. He raises his hand and lets out a force directly at the gold rank skeleton, and when it hits it, a status window appears stating that the gold rank undead disapproves of Kang's attempt to draw Death Kai from them. It was also said that in order for Kang to communicate with the undead, the formation that had been established in the Blood Mist Valley needed to be destroyed. But Kang was already aware of what would take place, so he made preparations for something he called the Formation Destruction. Kang's skill has been successfully triggered, the formation has been located, and he has begun destroying the unknown formation, according to the message that displays in the status window when it has been opened. But his eyes widened as he observed that the mist was disappearing completely. According to the status window, however, the weak section of the unknown formation is currently being identified, and at the moment, the formation is in a stage in which a significant amount of time has passed since it was first constructed. This state indicates that the formation has been in existence for a very long time. In addition to this, it states that the formation has become extremely worn, which has led to several breaking points being dispersed throughout. After the destruction was finished, the status window proceeded to determine the identify of the previously mysterious formation. Last but not least, the status window congratulates Kang for being the first person to find the formation known as the Blood Mist Heavenly Net Formation. Afterwards, Kang had never heard of the Blood Mist Heavenly Net Formation, but he was under the impression that it was located within the Blood Mist Valley. Kang assumed that the structure was real. 
even when he searches through all of the memories of the alternative future that he has stored in his head, nothing has changed. Within the Order sect, the Chaos sect, the Demonic sect, and even the Blood sect, there is not the slightest hint of that formation. However, a grin appeared on his face all of a sudden because he realized that if he was successful in destroying that enigmatic structure, then he might just be able to demolish all of the formations in the world with only that talent alone, just like the man sang -ya had claimed. However, he was astounded when the status window showed once more and indicated that a hidden effect of the skill called Formation Destruction had been activated due to the fact that the essential condition had been satisfied, and that an extra effect called Formation Reconstruction had been gained. The Blood Mist Heavenly Net Formation has been added to the list of formations that could be reconstructed as a feasible formation. Because the talent, Formation Destruction, did not merely consist of deconstructing the formation, but rather actually evolved further he found it impossible to believe what the status window had claimed. But Kang was overjoyed that he was allowed to use the formation that he had previously demolished, and that, true to his expectations, the winners continued to win. He tightened his grip on his fist, and he is going to take a look at that formation. On the other hand, 200 years ago, the Miram Union combined the 108 Arhat formation of the Shaolin Temple, the Black Heaven Taiji formation of the Wudang Sect, and the Blue Sky Boundless formation of the Namvong Clan to create the Blood Mist Heavenly Net formation. This was accomplished by combining all three of these formations into one. The demon eradicating celestial net configuration that was produced by the combination of these three formations into a single one. And by pure accident, the Nine Heavens Bloodless Formation, which was considered to be the most dangerous formation possessed by the Mount Tian demonic sect, was merged into a single entity and transformed into an entirely new formation. Because the core components of the formations used by the Miram Union and the demonic sect were merged into a single entity, it was difficult to dismantle the formation unless the person doing so had a thorough understanding of the procedures used by both organizations. When the formation is activated, a mist will develop that is so thick that it will be impossible to see more than a single inch ahead of you. This mist will also release a poison kai that will cause more damage the higher one's degree of martial arts is. Because the formations of the Shaolin, Wudang, Nangong, and Demonic Sect were the most powerful from each faction. Kang believed that it would be nearly impossible to remove that formation. This was because the formations of those four sects were the strongest from each faction, and because it was natural for it to be kept as the secret of all secrets in each of the factions due to the fact that there was not a single person in existence who would be proficient with the fundamentals of all four formations. But Kang now possesses the ultimate shape, which, anytime he uses it, will allow him to remain entirely hidden. It was quite awesome because he now possesses the skill that he requires the most for the fight that is about to take place. But he believed that it was premature to celebrate just yet because he had only finished the first stage in the process of dismantling the formation. After that, he rebuilt the Blood Mist Heavenly Net formation, and as he did so, various hues were dispersed around the valley. He stated that if things continue in that direction, the terrifying tales that are told about the Blood Mist Valley will become even more twisted because of him. Afterwards, he walked and headed to his final destination. He found himself in the middle of a place with a large pit and he is aware of every formidable undead being. He claimed that when his necromancy was at the B rank, he was able to create the skeleton of a zenith warrior. This indicates that an A rank necromancer is a transcendent, and that an S rank necromancer is an ascendant. He elevates his hand, which results in a force being applied to his hand. He noticed that there is one gray sparkle on the left and three on the right, and he is able to sense the energies emanating from a total of four undead who have attained their ascension. He mulls over the question of who he should approach first. Afterwards, he makes use of his death kai extraction to conjure a skeleton that has advanced to the level of ascended. But the status window tells him that the undead are extremely hostile towards him because he angered them by disturbing their repose and exhibit intense animosity towards him. However, when he peered down on the hole, he was surprised to see that the undead were gradually coming up from the hole, and this caused him to become alarmed. The status window pops up and informs Kang that the undead are taking in high strength, and that the creature has been resurrected as a skeleton commander. In addition, the undead finally climbed from the hole and it has a massive energy within its body. Kang was perplexed, and he was unsure of what the behavior of the undead was supposed to be. The undead unleash a tremendous amount of force as it assumes its stance and points its weapon in Kang's direction. When it suddenly struck him, the latter creased his brow since he realized that the undead was moving at an unnaturally high speed. 
but he was able to evade the assault even when the undead were close by, and he counterattacked with a significant amount of force. He was under the impression that, in contrast to any other martial artist he had witnessed, the undead possessed an unrivaled mastery of the art of the lighter body. Even though the undead continued to strike at him, he was able to avoid each blow and while he was preoccupied with determining which sect the undead belonged to. But Kang thought that he can't just stand there and let himself be defeated. Suddenly, Kang draws his sword and attacks the undead. However, the undead are able to evade Kang's strike because it was too fast. They continued to fight and counterattack one another, and a great light formed when both of their weapons sparked. After that, they both take a step back, and Kang notices that the inner Kai flowing through the blade is quite pure and this indicates that the undead person was a member of the Order sect rather than the demonic sect. Observing how the undead hold its staff instead of traditional weapons like spears or swords. Furthermore, Kang had a sudden recollection of the fact that 200 years ago, the most of the specialists at the level of Ascended who fought in the fight between the Order and Demon sects were mainly members of the Ten Sects, and that undead may have also been a member of the Ten Sects. But Kang was astounded when the undead threatened to kill him on the assumption that he was a member of the demonic sect. The undead from his stance and told Kang that it will kill them all. On the other hand, Kang was perplexed since the undead are able to articulate its own thoughts, which was something he had never encountered in any of his previous lives. He mutters to himself, I wonder if it is possible for an undead who had risen to the level of Ascended. But at the same time, he can't help but break into a grin because it appears that he will have to alter his strategies because initially, he intended to reduce the undead creature to dust for having the audacity to bear its claws at him. But now he plans to just stop the fight there and break the undead creature's limbs instead. Was this a good enough warm-up? He added while forming his stance. Following his encouragement of the undead to come and attack him, the undead suddenly rushed towards him and struck him with its sword, however, he was able to avoid the blow by utilizing his own sword. Kang observed that the undead were employing the power of wind and water, which means that he will not be able to inflict any damage with his Thunder Kai. Instead, he will need to make use of a different set of abilities. When he finally had the opportunity, he made a rash decision to employ his extortion skill, and after that, he used the selected target and dryad queen technique, followed by the deadly spine. Furthermore, after the zombie noticed vines gradually emerging from the ground, Kang fashioned them into a weapon and used them to attack the undead. After that, Kang launched an assault against the undead with his newest weapon. As a direct result of the huge strike that Kang delivered, the arm of the undead was severed along with his weapon which caused the weapon to shatter. They did not cease their fighting, which led to a significant explosion that occurred as a result. However, Kang was ultimately victorious over the undead, and he declared that even though the undead may be an ascendancy, in the end, teeth are more effective than brute strength. The undead had now bowed down before Kang and were kneeling on the ground. In addition, Kang is questioned by the undead about what they intend to do to him since the undead were already trembling despite the fact that Kang had not yet decided what to do with him. Kang noted the trembling body of the undead and remarked that it was undoubtedly unique in comparison to the previous instances to see a skeleton shivering in terror. On the other hand, the undead beseeched Kang to put an immediate end to it because it believed that it would rather perish than beg for his life from the likes of a devotee of a demonic sect. Kang, however, revealed to the undead that he was not a member of the demonic sect and that he would not benefit from the death of the undead in any way. Afterwards, the undead suddenly lifted his head to stare at Kang who recognized him as the Heavenly Gale Beggar, Zhang Li Pio when Kang realized who the undead person was. However, much to the undead's astonishment, Kang suddenly lifted his hand and began to create an energy. The undead were able to see this, and it appears that it was astounded by the energy that Kang was making in order to summon it. The undead are also aware of the powerful energy and think it is marvelous just before it begins to fade away. On the other hand, the status window appear and stated that the skeleton commander Heavenly Gale Beggar Zhang Li Pio expressed his deepest respect for Kang for demonstrating the ultimate body technique. The Sky Ladder and Kang has fulfilled all capture conditions and the Heavenly Gale Beggar was already added to the list of him summons. He couldn't believe that the undead was amazed by his skill and mentioned that it was marvelous before it was added to his summon list. He clenched his fist because that's a guaranteed long-life slave contract. Inside the infirmary, Jin Wu finally awakens after fighting with Chung Su. As soon as he opened his eyes, he abruptly sat in the bed and looked around the place. It would appear that he was experiencing discomfort in his shoulder, as this was the reason for his sudden holding of it. He was wondering about how long he had been lying in the bed because all he could remember was the moment when Chung Su was about to wield his sword towards him and he was on the point of death. 
At that precise instant, however, the leader of their clan materializes out of thin air and blocks the blade of Chung Su's sword. His train of thinking was suddenly cut off, and he was taken aback when their clan leader unexpectedly materialized out of nowhere. On the other hand, Shin Wun made the observation that it appears as though Jin Wu's condition has already significantly improved, and the latter inquired of their clan leader regarding his well-being and whether or not he had sustained any injuries as a result of his fight with Chung Su. Shin Wun, however, stated that he couldn't be hurt and that he would never be defeated by someone like Chung Su. As a result of this, the faction leader bent his head, appeared sorrowful, and apologized to their clan leader for his terrible look owing to the fact that he lacked the necessary abilities. In addition, Shin Woon instantly laughed because he had realized that Jin Woo's talents were, in fact, lacking. However, it wasn't Jin Woo's skill that was lacking, rather, what was lacking was Jin Woo's martial arts. He reveals to Jin Woo that the limitation of the martial arts that he was trained in is the reason he hasn't been able to break through the wall of transcendence. On the other hand, Jin Woo was miserable due to the fact that their clan leader's words were accurate. However, he was taken aback when the leader of their clan instructed him to follow him if he was able to move since there is somewhere that they need to go. Furthermore, the two of them made their way to the Thunder Cloud Hall. Xin Wun is questioned by the faction leader about the purpose of their presence, but the clan leader orders him to stop talking and directs him to move to the center of the room, where he is to assume the lotus position. After Jin Wu had completed this task, the clan leader gave him the order to close his eyes, and if he was in his posture, he was required to start his Kai meditation. The clan leader notices when Jin Wu begins to posture his body and start his meditation, and in that manner, the clan leader will be able to go forward right away. Shin Woon places both of his hands on the ground and then emits a tremendous amount of energy in the form of green light. He then directs this energy toward Jin Woo. Shin Woon is going to perform the technique known as Yin Kai Supplementation Formation, and as a direct consequence of this, Jin Woo gritted his teeth as he absorbed the energy that their clan leader had supplied. Kang had been observing Jin Woo up to that point, and he came to the conclusion that he was a very skilled martial artist based on what he had seen. Even when viewed from Shin Woon's point of view, his comprehension and awareness of martial arts expertise were remarkable, and he was highly startled to learn that he had gone this far without the guidance of a master. Because of this, it is essential for Kang to give him an injection of inner Kai. Afterwards, it was revealed in the status window that Kang had successfully merged a formation with a magic circle for the first time and that he was in the process of developing a new ability. In Kang's eyes widened as he realized in the status window that a talent called Magic Formation with a rank of SS Plus had been developed, and that he had gotten a prize of experience, as well as the fact that he had already leveled up. The phrase Alkai Supplementation Formation has been added to the collection of magical formations that Kang possesses. In addition, Kang broke into a startled grin when he realized that he had not merely been attempting to make a little adjustment to the configuration but had, Instead, acquired a brand new ability. In contrast, the All Kai Supplementation Formation converts the Kai of the energy source into the inner Kai and then injects it into the target that has been specified. The effectiveness of Kai expansion is improved when the technique for developing one's inner Kai is applied within the region that is under the influence of the formation. The efficiency of expanding one's inner Kai is currently at a level of 250%. In addition, one needs an energy source in order to make use of the magical formation. It has been decided that the inner core will serve as the energy source, and measurements will be taken of the inner Kai that is housed within the inner core. The measurement has been finished, and the process known as all Kai supplementation formation is currently being activated, and the entirety of one cycle's worth of inner Kai will be pumped into the person designated as Do Jin Woo. Kang was ecstatic about the whooping one cycle which was an enormous quantity of inner Kai that he injected into Jin Woo. However, he had to stop delivering energy to Jin Woo because if he doesn't, Jin Woo's body will eventually break down. When Shin Woon informed Jin Woo that he was completed, Jin Woo opened his eyes and was astounded when he peered into his hand and saw that it had a tremendous amount of energy. The leader of the Beacon clan extends his congratulations to him on reaching the level of transcendent martial artistry for the clan. And because of that, Jin Woo couldn't believe it and cannot find any words to say out of shock. He thought that he was now a transcendent, so he abruptly stood up and wielded his sword to try it and as a result, a massive force was released within his body through his sword. Jin Woo widens his eyes in amazement because he now possesses something he has never experienced until that moment. However, Jin Woo was surprised when Shin Woon commented that it's too early to be impressed by his energy and handed him a book. 
but he was confused because it was the Book of Eighteen Swords of the Splitting Wind and their clan leader told him that he picked the book up on his way. Shin Woon remained within the Thunder Cloud Hall after the faction leader had left because he intended to immediately begin training the Eighteen Swords of the Splitting Wind. Jin Woo's desire isn't any less than that of people who are younger, despite Kang's belief that it would be beneficial for him to take some time off and rest for a while. Since Jin Woo has successfully broken through the Wall of Transcendence, he should now be able to comprehend how much more advanced a martial art the Eighteen Swords of Splitting Wind is. And if it is indeed Jin Woo, there is benefit in sharing martial arts at such a high degree because it is natural to receive in proportion to what one bestows upon others. Kang pulled himself up off the ground and had the notion that it would be difficult for him to win the war against the Blood Sect with only his own might. And the only way to stop the hell that is going to come, Thus in order to win, he needs to grow everyone's strengths. Even insignificant actions, such as the one that he took today, will eventually add up to a significant transformation. In any case, it must come as a relief to him, because the six dog beating knots of the splitting wind and the eighteen swords of the splitting wind have evolved into entirely new forms of martial art. He didn't need to be overly concerned about coming into contact with members of the beggars sect in the future. Furthermore, generally speaking, it is more difficult to modify already existing martial arts than it is to create new ones. However, this does not apply to him because Kang feel it each and every time. On the other hand, the status window emerged and it stated that he had achieved the corresponding achievement, which was that he had successfully transformed and ascended undead into a summon for the first time. As a reward for accomplishing that goal, he was given a new skill called Martial Arts Innovation with the rank of SS+. Moreover, there is still one month left until the deadline of the government commission, and Kang should utilize that time to grow the strength of the Beacon Clan to its limit. As a result of this, Kang's double life started again once more as Kang and Shin Woon. He went to the Blood Mist Valley in the dead of night, when everyone else was asleep, with the intention of incorporating the three remaining ascending experts into his call. His plan was to do this as quickly as possible. However, it was not an easy task since the opponent was an expert of the advanced level. It just so happened to have a favorable matchup versus the Heavenly Gale Beggar, which resulted in an easy victory at that point in time. As a result, Kang adjusts his tactic and places an increased emphasis on protecting the transcending undead. As there are only three remaining, even if you were to capture one every seven days, it wouldn't be too late after all. The most essential thing is to increase the number of summons. It is said that the path that takes the longest to get there is the path that takes the quickest time to get back. Afterwards, as soon as the sun began to rise, Kang made his way back to the Commission Clan and began his other duties as the leader of the organization for the day. The first thing that he needs to do is mix two distinct styles of martial arts to create a new kind of martial arts, and then he needs to teach it to the guards that protect the Commission Clan. The arts of the Arhat Kai of the Shailen Temple and the art of the accumulated Kai of the military are the two types of martial arts that he needs to unite in order to be successful. In addition, the art of the Arhat Kai is the most basic kind of pulse art and the basis of all other forms of martial art. However, Kai accumulates very slowly, which is one of the reasons why many people avoid it despite the fact that it is a well-known martial art. It has incredible potential, but in order for him to see excellent results from the young guardians of the Commission clan, they will need to train for a significant amount of time. On the other hand, the art of accumulated Kai is the benchmark that everyone follows. There is value in the art for those individuals who are cultivating their inner Kai as a result of the fact that it is the most fundamental and has a very rapid accumulation pace. Having said that, art also has boundaries, and these constraints mean that no matter how much one practices, they will never be able to achieve their pinnacle. After that, Kang clenched his hand and then let go of the force. He began to merge the two different styles of martial arts while murmuring phrases that only he could comprehend. Afterwards, when their clan leader handed Gunho a book, the latter caused his jaw to drop in shock. The book in question was the pulse art of the Buddha's Nexus, which had been authored by their clan leader. When Shin Woon asked Gunho how the book was, he responded that it exceeded his expectations and he mentioned that he was able to comprehend it despite the absence of unnecessary material, and that it does not lack depth. He inquires of the head of their clan about the means by which he was able to develop such a flawless martial technique. On the other hand, Kang chooses to ignore Gunho's question and instead lets out a sigh of relief as he is able to comprehend what is stated in the book. He also stated that as of that day, Gunho was obligated to begin disseminating the pulse art of the Buddha's nexus to each and every guard in the Commission clan. Understood, clan leader, utter Gunho but when he was about to leave, their clan leader called him once again and instructed him to get Dial to come to his dwelling. 
Before the sun came down, Sam entered the room of their clan leader and announced that the man that he requested had arrived. The clan leader instructs Sam to not let anyone enter the vicinity of his dwelling starting that moment. Understood. Utter Sam then he left to call the man that their clan leader had requested. Afterwards, as soon as Dahil enters the room, he immediately greets their clan leader and pays him respect. He asked why their clan leader was frantically looking for him. But he was perplexed because their clan leader ignored him and didn't speak any words to him and he did nothing but look at him in silence. Because of this, he once more brought it to the attention of their clan leader. When the leader of their clan told Dahil that it was now simpler for him to communicate with him, Dahil's eyes widened in surprise. Dahil seemed shy to their clan leader for using honorific words towards him. However, Shin Woon can hear Dahil's thoughts pleading to speak comfortably to him and it seems Dahil was beginning to be nervous at him but he was not staring at Dahil instead. He was staring at the status window that appeared and stated that the martial arts and attributes of Ju Dahil were unknown. His hundred spirit eyes cannot be used due to the target being at a higher level than him. Afterwards, Kang noted that Dahil appeared uneasy and as a result, he apologized for doing such things since at that moment. He couldn't help but gaze at others. Dahil appeared to be nervous. Kang said that a guy like him should not have the audacity to treat the person who is in charge of the house society in such a careless manner. The house society is a cult that is made up of people who have fallen to the lowest levels of society, such as petty thieves, harlots, tramps, and those who live their life on the streets. The amount of knowledge that could be gleaned from such a large number of people served as both their source of power and their means of subsistence. The number of people who belonged to the house society was significantly higher than that of any other faction and Judail is the one who is in charge of leading the house society. However, when Kang said those things to Dahil, the latter did not confess that he was the leader of house society, and he did not know what their clan leader was talking about and he claimed that he was unaware of the group's name. But when the clan leader told Dahil that he was confused at first, because someone who was supposed to be in Zuchang had come to the Beacon clan for an interview, his eyes widened, and he does not know that the clan leader already knows that much other than the fact that Shin Woon called Dahil on his real name as the sect leader Shin Wuyang. Afterwards, Wu Yang's anger reached a breaking point. He unleashed his weapon and then suddenly struck Shin Woon. The latter observed that the sharpness of the weapon that Wu Yang was using passed right through his eyes, which is why he suddenly let go of his sword and counterattacked the hit. Wu Yang abruptly twisted his body in the air to launch a second assault, but Shin Woon was able to avoid it with his sword. After that, Wu Yang abruptly halted and told Shin Woon that not a single person was aware of his true identity but that he had no idea how Shin Woon was aware of it. On the other hand, the clan leader took notice of the weapon Wu Yang was carrying, which was none other than the notorious soundless flying daggers. He added that he wasn't even able to witness Wu Yang bring that weapon inside the Beacon clan, and as a result, the clan leader commended him for his incredible skills. But Wu Yang was furious because as he furrowed his brow when he discovered that the clan leader seems to know a lot. But from that moment onward, Shin Woon is going to have to disclose everything he knows and if he doesn't, he will pay the price with his blood. After that, he unleashes a tremendous amount of force throughout his body and assumes his position. But he didn't attack right away because he thought about how much their clan leader knew, and if he knows about the location of the secret base in Zucheng, then it will become more troublesome for the whole house society. That's why he said that if Shin Woon was planning on threatening him to exploit the house society, he had better forget such thoughts because in the house society, the information itself is power, authority, and life. On the other hand, when the clan leader explained to Wu Yang that the latter must have misunderstood him because he had no intention of taking advantage of the house society's vulnerabilities in order to torment them, Wu Yang was taken aback. When the clan leader also told him that the only thing he wants is an alliance between the Beacon Commission clan and the house society, it caused him to furrow his brow and it came as a shock to him, and he couldn't believe it when the leader of the Beacon clan stated that all he wanted was an alliance with his sect. However, he did not believe the clan leader because, in the end, it seemed as though he merely wanted the powerful information they possessed. When Shin Woon told Wu Yang that he won't deny that he was coveting their information, he furrowed his brow and said that there's no reason for him to accept the alliance that the clan leader has offered and refuse it. Shin Woon smiled and said that if that was the case, he asked Wu Yang if he could handle the consequences with a serious expression. He showed his sword that was hanging on his waist. Wu Yang was confused and asked the clan leader if what he was trying to say was to know his place. Wu Yang was irritated and based on his observations until that moment, he was not some ordinary man. 
Though he may have a big heart as a lake for his allies, he is someone who would become the devil incarnate to his enemies and to oppose someone like him would mean blood would spill, but not the Beacon clan instead the Hao society. When Xin Wun told Wu Yang that he was not as harsh as he thought he was and that they can't call it an equal partnership if only one side benefited from the agreement, Wu Yang felt perplexed. After that, Xin Wun articulates the conditions that would be to the Hao society's advantage, and he lays out two of those requirements. He elaborated his first condition, which is that he will tell the major culprit behind the line of disappearances of members of the Hao society. Wu Yang appeared to be surprised, and he was sweating heavily as Xin Wu spoke. Wu Yang was perplexed, which is why he asked the clan leader about the disappearance that he mentioned. However, the clan leader did not answer him but instead asked him how long he was going to pretend and Wu Yang was stumped. In addition, Wu Yang furrowed his brow when Xin Wu asked him if he hadn't come to Jiajiang to investigate the chain disappearances of the members of the Hao society. However, Xin Wu also told Wu Yang his second condition. The latter will bring the members of the Hao society who had their identities revealed back into normal society. And as a result, Wu Yang dropped his jaw and couldn't believe the second condition of the clan leader. He also asks the clan leader to stop playing with him because it isn't some problem that a mere leader of a countryside commission clan can solve. However, Xin Wun asks Wu Yang, who is still irritated and furrowed his brow, whether he thinks the sheer size of a faction will enable his members to return to society. And it doesn't matter if it's the lord of a province or the ruler of the whole country since what's important is the technique. Wu Yang furrows his brow in response. Xin Wun also stated that from that point on, all of the new guard and carrier jobs of the branch offices of the Beacon Commission clan that would be raised in each province will be filled with members of the Hao society. These positions will be created in the near future. Wu Yang expressed astonishment, but Xin Wun disregarded him and finished his sentence, which stated that the Hao society will be given access to all martial arts in addition to the fundamentals. Wu Yang continued to express his amazement. And even if they were to leak them to the Hao society, there won't be any repercussions. Wu Yang couldn't believe the stipulations that their clan leader imposed, much less the plans he had in mind for the entirety of the Hao society members. But then, he asks the clan leader if he will be able to bear it, if the identities of the members of the Hao society are disclosed since his honor might fall to the ground and if he will still be fine if that ever happened. Xin Wun formed a grin on his face and explained that rather than accepting some phony accolade, he chose to provide those who had reached the end of their lives with the desire to continue living. After that, Xin Wun extended a handshake to Wu Yang and advised him to make his decision right now. Xin Wun believed that his response would be sufficient to satisfy Wu Yang, but the latter was still uncertain about whether or not he would take it because Xin Wun planned to establish branch offices in other regions, and he would be the first to conquer Zhejiang. Are you confident in doing that? Asked Wu Yang. In response, Xin Wun instructed Wu Yang to grant him one month, and then the entire province of Zhejiang will be in his control after that period of time. On the other hand, Wu Yang appears to be persuaded since the clan chief gives him a recommendation that he won't be able to refuse, and it appears as though he has no other choice than to accept it. Then, they handshake to seal their agreement. There was a gathering of beautiful women dancing beautifully in a place, and they were all dressed in the same dress. It seems that Jung Ak was the only one having a nice time while trying to impress the leader of the Kowloon group while they are were having a drink together. He asked Yom whether he was happy with the reception, but Yom ignored him, so Jung Ak continued to talk and stated that he should have intended to be like that more often. But he was overwhelmingly busy, and Jung Ak will be thankful if the giving heart of Yom would comprehend his predicament. But it seems Yom was irritated at him and told that it's fine since he had also had a fair share of tasks to attend to within his own group so he wasn't able to properly pay attention at Jung Ak and if he was disappointed then he should forget about it because he already knew how Jung Ak being a snobbery. On the other hand, Jung Ak continued to pour alcohol at the Kowloon group leader and said that how could he dare to be disappointed in the great leader of the Kowloon group. Of course he understands his reason for overseeing the whole of Zhejiang and he knew he was occupied, then turned to the Zhejiang provincial minister, Kang Wai So, as if he was boasting something. But it seems Wai So was annoyed to Jung Ak for trying to impress the Kowloon group leader. However, Yom interrogated Jung Ak on the issues being discussed in the government commission. Jung Ak blurted out so quickly that he had already turned in the application on the first day and had already completed the hiring process for two transcendents. Yom, who was still irritated, told the leader of the H. Wang Rock Commission clan to make sure that they will take precaution after precaution. This is because it is of the utmost significance that the H. Wang Rock Commission clan become the best commission clan in all of Zhejiang. 
Then Yom glanced at Junak and believed that the latter was untrustworthy and some type of a person who looks to have a negative attitude that might be contagious to other people. And of that, since before he left everything up to the H. Wang Rock clan, he had to prepare something in case there was an emergency. Furthermore, it was claimed by Junak that he overheard some news while he was on his way. And that news was that the Beacon Commission clan has made an application and it appears that Shin Woon is actually doing as he wishes without knowing his place. But when the leader of the Kowloon group looked at Jung Ak and seemed to catch his attention on his news, Jung Ak continued his sentence and said that he was certain that Shin Woon was lying, and that he didn't know how that stupid oaf could get a hold of three guan of gold and two transcendent experts then suggested to the leader of the Kowloon group that they prevent the participation of the Beacon clan. But Yom informed him that they don't need to do so and that they don't need to stop him. Which is why Jung Ak was startled because Jung Ak was enraged with Shin Woon for severing the arm of his kid. He wants their commission to be disqualified and he doesn't want to participate in the event. However, Yom breaks into a sudden smile and explains that it was really galling of him to come up with a variety of lies so that he could rush in without realizing that it would be his grave. He then turns to Wai So and gives him instructions, telling him that beginning that day, he must begin preparing for the test that will be administered by the government commission in accordance with his directions. However, Wiseau gave off the impression that he was dissatisfied with the Kowloon group leader, but he did not voice his disappointment because he was afraid of something. After that, a servant unexpectedly approached Yom when he was handing a paper to Wiseau, and as the provincial minister read what was written on the paper, his eyes opened in surprise, and he yelled at the head of the Kowloon group, asking what kind of a test that was. As a direct consequence of this, the ladies' dancers suddenly stopped when they heard the provincial minister shout. Why so then stepped up and said that the Kowloon group commander had the aim, based on what was written on the letter, to kill all of the members of the commission clan, and that this goes beyond integrity. Yom's subordinates who were drinking in front of them turned to Wiseau with frowns on their faces. On the other hand, Yom assured Wiseau that he was correct and that he would eliminate all of those commission clans by means of the test for the government commission. After that, he gave Wiseau an evil smile and instructed him that he would be the one to carry out such a bloodbath. Wiseau's mouth fell open, his eyes enlarged, and his jaw dropped, and he was so stunned that he was at a loss for words when the leader of the Kowloon group asks him how he was feeling about taking the lives of innocent people with his own hands. Don't you feel exhilarated? Yom added. When Wiseau didn't respond, Yom abruptly stood up and it seemed he had something in his hand. Then he asked Wiseau if he was hesitating on doing his command. Because of this, Yom will make it simpler for Wiseau to decide. Then he showed to the latter some green item on his palm at which point Wiseau was completely taken aback by what he saw. After that, Yom told the provincial minister to decide whether he would rather force innocent souls into the pits of death, or would he rather become a father who chose to abandon his daughter's life. At this point, Yom grew upset because it seemed that Wiseau was attempting to challenge him. The latter, on the other hand, is powerless to resist Yom's order and must comply with it. Afterwards, while numerous individuals were present at that location for the commission clan test, the flags of various clans were displayed on the ground. Among those present was Ak Chil, who was also accompanied by the leader of the strong dragon squad of the Kowloon group, the sanguine rain blade Hyo Jung Gwang. Even the followers of Master Chung Su were present, including Song Hak, who just so happened to be Ak Chil's brother. People were astounded when they saw them, and some said that it seemed as though the commission had become more stringent, and that the H. Wang Rock clan was able to hire all of them. However, Ak Chil saw the people who he thought were scared of him and seems boasting that he commanded the Strong Dragon Squad and Master Chung Su because they will assist him on that commission test. But he was irritated when he heard someone announce that the Beacon Clan Commission had arrived, and when he turned he saw Shin Woon walking towards them along with his subordinates because Shin Woon managed to find his way on the commission test with his own feet. That's why he faced the latter and told him that it will be the day of his funeral. But Shin Woon pretends not to know him because the latter asks Ak Chil who he was and as a result. The latter became enraged and was about to say something but he couldn't finish his sentence when someone announced that the provincial minister has arrived. Ak Chil turned and saw that Wiseau has already arrived and everyone shall pay respect to him. Wiseau's gaze was fixed on the commission clans that had indicated their intention to take part in the commission exam. He focused his attention specifically on Shin Woon, a member of the Beacon clan. However, he was uncertain how to carry out Yom's command given that Shin Woon was much too young. Afterwards, he told them that only the clan heads and executives of each commission clan are permitted to enter the prosecution department. The rest of the clan members are required to wait outside. After that, he reversed course and went back to the prosecution department to wait for them there. 
Afterwards, every leader of the Commission clan were gathered inside the Prosecution Department and why so praised them because they have sufficiently met the conditions for the selection and have obtained the right to vie for that precious opportunity to lower the burden of His Majesty. Due to urgency why so will begin the explanation of the rules and regulation of the Commission test. Why so indicated that ultimately there are only three commissions able to be tasked between them all. So those that took first place, second and third at the end of that day's test will each receive one of these commissions. However, Shin Woon along with Jin Woo was closely listening to the provincial minister. Furthermore, Wai So also indicated that the third place will be responsible for fulfilling the commission to transport priceless flowers and herbs discovered on Mount Yandang to the royal palace. Next, in order to raise the morale of the soldiers who are fighting the Japanese pirates in Jejong. The commission clan that places second will be given the responsibility of delivering items that have been personally bestowed upon the warriors by his majesty from Changxing. And lastly, the commission clan who comes in first place will be assigned with the duty of guiding the souvenir of Princes Cho Hai, who were the siblings of his majesty, the emperor who had died ten years ago, from Mount Xiangxia to the royal palace in Beijing. However, everyone was startled by the news, and some people asked the provincial minister if he was talking about the princess Cho Hai, the person whom his majesty cherished very much. Another person remarked that the emperor wept for days and nights after the princess passed away. The person also said that if the commission clan is successful, then not only would there be bountiful reward, but the reputation of the commission clan would also be benefits incomparable to that second and third place, other says that if by chance, they happen to fail the mission, or perhaps lose or damage the belongings of the royal family, then not only would your clan be ruined because there may even be punishments that last for three generations, and that people seem scared. On the other hand, why so made the announcement regarding the particulars of the selection test. He stated that the capacity of a commission clan to defend their commodities in the face of any damage is the most significant and vital aspect of a commission clan. As a result, each of the six clans that make up the commission will go fight against the others in an effort to preserve an item. People were bewildered about the guarding struggle, but Shin Woon appeared cool and knew what the provincial minister was trying to say while Ak Chil seemed overconfident due to the fact that the Kowloon gang and Mount Huang sect were on his back. Furthermore, Wiseau added that every clan in the commission will be given the same item and that they will have four hours to complete their task. Within that allotted amount of time, they are tasked with simultaneously preventing other commission clans from stealing the specified item and seizing the belongings of the competing commission clan. When it was revealed that their commission clans were going to engage in combat with one another, the clans of the other commissions were astonished and shocked. The minister of the province has confirmed that they are correct and that each guard would be issued a name tag. If the tag is removed, the guard will be regarded to have passed away. Why so also mentioned that removing a guard's name tag will result in a payout of two points, and if they take an item from another commission clan, that clan will be rewarded with 50 points for having possession of it. After then, the total score will be tabulated, and the results, starting with third place and going all the way up to first place, will be announced. Other commission clans became concerned and stated that the test was too risky because it would include a combat between the members of the commission against one another, during which there would likely be a significant amount of killing. On the other hand, one individual approached the provincial minister with a question regarding whether or not the martial artists, who would be competing in the item guarding combat will be required to take the test while armed with their personal weapons. After Jun Guang and Ak Chil heard it, Jun Guang became enraged since the question was completely pointless. He also stated that despite the fact that the entirety of the martial world as well as China is aware of the fact that he and the entirety of the Myongjin Commission clan are completely useless for planning to use wooden swords in a real battle for the sake of their enemies' lives, and that it is obvious which Commission clan will be eliminated first from that test. As a direct consequence of this, the two individuals became quite angry with them. On the other hand, the provincial minister stated that Jun Wang was correct in his assessment because it is illogical to restrict their weaponry simply due to the fact that it is only a test. Additionally, they will be using their very own unique weaponry during the exam. In other words, the examination is going to be quite difficult. Because of this, any casualties that are unavoidable and do occur during the test will be disregarded as a result of the decision that was made with the authority of His Majesty, the Emperor. Therefore, it is his sincere wish that each individual will give the examination their absolute best effort. Following the conclusion of the explanation, the Minister of the Province gives the order for everyone to immediately proceed to the testing grounds. Meanwhile, at the location of the test, everyone was hard at work constructing their tent. 
the adjutant informed Act Chill that the place surrounding the testing field has been totally walled off, and as a result, it will be impossible for anyone to ascend the mountain. Adjutant responded to Act Chill's thanks for securing the testing field by stating that there was no need for him to acknowledge it because he was just another supervisor that the Kowloon gang had bought out. And now that he has established the foundation, Act Chill will carry out the remaining tasks on his own. But Act Chill gives off the impression that he is not paying attention since his eyes are focused on the Beacon clan, and he believes that their good luck will run out in the testing ground because the Kowloon gang has already bribed the adjutant who is acting in the capacity of the supervisor, along with the rest of his friends. When he thought that the Beacon Commission clan were nothing more than caged rodents, a grin spread across his face. He had his fist balled up because the moment the test started, he was going to kill Shin Woon straight away. On the other hand, the adjutant and Act Chill both direct their attention to the loud noise that the horses are making. The adjutant lost his temper and demanded to know from his subordinates what the problem was and when his subordinates directed his finger in a certain area, he immediately opened his eyes and dropped his mouth when he spotted those individuals. On the other hand, few guards prepare themselves for a struggle against the people who are coming and they question where they think they are because the region was under the control of his majesty, the emperor, and call for them to back off. But as soon as they realized who the man was, every one of them began to shake with horror. It was Nam Gang, the king of the Gale Thunder Mountain. On the other hand, when the guards tried to prevent Nam Gang from entering the testing field, he told them that every mountain in Zhejiang is a part of his land. In any other situation, he would have severed the heads of everyone. But given that he was just there to monitor his younger brother's exam, he is willing to look the other way in this case. Nam Gang went to the government commission test and searched for Shin Woon, who was one of the participants. After he dismounted his horse, he yelled at Shin Woon, telling him to hurry up if he could hear his older brother's voice. However, Nam Gang was being pointed at by a number of guards who were brandishing their weapons, but they were unaware that they were looking at the Mountain King. On the other hand, the adjutant and Ak Chil were perplexed since they had no idea who the younger brother of Nam Gang was from him shouting in such a manner. I, myself, have come here after hearing the news about your government commission test, Nam Gang added. In addition, people were discussing who Nam Gang was referring to, and some said that there was someone in the participant who had taken the Gale Thunder Mountain King as their older brother. However, everyone turned their attention to Act Chill because the H. Wang Rock Commission clan was the faction that was most likely to have a connection with the Tian Nu hideout. However, it appears that Act Chill was not the younger brother that Nam Gang was looking for. Despite the fact that Act Chill was perplexed, it appears that he was harboring the hope that he was the person Nam Gang was seeking for. But because a brave man like the Gale Thunder Mountain King will never be sworn brother with Act Chill, other participants did not consider that it was absurd. However, they continued to be interested in who it was. However, all of their attention was drawn to Shin Woon when he walked out and addressed Nam Gang as Hyung Min. And Nam Gang responded by acknowledging Shin Woon as his younger brother. They couldn't fathom the possibility that someone like him would be Nam Gang's sworn brotherhood. Shin Woon didn't anticipate that his older brother, Nam Gang, would come all the way on his commission test. The Mountain King then smiled and explained to Shin Woon that he was in charge of monitoring the entirety of Zhejiang, which was why he was aware of everything that was going on. On the other hand, Ak Chil seemed to be confused as his eyes widened. He couldn't believe it when he was again. His most loathed guy, the one who slashed his arm, none other than Shin Woon was the sworn brother of the Gale Thunder Mountain King. On the other hand, Shin Woon was delighted when he saw Nam Gang, which is why he said that since the latter was there, he might as well take a seat and watch comfortably because he would provide him with an entertaining spectacle. Good, I'll be expecting it. Ha ha ha, exclaimed Nam Gang. Furthermore, Shin Woon and Nam Gang were overjoyed to see one another, and Ak Chil couldn't take his eyes off of them as he gazed intently at them. It was inconceivable to him that Shin Woon was the younger brother of the Gale Thunder Mountain King. When he realized that everyone was putting their attention on Shin Woon, he became upset and even cursed at the latter because it should have been the H. Wang Rock Commission clan that was receiving all of the attention during the government commission test, and not him. This is the reason why Ak Chil suddenly goes to the adjutant and signals him to begin the test and put an end to Shin Woon's rising popularity. As a consequence of this, the adjutant issued an order requiring everyone to return to their respective posts immediately because the guarding battle would begin immediately. Moreover, there are only two ways to move on with the test. Each commission clan will create a formation with their camp in the center, and they will pick between attacking and defending their territory. 
The commission clan that will pick a fence will launch an assault on the opponent in an effort to loot as many items as they can in order to accumulate points. The commission clan that chooses defense is responsible for guarding their items to the best of their abilities and also for seizing the items of other commission clans who are no longer able to battle in order to accumulate points. In addition, people were yelling insults at the H1 Rock Commission clan since the clan has three squads, and from the very beginning, they were outnumbered by their opponents. However, despite the fact that everyone in the H1 Rock clan is a well-known wandering specialist, they are resolved to put up as much of a fight as they can. In addition, Akchil is standing in the middle of the battlefield, and it appears that he will be the one to initiate the offensive. He is staring at Shin Woon, the leader of the Beacon Commission clan, who is the person who most aggravates him. He believed that he did not know how much money Shin Woon spent buying out Nam Gang, but it appears that Shin Woon was unable to convince the Gale Thunder Mountain King to aid him with the test. However, Ak Chil was not like the others since he had solid reinforcements in the form of the H Wang Rock Clan, the Kowloon Group, and even the Master Mount Wang Sect, because even the supervisors, including the adjutant, are currently being bribed. Not even the Gale Thunder Mountain King will be able to do anything to change the situation. What will the Monarch of the Bandit Union do in the event that Ak Chil eliminates Shin Woon under the cover of an accident? After then, a sneering smirk emerges on his face as he realizes that the moment for him to exact his vengeance has finally arrived. The test has begun, shout of the adjutant. Afterwards someone blows the trumpet as a sign that the government commission test has begun. Afterwards, they were all more fierce and didn't want to lose the war, some of them were attacking, and others were getting ready to defend themselves. They wield their own weapon in both defense and offense, and whomever threatens them with proximity gets hacked to death by their sword. The adjutant observed everything that took place on the battlefield, including the blood that was splattered everywhere, the numerous fighters who were lying on the ground, some of them were hurt while others were already dead. He believed that even if the royal family had stated that the death would be forgotten and that the war was nothing more than a test, the fact remained that what had taken place was a battlefield. Despite the fact that the Aju Commission clan and the King Hua Commission clan have already made deals to lose to the H Wang Rock Commission clan, and that H. Wang Rock Commission clan will still receive the highest score. On the other hand, the adjutant seems to have noticed something that has caught his attention. He was perplexed because the guard of the H. Wang Rock Commission clan appears to be suffering and having a hard time because they haven't been able to move despite the fact that their numbers are significantly larger than those of the Beacon clan. The H. Wang Rock Commission clan has not been successful in killing a single person, nor have they been able to acquire a single item. Ak Chil witnessed everything, and while he did so, he gritted his teeth in anger at the leader of the Beacon clan. This was because the Beacon clan leader had entirely given up on the offense and instead put all of his troops' attention on the defensive. However, Ak Chil is aware of something because he has the impression that something is amiss. This is due to the fact that regardless of how much attention he pays to the defense, the fighting ability of the guards on their side should be significantly higher. He has the impression that they have been halted by something unknown. Shin Woon, on the other hand, employs his skeleton warrior to assist the entirety of the Beacon clan in passing the government commission test. Afterwards, Shin Woon informed his warriors that they were to take all of the items from the adversaries whose formation had been destroyed. As a result, they unexpectedly surged toward their adversaries in order to collect the items. Warriors from the H. Wang Rock Commission clan were taken aback when their item was promptly taken by someone. Then another person calls out to inquire as to what is taking place and whether or not the H. Wang Rock Clan is being defeated. Warriors belonging to the Kowloon group believed that the Beacon Clan would stage a return because they were unable to break their formation, which is the reason they were so angry. Nevertheless, they will never allow this to occur, despite the fact that they appear to be fatigued. While warriors from Mount Huang sect are furious because the oons that they obtained from the Aju Commission clan and the King Hua Commission clan are vanishing due to this H. Wang Rock clan. Someone inquires as to what action they should take, and another responds by shouting that they should launch a full-scale assault because there is no need to focus on any of the other Commission clans. An ally from the Kowloon group exclaims at everyone, and instructs Ever to head to the Beacon clan instead pierced through their defense by any means. He added, Mount Huang sect, Kowloon group, and H. Wang rock clan were now heading towards the Beacon clan. They were trying their best to break their defense. They kept on pushing and slashing their swords just to pierce their defense. And as a result, the Beacon clan seemed to be having a difficult time attempting to defend their formation because it was three commission clans against them. On the other hand, Ak Chil was furious. 
He kept on yelling at all of his warriors to keep pushing through the formation of the Beacon clan, and he also yelled at them saying that if any of his warriors lost at the Beacon clan, they would have their head chopped off because he wanted to eradicate the entire Beacon clan in an instant. As a result of this, the warriors belonging to the Kowloon group continued to launch attacks against the Beacon clan formation. However, they were all sweating and they clenched their teeth. It's getting harder for them to withstand, and they were starting to get pushed back due to the addition of the Kowloon group and the Mount Huang sect. It appears that the Beacon clan is having trouble defending their formation so that it does not break. At that rate, their formation is going to fall apart. And it occurred when one of the Kowloon group got through on the Beacon warrior and pierced its sword. As a consequence, the formation shattered, and it's an opportunity for their opponent to charge because one side of the Beacon's defense had been broken through. After that, the Kowloon group, together with the Huang sect and the H. Wang Rock clan, launched an assault against the Beacon clan. Others were attempting to defend their commission, while others were attempting to assault their opponent. But, in the end, Beacon's formation became disorganized. On the other hand, warriors from the Huang sect and the Kowloon group were perplexed when they heard from someone saying it was finally their turn. To their astonishment, Ha Rin, Marluk, H Wang No, Zhuge, and Jin Wu were enraged and racing towards them. As a direct consequence of Ha Rin's hasty decision to draw her weapon and strike it in the direction of their adversary, few people were hit by her weapon. Zhuge, on the other hand, made a sudden jump over their opponents and struck them with his iron leaf fan. Nonetheless, Few people were injured as a result of this attack. In addition, Marluk used his enormous arms to strangle their adversary, and then he abruptly smashed him into the ground. Meanwhile, H. Wang No utilized his bow and arrow to attack their adversaries. In addition, it was Jin Wu's turn, and given that he was now a transcendent, he tightly gripped his sword and created a massive force. He then abruptly jumped and released that massive force towards their opponent, and he didn't stop until their opponent was running just to avoid his attack. But it was useless, because Jin Wu pursued everyone who was blocking his way. Someone from the opposing clan of the Beacon was yelling for their comrades to get away because it appeared that they were unable to deal with the circumstance and how powerful the Beacon clan commission was. On the other hand, as a result of seeing everything, including how powerful the Beacon clan commission was, Ak Chil felt infuriated, and he gritted his teeth in an effort to contain his displeasure. He had no idea what was going on since he believed that they had already triumphed over the Beacon clan because they had already broken their formation. However, at that precise moment, the H. Wang Rock Commission, the Kowloon Gang, and even the Mount Huang sect were all miserably being defeated by just five individuals. In addition to that, they were unable to approach Shin Wun in any way. However, Shin Wu needs to get ready and begin his task, so he snaps his finger to activate his Shadow Stealth ability because it appears that his greatest subordinates have already prevailed over their opponents. According to the information provided by the status box, the Shadow Stealth ability has a grade of S+, and a proficiency of 61%. Even though Shin Wu was in their line of sight while he was using it, he was unable to be seen by anyone. It lessens one's presence as much as it possibly can turning the person casting the spell into a shadow. During the time that the skill was active, he was unable to be seen by the eyes of the others, and his movement speed was substantially increased. However, the stealth state was deactivated whenever he was assaulted by the opponent or when he attacked them. Furthermore, Shin Wu suddenly sprinted towards their enemy after he activated his skill, and their adversaries were stunned when he took every name tag and item they had. Shin Wu's sudden movement surprised their opponents, and their adversaries were shocked when he seized every name tag and item they had. They even cursed because he was too quick and they couldn't see where he was coming from. The items are being seized instantly. Someone shouted. Shin Wu appeared to take pleasure in stealing items from their rival. However, his attention was drawn to something else, which turned out to be an attack coming from someone else. Fortunately, he was able to sidestep it. Shin Woon was startled and looked around suddenly to see who it was. In addition, the man's attire revealed that he was a member of the Mount Huang sect, and that his name was Master Chung Gong. The latter said that Yu Shin Woon of the Beacon Clan Commission, such a young lad, has already made the future of the martial world bleak. Shin Woon is currently surrounded by a small group of swordsmen from Mount Huang led by Chung Gong. The latter informed the clan leader of the Beacon clan that his time for playing is done and that he will ignore his disobedience if he will only obediently give up and surrender. If this occurs, Chung Gon will only cut off Shin Wu's arms and destroy his Kai center. After that, he grinned as he brandished his sword in the direction of Shin Wu and pointed it at him. However, Shin Wu had no idea who Chung Gon was, but his eyes widened in recognition when he noticed that the three warriors who were surrounding him appeared to know him. 
when he saw the three warriors, he asked if they had ever seen each other before, and they were anxious when he saw them. After receiving no response to his inquiry from the three warriors, he inquired of them once more as to whether their master was behaving inappropriately due to not being aware of his position. It appeared as though Chung Gon had heard what Shin Woon had to say. Nevertheless, he did not respond and instead furrowed his brow. Because of this, the leader of the Beacon clan made fun of the warrior once more by suggesting that it was assumed that his master couldn't say anything because he was embarrassed. Chung Gon was unable to bear it any longer, which is why he inquired of the leader of the Beacon clan as to what he was babbling about while he continued to point his swords towards him. Shin Woon appears to be making light of the situation with Chung Gon because he shrugs his shoulders and appears to be laughing. He also explained that the reason for his behavior is because his disciple brother was beaten senseless. However, he is unable to finish what he was saying because Chung Gon suddenly yells at him to be quiet. He became enraged and furrowed his brow because Shin Woon had the audacity to make fun of the most important sect in Anhui while he was just a merely nameless whelp in Zhejiang. Shin Woon continued to make fun of the master of the Mount Huang sect. He even put his finger on his nose in order to demonstrate that he didn't care who the master was and for claiming that they are the most powerful. Chung Gon's teeth clenched in anger when Shin Woon stated that the Nangong clan, and not the Mount Huang sect, was the most powerful in Anhui. Suddenly, he approached the leader of the Beacon clan while yelling that he would cut off Shin Woon's tongue and feed it to the dogs because Shin Woon's statement infuriated Chung Gon. The latter on the other hand, made the decision to cooperate with Chung Gon and ordered the latter's subordinates to attack him all at once so that the game would be more entertaining. In addition to this, Chung Gon and his subordinates were now attacking Shin Woon, but the latter noticed all that was going on and quickly dodged their attack. It appears that Chung Gon's subordinates didn't see him because of his quick movement when he passed by them until he got near Chung Gon, who was raising his sword at him. Shin Woon's eyes widened as the blade of the master came within an inch of his face, but no one knows what happened since there was a violent explosion. On the other hand, warriors from the H. Wang Rock clan were astonished when they heard the explosion and stated that Master Chung Gon headed in the area where the explosion took place while the warriors from Kowloon's group were also surprised when they heard the explosion, and they turned their gaze to the direction from where it originated. When Ak Chil found out that Chung Gon was already there, he smiled a nefarious smile because he believed that because the master was already there, he now had someone who could assassinate Shin Woon. However, things didn't work out as planned since Master Chung Gon was now laying on the ground, quivering with rage and clenching his teeth. He was perplexed since his assault had unquestionably hit Shin Woon, but it appeared as though Shin Woon was unharmed because he was still standing and engaging in battle with his men. On the other hand, Shin Woon manages to defeat those subordinates though they are fewer than him while his body is still releasing force. However, Chung Gon tightly grasped his sword to help him to stand up while thinking who Shin Woon really was to defeat the greatest sect in Anhui in a single strike. Although struggling, Chung Gon managed to stand up then release a force. The latter called Shin Woon a demonic one and said that he won't know what kind of trickery he uses but that won't happen again. On the other hand, when Shin Woon examined his blade, he saw that the Twelve Swords of Thundercloud had progressed even farther and held an incredible destructive power. It was well worth the one-on-one -on -one practice that he had been putting in over the past month. In addition, Chung Gon began to attack Shin Woon, as the latter was debating whether or not he should attempt to utilize his Twelve Swords of Thundercloud in a genuine fight. After they had finished hitting one another, Chung Gon unleashed all of his might and swung his sword at Shin Woon which caused an enormous amount of force when it made contact. However, Chung Gon's eyes widened when he saw that Shin Woon was unaffected by his blow, and it appeared that Shin Woon's strength had increased as a result. The latter was now releasing such massive force within his body, and as a result, Shin Woon hit the shoulder of Chung Gon, causing the latter to ache in pain. When Chung Gon saw his own blood flowing on his shoulder, he became more enraged and attacked the Beacon clan leader once more. Both of them continued to wield their swords against each other. When Chung Gon was fighting Shin Woon, he was shrieking that he would definitely cut off Shin Woon's head and raise the name of the most powerful sect in Anhui, which is the Mount Huang sect. However, it would appear that Shin Woon did not worry about his strength and instead smiled across his face. Before he utilizes his twelfth sword of the thundercloud, he raises his sword, and as soon as he activates the fifth form, the blade suddenly holds a vast amount of energy. After that, he activates his thunderlight and rapidly strikes it in the direction of Chung Gon, and as a result, the latter was hit by Shin Woon's thunderlight, 
and took his life. Furthermore, Nam Gang who was calmly sitting suddenly smiled when saw how powerful his younger brother was. He commented that with just one incredible attack, not only did he defeat the enemy before him but he decimated the H. Wang Rock clan as well as he expected with his younger brother. In addition, numerous people were on the ground lifeless. Shin Woon looked into his hand because with just half the strength that he released, he created a hell before his very eyes. He thought that if the middle four form were that powerful, he wondered how powerful the final four form was. A significant number of warriors from the Mount Huang sect, the Kowloon group, and the H. Wang Rock were found lying on the ground. Some of them were still alive and yelling for help, but the majority of them had already passed away. On the other side, Nam Gang was still calmly sitting in the chair, impressed, and accompanied by other bandits standing behind him. He recalled the first time they battled on Mount Tianmu and how evenly matched their talents were. However, he was surprised to learn that Shin Woon was able to improve his martial arts to the same level as he was so rapidly. It is imperative that he maintain vigilance because, despite the fact that he is pleased with Shin Woon's development, he can't allow himself to get left in the dust as his older brother. On the other hand, it turned out that Ak Chil was still alive. He had gotten buried alive below the body of one of their troops. He lifted the dead body to make room for him to get up, but to his utter shock. When he saw that a great number of H. Wang Rock clans had already passed away, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. He jerked his head to the side and back again, and his jaw fell as he stared in disbelief at what he could only make out to be a dead member of their clan. He had no idea what had taken place or how it had occurred. When he heard someone speak behind him and tell him that he had survived, his eyes widened and little droplets of sweat began to gather on his face. After turning to check who it was, Ak Chil seemed shaken at discovering that Shin Woon is still alive but the latter was unsurprised to discover that Ak Chil was still alive and remarked that the latter appears to have a high level of durability. Afterwards, Shin Woon gives Ak Chil the order to hand over the item pouch and if he does so, at the very least he won't perish. Ak Chil was in a state of terror and could be heard yelling at Shin Woon to stay away from him. Just as Shin Woon was about to hit Ak Chil with his sword, someone yelled, Stop. When he turned around to see who it was, he saw that Jun Guang from the Kowloon group was walking near them with his subordinates. In addition, it seems Ak Chil saw an ally because his terrified face vanished and changed into a broad smile when he saw the strong dragon squad. He thought that he was already saved after they arrived that's why he abruptly stood up and hid himself on Jun Guang's body. Afterward, he laughs at Shin Woon telling the battle was not over yet. He even teased Shin Woon for thinking that the latter was safe just because he was under the protection of Nam Gang and the Bandit Union. But he has the Kowloon group behind him and they will obliterate the rest of the Beacon clan. But Shin Woon just let out a sigh and didn't pay attention to Ak Chil. On the other hand, Jun Guang displays annoyance toward Ak Chil, and it is possible that he considered Ak Chil to be a worthless vermin. If it weren't for their order, he would have gotten rid of Ak Chil as soon as possible. However, he is unable to merely sit there and observe Shin Woon doing his thing. For the sake of the objective of their sect, it is imperative that they not have the commission for first place taken away from them. But he believed that in order to face both Nam Gang and Shin Woon, he needed to use the power of his blessing. But he was unable to use it since there are too many eyes surrounding them that will see him. In addition to that, when he was questioned by a voice whether or not he could hear, he furrowed his forehead. He couldn't place who it was, so he kept turning his head from side to side. But eventually he came to the conclusion that it was probably Shin Woon. This demonstrates without a reasonable doubt that it was Shin Woon who told he was right. On the other hand, Jun Guang's subordinates were perplexed and didn't know what is going on because both Jun Guang and Shin Woon were just starting at each other for the past few minutes and it seems they are talking to each other although they can't hear any voices that's coming from them. In addition to this, Ak Chil was confused, he didn't know what was happening and Jun Guang was not yet attacking the Beacon clan leader that they are only staring at each other as if they are talking but they are the only one who can understand. If you go against your promise, you'll have to prepare to die, uttered Jun Guang. However, the latter signaled for everyone to back off by raising his hand. When Ak Chil saw it, he was so shocked that he dropped his jaw in amazement. But as soon as he learned that Jun Guang wanted to retreat, he became furious. He screams at the Kowloon group, demanding to know what they are doing and why they are not killing Shin Woon right at that moment. He then went to Jun Guang and gave him the order to eliminate Shin Woon as soon as possible. But the head of the Kowloon group didn't move an inch and just glared at him. Afterward, Ak Chil was terrified when he saw Shin Woon walking towards him and wielding his sword. Shin Woon is apologizing for what is about to take place. He pointed his sword towards Ak Chil and said that everything is ultimately just a test so he wanted to avoid any unnecessary casualties and at the same time, 
What he will do was only an unintentional accident while doing a test. Ak Chil was shaking in fear as he begged Shin Woon to spare his life with him. But Shin Woon disregarded him then he struck him with his swords, which caused Ak Chil to lose his life. Ak Chil's blood was scattered on the ground. Afterwards, Wiseau was perplexed after learning that all commission clans had been disqualified, and that the H. Wang Rock and Beacon clans were the only ones left. However, he did not understand why the Beacon clan was in first position while the H. Wang Rock clan was in second place, and this left him perplexed. Wiseau was in a difficult situation due to the fact that the leader of the Kowloon group urged that the H. Wang Rock clan have to be in first place yet he cannot simply overturn the accomplishment of the Beacon Commission clan coming in first place. He was at a loss for what to do in response to the circumstances, so he was taken aback when Shin Woon demanded his attention in his capacity as the representative of the Beacon Commission clan that came in first place in addition to this. The leader of the Beacon clan explained everything and why so commented that the decision was quite astute. Furthermore, Shin Woon also stated that he would only like to eliminate the hostility from the H. Wang Rock Commission clan, and that they do not have any plans to attack the Kowloon group. He stated the reason that he gave to Jun Guang, which was that he only wanted Ak Chil's head. In addition to this, he stated that since the Kowloon group intended to win the first place commission, it would be to their mutual advantage. Jun Guang, on the other hand, grinned and told Shin Woon that he would never forget that Shin Woon had given up being in first position in return for Ak Chil's head. Jun Guang's face was covered in a smile as he spoke. In addition to this, he would do everything in his power to ensure that the Beacon Commission clan is awarded the third place commission, and that Shin Woon is informed of this development within the day. Then Jun Guang said goodbye before expressing his gratitude to him once more. However, Shin Woon was under the impression that Jun Guang was grateful to him for giving up in the first place, when in reality, the leader of the Beacon clan was the one who should be expressing gratitude for something that was coming that they didn't know. Jung Ak went to see Yom Chin Siok after discovering that his son, Ak Chil, had already passed away and that Shin Woon was the one who had taken his life. He questioned the head of Kowloon as to how he could have done such things as allowing his son to be killed on the commission test and not doing anything to prevent it from happening. He was on his knees on the ground, and tears were streaming down his face. And the reason why he was so enraged was because Yom had let Shin Woon and the Beacon clan alone and had not punished them despite the fact that he had gone to such extremes for the Kowloon group the entire time. But to his utter astonishment, Yom even refers to his own son as a gobi, which causes him to become furious. On the other hand, Yom questioned him as to why he should not bring someone down who had voluntarily become the ally of the Kowloon gang and their link with the Beacon Commission clan was significantly longer than their connection with the H. Wang Rock clan. The leader of the H. Wang Rock clan's eyes widened in response to Yom's statement, and he hurled an obscenity in Yom's direction. Even the leader of the Kowloon group gets an earful from him as he rants about how nasty everyone is to him. He also questioned Yom about whether or not they would be willing to readily give up their relationship with the H. Wang Rock clan in favor of the Beacon clan. He turned to the leader of the Mount Huang sect, who went by the name of Master Chung Su, and demanded to know the reason why the other man had remained mute and made no effort to defend him or his son. In addition to this, he inquires of Chung Su whether or not he was enraged following the loss of his disciple brother and his pupil. On the other hand, Chung Su didn't bother with Jung Ak's rage, instead, he maintained his silence. And as a result, Jung Ak was left feeling so perplexed that he clenched his teeth in frustration because he concluded that both Yom and Chung Su were in on the plot. He was so enraged that he believed they would be better off without him and believed that they would be safe once they had sent him away. After that, Jun Ak raised himself to his feet, pointed his finger at Yom, and yelled, They won't get away with that easily because the moment he leaves this place, he will tell the whole world about the Kowloon group and the sect. All of it, he added. However, when Jun Ak threatened Yom that he would reveal their sect to the entire world, Yom abruptly released an energy, and as a consequence, Jun Ak enlarged his eyes, then immediately dropped on his knee. Yom's actions caused Jun Ak to cough up blood. He was scared at this point since he had the impression that he was suffocating. When Yom told him that it was silly to see him trash around without even appreciating the favor Yom did for him and that he would do whatever Jun Ak wished if he insisted on seeing the conclusion, he was sweating profusely. In addition, Jung Ak goes to Chung Su and tries to bribe him into giving what was promised, but his jaw dropped as Chung Su wielded his sword against him and told him not to be saddened since. For Chung Su, his power comes first, even before his pupil or brother. Afterwards, Jung Ak was overcome with fear. Because of this, he quickly expressed his regret for what he had said, explaining that it was merely an accident. He continued by saying that he would ignore everything that had taken place in order to save his life, 
but it was too late for Chung Su had already abruptly slashed his sword across his body. The end outcome of this was that Jung Ak's blood was splattered all over the room. Meanwhile, both Jung Guang and Xin Wun are surprised to run into one another, and they exchange pleasantries with one another. Nevertheless, Jung Guang said that it seemed like the leader of the Beacon clan was also making his way to the commission at that time. It was confirmed by the leader of the Beacon clan, who flashed a grin, and he also mentioned that his people had received the commissions for second and third place, just as he had promised. In addition to this, Jun Guang assured him that the Kowloon group never backs out of a pledge and was grateful to Xin Wu for the fact that they were able to convey the keepsake that belonged to Her Highness, the princess. On the other hand, Xin Wu continues to be of the opinion that he made the right decision. If it had been him who was tasked with delivering the souvenir of Her Highness, the princess that His Majesty, the Emperor had cherished, Xin Wu is convinced that he would not have been able to move through with the commission due to his anxiety. On the other hand, Jun Guang had a grin on his face and thought that Xin Wu was foolish to think that he'd throw away the opportunity that was offered to him out of fear, and it was something that made him chuckle. However, Xin Wu remembered something, and because he had hidden it under his garments, he was able to take it. When he handed Jun Guang a piece of paper that had something written on it, Jun Guang was taken aback. Xin Wu had prepared a tiny gift for the strong dragon squad. But they weren't going to need it because they were going on a lengthy trek to Mount Xianxia. Xin Wu was expecting that Jun Guang would be able to satisfy the thirst of his members with the gift. The latter is perplexed, but he cheerfully accepts the gift and then goes off on his horse. However, before he departs, he turns to the leader of the Beacon clan and tells him that he had been praying for their safe return. Likewise, please take care, utter Xin Wu. The latter forms a grin on his face while watching Jun Guang along with his strong dragon squad leave. On the other hand, Chu Lang Cheng, the vice group leader of the Kowloon group and the leader of the guard dragon squad, said that Xin Wu was an arrogant fool since they were assuming that Spineless Coward was the perpetrator behind the prison's attacks, but it was utterly nonsensical since he saw Xin Wu. However, Jun Guang advised him to leave Xin Wu alone since, despite the fact that he is destined to be eaten by them someday. It is not harmful to play with him until that time comes. In the meantime, the Strong Dragon Squad is continuing their journey toward the Imperial Palace in order to deliver the memento. Rain continued to fall on them while they were trapped in the abyss during the journey. The leader of the Strong Dragon Squad was informed by one of the members of the Strong Dragon Squad that it is impossible to progress any farther because of the poor weather and that it is unsafe for them to advance in their current state. When they saw what it was, three of the individuals in the group gasped, and they immediately drew the attention of their commander to the situation, asking for instructions regarding whether or not they should proceed. They summoned their leader once more when he didn't react the first time since. At that moment, they were all terrified because a significant amount of rock was falling from their side and was about to hit their leader. When Jun Wang turned around to see what it was, he was startled, his jaws were clenched, and beads of sweat began to form on his face. He had no idea what was happening. They are being bombarded with large rocks, and they are unable to flee the area until Jun Guang is struck by one of the rocks. After that, it continued to rain heavily, but the landslide had already come to an end. Kang was positioned in an area that overlooked the scene of the landslide, and it appears that the whole strong dragon squad has been obliterated. He expressed his appreciation for the fact that he did not have to exert any effort to fight Jun Guang. Despite the fact that the latter may be a transcendent expert but is helpless in the face of a natural calamity, Kang dashes into the area to inspect. He told himself that in an alternate timeline, Jin Sang was the one in charge of that commission, with the Kowloon group serving as his support system. The Beacon clan suffered incalculable losses as a result of the landslide, nearly reaching the point where it would have been impossible to recover without the ongoing help of the Kowloon group. In addition, he was able to confirm that Jun Guang had been buried alive as a result of the landslide after seeing the body of the latter. And just as Kang had anticipated, even seemingly insignificant things can be altered by his actions. In addition, Kang was able to obliterate the Kowloon group's attack force undertaking the commission without lifting a finger, and he will also be able to remove any suspicious towards him and plan to absorb all of the incredible mana from the corpses of Kowloon groups who just died on the landslide. And it was hitting two birds with one stone, so he decided to hand over the first place commission to Jun Guang even though the Beacon clan were the first place. On the other hand, the status this window materialized and revealed that he had begun absorbing the energy of the deceased, as well as the fact that he had absorbed a significant quantity of tainted mana. Because of the level adjustment made to Kang's skill, Death Kai Extraction, 
he was able to absorb a significant quantity of yin mana. Additionally, the rank of Kang's skill, yin mana heart, was raised to the SS rank. Furthermore, according to the information displayed in the status window, the mana that has been stored in the yin mana heart has reached the fifth circle, and he has unleashed a new ability dubbed Lick Mastery in Bone Storm. Additionally, Kang was able to absorb the inner Kai of the Ghastly Shadow Pulse technique for an amount equal to 365 days worth of time. In addition to that, he soaked up the inner Kai of the Spirit Shadow Kai art for a whole 365 days. Because he can't just ignore those amounts of inner Kai, he clenched his fist while he absorbed everything. And as a result, everything that was excess is now finished. Afterwards, Kang noticed something shining from a distance, and when he approached it to find out what it was, he couldn't help but break into a grin since he had located the souvenir that he had almost forgotten about. The fact that the souvenir was shining despite the fact that it was hidden in a dark spot allowed it to be discovered. He believed that in his former existence, Jin Sang had miraculously survived and taken the commission item with him, which allowed him to appease the wrath of the Imperial family. But not now because he found the memento. He was wondering about what the Kowloon group would do to appease the wrath of the Imperial family after they discovered they had misplaced the memento, and what would happen if he didn't bring it back. But not now because he found the memento, rather, he was curious about what would happen if he didn't bring it back. On the other hand, Yom was sweating inside the Kowloon group as a result of the shock he felt after hearing the news that the members of the caravan led by Jun Guang had all been killed in the landslide. However, he quickly gathers himself together and asks for the commission item but he loses his temper when his subordinate informs him that they had previously dispatched a search party to look for the commission item, but that they had no idea where it was located. He screams at his subordinate, telling them to locate the commission item as quickly as possible. In addition, when the subordinates told him that the emperor in a fit of rage had ordered the leader of the embroidered uniform guards, Azure Dragon Sword Yu Yaliang, along with 2,000 bodyguards to be immediately dispatched to Zhejiang. His jaw dropped and it seemed like he was trembling in fear. His eyes widened because it seems there are more problems aside from losing the commission item. He bowed his head and thought that it appears the Imperial family will personally deploy their forces simply to punish them and if that turns out to be the case, the non-aggression treaty that the government has with the Murim won't be able to go into effect. Once a faction has been labeled an enemy of the Imperial family, there is no way for them to escape unhurt. Meanwhile, Yu Ya Liang, the leader of the embroidered uniform guard, was in charge of directing a large number of guards as they rode their horses in the direction where the minister of the provincial government resided. Afterwards, someone makes an announcement that Yu Ya Liang has already come, and when that individual meets Wai So, the latter appears timid because he hides his face with his palm when they first greet each other. After Ya Liang removed the head armor, he noticed Wai So had lost a significant amount of weight since the last time he saw him. On the other hand, Wai So lowered his head in shame and explained that he hadn't seen Ya Liang in a long time. But seeing him now makes him feel embarrassed, and he can't bring himself to show his face because of it. Nevertheless, according to Ya Liang, the Kowloon group was successful in obtaining the government commission despite the fact that they did not place first in the test for the government commission, and that Wai So would not have typically given his approval. Because of this, he believes that there must be some explanation behind it. In addition to this, Ya Liang inquired of Wai So regarding whether or not he was compensated by the Kowloon group for the selection. Wai So, on the other hand, did not respond in any way, and did not raise his head, rather, he continued to stare at the table. Because Ya Liang noticed that Wai So didn't want to speak, he told him that the emperor had given him seven days to find the memento, but that if he wasn't able to find the items of her highness within that time, not only the Kowloon group but even he wouldn't be able to escape undamaged. Wai So showed signs of worries, but he remained silent about it. After that, Ya Liang suddenly rose up, and just as he was ready to leave, he turned around and apologized to Wai So. But Wai So continued to remain silent throughout the entire exchange. Wai So was anxious because he wanted to tell everyone everything. But the fact that his daughter's life is in Yom's hands prevents him from doing so. He jumped up all of a sudden and gave the appearance of being shivering with fear and rage because there is nothing he can do to save his daughter and at the same time punish the entire Kowloon group. However, his eyes widened in response to the voice coming from behind him. Shin Woon, the head of the Beacon clan, was standing there when he turned around to see who it was, and he was perplexed when he saw it was him. The latter advised him that if he wants to save her daughter and wreak havoc on the Kowloon group, then beginning at that time, he will do as Shin Woon commanded him to do. The Beacon clan leader gathers his most trusted men for their meeting. 
Jin-woo said that the landslide that Shin Woon predicted has actually occurred. While Zhu asked their clan leader if perhaps he was he cause of the landslide to occur, but their clan leader reasoned that no mere man could manipulate nature because he just happened to have learned a bit of geomancy during the process of learning out formations. Zhu suddenly laughs because he was expecting his answer since he was simply amazed by the wisdom their clan leader has and he even laughs more when their clan leader wink at him. Furthermore, Shin Woon questioned Jinu about the condition of the H. Wang Rock clan as he turned to face him. In reaction to this, the leader of the faction stated that the circumstances around the H. Wang Rock clan have seen a dramatic shift in recent days. Yom Siak Chin was responsible for the death of Du Jung Ak, Du Ak Chil's father. Du Jung Ak had protested to the Kowloon gang before his own death. Following that, the Kowloon group dispatched their men to the H. Wang Rock clan, and as of that time, they took control of it. When Shin Woon inquired as to whether or not they had disbanded, Jin Woo said that although the Commission clan had not changed, there had been a transfer of ownership. He added that at the present time, Yang Jio has been given the responsibility of acting as the chief of the clan temporarily. When Jin Woo mentioned that he had observed something out of the ordinary, everyone focused their attention on him, and they were intrigued by his statement. Jin Woo revealed to them that the wealth of the H. Wang Rock clan is, for unknown reasons, being transferred to the Mount Huang sect, after their clan leader instructed him to spill it out. They were all taken aback and remarked that there must be a rationale behind it. But Shin Woon grinned and said that it was apparent since they handed the H. Wang Rock clan to the Mount Huang sect as the price for turning a blind eye towards them. Huge made the remark that Mount Huang's acts are the same as those of the Low Chaos sect. However, Gun Ho made the observation that it is likely that the Kowloon group holds a favorable opinion of them due to the fact that they handed the commission over to the Beacon clan in accordance with what Shin Woon stated. Gung Ho also inquires as to whether it wouldn't be preferable to concentrate on the government commissions for the time being and grow the influence of such positions. However, Shin Woon disagrees with what Gun Ho has said since there is a golden opportunity that is on their way and they intend to make the most of that opportunity in order to prevail over their most formidable foe. They were all taken aback by the fact that they had the most formidable foe, and they were all intrigued about who it was. Because of this, Juj made the educated guess that it was the Mount Huang sect. However, he was incorrect, because Shin Woon divulged the information that their most formidable adversary was the Kowloon group. Furthermore, when it was revealed that the Kowloon group was their most formidable adversary, they were all taken aback by the information. However, it appears that Jin Woo was rather perplexed, as it appears that he believed the Kowloon group was already their ally. For this reason, Shin Woon explains to them that the Kowloon gang was involved in everything that took place around Yu Jin Sang. From the murder of Shin Woon's father to the poisoning of the vice clan leader and Shin Woon himself. In addition, Shin Woon took things seriously and informed everyone that the search operation would be wrapping up in six days and that the following day would mark the beginning of their conflict with the Kowloon group. Meanwhile, someone struck the individual, causing him to be flung to the ground. Ya Liang was the individual who struck the individual. The latter became quite enraged when the individual refused to let him enter the Kowloon residence, and it would appear that the guards of the Kowloon group were not feared to the embroidered uniform guard of the imperial family. He orders the remaining guards to make way as quickly as possible if they do not want to lose their lives. It appears that many of the guards are afraid of him, which is likely why they let him through. However, Yom was calmly sitting on his chair when Ya Liang suddenly opened the door of his dwelling. The leader of the Kowloon group seems not scared at the presence of Ya Liang because he just stared at the latter, but didn't say anything when Ya Liang asked him if he was Yom Siak Chen. The latter noticed that Ya Liang was releasing energy and it was the Ten Wordly Supremes, who are said to be the strongest in the current Murum. Yu Ya Liang was one of them and he was the undeniable trump card of the Imperial family and he would die if he slipped up so he abruptly knelt on the ground and greeted Ya Liang and introduced his name. Yom was informed by Yao Yang that the government commissions were intended to be selected through a test in the beginning. Nevertheless, Yom appears to have monopolized them for the last 10 years. However, Yom reasoned that he just complied with the request of the provincial minister because he was concerned about the possibility of that commission failing due to the subpar quality of the commission clan in Zhejiang. But it appears that Yao Liang did not trust him, and even yelled at him, telling him that his comments were gibberish because if his talents were excellent, then how would the situation occur? Yom was the target of Ya Liang's clenched fist, and he even pointed his weapon in his direction. However, Yom explains, much to Ya Liang's surprise, that even though it's not intended to be an excuse, 
Everything happened because their provincial minister Kang Waiso was fabricated in that particular commission route. As a result of this, Ya Liang became enraged when he noticed that Yom was trying to place all of the blame on the provincial minister. But Yom reasoned that he was only stating the truth, and all of the conversations he had with the provincial minister are documented in the records of the meeting. If Ya Liang is unable to convince himself to believe Yom, then Yom believes that Ya Liang must have viewed the record of the meeting for himself. On the other hand, Ya Liang is at a loss for words due to her shock that Yom may be telling the truth, in addition to the fact that he has proof. Afterward they went to check the record of the meeting, and it turned out that everything Yom had said was accurate according to the book that he was holding. Yom, who was standing behind him, turned and questioned him whether or not the information that was written on the book was sufficient to prove his innocence. But Ya Liang ignored him and didn't even turn to look at him. Instead, he claimed that in six days, if Yom are not able to uncover Her Highness's memento, he would pledge that upon all the honor that he has accumulated until that point to completely excavate everything of Yom's deeds. Then Ya Liang turned around to go. But right before Ya Liang was about to leave, Yom pleaded with him to keep the unneeded feelings that arise from his personal relationship and keep them separate from the business of the government. However, Ya Liang ignored his statement once again before leaving the room. In addition, when Ya Liang left Yom, the latter was so angry that he clenched his teeth and suddenly slammed his fist down on the table in front of him, which resulted in the table breaking. The group vice leader suddenly appeared before him and inquired about the next step they should take. As a response to this, Yom gives the group vice leaders instructions to get ready for the worst case scenario, and as soon as the orders are delivered, he must wipe all the evidence. The group from Kowloon was hard at work excavating the site of the landslide that had occurred earlier, which was the location where their leader of the strong dragon squad, Jun Guang, and their subordinates had been buried alive. Dung Ho was busy giving his comrades instructions to continue digging in the dirt so that they may find Her Highness's memento regardless of the circumstances. Can't you dig any deeper and wider? He added, they have no choice but to find it because their very lives depend on the item in question. His subordinates did their best to dig, some used shovels, while others dug with pickaxes. They were all hot and exhausted, but they had to keep searching because if they didn't discover the thing they were looking for, they would all be subject to harsh consequences. However, two people appear to be exhausted and are sweating heavily. They both have furrowed brows and an unhappy expression on their faces due to the fact that they are martial artists and not moles for doing the labor. They are referred to as demons of the blood sect for the simple fact that they have the ability to easily defeat Ya Liang and the rest of the embroidered uniform guards. Dung Ho overheard everything and became enraged because the two people think that they didn't know that they have been shoveling all this time because they were unaware of that fact. The reason was because in the hastily assembled monthly conference, it was suggested that their group leader's position should be removed. And if the matters isn't properly dealt with, he clenched his fist and gritted his teeth because if that happened, their foothold in the organization will quickly disappear. And despite the fact that they sacrifice a great deal for the cause of their sect on a regular basis. Afterward, Dung Ho took a glance at his fellow soldiers and noticed that it appeared as though they were idling away their time. As a result, he gave them orders to dig further deeper because they don't have a lot of time to find the objects because Ya Liang gave them only six days to do so. In addition, Dung Ho were surprised when someone spoke behind him saying that he was working quite hard. He was confused when he turned around to see who it was, it was the leader of the Beacon clan, Shin Woon. Furthermore, Shin Woon told Dung Ho that he was there to assist because it appears that the Kowloon group is in quite a bit of difficulty. Even though he appeared bewildered, Dung Ho stated that it had a profound effect on him to witness Shin Woon travel all the way for the Kowloon group. Despite this, Shin Woon made the observation that there hasn't been much progress made in the search for the item. Dung Ho reasoned that despite the fact that they had been searching for the item around the clock for the past few days, they hadn't been able to uncover even the slightest shred of evidence that it was still there. But he is unable to complete his sentence, and to his astonishment, Shin Woon interrupts him and says that he was about to notify the group vice leader that it is acceptable to remove everyone and take a break. His eyes widen in horror when Shin Woon shows him the object that they had been searching for day and night. The latter also explains that he found the memento on his way there. Furthermore, Ya Liang was walking toward to meet the emperor then he abruptly knelt to introduce himself. He stated that he had come to deliver the memento of Her Highness as ordered by His Majesty, the Emperor. Then he handed over the memento to the Emperor and apologized because the edges had been slightly damaged due to the landslide. In addition, the Emperor took the memento and said that it's alright if it is slightly damaged as long as it was found. The Emperor also said that there were issues that occurred from a natural disaster unavoidable by man. 
He felt that he needed to apologize and was shameful for being so furious when his subject worked hard to unearth and find the memento. Afterwards, he gave Ya Liang the instruction to make sure the embroidered uniform guard overheard what he was about to say, which was that he will grant liquor and meat to uphold those who have worked hard, so they must prepare for a banquet. In addition to this, he bestows a message that was penned on paper before asking Ya Liang the name of the person who discovered the keepsake. In answer, Ya Liang mentioned that Yu Xin Wun, the head of the Beacon Clan Commission, was the individual who found the memento. Meanwhile, every single member of the Kowloon group was seated on a chair in front of a lengthy table that included a variety of snacks and beverages. After spending all day and night laboring to unearth the item, it would appear that they were enjoying themselves after their ordeal. Everyone was having a good time. They kept drinking booze, talking about random topics, and laughing at things that were completely pointless. Shin Woon's cup was being filled with liquor while the vice group leader spoke to him, telling him that the Kowloon group is really grateful to him. However, Shin Woon stated that there is no need for such a pleasant phrase because they are in a position to seek amicable connections with the Kowloon group, and it is natural for the affair of the Kowloon group to also be an affair of the Beacon Commission clan. Furthermore, Shin Wun's words made Yun Ho feel grateful, and he also reported that their leader was highly applauding Shin Wun's favor as well and was hoping to meet him once the banquet was finished. It would appear that the latter was quite eager to talk to the head of Kowloon. Because of this, he disclosed to the group's vice leader that one of his goals was to meet and speak with the head of Kowloon. On the other hand, based on the look that he gave Shin Wun when he was staring at him, it appears that Yun Ho had some reservations about him. Perhaps he reasoned that even if it was unquestionable that Shin Woon was on their side, the latter still possessed a great deal of dubious qualities, and it was necessary to be cautious around him. Heed your attention, exclaimed Ya Liang. He was preparing to make an announcement and was holding a scroll in his hand. Since everyone was seated, it was decided that he would deliver the handwritten message that had been penned by their majesty, the emperor, before the meal was finished. Therefore, he demands that everyone show the appropriate amount of respect. After that, he looked for the leader of the Beacon clan, Shin Woon, to come forward. When he did, Shin Woon rose up, moved near Ya Liang, and kneeled down on the ground. According to what was written on the scroll, Shin Woon's exemplary heart has moved heaven and created a miracle. Because of the memento, the spirit of Cho Hai, which has been wandering among the Nine Springs, will finally be able to find peace, and the emperor will experience unfathomable joy as a result. If the emperor does not lavishly reward the person who made everything possible for him as a result of their undying loyalty, then it is not appropriate to refer to him as an emperor. Therefore, with this document, the emperor announces to his honorable subject Shin Woon that he will provide Shin Woon one of the things that he desires. Regardless of what it is, he should voice his wish. After that, when Dune Ho and his subordinates heard what their emperor had written on the scroll, they immediately dropped their jaws in astonishment and were shocked. Others couldn't believe that Shin Woon had a wish that the emperor would grant for finding the memento. Others couldn't believe that the scroll had been written by the emperor himself. Afterwards, Shin Woon was instructed by Ya Liang to speak about his desire, which may be a palace, grandeur, or the study of martial arts. However, Ya Liang does not name any of things as being Shin Woon's goal since there is something else that Shin Woon wants. Then Ya Liang urged him to say whatever it was that he desired to say. Because of this, Shin Woon says that what he really wants is the restoration of justice, and if he begs his majesty, the emperor, to tackle the issues of drug trafficking and human smuggling that plague Zhejiang, he will. The statements made by the leader of the Beacon clan took Ya Liang by surprise. Because of this, he inquired once more about the drug dealing and human smuggling that he had described. Shin Woon vouched that the information was accurate and that it was in line with what he had stated. On the other hand, the angry vice leader of the group clenched his teeth and wrinkled his forehead as he reacted to what had just happened. He cursed Shin Woon for stabbing him in the back, and it was later found out that he was the one responsible for those incidents that took place in jail. The irritation that he was experiencing caused him to tighten his fist, and it appeared as though he intended to punch Shin Woon at that very moment. Nevertheless, doing so would have been too risky. He is unable to continue to remain in that location and must rapidly leave in order to provide their superior with an account of what has taken place. Therefore, Dune Ho proceeded to walk, and as he was ready to go, he yelled at his subordinates and other swordsmen to get out of his way. However, he is unable to continue walking because Ya Liang suddenly yells at him and instructs him to come to a stop. 
Afterwards, a significant number of guards now had their swords pointed in the direction of the vice group leader. Because starting then, until Ya Liang gave out his orders, no one was allowed to leave the place, and he was required to stay where he was. As a direct consequence of this, Dun Ho became quite irate. Xin Wun was confronted by Ya Liang who informed him that none of the things he had spoken could be ignored easily then he asked once again the leader of the Beacon Commission clan if Shin Woon could honestly accept responsibility for his statement. In response to this, Shin Woon, who was grinning broadly from ear to ear, stated that of course he could accept responsibility, and that not a single thing he said was a lie. And because of that, the group vice leader turned to him and was enraged. Furthermore, the Beacon Commission clan head is confronted once more by Yao Yang, who appears to be enraged. He asks how he will prove his words and how he knew about those crimes. In answer, Shin Woon says that the subordinate who attempted to seize control of the Beacon Commission clan is the same individual who poisoned both Shin Woon's father and brother and who utilizes the medicine that Shin Woon was referring to. In addition to this, he said that he witnessed the individual in question use the drugs to manipulate his younger brother like a puppet in front of his very eyes, and he claimed that he acquired reports of human trafficking from the GM family who were covertly allied with him. And last but not least, he was successful in identifying those individuals who were truly to blame for everything that had transpired, and it just so happens that they were there in that precise location. After then, the group vice leader's eyes widened and Dune Ho clenched his teeth as soon as he heard all that had taken place. Moreover, the leader of the Beacon clan is questioned once more by Yao Liang about who could be responsible for the crime. As a response, Shin Woon exposes that the culprit was the entire Kowloon group, and as a direct result of this information, the group vice leader abruptly yells at his other comrades to flee the scene. But before they could make their getaway, Ya Liang gave orders to his uniform guards to capture them. As a result, they were currently encircled by a large number of guards, each of whom had their sword pointing in the direction of the entire Kowloon group. In addition, the vice group leader turned to the leader of the embroidered uniform guards and yelled that Shin Woon's statement is a false accusation. He claimed that Shin Woon was blinded by his own greed and that he was trying to claim the sovereignty of Zhejiang. He also claimed that Shin Woon is not in possession of any evidence other than his hollow remarks, which are the only thing he has. He pointed his finger at Yao Yang and questioned him whether he honestly believed the Kowloon group would evade the eyes of the provincial minister if they had truly expanded their authority through heinous crimes. He abruptly jerks his head around to look for the provincial minister and shouted at him, If you can hear me, you have to hurry up and say something. On the other hand, Shin Woon suddenly interjects himself and questions the group vice leader, demanding to know if the latter truly believes that he could get out of the predicament by threatening the provincial minister. Shin Woon is going to show him the evidence because he expressed an interest in doing so. After that, the group vice leader turned around and was confused when he saw a lady being protected by Ha Rin and Juge. Ya Liang was astounded when he saw the lady since he knew that she was the daughter of the provincial minister, Lady Dan Yi. The latter noticed her father when Yso put his hand on her shoulder to support her. However, Shin Woon reportedly claimed that the Kowloon group was holding the daughter of the provincial minister as a hostage. Shin Woon, however, is unable to finish his sentence because the provincial minister has intervened and continued Shin Woon's statements by saying that the Kowloon group was able to plot everything by threatening him, and he confirmed that everything of the Beacon clan leader's words are genuine. Because he wanted to protect his daughter, he listened to the Kowloon group at first but not anymore. When he realized that the Kowloon clique was to blame for their plight, it infuriated him and he exploded with wrath. In addition to this, he stated that today, ever since Juj and Ha Rin had rescued his daughter, he was at last able to tell the whole truth. On the other hand, after the group vice leader heard the statement made by the provincial minister, in which he placed all of the blame on the Kowloon group, it became clear that there was no sense in defending their sect because everyone now knew the truth about the Kowloon group. He was furious and clenched his teeth in a show of his fury, but he quickly gathered himself and ordered his allies to draw their swords and launch an assault on the foes as soon as possible. After that, all of the members of the Kowloon group ran to the uniform guards, but Ya Liang roared at the vanguard and ordered them to arrest all of the members of the Kowloon group and to kill anyone who resisted. As a direct consequence of this, a large number of individuals were now engaging in violent conflict with one another. On the side of the Kowloon group, individuals pierced their swords in an effort to stay alive and evade the wrath of the embroidered uniform guards, whereas on the side of the embroidered uniform guards, individuals pierced their swords in an effort to apprehend the Kowloon group. Both factions have no qualms about cutting their swords in the direction of their rival. 
However, one of the uniform guards noticed that the Kowloon group was attempting to flee, which prompted the uniform guards to dash towards them in an effort to arrest them. In addition, even Yao Yang brandished his swords against the Kowloon group, and the group vice leader of the Kowloon group clenched his teeth in response to seeing Yao Yang. Since he is of the opinion that he will be killed in the event if he engage in combat, he comes to the conclusion that he must leave the scene immediately. On the other hand, Yao Yang became aware that the vice group leader was engaging in activity, and he immediately yelled at everyone to move out of the way. After that, there was a significant explosion that occurred. It was a lucky escape for Ya Liang and the uniform guards, who were able to evade the explosion by utilizing his weapon. However, Meng Junho was nowhere to be found after the explosion, which is why Ya Liang unexpectedly directed the uniform guards to instantly follow after him. However, he is unable to complete his statements since Xin Wun has already dashed off in pursuit of Dyun Ho. Yom Chen Seok extended an invitation to Chung Sung and other recently initiated members of their sect to join him for a drink. On that happy day, he instructed everyone to drink to the happiness in their hearts and enjoy themselves. Everyone appeared to be delighted and content due to the fact that they were given the opportunity to drink with the leader of Kowloon. Yom was told by Chung Su that he didn't know how to repay him for all the grace that he showed him by believing that he could gain such tremendous strength without any training or anything else. Chung Su, who appears to likewise obtain authority from their commander, is supported by other members of the group. They consider it to be the chance of a lifetime that was presented to them because they listened to and followed the advice of their disciple brother and the leader of the sect. Don't mention it. Utter Yom while drinking from his cup. The latter also told the newly initiated members that they are automatically brothers the instant they enter the sect, despite the fact that their levels of order and chaos may differ. Their sect will help the Mount Huang sect in rising within the upper echelons of the Murim Union with all of their heart and soul. As a result of this, Chung Su will be grateful to him for the rest of his life and will never forget everything he has done for the Mount Huang sect. The new members have also expressed that they intend to play an active part in supporting both their group leader and the sect as a whole. On the other hand, Chung Su told that he couldn't help but be surprised that the person was a member of the sect as well and if their group leader had told that fact earlier, he would have entered the sect without any hesitation. Yom put down his cup and explained that it's one of the greatest secrets of the sect, so he pleaded to the new members to be more understanding. Furthermore, that person already knows about Chung Su's entry to the sect and is very pleased about it. He also said that the person has requested to meet at a later time to drink, so there should be a summon coming soon. The new members seemed surprised and were delighted by the statement of Yom that's why the latter told them that they don't have to be impatient and just enjoy the drink. One of the new members was about to say something but they were all surprised by a loud noise. Yom who also heard the loud noise was confused and when he realized that it was coming from the outside he abruptly stood up and opened the window. Furthermore, Yom widened his eyes in shock when he saw from afar that there was an explosion and found out that it was red smoke. He suddenly thinks of Meng Dun Ho and asks himself if the explosion came from him. The new members seem worried and keep asking him what happened and due to the annoyance that he felt, Yom releases a tremendous force that does a red light and as a result, those new members seem to be struggling with something since they were all sweating. Afterward, Yom's subordinate ran up to him and asked if he seen the red smoke. Yom acknowledged that the explosion was a signal coming from Dun Ho to his subordinate. He gave his subordinate the order to immediately activate the formation, remove all of the evidence and witnesses, and then retreat to their headquarters. He also instructed them to instantly assemble half of the attack squad, head outside their estate, and gain time by attacking people in order to prevent their adversary from entering their area. Yes sir, exclaimed the subordinates. Yom issues orders for the newly recruited members to gather all of their weapons and get ready for battle. Those new members appear to be terrified, which is why they question Yom about what is going on and why they need to get ready for a conflict, and Chung Su also questions their leader about whether or not he seriously considers engaging in combat with the Azure Dragon Blade. However, his eyes widen in surprise as Yom turns to him with a malicious expression and orders him to keep his mouth shut. Following that, Yom walks to a closet and opens the door to it. When the new recruits, including Chung Su, found out what was hidden behind the closet, their reactions were predictable, shock and awe. There was a violent thunderbomb inside. They were all intrigued by the idea that the most taboo items in the martial arts world could be found there. Chung Su also mentioned that there is not just one violent thunderbomb, but rather three of them. On the other hand, Yom greeted the new members with a nefarious grin on his face and informed them that he believed that three violent thunderbombs would be sufficient to eradicate the city entirely and leave no traces behind. 
When the statement was made by their group leader, all of the new members were as stunned as they are currently sweating. Yom, on the other hand, overheard someone say something from the outside, and it seems familiar to him. Because of this, he threw open the window in an unexpected manner and yelled, Meng Dun Ho, is that you? However, his eyes widened in shock when he saw his numerous subordinates who seemed scared and wielding their swords against Yun Ho who appeared to be like a monster and was screaming in pain. Yun Ho was calling for help but it was too late because Shin Wu struck him using his sword and cut him in half. As a result, all the subordinates of Yom were shocked when they saw how Yun Ho cut in half in just one strike. On the other hand, Shin Woon was standing in front of the lifeless body of Dune Ho, and his one foot was stepping on the corpse while looking at Yom and said that the mist is a bit irritating. But it's not enough for him to be concerned then form a grin on his face, don't you agree? Taloon group leader Yom Chin Siok. He added. However, Yom's subordinate was yelling to their fellow soldiers that their adversary was by himself. Thus they should all go in formation and kill their adversary with simultaneous blows. After that, they began to approach Shin Woon while simultaneously pointing all of their weapons in his direction. However, Shin Woon was not alone himself, and the news makes him feel a little bit downcast. Because of this, he immediately snapped his finger to perform the necromancy, which summoned a large number of skeleton warriors. When one of the Kowloon group's members saw the skeleton warriors that Shin Woon had summoned, he was awestruck and his eyes expanded in response. In spite of the fact that he was shaking with dread and had a strong grip on his sword, the individual screamed out and demanded to know what those things were. Then one of them responds that those things in question are skeletons. They were all looking at Shin Woon, who was standing still while surrounded by his many skeleton warriors. Some of them claimed that they had never seen or heard anything like that, while others claimed that they couldn't believe it and that it must be the advent of the messenger of the underworld. The fear that each and every one of the Kowloon group's warriors felt caused them to break out in cold sweats. On the other hand, Shin Woon is able to call forth a maximum of 80 skeletons at this time, but he will soon be able to raise that number to hundreds. Shin Woon believes that 60 should be sufficient for the Kowloon group warriors, though. On the other hand, every single one of the Kowloon group warriors was astounded and they all turned to look at the individual who suddenly materialized before them and demanded what they were doing. The person was on Ho Jun, and was the Crouching Dragon Squad leader. The individual encourages the warriors of Kowloon to not be scared of the piles of bones because they have the advantage of numbers. He gave the Kowloon warrior the orders to employ all of the demonic arts and launch an assault. Furthermore, it would appear that Ho Jun has finally been successful in motivating the warriors of the Kowloon group as they are currently charging towards Shin Woon alongside his skeletons. On the other hand, the latter gives orders to all of his skeleton warriors to eliminate each and every one of the Kowloon group. After that, a large number of skeleton warriors headed towards the Kowloon group and engaged in battle with them. However, due to the fact that those skeleton warriors were all transcendent, it was simple for them to win the fight against the warriors of the Kowloon group. Some of the skeletons severed their opponent's skull with their swords, while others pierced their opponent's body with their swords, and yet others sliced their opponent in half, and Ho Jun witnessed the entire event. He couldn't believe those bizarre creatures were training in martial arts, and for achieving such a great deal with such a limited amount. In addition, because he was so irritated, Ho Jun clenched his teeth, furrowed his forehead, and started to sweat as a result of his behavior. Everything was amazing, and Ho Jun had the thought that it was possible that each and every one of those skeleton warriors could be transcendent experts. If that were the case, then the Ho Jun's group would have absolutely no chance of winning the battle at this rate. And if that isn't the case, he has no other option except to use the blessing that the leader of the blood sect bestowed upon him. After that, he directed his finger on his palm. And after that, a significant explosion took place. He had no idea that even his allies would perish in the explosion while shouting for aid. But Ho Jun didn't bother to pay attention to them because it seemed like all he cared about was beating Shin Woon and those skeletons. But his eyes widened when he saw what appeared to be a skeleton in front of him. And it appears that even Shin Woon was not impacted by the explosion. Shin Woon questioned Ho Jun about whether or not he truly believed he would be able to change the course of events with such a modest explosion that had no negative impact on them. Because of the explosion, Ho Jun was able to eliminate all of his own troops. The latter appears to be trembling in fury then he sees his comrades racing towards him in an attempt to aid him. But Ho Jun ignored him and transformed into a creature that resembled a black mantis in an instant and used its front leg to slash the necks of his comrades. All of a sudden, the heads of his allies were severed and tossed up in the air. In addition to this, he gives the order for all of the Kowloon warriors to launch an assault on Shin Woon at the same time, 
and he warns that anyone who escapes would meet their end at his hands. On the other hand, Shin Woon let out a sigh when he saw Ho Jun became a monster and guessed that it's a black mantis then commented that insect types are not his favorite but it doesn't matter because he abruptly lifted his hand then summoned another skeleton. And in an instant, the black mantis vanished and as a result, the rest of the Kowloon warriors dropped their jaws and seemed shocked when they saw that the soldiers who had already died became exactly like those monsters. However, Shin Woon formed a grin on his face and commented not to curse him for being unfair because there's nothing he can do since that was his power. He looks on the upper window to look for the Kowloon group leader Yom Chin Siak and ask if he agreed with him. Afterwards, Shin Woon was a bit surprised when he saw Chung Su finally came down and wielded his sword while pointing it towards him. The latter told Shin Woon that he still had plenty of things to pay him back for and though he may not understand the trickery that Shin Woo was pulling, it has to end now. In response, Shin Woon told Chung Su that it would be better for him too. The latter seems confused when Shin Woon told him that there's someone who wanted to see him first. His eye widen and sweat starts to form on his face when Shin Woon releases an energy. Afterward, the status window appears and notifies Kang that he has satisfied the hidden criteria. It also informs that the skeleton commander spiraling lunar sword sage, Myung Jiang is being called by its own will, and that it was releasing the fury that it had been holding back. In addition, the status pane revealed that the values of Skeleton Commander Spiraling Lunar Sword Mage Myung Jiang's statistics have improved by a factor of 200%. After then, in the blink of an eye, the skeleton of Myung Jiang materialized out of thin air and started putting off an incredible amount of force. In addition to this, Shin Woon interrogates the Skeleton Commander about whether or not he sees everything, which demonstrates that Shin Woon was telling the truth the entire time. After that, he gives the skeleton commander the order to personally eliminate his dumb disciple, just as he had promised. In addition, the skeleton commander, also known as the O-Sword Sage, assumes a fighting stance and appears to be prepared for battle. The title of Sword Sage is considered to be the highest distinction that can be bestowed upon a martial artist in the entire field of martial arts, and it is not given to just anyone. The title of Sword Sage can be earned, but only by individuals who have the most admirable of personalities and are skilled in the appropriate forms of martial arts. The spiraling lunar Sword Sage, Myung Jiam, was still considered to be among the most esteemed Sword Sages up to this point when those prerequisites were met. In addition to this, Chung Su appears afraid while looking at Myung Jiam who was not approaching him and was not delivering such a significant amount of power. When he realized that the energy that the skeleton possessed was the same energy that belonged to the spiraling lunar sword sage, he was so shocked that his mouth dropped and he started to sweat. But he was confused because he was able to sense the energy of the sword sage from the skeleton. On the other hand, Shin Woon labeled Chung Su as an idiot because he had failed to realize that the skeleton that was standing right in front of him was actually his master. He also stated that Chung Su's corruption has spread all the way to the underworld, compelling the spiraling lunar sword sage to reappear in the realm of the mortals, and that he is obligated to show the sword sage the utmost respect because of this. But Chung Su appeared to be perplexed, and it appeared that he was at a loss for what to do. However, the skeleton commander suddenly opens his mouth and asserts that the incident was his doing. Because of his shortcomings, the Mount Huang sect has become tainted. Hence, he must rectify the situation himself with individuals who are steeped in evil and responsible for tainting the sect. After that, he assumed his fighting posture and prepared himself to engage in the fight. Afterwards, Chung Su was infuriated and refused to believe that the skeletal commander standing in front of him was actually his master. Even the skeleton commander and Shin Woon received an order from him to stop lying, and he vowed that he would never allow himself to be misled by any simple wizardry. The skeleton commander in front of them was not the spiraling lunar sword sage, rather, he was merely a pile of bones, and Shin Woon was making fun of them for telling lies. He encouraged his allies not to fall for the trick because the skeleton commander was not the spiraling lunar sword sage. Shin Woon let out a sigh as he expected how stubborn Chung Su was being. The latter also stated that even if the skeleton were to turn out to be the true sword sage, they should not be worried. When he says this, he smiles savagely since they already possess power that is far superior to that of the skeleton. Thus there is nothing that they should be afraid of, regardless of whether or not the Sword Sage has ascended. Afterwards, Shin Woon was expecting everything Chung Su had to say. Because of this, he instantly issued orders to the Skeleton Commander to carry out all of his commands exactly as he desired. When the Skeleton Commander overheard Shin Woon say such things, he immediately made a beeline for Chung Su and the other members of his group. 
the skeleton commander first confronts an elder with long hair, and as it swings its sword towards the elders, a light emanates from the blade of the skeleton commander's sword. As a consequence of this, the elderly man with the long hair was struck on the chest, and blood began to pour out of his body. The skeleton commander took a blow to the neck from another elder, however it does not appear that the blow actually hit the skeleton. Following that, the skeleton commander turned to confront the elder, at which point he took a number of blows, which ultimately led to the elder's body being hacked to pieces. Afterwards, the skeleton commander is confronted by two elders at the same time, but he quickly leaps away to escape being hit by a sword that is being brandished by one of the elders. After that, the skeleton commander thrust its sword into the chest of one of the elders, then abruptly swung its blade and unleashed a tremendous amount of force towards its adversary. Because of the enormous amount of force that the skeleton commander let off, the two elderly people were expelled as a direct consequence of this. In addition to this, Chung Su masked his face in order to protect himself from the dazzling light emanating from the skeleton commander's sword. He gave off the impression of being terrified and couldn't believe that his allies, who were all seniors from the Mount Huang sect and had gained powers from the Blood sect, had been defeated so easily. When he looked around, he was shocked to see that all of his companions had been put to death by the skeleton commander, who had claimed to be his master and a sword sage. He considered the possibility that it was the genuine sword sage. However, Chung Su seemed trembling. He realized that it was impossible for him to take on the skeleton commander by himself now that all of his allies had been eliminated from the fight. He clenched his teeth in frustration as a result of the fact that the strength of the demonic sect that Yom Chiaxian had given to him was still insufficient. However, there is no other option for him, and he must use all of his abilities to prevail over the skeleton commander and Shin Woon. After then, he lets out such a large amount of force that it causes the whites of his eyes to turn crimson, and the veins in his face to become visible. In a single moment, he mutated into a hideous creature, complete with pointed claws and teeth. Ching Su is now able to sense that his power is growing as a consequence of the fact that he has finally gotten the power that the blood cult promised to give to him through Yom Chin Siak. Since he has finally achieved the goal of becoming one with the demonic beast, there is no longer any reason to be terrified of him. He looks into Shin Woon and the skeleton commander because he intends to destroy both of them to the point where there is not even a shred of evidence left of them. After that, a red glow began to emanate from his eyes, and as a result, his entire body began to dash towards the skeleton commander then abruptly jumped to strike it. On the other hand, the skeleton commander was unruffled, and it appeared as though it was waiting for Chung Su to launch an assault. However, before Chung Su could get within striking distance of the skeleton commander, the latter triggered the spiraling lunar and blasted a massive force out of its body. Chung Su was able to observe this force. After that, the skeleton commander activated his sword god and suddenly thrust his sword forward with an incredible amount of force in an attempt to cut Chung Su. And as a direct consequence of this, the great force that struck Chung Su pierced his body, causing his blood to spurt out from the wound, followed by an explosion. On the other hand, Yom Chin Siak appeared to be monitoring Shin Woon and the skeleton commander as they fought while his eyes were fixed on the two of them. In addition, Chung Su's life was ruined, and just before he dropped to the ground lifeless, he came to the realization that it was the genuine power of the Mount Huang sect then he fell on the ground. However, since Chung Su has been eliminated, it would appear that there is only one rival left, and that rival was Yom Chin Siak. Shin Woon was making his way toward a spiral staircase in order to engage in combat with Yom Chin Siak. When he reached the top of the staircase, he spotted a partition and it appeared that Yom was behind it since a significant amount of energy was being released. He is aware of an enormous demonic presence, which is why he brandishes his sword and suddenly slashes it across the divider, which causes an explosion. After that, Yom Chin Seok slowly emerged from behind the smoke and informed Shin Woon that he was late because he had been waiting for the latter. Shin Woon and Yom Chin Seok were both putting out a tremendous amount of power when the latter approached the Beacon clan leader and claimed that he had been watching his fight. However, Yom was curious as to why the Beacon clan leader had walked all the way up to his abode without his skeletal monster. In addition to that, he stated that based on that action, it would appear that there is a limit to the sorcery that is utilized to dominate those skeletal monsters. Shin Woon's eyes opened in surprise as he saw the three violent thunderbombs behind Yom Chin Siak, so he asked the latter why they were there. 
On the other hand, Yom Chin Siak remarked that the leader of the Bikun clan is very perceptive, but he does not wish to explain himself. Instead, he cautions Shin Woon that if he does not leave the city within the next 30 minutes, Shin Woon and everything else will vanish without a trace, and no matter how skilled a con artist he was, there is nothing he can do about the powerful thunder bombs. It would appear that Shin Woon did not pay attention to what the other person was saying. Perhaps he was trying to come up with a way to stop those violent thunder bombs. In addition, Yom Chin Siak urges Shin Woon to seek forgiveness from the demon god for all of the wrongdoings he has committed due to his lack of knowledge and to follow the demon god because he is the only one who knows how to extend his life. Only under those circumstances can Yom Chin Siak be able to ignore the crimes that Shin Woon has perpetrated. But he was unable to continue speaking, and he was astonished when Shin Woon abruptly yelled at him and told him to stop. On the other hand, Shin Woon presses Yom Chin Siak with the question, why do fools like you try to sell your no-name god whenever you're about to lose? But he provides an immediate response to his own query and speculates that it may be the extent of those cultist fools. But Yom Chin Siak suddenly exclaims that he was not purchasing him, so he is unable to complete his statements. It appeared as though Yom Chin Siak was unable to take any more of the insult that Shin Woon was providing. He furrowed his brow, he tightened his teeth while veins could be seen on his forehead. And then all of a sudden, he brandished his sword towards Shin Woon, which resulted in a large explosion on his residence. And as Shin Woon was able to avoid his strike, afterwards, Yom Chin Siak told Shin Woon that in the end, the latter chose the poison chalice for himself but it's fine because it's better that way since he was able to get rid of him completely. But Shin Woon just smile at him and ask the Kowloon group leader if he believe he can defeat him. Because if he will just kill him, it will be too easy for him and because of that statement. Yom Chin Siak seething in anger as he widened his eyes and abruptly struck his sword and yelling that he will tear Shin Woon into shreds. But Shin Woon was combative and also wielded his sword towards Yom Chin Siak and luckily the latter avoided it. They keep attacking each other as their sword collides and creates lights that lit the place. But Yom Chin Siak seems confused because he notices that Shin Woon was not getting fatigued at all and he was getting stronger as he fights him. But the power of the blood sect should be far superior than anyone and it doesn't make any sense because even those who have attained ascending art. But he can't continue his sentence because Shin Woon suddenly stopped and said that it was over. In addition, Yom Chin Siak's eyes widened in shock when Shin Woo summoned his bone storm then in an instant. Numerous skeletons were heading towards him. He was dazed and seemed confused while doing nothing when numerous skeletons approached him and slashed their sword against him. And as a result, he fell on the ground kneeling while his arms were cut. He was seething in anger while looking at the Beacon clan leader who was walking towards him. Yom Chin Siak cursed at Shin Woon that's why the latter asked him why it is always the weak ones cursing after getting defeated. The Beacon clan leader was grateful to Yom because he was able to buy time to get rid of those violent thunder bombs. On the other hand, Yom Chin Siak switched his attention to the location of the destructive thunder bombs and was taken aback when he realized that he had failed to notice that the leader of the Beacon clan had already removed the bombs. Because of this, he became infuriated. And then he went to Shin Woon and demanded to know, for the last time, just what Shin Woon has against him, as well as why he had done all of this. He continued by asking, just why? But when Shin Woon told him that he was not attempting to stop him, but rather that he was trying to stop the blood sect, his eyes widened in amazement. The Beacon clan leader also indicated that Yom Chin Siak was just the beginning of it, and that he planned to wipe out the entire blood sect the people responsible for bringing ruin to the world, in the future. And finally, your boss, even that snake-eyed sect leader. He added, Yom Chin Siak appears to be in great fear after learning that Shin Woon was familiar with both their blood sect and the snake eye sect head. It would appear that he has no other option but to try the very last thing he can think of. Suddenly, he lets forth a tremendous amount of energy while also plotting to take Shin Woon's head by any means necessary. The latter was taken aback when he saw Yom Chin Siak gradually transform into a massive monster with sharp fangs and a head that was on fire. Yom became the executioner of the Requiem for the Eighth Disaster, the Balrog. After Yom Chin Siak had completed his transformation and made use of the blessing that the Blood Sect had bestowed upon him, there was a massive explosion that took place within his home. Thankfully, Shin Woon was able to dodge the explosion by moving backwards. The latter scrutinizes the big beast that is standing in front of him who possesses enormous arms and legs. Its teeth and nails are both sharp, and it is emitting flames all over its body at the moment. Balrog is a being that existed in the generation before Kang. Aside from what he had read in the book, he did not have any prior experience with the tactic that Balrog could employ for him to be able to defeat the monster. 
However, it was an interesting experience for Kang to meet the Balrog. After that, he gives the order for his skeleton warriors to commence their assault on the enemy. Furthermore, a large number of skeleton warriors were making their way towards the Balrog, which was poised to receive their assault. But Balrog gives off an air of power because it was simple for him to slash its claws to launch a counterattack against those skeleton warriors, and as a consequence, other skeleton warriors had their heads severed, other skeleton warriors had their heads grabbed and pulled out of their bodies, other skeleton warriors had their entire bodies slammed against the ground, and other skeleton warriors were set ablaze by Balrog's flame. In addition to this, the massive body of Balrog was emitting such a significant quantity of flame that it was threatening to murder Shin Woon by saying that he would do so. As a result of Balrog's strong flame, all of the summoned skeletons were destroyed, and Kang was able to see that he was a different foe from those he had fought in the past. Because he was unable to vanquish the Balrog with the might of his mana alone, he is forced to let go of all of his power in order to achieve victory since he has no other option. After that, he placed his palm on the ground and let out an energy in the form of white light. In an instant, Quack Ju San, who was using a vampire lord, as well as Gong Sun Chu, who was a basilisk, the flying salamander that he obtained on Mount Tianmu, Miwal Hua, who was the dragon flowering fire, and Yuil Lang, the skeleton peak swordsman, appeared before him. However, it appears like Kang was having some difficulty because he used up all of his energy to summon those undead. In addition to this, he uses his ability, the Divine Spirits and Rightful People, which causes a spike in his energy that affects even the undead he has conjured. Furthermore, he commands those summoned undead to make an all-out war towards Balrog. Go, he added. After that, all the undead rush towards Balrog and use all their might to strike the monster, but it seems Balrog can engage in combat with them simultaneously. Kang was having problems breathing because he cast a spell that boosts the target's resistance to fire but requires a significantly higher amount of mana than is required. It's possible that if they lost at that moment, that would be the end of them. However, he held out hope that all of the summoned undead would battle with all of their might because it was a matter of life and death for them all. He was taken aback by the fact that the most skilled swordsman was still on his side and appeared concerned for him. Because of this, he turned to the elite swordsman and informed him that he was alright, and that they should go help the undead fight against Balrog. He gripped his blade tightly as they both charged forward in the direction of the beast. Afterwards, they both strike at the monster at the same time. Quack Ju San uses his blade veil, while Mi Wal Hui uses his countless vines. Basilisk relies on its strength to fight, and Shin Woon uses his blade veil. If they keep attacking like that, there is a possibility that they will end up winning the match. But his eyes widened in amazement as the Balrog let off a massive volume of flame that consumed all of the undead that Kang had summoned. He was fortunate enough to evade the blow, but it appears that he was starting to lose strength since he unleashed all of his power and launched a full-scale assault when he summoned those zombies. There was not a single summons that was not lying motionless on the ground. He was aggravated by the fact that he was unable to triumph over Yom Chin Siok. He has no choice but to keep fighting. He has nothing to lose and will do so until the very end. While he kept his gaze fixed on the Balrog, he clenched his teeth. On the other hand, a status window pops up and notifies him that the hidden requirement unbending will has been fulfilled. Additionally, the information on the secret quest one who chases chaos has been updated, and the quest's grade has completed calibrating as a X grade. This is good news. The clear condition of the hidden quest one who chases chaos has been altered to require that the player vanquish all eight unknown disasters. Despite the fact that you have the title chaos pursuer automatically equipped, it was also mentioned in the status window that the effect of the title chaos pursuer had been triggered, and that within 24 hours, all of the damage that had been dealt in combat would be entirely repaired as a result of the impact of the title. Whenever he engages in combat with a subject of chaos, 200 points will be subtracted from each of his stats. Although a portion of the power of the unknown will be imbued into the body of the awakened as a result of the effect of the title, the awakened will experience a significant reduction in their skills. Kang was taken aback by the news that all of the power he had acquired would be revoked. As his veins became visible, he clenched his teeth in frustration because his control over Shin Woon's body and spirit was beginning to slip away. If his self-control wavers for even the briefest of moments, he has the uncanny feeling that it will vanish entirely. But even if it were God, that wouldn't be possible. He was so lost in his own thoughts that he failed to see that Balrog was coming closer to him, so he is at a loss for words and unable to complete his sentence. It's a good thing the peak swordsman is still alive because he managed to narrowly avoid the blow that was intended for Kang.
He fixed his gaze on the peak swordsman who appeared to be straining since its feet were trembling, and as if he cannot hold any more, but it had to protect Kang. However, the peak swordsman is able to avoid anything Balrog throws at him in a form of light. Kang, on the other hand, appears to be frozen in emptiness, almost as if he were noticing something. Then, all of a sudden, a smile appears on Kang's face, and both Balrog and the peak swordsman gaze at him and was astonished when the body of Kang suddenly emits a large amount of yellow light. After that, the status window appeared and claimed that Kang had totally absorbed the powers of the unknown as the will of unknown is perturbed. It also stated that the scythe of melting poison have largely absorbed the power of the unknown and that its grade had increased to SS+. Based on the posture of Kang and the energy that was releasing on his body, someone or something handed him power. Kang takes a glance in his hand, and all of his energy suddenly feels like they've been combined into one. He seems to have been given a new lease of life. However, he was still baffled as to where his unexpected vitality had come from. His yin mana, the kai that lies within his center kai, and the power that comes naturally to him are all converging to give him strength. Because of the mutual hostility between them, the three energies have never been able to combine. But he has the strange sensation that some unknown being is the one who gave him his abilities. Even though he doesn't know exactly who gave him power, he can't help but break out in a spontaneous grin. The experience hasn't quite erased the bitter taste it left in his mouth. However, for the time being, he will put that power to good use. Afterwards, he establishes his posture and makes it appear as though he is prepared to engage in a fight as a result of gaining power. On the other hand, when Balrog sees that Shin Woon appears to be regaining his energy, he becomes enraged and begins to release a large amount of force and is going to take an assault towards Shin Woon. The latter appears to be well prepared, which is why he even encourages Yom Chin Siok to attack him. When the fist of Balrog was an inch away from the Beacon clan leader, and since he had already gained his power, he was now able to use the twelve swords of the thundercloud and the scythe of melting poison. Then, he combined it with his fusion technique, and all of a sudden, he wielded his sword towards the one arm of the monster and cut it. And as a consequence of this, Barlog became furious due to the pain that he was experiencing as well as the fact that his arm had been sliced and had fallen to the ground. He quickly stops his strike and grips his remaining arm as though it will ease the pain. But the monster is still roaring at the leader of the Beacon clan as though it was saying something since the creature was still Yom Chin Siak. Furthermore, Kang assured the beast that it was an exhilarating experience. After that, the leader of the Beacon clan was pondering what he should do next when he suddenly lifted his hand and used the skill White Wishes. As a consequence, Mi Wal Hua, the Peak Swordsman, the Basilisk, Quack Jusan, and the Flying Salamander were all brought back to life, and their bodies were all shining in yellow light just like Kang's due to the power that someone had lent him. On the other hand, the status window pops up and notifies him that the power of the unknown are being imbued into the summons, as well as the fact that the status of the summons has been increased. In addition, Barlog appears perplexed that Kang is actually capable of doing such things. Afterwards, Kang asked the monster whether he was shaking now, and the monster must have felt terror now that all of his summoned creatures had received their power along with his summons and himself. In other words, everything was over for Yom Chiak Sion, and as a direct result of this, the monster became furious, a significant amount of flame was released onto his body, and it appeared to be getting ready to attack once more. On the other hand, Kang issued an order for all of the summons to launch an assault against the monster. As soon as all of the summons heard Kang's command, they all dashed in the direction of the monster. Everyone put their utmost effort to vanquish the dreadful monsters, and they all attacked using the most effective technique they possessed. Even though the monster was emitting a large amount of flame, the summons weren't bothered by it because they were all protected by the power of their master, Kang. They continued to strike the monster until it failed to realize that the peak swordsman had suddenly jumped above him and was using its swords to fight against him. Unfortunately, by the time the monster noticed the peak swordsman, it was already too late, and the monster was unable to evade the attack of the peak swordsman because it seemed bewildered. As a consequence, the peak swordsman severed the monster's head. The skeleton seemed to have no compunction in severing the entire monster's body into pieces. Wait for you friends in hell, utter Kang. The status window suddenly appeared and stated that Kang has eliminated the disaster Balrog and he obtained a superior mana stone as a reward while his experience has reached its maximum. The status window also stated that Kang has leveled up and reached level 81. 
His attribute as a necromancy has reached rank SS plus and additional proficiency has been obtained for all necromancy related skills while his skill, skeleton mastery has reached rank SS plus. Furthermore, the number of familiars that can be summoned simultaneously has increased to 130, and new summons have been added to the possessed familiars. The new skills, Execution Knight, Dullahan Mastery, Undead Infection, Domain of Nightmare, Soul Obedience, Grab Heart, and Chain Storm has been unlocked and because if that, Kang obtained a new treasure which is Six Soul Banner as a first clear reward. Kang also obtained a new treasure which is Black Demonic Flame Longsword as a first clear reward and the title Demonic King Slayer for the first time. Kang looks bewildered when he stares into his hand, and then he lets out a sigh and realizes that he had been feeling incredibly exhausted now that the power that was lent on him by someone has vanished. However, all of the summoned had already slain the destructive monster Balrog, and what this implies is that someone is only going to offer Kang the power when he is ready to fight against the eight disasters, and this leaves Kang with additional questions. However, he has to focus on his work at the time and won't give it any more thought until much later. He does this by first stepping on the monster's head, then raising his hand over it. An enormous fire completely destroyed a large number of homes, commercial organizations, and other structures in the place. People were yelling and trying to find assistance, however, everyone was surprised when the Kowloon group pounced on them and slaughtered everyone. A man who appears to be the leader in charge is yelling at his subordinates to kill all the individuals and because of that, people were horrified, but they continued to hide and flee in an effort to get away from the pitiful occurrence. But the Kowloon group was all experienced and had weapons, so they were unable to get away from the catastrophe. The Kowloon group continued to use their swords as weapons of assault against defenseless individuals. Some of the victims suffered cuts to the head while others on their chest. Because they were killing those innocent individuals in order to buy more time for their boss, the leader in command appeared irritated as he clenched his teeth since he believed that their leader was not yet finished with what he was doing. However, by that time, a signal from their commander indicating that the installation had been finished should have been received but until that moment there was none. But he thought that when he left their leader in order to carry out his orders, he had the unexpected impression that there could be something within. Afterwards, he turned around as he noticed something which caused him to be surprised. He then furrowed his brow and clenched his teeth when he realized that Ya Lang and the entire troop of the embroidered uniform guards were already there. However, because it was so hot and the winds were blowing in their direction, Ya Lang abruptly took a step back. However, he quickly controlled himself and continued to walk towards the Kowloon group who were being merciless and slicing their swords at a large number of innocent people. On the other hand, the troops of Kowloon all gathered together with the leader in charge and pointed their swords against the embroidered uniform guards. The leader in charge told himself to stay calm even though he seemed to be sweating in fear, because their numbers were greater than their enemy, and even though they were the embroidered uniform guards, they won't be able to. But he is unable to continue his train of thinking because his eyes suddenly widen in horror as Yao Liang unexpectedly pierces his blade and penetrates his body. After impaling the leader in charge with his weapon, Ya Liang appeared furious as he clenched his teeth and wrinkled his brows as he removed his weapon. As a direct result of Ya Liang's actions, the leader in command collapsed to the ground and was rendered unconscious. When the Kowloon groups discovered that their leader in charge had already been killed, they appeared to be in a state of complete and utter terror. Furthermore, all of Ya Liang's embroidered uniform guards were given the order to utterly destroy all of the Kowloon group's surviving forces. After that, all of the warriors from the Kowloon group and the embroidered uniform guards charged at one another in an attempt to engage in combat. They stabbed at their adversary with their swords, but considering that the uniform guards are more well known for their skill in martial arts, it's possible that they were able to prevail over the Kowloon group. In addition to this, Ya Liang made a beeline for Zhuge, who were standing still, and attempted to demolish the formation that Yomchen Siok had constructed. Zhuge appeared to be having trouble demolishing the formation, and despite the fact that he was trying his hardest, he did not appear to be making any headway in this endeavor. Zhuge explained to Ya Liang that it is not simple to destroy the formation since it is put together in such a complex way, and that it is impossible for him to do it using his power alone. Furthermore, because Zhuge was the only one who could break through the formation, Ya Liang begged him to stay for a little while longer. Zhuge was ready to say anything, but he was unable to do so because he observed something happen in the formation. Ya Liang also appeared to see what happened, which is why he immediately grabbed Zhuge and they both jumped when the formation suddenly erupted. Following that, when all of the embroidered uniform guards observed the massive explosion that had taken place, they were completely taken aback. 
They all widened their eyes, some of them even dropped their jaws, and instead of trying to figure out what was going on, they just stared blankly at the enormous blaze. Both Yao Liang and Zhuge were able to survive the explosion. Zhuge expressed his gratitude to the leader of the embroidered uniform guards, but when he turned his head to look at the location where the explosion took place, his jaw dropped in shock and couldn't able to continue his sentence. Even Yao Liang was unable to respond to Zhuge because he seemed dazed at the location. After the explosion, it was revealed that the location was the headquarters of the Kowloon group. Because of this, Yao Liang gave his soldiers the order to search the area carefully on the spur of the moment because they needed to determine whether or not Yom Chin Siak was still alive. Afterwards, Yao Liang is aware of the odor of the explosion, and he verifies that the odors are unquestionably remnants of gunpowder. All of a sudden he wrinkled his brow when he learns that the odor could be that of the violent thunder bombs, and he was perplexed as to how these bombs could be at the Kowloon Group headquarters as such bombs are undoubtedly locked away in the treasury of the Imperial Palace due to the fact that they are extremely deadly. In addition to this, Yao Liang realized that there may be a traitor within the Imperial Palace. He grips his blade more securely than ever before. Furthermore, another one of his comrades yelled that they had already discovered the dead body of Yom Chin Siak, so he hurried over there to look at it. According to the subordinates, Yom Chin Siak was undoubtedly represented by the skeleton because it had the latter's skull, as well as traces of clothing and the black sky sword. Although the corpse was indeed the body of Yom Chin Siak, he did not die as a result of the explosion and that is the reason why Ya Liang was not convinced since he noticed that the corpse was not simply burnt by the explosion. Rather, there are some visible traces of battle on the corpse, which means that someone broke through the formation and dealt with Yom Chin Siak before they arrived. But Ya Liang's thoughts suddenly stopped when someone called his name. He was the provincial minister who was asking if he was injured. Why so seemed weak due to the explosion made by Dyung Ho because he was held carefully by the Beacon clan leader and Ya Liang seemed startled when he saw Shin Woon. The following day, after Shin Woon had successfully taken down Yom Chin Siak and an explosion had taken place that exposed their hiding spot, all of Zhejiang was thrown into complete anarchy. The Kowloon Group, an important part of the chaos sect that had governed Zhejiang for decades, was eradicated at the hands of Yu Jia Liang and the embroidered uniform guards. This victory marked the end of the chaos sect's reign in Zhejiang. Distribution of illegal substances and trafficking in people are among their many crimes. The atrocities that were performed by the Kowloon group, who were responsible for committing deeds that were considered to be heinous crimes throughout the Central Plains, infuriated the Emperor, and he made the decision to put things right, despite the fact that it appeared to be too late to do so. The Emperor gave orders to arrest all those associated with the unpardonable atrocities and put them to death. And because of that, Zhejiang had fallen into a vortex of chaos in the orders of the emperor. Whether large or small, the Mount Huang sect of the chaos sect which had connections to the Kowloon group and several order sects associated Ek with the Murum Union were hit as well. Afterwards, the emperor commanded the establishment of an organization to manage the martial artist of Zhejiang. Alongside rumors that the Beacon Commission clan would stand at its center was Yu Xin Wun, and he was rising as the new ruler of Zhejiang. In the meantime, there was a gathering of people, but the blue light that surrounded them obscured their identities, and it appeared that they were conducting a meeting. Under the guise of Commander Li, the military director of the Blood Sect said that Yu Yaoliang, wielder of the Azure Dragon Sword, was responsible for the obliteration of the Kowloon Gang three days ago. After the spies were dispatched, it was verified that Commander T, who also happened to be Yom Chin Siak, was murdered. Even if Yu Yaoliang were at the pinnacle of ascension, if Commander T had demonstrated the power of the blessing that the blood sect leader had given him, then it would have at the very least allowed him to escape an emergency situation. This was incomprehensible to a different individual who went by the alias of Commander Gan. Commander Lee agrees with Commander Gan because that particular aspect seems fishy to him as well. After he investigated it was confirmed that there were no traces of the blessing being used in the bodies of their comrades. Perhaps he chose not to display the powers of the blessing in the event that the identity of the sect could be revealed. Another person under the alias of Commander Gam commented that it seems Yom Chin Siak did at least one thing right before he died. It all makes sense because Yom Chin Siak's level without the blessing is about ascended middle rank and he wouldn't have been able to defeat Yu Yal Yang. Additionally, it was established that the clandestine prisons where the drugs and finances were concealed had been seized by an unknown character, and Yom Chiaxian was solely responsible for bringing this on himself. But whatever happened, to imagine that the latter would conduct a foolish deed that set back the great will of the sect is ridiculous, and it is too soon to declare that the great will of the sect has been hindered. 
The animosity between the Chaos Sect and the Miram Union has reached a new high after the destruction of the Kowloon Group. Although both sides are maintaining their silence for the time being due to the Emperor's fury, the antagonism between them is like a dormant volcano that is about to erupt. However, if they were to stage an event that would cause it to break out, it is possible that they may hasten the conflict that has been predicted to occur between order and chaos. Furthermore, they are going to make an effort to prepare for the occasion that will investigate into the conflict. Another person approaches the group and inquires about the Azure Dragon Sword. They want to know whether or not they are planning to abandon Yao Liang, who has the audacity to brandish his sword against the Blood Sect. Commander Li reassured him that the destruction of the Azure Dragon Sword was a part of his plan, and that he should not be concerned about it. However, it appears that there is another person that they need to keep an eye out for, and that someone was Yu Xin Wun, who was a member of the Beacon Commission clan. Meanwhile, Shin Woon is looking at the dry land that he purchased not too long ago, and it appears that both he and Sam are pleased with the purchase. Sam made the remark that all of the ground that was eroded by the landslide has become productive, and that whatever is grown on that area would result in a fruitful crop. Yes, you're right, utter Shin Woon. The latter spotted the seller who was standing behind him and seemed surprised when he saw the dry land that he purchased. The vendor couldn't believe that the dry land was now fertile because only a few days earlier, the property was covered with boulders and lots of dirt. Suddenly drawing near, he begged with the leader of the Beacon clan to buy back the land he had previously sold to him. When the leader of the Beacon clan asks the seller why he should sell it back, the seller responds by stating that farming in and of itself is a difficult endeavor and he would pay twice as much for that type of land. The leader of the Beacon clan let out an unexpected laugh and promptly rejected the offer made by the seller. However, the seller is adamant about taking into consideration his offer. He explains that the former landowners are currently exerting pressure on him to return the land, and he knows that if he loses their favor, it will be the end for a broker like him. The vendor goes so far as to go on his knees and beseech the leader of the Beacon clan to give him another chance to buy the land. But the leader of the Beacon clan didn't change his mind and turned around to walk away. Just as he was about to go, however, he stopped and told the seller that he was not concerned with his business. What about the time you sold this dirt cheap land to me at a much higher price, he added. Then he calls Wang Sam so that they can leave the place. The seller wanted to say more but the Beacon clan leader ignored him. Afterwards, Shin Woon and Wang Sam were riding in their carriage when it unexpectedly came to a stop in front of the store that sold agricultural implements. Because Shin Woon had some important business to attend to, he gave Sam the instruction to wait for him in the carriage. The latter, who was perplexed, asked him where he was going and whether or not he was going to get some more farming equipment. After explaining to Sam that he was going to get something new and that the conversation might be a little bit lengthy, Shin Woon then left Sam very bewildered. When he entered the shop, he saw H1 Gongmang, who quickly greeted him, giving the impression that he had been waiting for him to arrive. It seems heavenly luck has made a way for me, utter Shin Woon. The elderly man instructed him to go inside, where she would be waiting for him to arrive. Shin Woon went through a specific door in order to reach the godmother who was waiting there. When Shin Woon unlocked the door, he discovered the woman inside. The godmother immediately recognized him as Yu Shin Woon, the clan leader of the Beacon Commission clan. The moment he stepped foot in the room, the godmother inquires to him in a startling manner where side he hails from. Shin Woon's response of neither caused the lady to break into a spontaneous smile, and she speculated that the latter must have come from the demonic. But she is unable to continue since Shin Woon cut her off mid-sentence by declaring that he was not a member of the demonic sect. I am simply treading the path I've chosen, he added. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope you love this manhwa. Have a good day.